only get worse. I promise you. I missed my own wedding for this. I canceled all family engagements for this. What family engagements did you have that you canceled for Bionicle Day? I quite literally put my vacation on pause for this. <laughs> are, you, are you being serious? Are you being serious? Did, are you on a vacation that you put on pause? Because that's stupid. I, the only reason I think you might be serious is because he's literally saying, please don't scam. Like, he's actually nervous that he told his family, wait, we have to... <laughs> wait, we have to postpone the vacation. This is something really important. They gather the family around, put the TV on. Oh, God. It's just like I'm already looking at the time, and I'm already so sad for what... <laughs> I'm so sad for my future. I'm so sad for Atrioc in fucking seven hours, who's not even done. He's still got a full fucking Oppenheimer of Bionicle left in seven hours. Ah! You mispronounced happy. <laughs> oh, sorry, I do that sometimes. Uh, I do that sometimes. Uh oh god dude it's just crazy because during during Oppenheimer I was thinking man this is a good well crafted movie by one of the great directors of our time and still 3 hours is a little long <laughs> like I'm still getting a little antsy at the end and so I can only imagine what a 9.5 hour bionicle deep dive is gonna do to me. I, I. No, I'm not gonna be pausing for classic Atriot quips. I want you to know that I'm not gonna be pausing the video to go, whoa, bada nui, <laughs> because as, we don't have time for that. We don't have time for that. You will have to pause for it to be an ethical reaction. <laughs> you think I'm uploading a main channel react? Atrioc deep dive react to <laughs> uh, God. Holy God. Well, all right. Let me tell you guys my preparation. Because this is gonna be this is gonna be intense. This is gonna be no joke. Um This is gonna be no joke. Uh I understand that I am gonna get fucking nightmarishly bored. I assume, during this fucking Bionicle. Although, here's what I was thinking. Here's my goal. I have to know that I paid attention, right? I have to know. I have to know that I paid attention. So, I'm going to take notes <laughs> on my whiteboard. Anything I think that's important as it's going. All right? And then at the end of it, I'm going to find a Bionicle quiz. <laughs> a Bionicle lore quiz. To see if I learned anything. Okay? That's the plan. Watch the video. Take the quiz. Prove that I am a true Bionicle fan. Here on 810 Bionicle Day. Get my Bionicle diploma. And graduate. Now why am I doing this? Great question. I have no fucking idea. I was thinking about that like two hours ago. I forgot why we even got into this. I legitimately, I'm not even like exact, I don't remember why we started talking about Bionicle. I don't remember why I said I would do this. All I know is that like the fucking, the, the, the winds of earth move fucking mysteriously. Like a fucking butterfly flapped its wing in Saigon and now I'm here fucking watching Bionicle for nine hours. I feel like I'm being moved by the tides of fate. It's out of my hand. Will you be doing the worm doing the stream? No. <laughs> I mean, I might freak the fuck out. Oh, wait. Ask the Storyteller made a song that says, Let's kick off Bionicle Day. Oh, God. The... <laughs> All right. Well, it starts out with me bald from a few months ago. That's a great start. Uh... Does anyone have a link to a video where they played two characters? 
It takes great range. Let's see yours. College class. You got to be born with it. Yeah, you guys are truly fucking all-time great Oscar-worthy actors. So what is this? Gathered friends. Gathered friends. <laughs> Listen again to our legend <laughs> of the Bionicle. It's Ace Kmart. I want every motherfucker in chat to rise up for today. It's Bionicle Day. Brothers and sisters, not since May 22nd has the world experienced such a phenomenon. Nay, a miracle. Origami Mario, Lego Ninjago, it was all leading up to this moment. It was all Bionicle. Montanui has made it possible that HR's I don't hairline, even know what Montanui is! I don't even Montanui know what that is! Montanui has made it so league addiction may one day crack. And Montanui has blessed us with this feast of glizzies and coffee. For that, we have to give thanks. So friends, join me as we enter the world. A Bionicle. Mouse MD, poppin' beats. You got eight ish on the track. Shut up, this is seven minutes! I don't have time for this! This is seven minutes with Mouse MD and eight on the track! I have to get started! Prince of Sheep. Bye bye, bitch. Fox the God. This shit, this shit happened. I'm sorry. I <laughs> Your producer tag is Ba Ba Bitch. What? <laughs> now I am become death. The destroyer of world. I'm Austin A. In brackets, Austin and Gaming, and this is my I producer don't think tag. Oppenheimer this was involved. There's your fake. <laughs> This is all tags! <laughs> yeah, it's Bionicle. Starting with the Chronicle. Got on the track, I ain't getting philosophical. Ask on the beat, now you know that ain't an obstacle. Jealous from the model, I'm repeating that shit later. United in duty, not a goal, what I'm saying. Found the Atriarch, when his name is what I'm swaying. This is the way of the Bionicle. Keep the haters on, watch it, you pay with the soul. Yeah, it's all a coin on my time till my cool to turn up. But I throw caution to the is. wind, then I let it burn up. I'm sort of like the first time with the blood of the light. Chad, talk about some breaths like it's kryptonite. Run this shit like OJ, I'm talking Fortnite dubs. Fuck a two week note, you got the D and so. All my homies ride it high. Biggie Puffy, we high. Got that golden white gig, cause my crush fly. It's not a mask, it's a Kenohi. My superpowers can make fans to those who don't really know me. The stories they gon' tell of eight ten is gon' be legendary. No. Swat and fighting for a date like I'm Ivan Drago For hundred ain't worth shit if she don't fuck with Ninjago I'm like Mata Nui, chat just knows that I sculpted them Your figures may be bigger, man, but I'm the one who's holding them no, Take not. it on the chessboard called Dom You're not holding my fingers you what? <laughs> She ain't <laughs> Fighting for a date like I'm Ivan Drago 400 ain't worth shit if she don't fuck with Ninjago <laughs> This is Ludzi Holy shit, he can beatbox and rap? Holy shit! Take it on the chessboard called Don Juan Bishop. No matter how you read my stuff, that shit don't add up. That's a luxury differential, big A, get your stats up. This gamma maybe millions being tusk gonna act up. Uh, praise Tusk, the bringer of community. Ivory throne is that name the me unity. A martyr for us since the toe of chest stupidity. Talking to modern we on Twitch like this is you and me. Bring enough snackies for a nine hour movie. Big happy meal, apples in a caramel jacuzzi. Hit a holla or Nirvana, faded off a golden doobie. Toe a Terran through Terran. Mana cases in my tenue. That is commercially the soapiest. That is Dr. Spock's associate. That Hopes is that's the ghostliest. Back to snacking Mobius. Strips of paper green, cash copious. Slime stacking rocket money. Nickelodeon. Stream uh, shots serving Discord pandemonium. He's Public shots trading Amazonian. The Elden Ring King with the Burger King crown. The Golden Arch throwing darts thrown by a murdering clown. It's Billy. Uh, oh, pump. Yeah. You be taking two L's, tripping in the Me over. 
It's, it's kind of winning me over, you know? The vibes are... Uh, <laughs> I wanted to authentically do an ad lib. I was getting into it, dude. I wanted to say, <laughs> I'm trying to join in, dude. Holy fuck. Would you pick Winnie, Yogi, Smokey, Ted, or Paddington? Bros and fuck London, now we back to Paris. Chester Bennington, but you ain't get the I'm bar. Same okay. limo, ain't the time for it. Because we got bigger A and bigger Ooh. things. Banco Anthem just to start, we got a bigger stream. No. Big ups to Patriot for the shout out on the scene. Uh -huh. It started with hit a pop, now we on modern Ron dreams. Gathered friends, Sigurd Hop 7 here, wishing you guys all a fantastic bionicle day. As the storyteller gave me the opportunity to say a quick message here, so I figured why not. Pardon the surroundings, I'm on a work trip right now. <laughs> Fucking direct to camera read. Oh Christ. Government still does not recognize August 10th as a, as a religious holiday. It's kind of strange, but hey, out of my hands. Okay. When I first started asking Atriarch his opinion on Bionicle lore and sharing Duckbird's <laughs> video in chat months ago, I did not think it would culminate in this. <laughs> but I am pleasantly surprised, as always, with you guys' unity and how willing y'all are to cling to the dumbest ideas. Yeah, no, so 100%. Hopefully, this holy day, the Bionicle community has shared, can be enjoyed by everyone, as is our duty. Just remember, <laughs> screw Belika, Toro is the goat, big up to my man, Mad Nelly, that you guys always have bonks, and you always have stonks, and have a good stream, big up to Where do you work? You know Where, do you work? Where do you work? Where do you work? I have to make a phone call. Where do you- I just need to ask them! I need to ask them some questions! Where do you work? <laughs> if AMD? <laughs> this, is, this is an AMD long con. Oh, your Absolute lot there. That was... That was phenomenal. Uh, that's almost so good that we don't even need to watch the lore, huh? What do you guys think? Maybe that was like... Powerful enough... That we don't need to watch 9 hour Bionicle lore video. Okay, here is the video that I'm supposed to watch today, which is called Bionicle Retold, Entire Story in One Video, Prologue, Episodes 1 through 10, Epilogue. <laughs> Nine hours, 20 minutes, 33 seconds by duck bricks one year ago this is a 403,000 view video gathered friends listen again to all legend of the bionicle in the time before time, Duckbrick started a Bionicle retold series, recapping the entire Bionicle storyline from the beginning to the end. And now, all journeys must come to an end. A prologue, 10 chap chapters, and an epilogue, the Bionicle retold story is completed. And so, in this one final video, we will be combining all of the entire Bionicle retold story in one massive video. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy and listen again to our legend of the Bionicle. Uh, okay. Thank you for the $7 and the message. High key recommend 
the goaded series reviving Bionicle after this. If you want more sick lore, Lil Bro. I think I'm going to be good. I think I'm going to be good. My goal is to watch this, learn enough to pass a quiz. <sighs> Fucking Christ. Behind Lego's breakout theme. Ten chapters. It's got, it's got a Game of Thrones intro. <laughs> the journey starts now. Bionicle retold. Prologue. Pro <laughs> the core wall. Our story begins on a planet called Spherus Magna, where most of the action in the Bionicle storyline begins and ends. This planet was occupied by three major types of sentient beings. Glatorian, who were physically adept warriors and protectors. Skrull, who were incredibly Bro noble to- <laughs> I can't pause. I can't pause, I'll lose my life. But I have to say, he's already talking too fast for me. He's already talking too fast for me to keep up. I was gonna put it on 2x speed. I literally can't even keep up. I thought he'd be talking slower. He's actually, this is dense. I'm worried this is nine hours of dense high speed talking. Aristic warriors and biologically different from Glatorian and Aguri, who were smaller in stature than either Glatorian or Skrull and made oh up the God. vast majority of the population. Oh God. In Lego set terms, <laughs> the Aguri were basically your small sets and the Glatorian or Skrull were the larger sets. These characters had incredible- <laughs> I gotta tell you something. I wanted to have a Bionicle to build for this stream. So I ordered. I looked on Amazon and the only one that had one day rush order. Oh, we'll definitely need subtitles, please. Oh, the only one that I had one day rush order. It came loose. <laughs> it's just this box with the loose pieces. It was like used. I didn't even get the little bionicle tin. Incredibly long lifespans, living for thousands of years unless killed. This was in part due to a refinement they had made. To I need. We, we should add a timer, right? <laughs> we just need to know where we're at at all times without having to pause the video. Yeah, let's... Perfect. Yeah, okay, get this. There it is. We'll just run this for... Okay. I mean, it's already been. To their bodies. Despite being completely organic creatures, they had metallic implants and a completely metallic bone structure. The best way of mentally reconciling this is by thinking of stuff like cyberpunk or humans in the far, far future. Okay. Where mechanical implants and technological upgrades have almost completely I see. overtaken the organic body, despite having an organic core. This well, society of workers- They're all Legos, right? So- up Into eight tribes, based on the regions they lived in and the color of their armor. Fire, water, jungle, ice, rock, sand, iron, and earth. Jungle. These were generally made up. Jungle, of sand, and Korean, earth. Except for the rock tribe, which was mostly exclusively scrub. And rock. During the early days of the civilization. Rock, sand, and earth are all different tribes. <laughs> Fuck, why am I pausing? Fuck, I can't pause. They love crafty and like being known as Anana roamed free, feeding on the dreams of the Agori. Those she fed on were eventually driven mad and rejected from society en masse. Mm. At the same time, certain members of the population began to mentally evolve, quickly rising to prominence. Superior in intellect and creativity, uh, these Bionicle people fans. left behind the confines of tribal society and bestowed upon themselves the totally not egotistical title of <laughs> great beings, seeing themselves as a vastly superior to the rest. Eventually, these great beings became the scientist kings of the planet, with all other members of society bowing to them. Okay. The minds of these great beings became great so beings. much more advanced I... than the other members of the planet. Like Twitch Shatters. Over thousands of years and cycles of evolution, they became biologically different than Agori and Glatorian, 
almost constituting as a brand. What is agori and platorian? The closest analogy that I can come up with here <laughs> is same I with love his poppins. I they love his poppins. <laughs> one is much more intelligent. You know, I can't talk over. All right, I won't pause. I'm not pausing for 10 minutes. At least guaranteed. 10 minutes. No pause. But I love that he ostensibly recorded the narration, but then also pauses his own narration to come in on a green screen and explain. Just, okay. The other. No more pauses. The great beings' minds were just so much more advanced than the standard okay. Gory or Glatorium. I need to know what Agori and Glatorium are. Species as the years passed on. Meanwhile, when Anana moved to attack the great beings, she was beaten back. Due to the fact that they had biologically evolved past normal Gatorian and Agori, she was unable to truly drive their incredibly complex minds insane, and went to do hiding after her defeat. With no more major present threats, it was a time of happiness and expansion. Mm -hmm. During this time of prosperity, the great beings began construction on a colossal okay. type robot, which was intended to be piloted by Agori to navigate nearby star systems <laughs> and explore the known universe, furthering the spread of their civilization. Unfortunately, they were unable to find a stable power source for uh, the robot, and upon attempted launch, it is unfortunate. into several pieces God across damn. the vast desert. Keep this in mind, because this is basically a Deus Ex Machina that will be relevant for not only just the end of this episode, but the end of the entire Bionicle storyline as a whole. Just remember, the prototype robot exploded due to an unstable power source, okay. and all across the desert are the remains of this massive robot. But this happiness was not to last. Prototype because after over 50,000 years without her presence, Anana grew hungry again. At this point, she had faded into legend, and few still passed on the tales of warning about her. Anana chose to specifically target one tribe in particular that were susceptible to her attacks, the Iron Tribe, <laughs> driving nearly every single one of their members mad over time, eventually killing them all off. To the rest of the Agori, this appeared to be a mysterious and deadly plague that targeted most of the Iron Tribe Agori. From the ones who remained, many were well, driven mad. <laughs> There's a difference. <laughs> I mean, this is a, I have to pause. This is a toy. You know what I'm saying? Like if this had jump faded into a Barbie doll. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Can you imagine? The, list, the girls just play with the doll. <laughs> Add themselves by the decimation of their entire civilization and all they had known to love. And the only survivors were shunned and driven away from the rest of the Agori in fear of their... There were lives lost? Okay, I'm seeing right here. To this day, we okay. only know of two named survivors who were both filled with hatred and paranoia against the rest of the Agori for this mass shunning. In the grand mass scene, shunning. the decimation of the Iron Tribe and their two remaining members aren't too relevant right now, <laughs> but just keep them in mind for later because they'll be relatively relevant down the line. You got Meanwhile, it. Meanwhile, anonymous got it. troublesome misdeeds you got it. there. Grown Two members of the Iron Tribe. Of the militaristic ways of the Skrull, she used her telepathic abilities to expand the mental powers of the female members of the Skrull species, hoping they would use their newfound telepathic powers to wipe out their male counterparts. However, this didn't happen instantaneously, and while it did cause Robust. the male and female members of the species to have a major cultural divide, no major conflicts happened until much, much later. We've got in one story. in real life. All you need to know at this point because is women aren't doing this. Women are not making these videos. Cult-like society <laughs> called the Sisters of the Skrull, okay. isolating themselves completely from the rest of the villages. Okay. As years passed, the eight tribes slowly dwindled to just seven main tribes ruling the lands. Okay. Of course, you already know what happened to the Sand Tribe, and so there really only were just a few left. Fire, water, jungle, ice, I, sand, rock, and earth. I thought, I thought you just said- time, the great beings had also grown tired of actively ruling the land, and instead decided to take a step back from the politics of ruling to focus on their scientific experiments oh, of course. and technological expansion. Out of Good the call. seven remaining tribes, a single warrior was chosen by the great beings to be imbued <laughs> with elemental powers via a mysterious scientific process the great beings personally designed. Okay. These warriors, now known as the Element Lords, were assigned as the rulers of their individual tribes to act as representatives of each for diplomacy and trade. Okay. As the Element Lords ruled Spherus Magna and all its inhabitants, <laughs> the great beings began to fade more and more into obscurity and legend. Okay. They spent this time experimenting on the native I'm animals following. and even Glatorian Anagori, 
transforming the Sand Tribe into mindless beasts as a game to see who would survive best in the wild, and imbuing the massive insectoid creatures that roamed the land called Scopios with biomechanical implants Scopios. essentially for fun, making the desert a whole lot more dangerous and giving us LEGO fans a killer set at the same time. It was around this time where everything began to go wrong. As the Agori delved yeah, deeper and brother. deeper into the core of Sphere's Hell magma, yeah. they uncovered a substance now known as Energized Protodermis. This discovery spurred on the central conflict of the Bionicle story. When Energized Protodermis okay, what is this? was discovered by the Ice Tribe, Energized the first Agori to the substance with his bare hands was instantly vaporized. And that was just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> when animals and other objects were exposed to the substance, nice. they not only nice. were just disintegrated, some actually were mutated and transformed into fantastical new creatures. Okay. Immediately seeing the limitless potential mm. for such a powerful substance, the Element Lord of Earth advised the Lord of Ice to barricade his territory, refusing to share it all, except of course with the Earth Tribe, and ordering all Glatorian of Ice to defend the land at all cost. Okay. This understandably <laughs> angered the rest of the Element Lords, who naturally yeah, assumed the Lord of Ice would share it with the rest of them, at least via trade. As diplomacy broke down and the ice territory was transformed into a full-on kingdom overnight, the core war began and the beginning of the end was nigh. The mining okay. of energized protodermis, well, clearly not the beginning of the end because this is of the planet, not even one hour, caused the planet to grow unstable, with the protodermis bubbling up onto the surface of the planet all across the globe, okay. only further fueling major conflict over these hotspots. Okay. The Gori and Glatorian began to attempt to study the energized protodermis, turning it into <laughs> weapons and major forces of destruction. Absolutely <laughs> horrified by the state of society, the great beings <laughs> attempted to step in. But since so much time had passed since their dominance, relatable. Their for peace I am also horrified war, by the state of society. Every single tribe succumbing to the war. Taking advantage of technology developed by the great uh. beings, the Agori began to even modify animals for war, fusing uh. organic creatures with mechanical implants to hone them for battle. As the battles raged, this proved to be okay. one of the bloodiest conflicts in the entire history of the Bionicle story. Um, okay. The power of the Lord of Jungle caused hundreds of warriors so, to be fused into trees and okay. life, creating an eerie forest of I blood. do have to pause. We're 10 minutes in. I just need to understand. My understanding is that the ice tribe found phasmophobia in the ice, and if you touch it, you get stronger and so the ice guy said, fuck it, we ball, I'm not sharing. And then all of the other tribes wanted some of that shit. And now they're fighting for it. But now the ice tribe is probably the strongest on account of all that. It's kind of like a metaphor for oil. Pretty deep. <laughs> Blades and corpses. <laughs> Even warriors who had grown disillusioned to fighting were soon pulled into the conflict, with very few remaining safe havens left on the entire planet that hadn't been touched by the conflict. Even innocent Agori who were non-combative were inadvertently killed in the senseless fighting over this resource. Okay. During this conflict, the great beings began to secretly recruit Agori to serve them in the name of peace. Right. Some of these Agori were tasked to gather samples of energized protodermis and send them back to the great beings. Upon an intensive analysis of the substance, the great beings realized that the sheer amount of energized protodermis being drawn from the core was destabilizing the planet, and well, society as a whole was on the path towards an extinction level event if energized protodermis wow, it's continued like real to be Earth. drawn from the planet. To address All resources. This, the great beings developed two major contingency plans. The first was a short-term solution. To end the war, the great beings developed completely mechanical shape-shifting killers called Batera, created for <laughs> one singular purpose, to wipe out any being ever seen holding a weapon. Unleashed en masse, these Batera proved to significantly slow the war, but at an incredible cost to the population. Unfortunately, due to their incredibly advanced Wait, AI, even after the great beings attempted to shut them down because they were dealing more harm than good, the Batera rejected their programming, <laughs> instead revolting against the great beings and rampaging who across could have the land, that? wiping out anyone they could find who was wielding a weapon. Okay. And so they developed this second plan, which was more of a long-term solution. Sure. Unsure of the long-term viability of the planet, the great beings drafted this much more extreme plan. 
Remember right. that prototype robot designed to map out oh. star systems and expand civilization? I do. It that exploded. Was ultimately abandoned because they couldn't figure out. I a wrote good, it down. It exploded. Power source. Well, the great beings decided to resurrect the project, fueling a new second version of the robot with energized protodermis, which was the only substance powerful enough to uh -huh. keep it afloat and stable. The goal of this new project, dubbed the Great Spirit Robot, to signify the fact that it carried the spirit of Spherus Magna, of course. was to survey other worlds, learn more about other cultures and planets, and after a hundred thousand years, return to <laughs> Spherus Magna with hopefully the tools and knowledge gained necessary to repair the planet at its core. Oh, good. This robot it was a hundred thousand years ago. It stood at forty million feet high and contained its own internal gravity and weather systems that could be forty million controlled. feet high. The most interesting was this written for children? Was that it essentially was an entire universe to populate this world and run the internal mechanics of the robot? The great beings made an entirely new biomechanical species known as Matoran. These were not fully organic, like the Victorian and the Gori, oh, but they also weren't fully robotic, like the Batera. They were essentially the perfect blend in between, and most similar to some of the most advanced great beings, for sure. and the advanced for sure, for sure. who become for more sure. machine than man. For sure. These were similar in scale to a Gori, but their minds yeah. were completely artificial, at right. least at the start. In the beginning, they were little more than robots, with some organic components, operating entirely based on their programming directives to fulfill certain tasks, right. like maintaining the power source, executing repairs, and right. so on. During construction of this robot, the great <laughs> beings use advanced science and biological experiments to create a being known as Tren Krom to oversee oh, construction shit. and Krom. The as the great spirit was being built. Is this his Tren fan Krom drawing? Was completely organic featuring no mechanical parts whatsoever and had immense telepathic abilities to be able to govern the minds of all Matoran in his vicinity. We haven't even seen one bionicle yet. Oh, and one last thing I didn't mention. Trenkrom is horrendous in appearance. He's essentially a blob of pinkish flesh with tentacles and barbed hooks sticking out of every end of him. He has just two eyes inset into a gelatinous skull, uh -huh. but had the ability to grow extra eyes anywhere around his body so he could be all-seeing. And he could also shoot freaking laser beams from his eyes. <laughs> this isn't really that relevant right now, but I'm just trying to paint a picture here so when Trenkrom appears later on in the story, you'll maybe be able to better understand why some characters literally go mad just by seeing him. Okay. He's that horrendous. Freaking but anyways, after laser beams! After construction of the Great Spirit Robot was done, Trenkrom's usefulness was over, and the Great Beings placed him far away from the proceedings Trend at the center of the robot, Krom. confining him to an island of his own where we wouldn't see him in the story until much, much later. Meanwhile, as construction of this robot was occurring, the Core War raged on. At this point, some tribes had formed uneasy alliances with each other, and the Earth tribe had been essentially shunned and systematically killed off for being the people who started this war by manipulating the Lord of Ice to I take the Protodermis for himself and them. In a they manipulated the Lord the war, of Ice? A legion of Skrull, fresh from a major victory over the Jungle Tribe, routed the Ice Tribe from their mountains, right. giving the Fire the tribe, ice tribe from their mountains through the Northern Ice Tribe flank <laughs> and finally seize control of the original spring of Energized Protodermis, <laughs> which caused all this fighting to begin with. <laughs> Unfortunately, the fire tribe it. then proceeded to it. foolishly drain the wellspring oh. of all its energized oh. protodermis, significantly advancing the planet's decay and causing earthquakes to break out all over the planet. The great beings, observing this destruction, hastily began preparations to launch the great spirit robot. It's at this point in the story that I want to address one major thing. Oh, please. Despite what the legends may say, the great beings were far from benevolent gods. Sure, they all did want what was best for society, but many of them had massive egos and saw themselves as literal gods because of their physically advanced and mentally advanced nature above the rest of the population. Of course. This was not a great mix for a brand new universe being created, and we're going to get into why. It's like when my dad says he wants what's best for me, but then tries to stop me from watching Bionicle shows my entire childhood and not coming out to family dinner or with... You know what I'm saying? Like, he thinks he knows what's best, but he doesn't understand that spending every waking moment 
Studying Bionicle. Okay. And so in all this chaos, one rogue great being named Velika made a choice that would kickstart the entire Bionicle story and launch the main conflict that would drive 10 years worth of the Lego theme. Oh! In the final moments Wait. before launch, Velika essentially pushed a software update to Almatoran, which elevated them beyond mindless robots assigned to do certain tasks mm -hmm. and imbued them with a form of artificial intelligence that he had been secretly developing which was so advanced, they became no different than the average Gori or Glatorian back on... Hey, thanks, babe. Yep. I'm watching porn. <laughs> Don't come in, I'm watching porn. <laughs> ah, phew, safe. Spherus Magna. He did this not out of the goodness of his heart, but with a plan to later reveal himself as the source of their free will, in hopes they would choose to worship him because of this. Oh God. Because what really is the point of having a mindless army of robots worship you when you could give them sentience and have them choose to worship you out of their own free will? Now that's what Velika's talking about. It was this <laughs> sentiment that caused every single inhabitant of the Matoran universe to gain full sentience and okay. consciousness at once. Oh? While most still went about their daily tasks, as time went on, they became more and more independent, functioning as unique individuals with personalities, hopes, fears, and dreams. Velika had, whether intentionally or not, just created a new sentient species. And as this great spirit robot blasted off into deep space, carrying <laughs> a brand new, fully intelligent species on board, the Core War ripped the planet apart in a major event known as the Shattering. The Shattering. The destruction. Three new celestial bodies were born. Bota Magna, home to vast jungles and biomechanical dinosaurs. <laughs> Bara Magna, now a vast post-apocalyptic desert wasteland which okay. housed the vast majority of surviving Agorian Bota Magna, Bara Magna. And Aqua Magna, an ocean-filled planet with no Aqua surviving Agorian easy. I get it. inhabitants. The stage was set for an epic journey as the inhabitants of the great spirit robot slowly gained sentience, all while having no knowledge of their origins and original purpose. As life on Bara Magna began to regress into nomads wandering the desert and the robot launched forth into the universe, we now have reached the end of the beginning and the start of a new chapter in Bionicle lore. Previously on Bionicle Retold. No. Prologue, the Core War. No, 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 no. Extinction. Thousands of light years away. Battles rage no. across a planet known as Spherus Magna over no. Energized Protodermis, a mysterious and powerful substance with no, the you can't do to this. create or destroy. <sighs> Elemental tribes You can't recap what we just watched in the video! With the mining of this substance. Scientist kings known as great beings devise a last-ditch attempt at survival, <laughs> sending a colossal robot hurtling into deep space. No! Fuck that! I don't need to watch the recap! Say that to begin with! If the recap covers it in a short amount of time, just say that to begin with and <laughs> you don't need the rest. It's mission to survey and collect data on other worlds, societies, and technology with the hopes of returning after thousands of years to repair the planet. As this great spirit robot launches from the planet's surface, the war for Protodermis splits the planet in three chunks, forever altering the future of society. The fate of Spherus Magna and all its inhabitants lies in the hands of a burgeoning species created at the heart of the great spirit robot, mm -hmm. only just beginning to seek out their own place in the world. This is Bionicle Retold. Chapter one, begin. <laughs> we last left off with the great spirit robot hurtling into space, carrying a new hybrid species aboard called the Matoran. In the Matoran language, great spirit translates to Mata Nui, and at this stage, Mata Nui, I know that. Everyone the says great it. Great spirit robot was known as just Mata Nui. This Explain microcosm of a universe served as the primary mystery driving eight years of the Bionicle storyline from 2001 to 2008, 
as you may probably guess, this was the big mystery yet to be unveiled until eight years into the LEGO theme, that literally everything was happening inside a gigantic robot. But to truly delve deep into this brave new world, we have to turn back the clock, returning to the time before Spherus Magna was split apart and the great beings were still working to develop and build this Matanui robot. Right. It was at this time that the robot was divided into multiple internal domes, separated by a sea of liquid protodermis that, in essence, was the lifeblood of the robot. <laughs> With internal gravity systems keeping everything secure and in place, Vast continents began to slowly Wait. take shape, with artificial weather beginning to kick in to climate These control. These are continents inside a robot? World. This robot had a very precise system of surveying alien worlds. Upon arrival on a new planet, the robot would land and lay horizontally, submerged in the <laughs> oceans of the world. Across the face of the robot, a highly specialized cloaking mechanism would take place, disguising itself as a remote <laughs> island amidst the ocean. When the analysis was completed and what? surveying was done, mechanical swarm-like robots known as the Borok Swarms would wipe across the face of the robot, clearing away the camouflage and preparing it for takeoff yet again. Aided by a remote satellite known as the Red Star to calculate trajectory and conduct repairs, the surveillance process was truly state-of-the-art. The very first species created by the great beings were known as the Matoran, hardy builders and workers similar in size and ability to the Agori. Unbeknownst to the rest of the great beings, they had gained full sentience and free will thanks to the meddling of the great being Velika, who also transferred his consciousness into a Matoran body to keep an eye on the universe and influence the development of society. Okay. Much like the Agori and Glatorian, the Matoran were also separated into elements, although this time, unlike the inhabitants of Spherus Magna, <laughs> they were built to possess some innate elemental abilities. <laughs> to perform the... <laughs> it's so funny! This is like a Ken Burns documentary, but every fucking 15 minutes, it'll be like the most fucking childlike drawing of all time. Like some kid's fucking preschool artwork. <laughs> and they'll do a slow pan over it like it's fucking historic the Rosetta Stone. Vast degree of functions and roles in the Matoran universe. 15 elements were chosen for Matoran to be divided into. Fire, water, air, ice, stone, earth, light, magnetism, Lightning, Plasma, Gravity, Sonics, The Green, Iron, and Psionics. I just want to note that out of these 15 elements, I know it sounds like a lot, but really only seven- One of them's just called The Green? Psionics, Electronics, and The Green? And there's 13 of these in addition to the fucking eight different tribes? Rock, Stone, and Earth? How the hell? and arguably six are really too too relevant to the main storyline the other ones just play supporting roles you probably guess which ones are the most important and i'll be going over them later no in this the video. green and the other thing i wanted to note is that the batoran have their own language they basically have their own dialect separate to the english language where a lot of words in english translate directly into batoran universe words mm. a key proponent of this language is the use of suffixes and prefixes as well so, for example, the prefix ta means fire. So, a matoran of fire would be a ta matoran. A village of fire would be ta koro, with koro meaning village. A region of fire would be ta wahi, with wahi meaning region, and so on. And don't worry if this is a little bit confusing, I've linked dictionaries down in the description below, and I'll also be explaining every single word as they come along in the story. So don't worry about getting no! too, too confused because I will be explaining every single word I say. No! Just keep in mind that if I say the word Matoran and have some prefix behind it, then that necessarily means that element. So Ga Matoran water, Le Matoran air, and so on. The first Matoran ever brought into being were the Matoran of Light, or Av Matoran. It was their job to maintain and power the heart of the Great Spirit Robot, and as such, were equipped with minor elemental light abilities to ensure the power source of the robot remained stable. Situated in the realm of Karda Nui, the world that feeds the world, these Av Matoran were the first to work amongst the Matoran universe and sustain its artificial heart. Upon reaching the end of their life cycles, or if needed, Av Matoran could be forcibly evolved and transformed into the Borok robots created to cleanse the surface of the robot, losing their personality and memories in favor of a singular will to cleanse. Remember this for a future chapter. 
You may be able to guess where this is going, but a swarm of mindless robots with one core directive to cleanse the surface of Mata Nui would prove to be, let's just say, problematic in the future story. <laughs> core to the functions All of right, the I got the dictionary open. robot were the Kanohi masks, highly advanced technological objects that granted powers and abilities to any Matoran who wore them. Ah. Initially created by the great beings, these masks represented an additional secondary power boost in addition to the wearer's primary element. There are four major types of Kanohi power levels. Powerless, Noble, Great, and Legendary. Ah. Yes, these were the collectibles of the LEGO theme. You gotta have them in any original action-adventure theme LEGO puts out. Powerless masks are worn by every member of the Matoran species, and essentially served as power sources of the Matoran. Despite being unable the powerless to access masks the serve as the power, power sources? The would normally provide, without a Kanohi mask, Matoran laps into a comatose state. There would also be some extraordinary Kanohi that possess powers far beyond a normal mask known as legendary masks. Only three exist. The Kanohi Vahi, the mask of time. The Kanohi Ignika, the mask of life. And the mask of creation whose true name has been lost to time. Oh, that's These unfortunate. These masks cannot be worn by ordinary users and often require special circumstances for their power to be accessed. Okay. These were planned to be brought into existence by the great beings to fulfill extremely specific and incredibly powerful duties. The Vahi could be used to slow time around a specific segment of the universe, allowing for quick repairs before major damage was dealt to the robot. The Mask of Creation allows its user to imagine okay. a completed product from raw materials and learn how to construct it or make it out of thin air if it was already envisioned. And finally, arguably the most important of all, the Ignika Mask of Life was only to be used in the most dire of emergency situations. Should the power source of the Great Spirit Robot ever falter, the Ignika could be worn by an inhabitant of the Matoran universe to kickstart it back to life, <laughs> sacrificing that inhabitant in the process. This okay. mask also had an I can see where that's going. powerful failsafe. Should the advanced AI of the mask deem the Matoran universe and in turn the Great Spirit Robot as a whole beyond saving, it would activate a death countdown, instantly <laughs> killing every inhabitant of the universe at once to prevent the technology of the Great Beings from falling into the wrong hands. What wrong hands?! Meanwhile, It kills the everyone in the universe?! The, the Great Beings brought forth many more Matoran to populate the land. <laughs> Each imbued with innate <laughs> elemental abilities that can manifest. Don't show me this photo again. Perform certain tasks. The main Don't show me this photo again. Crop up in the story were Ta Matoran, Matoran of fire who could tolerate extreme heat and work in intense conditions. Ga Matoran, Matoran of water who could hold their breath for a I long time. I bet Ga stands for water. And could repair any water damage to the robot. Le Matoran, Matoran of air with great ability and speed in tall structures. Ko Matoran. Matoran of ice that tolerate immense cold and can repair breaches from the vacuum of space. Uh -huh. Po Matoran, Matoran of stone with incredible strength and physical prowess for the heavy lifting jobs of the universe. And Onu Matoran, Matoran of earth with night vision and enhanced strength to toil in the darkest parts of the universe. Cool. After the creation of the Matoran, the great beings created two kindred beings to serve diametrically opposed roles. Artaka, who ruled over a land of the best Matoran crafters and builders Giga Chad. who churned out rare artifacts and powerful tools to aid the universe. Okay. And Karzani, the ruler of a realm where broken and malfunctioned oh, he's like the Matoran Joker. were sent to be repaired. Holy shit! While both started with noble intent, Velika's meddling gave all members of the universe sentience, not just the Matoran. And as time progressed, some of these realms devolved into stuff much, much darker. <laughs> Immediately after How the dark could it be? Great beings pitted How Ataka dark could it be? against each other in a competition to earn the legendary mask of creation. Artaka eventually emerged the victor after months of battle, claiming the mask and leaving his counterpart, Karzani, with the Kanohi Olisi, the great mask of alternate futures. <laughs> this left Artaka with the power to create literally anything he wanted, and Karzani with the power to inflict visions of alternate futures on his subjects. <laughs> Still a cool power, but not literally create anything you yeah, want. Yeah, that you You can understand why Karzani may be a little jealous of his brother. <laughs> Due to the sentience Velika bestowed upon the members of the Matoran universe, Karzani grew deeply resent- Just like my brother, who's a doctor, is jealous of me. Because I- <laughs> I have much deeper knowledge of bionicle lore. <laughs> <laughs> of Artaka and slowly began his descent into darkness. <sighs> Meanwhile, the great beings continued to experiment and create. 
in an attempt to gain full expertise over creating purely organic materials, something they had first attempted with Tren Krom. The great beings inadvertently unleashed twisted and hideous lizard-like creatures known as the Zyglak onto the, the Zyglak. Universe. Escaping from the labs of the great beings, the Zyglak embodied an evil nature in true opposition to the Matoran, significantly impacting worker productivity as they rampaged across the insides of the robot. And worker so, productivity was down, huh? On the horizon, the great beings decided to create a protecting force to defend the Matoran against evil and violence. Okay. It was in these early days of prehistory that the Hand of Artaka was formed, featuring an array of defensive soldiers such as the mighty Axon and weapons master Hydraxon. Operating from the realm of Artaka, this group Holy soon shit. exemplified principles Wait. of justice and courage. Again, thanks to Velika giving each inhabitant free will to develop their own moral code. Right. With the Zyglak held at bay by the hand of Artaka, the great beings could refocus on further development of the universe. Mm -hmm. And so, a city of legends was born. Rising from the central head of the great spirit robot, the city of Metru Nui was quite literally the brain of the universe. Okay. The focal point where all knowledge was processed, archived, and analyzed by the dutiful Matoran kept inside. It was then that the wow, great beings sought to improve and evolve the Matoran species allowing the most noble and good of their kind to undergo a transformative process to evolve into warriors and protectors known as Toa. Should Toa. any threats endanger the Matoran, particularly those living in Metru Nui, chosen Matoran could rise to the title of hero <laughs> and gain physical strength, full control over okay. their elemental abilities, and have their powerless Kanohi masks upgraded <laughs> to great Kanohi masks, giving them a wide range of secondary powers for each new Kanohi. And with cool. Toa representing the second cycle of Matoran evolution, the third and final cycle was created, known as Turaga. Well, After I know this is like extremely deep uh, and true lore, but it almost feels like it's like every plot point is designed to make a different tier of power that you could sell toys with. You know, isn't that crazy? I mean, that's not obviously not the case, but like I'm sort of noticing a pattern where after Toa fulfills their duties, they can choose to surrender their power and become Turaga, transitioning from warriors to elders with an active hand in guiding Matoran society. All right. The first Toa created was Toa Helrix, hailing from the land Toa of Toa Helrix. Helrix was sent to Metru Nui to assist the Matoran in its construction and beat Who back any this one? that attempted to breach the city gates. To further fortify and defend the central processing city, the great beings gave life to a new subset of species known as Rahi animals of limited intelligence to inhabit the lands and act as a natural defense against invaders. Some of the first Rahi were sea creatures of vast proportions, ancient during the time where Metru Nui was still being built, inhabiting the depths of the Silver Sea of Protodermis around the city. I don't get it, because... And finally, as Metru Nui neared completion, the Matoran universe was complete at last. From the brain of the robot housing Metru Nui, to the heart and power source of Karda Nui, and to even southern islands at the legs and arms of the robot, Matoran and Toa colonized these individual islands. They made an animal wizard on the get. What I don't get is why the great beings keep making shit. <laughs> it keeps saying the great beings make this to defend against this, but they're the only ones that have, they have all the power. There's no outside force. They just keep making stuff that it's like for the purposes of defense. But... <laughs> There's no. Is it the great beings? Just the Lego company? <laughs> like they already made the fucking Toa or whatever to defend the city, but now they're making random fish, low intelligence fish that are like this helps defend. Like what? What the fuck does it do? What's the point? The great spirit robot. At this pivotal point in history, the great beings undertook their last creation and forged the Kanohi Ignika, the Mask of Life. Heated by undying fires and cooled in caverns of ice, the Mask of Life housed the power over all life in the universe. Wow. And its fate could shape the destiny of all the great beings' creations. Okay. As the Matoran labeled throughout the universe, two great beings brought the Ignika down to the southern continent, where they hid it in secret on an island known as Voya Nui, where it was preserved safely for many ages beneath the volcano Mount Valmai, guarded by a new being named Umbra, waiting for its destined wearer to arrive and for its own destiny to be fulfilled. Okay. It was with this final act of creation that the great beings completed the universe they had begun. Okay, and they're done. Perhaps forever. 
all except, of course, Velika, who continued to masquerade <laughs> That's as a, a great being? to influence the development uh. of a species he considered he had the right to rule. And as the great okay. beings departed the universe, they kickstarted the dormant AI of Mata Nui to govern the entire universe in their stead. Awakening, the great spirit Mata Nui assumed control of the robot and directed Mata it to Nui. the heart's Spherus Magna, right at the brink of the shattering and bringing us back to where we left off at the end of the prologue. <laughs> As Mata Nui flew deep into space, beginning the great work of categorizing and gathering data on other worlds and species, members of the universe began to diverge from their loops and develop their own personalities and motivations. Right. In these early days of the burgeoning universe, the Matoran labored in darkness and lived in sorrow. The best among them were sent to the realm of Artaka. Right. Known as the Great Refuge, this was a glorious place to work safely and happily in the light. Wow. The damaged and it's malfunctioning like Tokyo Matoran were sent to Karzani, whose original purpose was to repair the Matoran and send them back better Society. Than but the realm of Karzani was a harsh and unforgiving place, and without the governing hand and supervision of the great beings, Karzani soon realized he was ill-equipped to repair the Matoran on his own. Instead, any attempt he made to rebuild the Matoran resulted in them being reshaped into weaker and more misshapen forms than the ones they arrived in. <laughs> and giving them weapons to compensate. <laughs> in his shame, Karzani began to send these poorly rebuilt Matoran to live in seclusion on the southern continent. Oh, God. As Turaga, all across the Matoran universe began Wait, to... Wait, so they, they would come to him broken, he would disfigure them, make them worse, and then give them a weapon and make them <laughs> kick them out. ...realized that no Matoran sent to Karzani ever returned. They barred off all paths to his land, further driving Karzani into a rage and twisting his mind. I see. As the years passed, Karzani became bitter and angry, blaming the Matoran for his failures, deluding himself into thinking that they were not destined to be repaired. I mean, they gave you a tough job. Karzani then held captive what Matoran he had left, enslaving them and subjugating them to grotesque experiments in order to fortify his own realm for his now sinister purpose. This is a kid show. <laughs> any stray Matoran who may wander into his traps. <laughs> a passage from Bionicle books describing the realm of Karzani describe it as a place books. where fire provides no warmth while the touch of ice burns. Dust falls cascade over mountains while pools of water sit unmoving. Thunder makes no noise, but the sound of a gentle breeze can be deafening. This is a realm of shadow, of famine, plague, and blight. A world of darkness where there is no place for light, and the ground screams at your very steps. In case it wasn't already... <laughs> they got George R. R. Martin to write these? This is on the back of a fucking tin at Target, right? This is not like a ancient tome. Obvious. The realms of Artaka and Karzani are basically the bionicle equivalent of heaven and hell, where the good mm. Matoran are sent to Artaka to work in peace. Good. And the bad ones. I want a Judeo Christian allegory in my children's to toys. Karzani, basically hell. In fact, it was a common insult for Matoran to use against each other. Go to Karzani if it wasn't clear enough. <laughs> During this time of upheaval, the growing numbers of Toa soon <laughs> rendered the Hand of Artaka obsolete, with many of its members splitting off to form their own organization dedicated to carrying out the will of Mata Nui. Okay. This new secret society known as the Order of Mata Nui began to operate in secret, keeping a watchful I eye on the Matoran universe. To publicly maintain order, Mata Nui also brought a powerful new race of beings known as the Makuta. We don't need more joining together into the We don't need more new races new of beings. beings had the important role of creating new Rahi in the absence of the great beings to perform unique tasks and aid the Matoran, resulting in a massive rise of diverse new species as these Makuta experimented with viruses, organic material, and liquid protodermis itself to create beasts of burden, laborers, <laughs> repairers, and more. With the Holy city shit. of Metru Nui completed, okay. it was the Brotherhood of Makuta's primary job to protect the city against any and all threats alongside the Toa, both with the creation of Rahi beasts bred okay. for battle what and, are the defense, threats? and by upgrading their own bodies to make them suitable for war. I guess Kazua or whatever? And finally, the first alliance of Toa into a cohesive team was then made, a tradition that would endure for the rest of history, and the first Toa canisters were built by the Matoran <laughs> as a primary means of transport for the Toa. If the Toa canisters look familiar, it's because they literally were the packaging that the toys came in. Pretty 
pretty cool brand story integration, if I do say so myself. You do. Despite the rise you of do say so yourself. the of Makuta, the Zyglok continued to pose a major threat to the, the Zyglok. Toa. I forgot about and them. in a critical moment, the leader of the first Toa team, Lesovic, hesitated. And as a result, his entire team was killed by Zyglok. Guilt ridden, Killed? Lesofik deserted his post and began to explore the universe without a purpose. In spite of this failure, the Order of Matanui partnered with Artaka uh -huh. to create six elite Toa, physical embodiments of the elements, and unique by the fact that they had never been Matoran. Okay. Due to the power of Artaka's mass okay. they came into being as Toa. They were Tahu, Toa of Fire, Gali, Toa of Water, mm -hmm. Liwa, Toa of Air. Kopaka, Toa of Ice, Hohatu, Toa of Stone, and Onua, Toa of Earth. Remember their names, for they would grow to become the central characters in Bionicle lore. For hundreds of years, this elite I forgot of them, Toa but... Mata, named after Mata Nui himself, protected the heart of the robot and defended Kata oh my God, against wicked. any and all threats. During this active duty in Kata Nui, the Toa Mata were trained by weapons master Hydraxon, now senior member of the Order of Matanui, in preparation for their ultimate destiny. Impatient of their endless training and yearning to learn more of their intended purpose, okay. Tahu, leader of the team, along with Kopaka, sought out Helrix, the first Toa, demanding to be told a- Are these guys like... I mean, they're the main characters, right? Are they like teenagers? Do they talk like, yo... Are they like Ninjago characters or like... Yeah, Dad, I don't want to... Okay. I figured. ...a reason for their existence. Helrix then finally revealed to them their crucial purpose, telling them of the mysterious Kodrex, a giant silver sphere created by the great beings in Kardanui where their journey would begin. It was there that Tahu and Kopaka learned of the team's true purpose. Should Matanui ever succumb to external attacks or even be overthrown from within, they would automatically awaken, jettisoning from their Toa canisters and fueling mm. the Kodrax with their elemental energies, restoring Mata Nui and saving the Matoran universe. And so, when they were adequately trained and it came time for the Toa Mata to achieve their destiny, they okay. were sent deep into the Kodrax and placed in stasis inside special Toa canisters designed to sustain life functions but keep them asleep, ready to be summoned in time of crisis. And okay. after this failsafe was put in place, the beings called the Barag Twins, queens of the Borok Swarms, who? were brought into creation <laughs> and sent into slumber alongside the Borok Swarms, Wait, who? awaiting the time of their awakening, just like the Toa Mata. But little did this brand new universe know, storms were brewing, and major internal conflict was about to strike, I... kickstarting some of the most pivotal <laughs> moments that plunged the universe into conflict and changed the course of the Great Spirit Robot forever. <laughs> But and that's this is all, all for next time. And with two major fail safes deep in stasis and the Matoran universe well on its way to being fully developed, thus ends chapter one begins. Let's go! One down! On Bionicle Retold, chapter one beginnings. Birth of a new universe. After a catastrophic extinction level event that split the world of Spherus Magna in three, a colossal robot rockets away from the destruction. Carrying a I don't hybrid wanna... species so technologically advanced that they are indistinguishable from fully <laughs> sentient species. The body of this Matanui robot houses several spheres with climate-controlled items no, I... and unique ecosystems within. <laughs> Housed inside this robot are dozens of unique species. Matoran laborers maintaining the robot, animalistic Rahi guarding the boundaries, noble uh -huh. Toa warriors protecting yep. the Matoran, and wise Taraga elders guiding society. The sparks okay, that kind of helped me because I didn't remember that. Diverse development with the Order of Mata Nui keeping a watchful eye over the universe while working with the Brotherhood of Makuta to keep the peace. Uh -huh. Until now, the only threat has been the mindless Zyglak, byproducts of ancient science united in their will to destroy. Okay, the Zyglak are the bad guys. growing at the heart of this universe, and this fragile peace is not to last. This is Bionicle Retold. <laughs> yeah! Part 2! Chapter 2, Rise of the Brotherhood. <laughs> Part 
Part 1, Reign of the Six Kingdoms. <laughs> No! With the There's parts of the slumber, chapters! The completion of the great city of Metronui, housed in the brain of the robot, construction on the internal workings of the robot had finally come to an end. The Matoran laborers spread out amongst the island domes were separated, isolated to their own homelands and regions. And so, to maintain stretch. order and unite all disparate aspects of the Matoran universe, the great spirit Mata Nui saw fit to bring six new prime species into existence. Okay. Perfect physical specimens. New species. Beauty and absolute power. These rulers were known as the Baraki. Why is there new the species Matoran every time? translates directly to warlords. The Baraki consisted of Prydak, the strongest and fastest of them all. Okay. Kalma, a cruel and emotionless ruler. The secretive and isolated Mantax. Elek, who was once the most brutal of them all. Karapar, an incredibly powerful physical force. His and name's Takadus, Elek, and he has electricity. Kind of a treacherous warlord with an eerie hypnosis ability that held his armies in his thrall. Just a side note, the images shown on screen like this guy right here for the Baraki are actually for mutated versions of the Baraki. Mm. Of course, these are mm. not the prime specimens that they were I was going to say. But as to why they were mutated, I was gonna well, say. we're going to have to wait and find out for that. <laughs> but unfortunately, we do not have any images of the Baraki pre-mutation. So any images shown on yeah. screen here are for the post-mutation Baraki. They're the same characters, just underwent a bit of a physical transformation, which we'll delve into much, much later in the coming chapters. <laughs> the rule of the Baraki lasted for nearly a thousand years, resulting in a massive military campaign to form an empire spanning most of the known universe. I see. After each of the six Baraki maintained peace over their own sector of the Matoran universe, they banded together in an alliance known as the League of Six Kingdoms. Led okay. Led by Pradact. This league lasted for more than 14 <laughs> millennia before it was dissolved. But <laughs> they couldn't tell their universe was a giant man or a giant robot, <laughs> even though the map of it looks like a guy with legs and arms and a head. <laughs> Absolute power. That was the big reveal after eight seasons was that the whole thing was inside a robot, and this is the map corrupts absolutely and as the baraki exercise their power as some of the most prominent political and military figures in the universe it became apparent that some of the methods they used to accomplish their goals were far from peaceful and mm. arose instead from a desire for the acquisition of wealth tyrannical domination and yet more sinister the overthrow of the great spirit himself monitoring the political situation intensely the brotherhood of makuda sworn guardians and defenders of the great spirit mata Nui, Right. Paid off the treacherous Takadox to act as their spy on the inside of the League of the Six Kingdoms, what? reporting back to them with troop movements and plans. With the League's main focus now twisted from the Narc? preservation of order to the complete domination of all life, the Matoran universe was under a complete totalitarian state of rule. Matoran were forced to abandon their posts and take up arms as the League drafted more and more people into their armies. And despite Metro Nui signing a trade agreement in exchange for sovereignty and freedom, all other domes across there the universe trade soon agreements? fell to control of the Six Kingdoms, with the Baraki succeeding in their initial goal to unite the universe, but at a great cost. It was at this point that the Brotherhood of Makuta decided to step in. Takadox, the mole inside the League, informed the Brotherhood that the Baraki were prepping their armies to overthrow the great spirit Mata Nui himself. Mm. Seeing these warlords had gone too far, the Brotherhood of Makuta, led by the powerful Makuta Miserix, summoned their own armies to pour forth from their colossal fortresses. Partnered with every available Toa team, they were led in battle by Makuta Teradax, a high-ranking lieutenant of the Brotherhood. This combined army swept across the forces of the League, overwhelming them in a climactic surprise attack. Okay. And so, with their armies defeated and driven away, the six warlords were brought before Makuta Teradax, bound and begging for their lives. <laughs> in a final act of desperation, the Baraki revealed their details of their plans to Makuta Teradax, begging him to join them to rule over all the universe. But in the would... moment, Teradax rejected their treasonous offers, sentencing them all to execution for their crimes against Holy Mata shit. <laughs> Although, of course, he secretly planned to spare Takadox for all his help and information. Right. But before Teradax got a chance to execute this punishment and reveal to the Baraki who had betrayed them, a crack of energy blasted through the empty battlefield, materializing <laughs> a being out of thin air the to disgrace Baraki and Teradax himself. <laughs> While unaware at the moment, we now know this to be the being known as Botar, teleporting servant of the mysterious order of Mata Nui. 
Who's... Unbeknownst to Teradax and the rest of the Makuta, the Order of Mata Nui had a far worse fate planned for the Baraki. To punish them for their failed revolt, these secret servants of Mata Nui tasked Botar to teleport the Baraki to a massive prison known as the Pit, where they would spend the rest of their eternal lives in prison in the <laughs> darkest depths of the universe. Jesus Christ. And so as energy bonds <laughs> wrapped around the Baraki, and they began to vanish before Teradax's eyes, this marked the end of the League of Six Kingdoms. But although the Baraki faded from history and were now yeah. forgotten, their ideas remained in the mind of Teradax, the first seeds of what was to one day become the darkest and most destructive plot uh, in the history of the He's gonna turn evil. Part 2. Rise of the Dark Hunters. <laughs> cool. A time of subdued chaos followed these momentous events. Mm. With the fall of the League of Six Kingdoms, one of the most powerful and influential forces in the universe, a vacuum of leadership was created. In this vacuum of order and power, trouble began to brew on distant islands throughout the universe. On a secluded island in the southern realms of the robot, a being who would later be codenamed Ancient revolted against the government of his home code island, named Ancient. doing dirty work for the highest bidder. <laughs> Ancient's actions quickly plunged this island into chaos, starting a bloody civil war that resulted in most of the <laughs> island's population to be wiped out. And as the dust okay. settled, Ancient was approached by another a being later known war. as the Shadowed One with a business problem. Who is this? Work together and form a shadowy organization in the underbelly of the universe, <laughs> doing dirty work for good pay. <laughs> Thus, the idea of the Dark Hunters, one of the most infamous organizations in history, the was The Dark born. Hunters, okay. Conquering a small island called Odina and establishing a massive fortress on its shore. Ancient and the Shadowed One began to rapidly recruit displaced warriors from the disbanded armies of the League. Dark warriors? This group would quickly grow in number, consisting of corrupted beings, rogue Toa, bestial tyrants, sadistic murderers, convicted criminals, insane wanderers, <laughs> and anyone else corrupt and crazy enough to join their ranks. Bit of a fun fact here, the vast majority of the Dark Hunters like Ancient here were actually fan models that were canonized in a major contest that the LEGO group ran in 2005 to put every single Dark Hunter in a guidebook made up of mocks of different characters and builders in the community. You can actually check That's out all of cool. these models because I'm doing a weekly review series called Bionicle Fan uh, Reviews where I'm reviewing every fan-created, canonized Bionicle <laughs> model just like this one. So if that's the kind of thing you're interested in, please feel free to go check it out. <laughs> Sign me up. The Sign me up. Sign me up. As the Dark Hunters grew in power, the rest of the universe stumbled. Strife, malcontent, and disorder spread across the lands, reaching into the very heart of the Toran civilization. Okay. Metru Nui itself. Thus, 500 years after the defeat of the Baraki, the period known as the Great Disruption began. Heralded by the Matoran Civil War, the Great Disruption marked a dark time for the universe. With no more Baraki present to keep the Matoran in check, it wasn't long until things began to spiral out of control. It all started with a minor dispute. There's just so many Torrens, names. The builders and workers of stone. There's so many and names. Torrens, the crafters and smelters of fire. <laughs> a small skirmish over trade boundaries and legislation resulted in more and more malicious acts, with angered Pomatorans sinking Tomatorn barges, and the Tomatorn reacting by allying themselves with the normally peaceful Gamatorn, who attempted <laughs> to stop the conflict. I know what These that means. It's the water Matoran. And soon, all work in Metro Nui ceased as the city was engulfed in a full on civil war. Onu Matoran oh, no. joined with Ga and Ta Matoran as the Le Matoran of Air and Ko Matoran of Ice <laughs> banded together with the Po Matoran. With the city descending into violence, the main hub keeping the Great Spirit Robot active and functioning was essentially offline, causing a ripple effect through the rest of the universe. The best way to imagine just the Thank sheer you. amount of damage done to the rest of the robot and in turn the Matoran universe by Metro Nui going offline is probably by imagining what happens to your own body when you get severe head trauma or say your brain <laughs> just decides to shut down. Definitely not a good thing for all of the rest of these systems of- I'm, I, You know what? I'm feeling it right now. You know what? I can 100% relate to my brain literally shutting down. It is damaging. The body especially if the head itself is completely powered off, which was essentially what was happening while the Matoran were busy fighting each other instead of performing their tasks. For 400 years, the Matoran civil war raged across Metru Nui, plummeting the rest of the universe into darkness. Once again, the task fell to the Brotherhood of Makuta, the de facto defenders of order in the universe, to remedy the situation. With Makuta Teradax leading the military forces yet again, a it's drastic still good, right? plan was enacted. 
Remember how one of the main goals of the robot was to catalog and accumulate vast archives of information about of animals, creatures, and civilizations? Of course. Well, a vast majority of these animals were contained by force in the great archives of Onumetru, where underground tunnels and passageways held copies of every species that had been discovered thus far, including some of the most vicious Rahi. And so, in a severe act to stop the civil war, Makuta Teradax and his forces rounded up many of the most militaristic Matoran, sealing them in the archives and unleashing the vicious animals within to purge the survivors. <laughs> the Matoran leaders who spurred on the conflict were yet again teleported to the pit by Botar, Wait, just like the Baraki before them. <laughs> While this traumatic event known as the Archives Massacre did its job to terrify the Matoran into subjugation and stop the civil war, the damage was done. Additionally, the bloody methods employed by the Makuta, lacking any thought for the preservation of life, sparked enduring distrust between- I'm sorry, they locked their enemies in a big fucking prison with wild animals that ripped them to shreds? The Matoran and the Brotherhood. The consequences of the Great Disruption were far more widespread than anyone realized. This is the for great kids? Spirit had been so greatly weakened by the events of the Civil War that he now neared death. Recap time! In Chapter 1 Beginnings, we explained that there were three legendary Kanohi masks, <laughs> the most important of which was the Kanohi Ignika, whose important role was to kickstart the Matoran universe and the Great Spirit's life should its life force ever dwindle. The way it works is that any member of the Matoran universe can wear the Nika on their face, thus absorbing their life energy well, he has and one. sacrificing themselves to kickstart the universe, right. thus saving the entire world and Matanui's life. I do so remember it was that. that. It was a Toa of Magnetism called Jovan was charged with leading a group of his fellow Toa to the heart of the southern continent, to the raging volcano of Mount Valmai. Beneath the fiery mountain, Jovan and his team discovered a mage of passageways filled with a host of trials and were tested time and time again by the guardians of the mountain's secret. Okay. They proved themselves worthy and at last came to the Chamber of Life in which waited the Kanohi Ignika, the Mask of Life. Yeah. Placed there by the great being long ages ago, this feels like it should be the end. had waited for one destined to take it and use it and its bearer had come. The group of Toa took the Ignika from its chamber and traveled even farther down beneath the surface of the continent, eventually arriving in Kata Nui, the core of the universe. <laughs> the Toa who was destined to wear the Anika did so, fearfully and with regret in his heart, and okay. was consumed by the energies of the mask. He killed himself? His life energy was channeled through the mask and used to replenish the life of the dying great spirit. The death of their fellow Toa and the fearful power of the Anika shocked and terrified the remaining members of the group. Who hurriedly returned Jesus to the chamber and left in fear and Jesus awe. Christ! Only Jovan, leader of the group, chose to stay. Giving up his power for the greater good and becoming a Turaga, he settled amongst the Matoran who lived near Mount Valmai, his destiny fulfilled, and the utter destruction of the universe averted. Good job. Part 4 Evolution <laughs> of the Makuta. And so, with one major catastrophe oh put behind I'm them, the mind. Matoran universe settled into a period of rebirth and rebuilding. Metru Nui was slowly rebuilt, and while distrust and prejudice between certain sects of the Matoran still remained, for the most part, all evidence of the Civil War was swept aside to the history books. In the meantime, the Brotherhood of Makuta focused on damage control and anticipating any upcoming threats, as they had allowed the two previous major threats to exist for far too long. A member in their ranks named Mutron was tasked with ensuring the entity Tren Krom from the early days of the universe did not remain a threat. Here's a little recap from the prologue. Stop the recapping! Trent Stop was a recapping! Being created by the great beings to govern the Matoran universe while it was still being constructed, far before the time of Artaka, Karzani, or even the great spirit Matanui himself. Trenkrom was a horrendous reptilian organism who featured incredible I know. telepathic I know. abilities. I know who Trenkrom is. Bridges Against my will, I know who Trenkrom is. member of the Matoran universe to uncover their secrets and to be able to control their will. Upon discovering Trenkrom's island, Makuta Mutron was immediately seized, while Trenkrom bridged Mutron. their minds, catching up on all the events of the universe that he had missed. In return, however, he inadvertently shared some of his memories with Mutron, namely that everyone was created by the great beings, and the great spirit Mata Nui was, in fact, a colossal AI controlling a robot hurtling through space, and it was possible to overthrow the Mata Nui AI consciousness. However, Mutron was expressly loyal to Makuta Teradax, not the true ruler of the Brotherhood, who was Makuta Miserables. 
since Pterodax had led them into battle as Miserix's lieutenant time and time again, Mutron's true loyalties lay with him. And Do you guys think Earth is inside a giant robot? Immediately after returning to the Makuta Fortress on Destral, Mutron conveyed what he had learned from Trenkrom directly to Pterodax, who immediately called a major convocation, something no Makuta other than Miserix was allowed to do. With all the members of the Brotherhood of Makuta gathered in one chamber, Pterodax gave a grand speech, urging them that with this knowledge, the Makuta had the power to take over the entire universe, arguing that since they did all the dirty work for Mata Nui anyways, why not have them be the ones in control? I don't know the difference. Vizrix, leader of the Brotherhood, stood firm in his values, arguing that Pterodax's crazy plan could end up destroying the entire universe. Pterodax, you've gone rogue. By Pterodax to overthrow him. And so after a brutal fight between the two, the Makuta were called to a vote. Pterodax as their leader, or Miserix. While Miserix still had some staunch supporters, more and more Makuta Oops. were swayed to Pterodax's side, with the remaining defenders of Miserix being forced to side with Pterodax to go with the majority. Two members of their ranks, Makuta Spiria and Makuta Krika, were then ordered to kill Miserix, but oh since they had God. been secret supporters of Miserix, neither had the heart to kill him. <laughs> Instead, sneaking him off the island and faking his death to Pterodax. Oh, with Miserix out I of the see. picture and marooned on an isolated island with no allies, Pterodax began a massive restructuring well, of allies. the Brotherhood, tasking his most loyal lieutenants, Gorast and Ikarax, <laughs> to kill any Makuta who had originally sided with Miserix. Pterodax <laughs> then tasked scientists within the Brotherhood to seek out new races within the Matoran universe to see More if races. any be modified for war, prepping for the eventual takeover of the universe. Makuta Spiria discovered a peaceful yet physically adept so race a... known as the Skakti, who he saw fit to alter with viruses, granting them powerful laser vision and even elemental abilities when two Skakti work in conjunction with each other. Scotty? After this newfound evolution of the Skakti, Spiria left them to their own devices, leaving some Rahi of his own design called Vizorak on the island to keep them in line. But when Spiria returned, it was a total war zone. The Skakti had shed their peaceful ways and with their newfound abilities, defeated the Vizorak guards and started to slaughter each other in bids for power. Oh god. Not only did he amplify their abilities too much, but he instilled in them a sense of violence and conquest <laughs> to make them uncontrollable by the Makuta. As a result, Spiria was banished from the Brotherhood for killing a race, replacing them with horrible monsters who did nothing but destroy. Of course, we'll see this band of vicious murderers and psychopathic criminals at some point in the future. Just you wait for the later chapters. This is for like seven year olds. While the Brotherhood continued these experiments and began to cease contact vicious with other Vicious murderers and psychopathic the universe, criminals. The Order of Mata Nui grew concerned, suspicious of the secrecy surrounding their latest ideals. Since the Brotherhood of Makuta used the element of shadow as a primary power source, they would be particularly vulnerable to the element of light. Particularly, if any av Matoran were to transform into Toa of Light. Prematurely acting out of suspicion. Bro, someone said he, this guy made this for some stupid class that he was in, I'm sure. But his shirt says he's at Wharton. <laughs> he's at Wharton Business School. What class at Wharton would require to make a nine-hour bionicle the film? Matanui removed several of these Matoran of Light from their homeland as a failsafe, hiding them from the Brotherhood and disguising them as Matoran of Bionicle other elements business. to conceal their true nature and brainwashing them into thinking they were ordinary Matoran of other elements. They were then scattered to random parts of the Matoran universe, stretch. decentralizing stretch. the main hub of Av Matoran. And so after this task was completed, Mata Nui erased the memories of the previous six months from everyone in the Matoran universe, save members of the Order. This led to a gap in recorded history known as the Time Slip, Mm. where most Avmatoran vanished, unbeknownst to the population en masse. And as the years passed, the Makuta species began to slowly evolve, shedding the need for robotic parts and transmuting into a gaseous substance now known as Antidermis. This evolution <laughs> did come with a significant weakness. Should the robotic armor of the Makuta be breached, the Antidermis containing the essence of the Makuta would seep out, eventually killing the Makuta with The Antidermis. However, this evolution gave the Makuta new abilities, such as the power to possess any purely robotic shell or suit of armor. Ah. Part 5. Tale no! of Holy Khan. No! During all these events, the grand city of Metronui operated in a period of relative peace, 
under the firm but just rule of Turaga Duma, an experienced elder who had served as a Toa for more than 2,000 years. Hello, Inspector Corps. Under the leadership of Turaga Duma, Metru Nui became a center for innovation and invention. The archives of Onu Metru, a massive museum and catalog of all known species and objects in the universe, were expanded and improved. New technologies such as mm -hmm. the Kanoka discs, base materials to make new Kanoki masks, were invented, along with improved <laughs> methods for forging Kanoki. Security and peace were maintained with the invention of robotic order enforcement squads called Vaki. Duma Why do they keep making robotic enforcement squads and journey of with one different names? Likon, and its transformation into a Toa hero, protector of Metru Nui. Soon after his creation, Likon too grew wary of the Brotherhood Likon. of Lakuna, carving a stone tablet in secret. Okay, be honest. Did any of you before this fucking thing knew who the fuck Likon was? Anyone? Like, it, uh, naturally, you just, you are aware of the character Lee Khan. Unironically, yes, you knew this was. Prior to today. <laughs> that detailed the powers of a Makuta, their locations, and other essential information. Alongside some other Toa he trusted, they then hid this Makoki stone, detailing the powers of a Makuta, their locations, and other essential information within a heavily guarded fortress unknowingly close to a camp of vicious Rahi called Frostelis. When word of this stone reached the Dark Hunters, <laughs> yes, I watched this video weekly. to raid the fortress and seize this incredibly detailed and valuable tablet of it's information so dense. for themselves. Amidst all this he... <laughs> chaos, the neighboring Frostelis chose to strike he takes the fortress no breaks. and claim it as their territory, resulting in the Makoki Stone being lost to the Dark Hunters and all of Likon's teammates and friends being killed. As Likon fled the fortress, Poor he Likon. swore to never run away from anything ever again. <laughs> As he was running away. Eventually, the Dark Hunters split the Makoki <laughs> Stone into six parts and auctioned off each part, with all six components they eventually being bought them? out by the Brotherhood of Makuta themselves, who sought to be the ones to hold all their secrets close at hand. But as it turns out, Likon would soon have another chance to prove himself in the defense of Metru Nui. As the ambitious Shadowed One, leader of the Dark Hunters, yeah, led his Dark thoughts Hunters. on the conquest of Metru Nui, he unleashed a monstrous Rahi called the Kanoki Dragon from an icy prison deep beneath the waves of the Silver Sea, <laughs> where it had been trapped countless millennia ago. <laughs> Awakening from its age slumber, the enraged dragon emerged from the depths in a blast of heat and flame, burrowing up from the bottom of the archives oh, and yeah. wreaking havoc amongst the tall towers and buildings. That was a tough time. Eventually, the beast made its way to the great furnace of Ta Metru, where it settled to rest and absorb the immense heat. Turaga Duma immediately sent out messages calling for help and summoned Likon and all available Toa to confront the terrible monster. The Toa arrived just in time to save Turaga Duma from three dark hunters who were attempting to blackmail Duma into securing a base for them within the city. The hunters escaped, leaving the Toa to confront the Kanohi dragon alone. Uh -huh. And after a long and tiring battle, they succeeded. Four Toa of Ice froze the Kanohi dragon in an immense block of ice, putting a final end to its destruction. There will be a quiz after this. The subdued dragon was taken to the island of Zia, where it was given to the Vortex species for imprisonment. Eleven Toa, now led by Likan, then okay. decided to remain in the city to defend against the growing threats of the Dark Hunters. Right. This new team of Toa, dubbed the Toa Mangai, served as the prominent <laughs> protectors of Metru Nui, Warning oh my off God. most of these Shadow One's attempts to breach There's the city There's so walls. many different groups. During this time, a rash of inexplicable... So many groups, so many names. Toa Mangai. At this time, only three Toa were left to protect the city. Likon, Toa of Fire. Nidiki, Toa of Air. And Tuyet, Toa of Water. Okay. As a state of emergency was declared in Metru Nui, the three Toa set out to hunt this serial killer on the loose. There's a serial killer? Discovered with the bodies of the murdered <laughs> Matori were tablets inscribed with the name of one Toa. Toa Tuyet. After confronting their comrade, Likon and Nidiki got Tuyet to confess that the Dark Hunters were blackmailing her, believing her to be in possession of an incredibly powerful artifact known as the Nui Stone, created by unknown beings in the universe Ow! to absorb the powers of any Toa in their area. <laughs> Sorry, I'm allergic to amazing to content. User. Each uh. day that Tuyet refused to give the stone to the Dark Hunters, they would murder a new Matoran. Oh my god, really? Claiming to not actually have the stone, Tuyet joined Likon and Nidiki in flushing out the Dark Hunters. Well, what if she does have the stone? Likon and Nidiki successfully capturing a few Dark Hunters as they discovered lurking around the area. But to their dismay, the murders continued, even with the Dark Hunters imprisoned. Immediately realizing Tuyet must be behind the murders, Likon immediately went to confront her. <laughs> 
Tuya then revealed that she did in fact possess the new <laughs> stone and fuck. used its powers of Toa absorption to enhance her elemental abilities. Elemental. She attacked Leekon, intending to use her powers to set herself up as the sole ruler of Metronui. But this attack was in vain, as Nadiki and Leekon together were able to defeat her, blasting the Get stone owned. with fire, destroying it. Get owned. As was the case with all prior insurrectionists, the teleporting being known as Botar appeared to. I'm sorry, it doesn't make any sense though. T t Tuya or whatever, the, the water woman who was secretly bad. They found murdered bodies. And then they tracked it back to her. And she was being blackmailed by the Shadow Society so they could get access to the stone that she had. And then they locked up the Shadow Society and the murders kept happening. So they realized it was her the whole time. But... The whole point was there was one murder every day until she gave up the stone. But she had the stone the whole time. So why is she still killing people? Why is she killing people? She has the stone the whole time. Teleport two yet away to serve her sentence. <laughs> but this was not the last time we would see of her. Cause she Tune a baddie. Sometime around <laughs> chapter seven or eight, where Tu Yet and the Nui Stone became very, very relevant to what we call the main story. Until then, just file this information away in your mind because it's not going to be relevant for the next several chapters. I'm just giving you this information now because it takes place at this particular point in time to fit with the timeline. The events of Tu Yet's shocking betrayal and the Tuyet. chaos now gripping Metru Nui prompted the Shadowed One to strike bringing on a great Toa Dark Hunter war as the Shadowed One sent his forces to seize Metru Nui for his own nefarious purposes. Despite the war being fought valiantly, with many Toa giving their lives for Metru Nui, the Dark Hunters eventually overwhelmed the city, beating down the Toa as a constant barrage. During this volatile time, a Dark Huntress named Lariska convinced Toa Nidiki to betray his brothers and join the Dark Hunters, Toa promising Nidiki. to spare him and even allow him to rule parts of the city once the Dark Hunters inevitably overthrew Taragaduma. Little did Nidiki know, but Likon had been secretly listening in on this deal, and after Nidiki made- Guys, so many of these images are from a guy named Bob the Doctor 27. Bob, the entirety of Bionicle lore rests on Bob the Doctor 27. <laughs> Major moves to betray his fellow Toa, <laughs> Likon struck back, surprising the Dark Hunters and Nidiki, winning a conclusive victory over their forces. Honorably, Likon let the enemies go, with the promise that they never return to Metru Nui. They're gonna return! And they take the treacherous Nidiki with them. Following these events, the Shadowed One inducted a reluctant Nidiki into his ranks, partnering him with the brutish and unintelligent Dark Hunter Kreka to keep him in line, knowing his penchant for betrayal. And as the time passed, Nidiki grew weary of his membership in the Dark Hunter ranks, seeking any way out he could find. And as it turns out, opportunity struck with the arrival of a mysterious stranger named Rudaka on the island, who sought to be Rudaka. trained by the Dark Hunters and increase her fighting prowess. Nidiki immediately approached her, promising to train her oh, and return him for a ticket off the island. But Rudaka was a dishonest and traitorous being, much like Nidiki himself, and at the first opportunity, she backstabbed Nidiki, selling ah. him out to the Shadowed One and revealing his intent to leave their ranks. And so as a cruel punishment, the Shadowed One demanded more, telling her that Nidiki had to be stripped of his dreams as a Toa once and for all. His dreams Rudaka as a Toa? Rudaka then used her customized weapon called Rotuka on Nidiki, <laughs> mutating him into a hideous four-legged creature, bereft of his elemental powers and with no choice left but to submit to the Dark Hunter's oh, That's will. fucked up. Part 6, Corruption of the Makuta. You can do this, Brandon. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. Be strong, be strong, be strong, be strong, be strong. We're tasked focus, focus, focus. personal bodyguards. With their job to protect this leader of the Brotherhood of Makuta from harm, the Toa Haga truly believed they were performing an honorable deed. But as time progressed, the Toa Haga discovered a horrible truth. The Makuta had been directly responsible for a series of mysterious and dark attacks and misdeeds in recent history. Mm. In a massive strike force against the holy city of Artaka, the Makuta who was originally tasked to protect Artaka turned against it, stealing the powerful Kanohi Avoki, the mask of Kanohi light, Avoki. from Artaka's fortresses with an army of robotic Exotoa armor, Visorak spiders, and Rakshi, <laughs> particularly devious Rahi loyal to Makuta. <laughs> the Makuta also had been partnering with the Dark Hunters, funding their- Am I gonna sound crazy? I feel like I could watch all nine episodes of this show 
faster than this and it would it would be easier to understand because it would recent strikes and <laughs> fueling the conflict between them and metro nui and even oh, held sway seasons? over the vicious Vizorak hordes long thought to be an uncontrolled menace or rahi experiment gone wrong at once the toahaga launched a raid on the brotherhood fortress at destro where they stole back the evoki and makoki stone oh it's books but not before four of their members oh were my god it's so many books Rudaka who is now working directly for Teradax after receiving the favor of the Shadowed One for backstabbing and mutating the Diki. Rudaka used those same mutagenic powers to transform the four it's captured four Tuahaga movies. into Oh Bishu, my god, okay, never mind. Creatures she called Rahaga, a combination of Haga and Rakshi, <laughs> for their grotesque appearance resembled the vile Rakshi. Two members of the Haga, Norik, Toa of Fire, and Iruni, Toa of Air, managed to escape after barely beating Makuta Teradax himself in direct combat. And so, after returning to free their mutated comrades, Rudaka struck them in the back as they fled, mutating them too into Rahaga. Mm -hmm. But not before they were able to escape with the Evoki, Mask of Light, and Makoki Stone. As the former Toahaga, last defense against the Makuta, fled deep into the archives, Teradax was free to enact his plans. Afraid of the Toa's potential to damage their armor, the Makuta began a covert genocide of all Toa of Iron, genocide? wiping them off the face of the map. And now, with the treachery of the Brotherhood exposed, Teradax enacted his final plan, infecting the Great Spirit Matanui with a virus, which would gradually render the Great Spirit comatose. Its effects weren't immediately apparent, but would have serious ramifications over the entire universe as a whole. Okay. Continuing to enact this grand plan, Teradax imprisoned Turaka Duma and used his shape-shifting powers to impersonate him for over a year and a half. During this time, Teradax, <laughs> under the guise of the benevolent Turaga Duma, gradually called all Toa away to secure sea gates, where they were killed by a higher dark oh my god. eliminator. Teradax also hired Nidiki and Kreka, who helped him with various tasks in Metro Nui. And so, with all the Toa Mangai wiped out, some Game of Thrones shit. Nikon remained. Growing suspicious of Turaga Duma, who had conveniently sent all his comrades to their deaths, Toa <laughs> Khan readied himself to choose six Matoran to become new Toa in his stead. Oh, wait a minute. Previously on Bionicle <laughs> Retold, Chapter 2, Rise of the Brotherhood. Okay. I think we can skip these. Deep inside the heart of the Matoran universe, the no, Brotherhood I think of we Makuta, can skip these recaps, the bro. The of peace and justice they... have secretly turned dark. Plotting to overthrow the great spirit Matanui and led by the ambitious Makuta Teradax, the Brotherhood's tendrils spread across the universe, stoking the flame of conflict between Metro Nui. I don't think we the need the, the recaps. The are... Ruthless bounty hunters. No, I know what happened. On this city of legends, while noble Toa once protected the city and the universe from harm, many have met their fates in mysterious accidents, out on mission for the wise elder Turaga Duma. Yeah, but he's not. Yeah, he's secretly Teradax. Yeah, he's secretly Teradax. I knew that already. Now, the fate of Metro Nui and the world falls into the hands of one battle-weary warrior, Toa Likon, as he urgently seeks to transfer his power right, into Likon's six new the goat, worthy huh? Matoran, creating the next generation of heroes. <laughs> this is Bionicle Retold. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go! The journey starts now! Chapter 3 Legends of Metru Nui. <laughs> Part 1 Fist of the Vaki. <laughs> Under the leadership of the false Turaga Duma, Mm -hmm. Metro Nui slowly fell from a beacon of light and order to Duma, a dark Metro Orwellian Nui. police state. Matoran was forced <laughs> to work longer and longer hours with those who were. <laughs> this is what Orwell was thinking of things. when he wrote with 1984. The false Duma, the Vaki police force were retrofitted with staffs of suggestion, tools that could bend the mind of even the most strong-willed Matoran and force them back to work. Vaki Nurak used staffs of command to fill their target's mind with a single overriding command that was obeyed until the effect wore off. Vaki Bordak used staffs of loyalty to fill the target with a strong desire for Duma's sense of order, mm. causing them to betray even their closest friends for minor infractions. Zadok used staffs of suggestion, turning the Matoran against each other and using them to convince troublesome <laughs> comrades to return to work. Vaki Kirak used staffs of confusion, 
scrambling their target's <laughs> sense of time and place to prevent troublemaking. Uh huh. Rorazak used staffs of presence, allowing them to see what? and hear what we'll their target what? saw or heard without their knowledge. These powerful staffs also allowed the Rorzak to detect- There's never like one of anything. Everything is always one of fucking 14. And they all have different names. There's, it's always fucking a group of 19. Any rebellious thoughts Matoran may hold, quashing them before they ever got to act on their thoughts. And worse of all, the Vaki Vorzak used staffs of erasing, temporarily eliminating their target's higher mental functions Leaving intact only motor <laughs> skills. That's happening to me. The targets of all oh my god, they're using a staff of erasing on me the right now. Wandering aimlessly through the I'm streets being hit the with a staff of erasing. With the Baki police force, the false Duma kept a firm grip over the city oh, of Metro I can New, feel the lore. Punishing any infractions incredibly harshly and modifying the Vaki's AI processing units to use extreme force and brutality whenever possible. While the staffs never physically harm Matoran permanently as to not decrease productivity, the mental ramifications what? of the Vaki's abilities cause the Matoran workforce <laughs> to live in constant, perpetual fear, forever watched by the Vaki that lurked above. What? Even beyond this powerful police force, <laughs> new threats this? lurked in the outskirts of Metra Nui. Makuta Teradax, operating incognito throughout the city as Duma, unleashed a vile, Obedience is happiness? The Morbuzak on the edges of the city. Stretching its vines deep More within Buzak. Matoran civilization, the Morbuzak was designed to push the Matoran into the center of the city, making them centralized in one place. Don't worry if you're confused. You're gonna find out exactly why Teradax wanted all of the Matoran of Metro Nui in one centralized location later on in this chapter. So don't worry <laughs> about that and sit tight for now. The Morbizak's first known action was to grow vines in the area of the Great Furnace and drive the Matoran away, allowing it to grow its king root in the center of the massive building, fueled by molten huh. protodermis and the flames. I was worried. From there, it spread its vines all throughout the city, attacking structures and Matorans seemingly at random, although of course mostly keeping to the I edges of the various metro. Oh, I was stressing. Matoran and even some Vaki fought back, but it was clear that the Morbuzak was too strong for them to defeat. This extreme rising threat of the Morbuzak, coupled with Duma's push have... to a dystopian police state, caused Toa Likon, sole protector of Metro Nui, to grow deeply I know suspicious who Likon of his is. leadership and form his own plans. Okay. Part 2. Faithful Matoran to Mighty Toa. <laughs> After many long years guarding the mighty city of Metro Nui alone, Toa Likon secretly right, stole Likon. six Toa stones from I know the who you are. I'm focusing Gamachi, on you. Transformative objects with the power to grant a Matoran incredible strength fighting prowess and elemental abilities, becoming a Toa themselves. Just as he ready to leave, a massive blast rocked the temple, and Lee Khan found himself face to face with his former comrade turned traitor, the Dark Hunter Nidiki, and Kreka, the brutish and hulking Dark Hunter assigned to keep Nidiki in line. Okay. Escaping after a short skirmish, Lee Khan hurried himself to grant Good the six shit, to six Matoran he deemed worthy of becoming Toa. And yet, in an ironic twist of fate, Makuta Teradax himself used his mental abilities to influence Lee Khan's decision, twisting his mind to pick six Matoran who were quarrelsome, discordant, and overall not fit to be Toa. <laughs> but little did Teradax know, but the Order of Mata Nui, who had been secretly Why? watching all these events unfold, had personally tricked Teradax into influencing Lee Khan Wait, to pick the what? correct set of heroes. <laughs> whose flaws would later take them on an emotional journey oh to grow God. into the true guardians of the city. Oh my God, In the Ga Metru school district, Lee Khan delivered the first the stone to Nokama, a teacher who was wise beyond her years. <laughs> Moving to Po Metru, the second stone went to Onua, a stubborn carver and craftsman in the forest. Next was oh Ko Metru, where a scholar named Nuju received the third stone. In turn, an archivist named Wanua from Onu Metro was granted the fourth, and a test driver named Matau from Lee Metro was given the fifth. Finally, Lee Khan descended on his home region, Ta Metro, bearing the final stone to a Tamatoran forger named Vakama. When Lee Khan discovered Vakama, he was deep in the midst of crafting a mask, using the most powerful discs available to him to forge the legendary Mask of Time. Just a quick recap of the events stop. of the prologue in stop. chapter one stop. beginnings. Stop. The great beings stop. who are the people responsible for creating this entire Matoran universe actually drafted up plans to make three legendary Kanohi. I know. The Kanohi Ignika or the I, Mask of Life, <laughs> I know. The I know the three masks. Mask of time. Of mask of fucking of life. Mask, mask of mask fucking of creation. Was given to I know. Kaka, which I know. To anything. 
The Kanohi Vahi, which was the Mask of Time, was originally created to allow users to slow or speed up time in certain areas of the robot, but unfortunately, due to the events of the Shattering, the Great Beings never actually got to make this mask, instead being forced to abandon their plans as the robot left the planet of Spherus Magna. What's really significant about this is that certain members of the Matora universe, namely Vakama, actually have the ability to create a legendary Kanohi such as the Vahi, which means that their minds are about as sophisticated as some of the great beings were, which definitely goes to show just how far the sentience Velika gave them has gone. In Tametru, Likon snuck into the forge, granting Vakama with the final Toa Stone and leaving him with cryptic messages to rescue the city from the grip of the Morbuzak and something far darker. With all stones delivered and instructions given to the Matoran to go to the Great Temple, Likon's final task was done. But before he got a chance to leave, Likon's revelation to Vakama was interrupted when Nidiki sprung from the shadows of the forge along with Kreka. Okay. After a short fight, Nidiki dangled the helpless Vakama over the burning furnace. I thought Nidiki Likon was to weak. Throw down his weapons and surrender himself, or else watch Vakama burn. As Likon was bound by the Dark Hunters and Vakama barely escaped alive, the grip of the Morbuzak tightened around Tom Metru, forcing a widespread evacuation to the center of the city. Right. With its sole protector in chains and a false leader commanding the Matoran, these were dark times for Metru Nui. Of course. And so, in the temple in Ga Metru, these six Matoran gathered to fulfill their destiny. They were stubborn, harboring ill will towards each other with the remnants of long past Matoran civil war still influencing their bias. <laughs> Struggling to keep the peace among the newly assembled group, Nokama attempted to reconcile the Matoran as their Toa Stones began to glow, activated by their presence in the temple. Uh -huh. Six tendrils of energy burst from the raised Suva, striking the bodies of the Matoran and Suva. imbuing them with Toa energy. And so, they were transformed, and that day signaled the solemn Puberty. end of their Matoran <laughs> lives. No longer were they humble craftsmen, now they were powerful warriors and the protectors of the city. Vakama, Toa of Fire. Nokama, Toa of Water. I... Matau, Toa of Air. Yep. Nuju, Toa of Ice. Yep. Oniwa, Toa of Stone and Wenua, Toa of Earth. Together, Stone and Earth. they would become the Stone and Earth icons of peace and justice across the city. But they were far from a cohesive team yet, and a series of trials and tribulations awaited them. Okay. Part 3, The Great Search. As the Toa observed their new forms in awe, Vakama was struck with a... I hate to pause, but... So, this is when we... These are the main characters of Bionicle now, right? <laughs> We're an hour and 20 minutes in, and that, these are... ...vision of the Great Discs, six of the most powerful Kanoka Discs in existence. While standard Kanoka Discs were plentiful and could be used to form many masks around the city, the six Great Discs were something special, created by Artaka himself, with the intent to be fused together into a Disc of Time. Each Great Disc represented one of the six elemental metros across the vast These are 2003 city. Bionicles. Beyond this, the Discs were the only objects with the power to eliminate the King Root of the Morbuzak, destroying its grip on the city. And okay. so, the Toa set out on a grand quest to seek out and uncover the hidden locations of the Discs. Partnering with Matoran who had been entrusted with the locations of the Discs, the Toa took on this new task with varying levels of enthusiasm. Only one particular I'm not doubting into it. Vakama's visions and belittling what he saw as a mere scavenger hunt. <laughs> Just a quick note here, I am kind of blasting through one of these first major initial arcs for the Toa Metru, mostly because it's not too, too relevant for the main story as a whole. Kind of unfortunate I have to do this, but we do have to cut this down into a format that is easily digestible. That being said, if you are interested in this setting or in these characters, I actually would highly recommend that you go and check out the Search for the Matoran and the Search for the Masks, which were comic and book arcs, which covered the story that I've summarized in very, very quick format here, which especially details the Toa Metru learning how to use their <laughs> elemental abilities, trying to work together as a team, and really gives a lot of characterization to each member, some of which I'll barely even mention throughout this recap. So if you are interested in these characters and want to learn more about their personalities, definitely go check out those books and comics because they do do a great job of setting up these people as a Toa team, just not necessarily major world-breaking stuff that we'll have to officially discuss in these recap videos. 
As the Toa sought out the discs Thanks. and grew into their new forms, they were deceived by the treacherous Pomatoran Akmau, who had been paid off by Nadiki to snare the other Matoran who knew the locations of the discs and confuse the Toa into wasting their time and running into traps. I'm mentioning Akmau now because this is not the last we'll see of this slippery character in many more stories to come. <laughs> Just remember, Akmau is kind of a devious guy. Okay, Blaming sure. each other for this deception, you the got it. were forced to Akmau fight to overcome is a devious guy. Banding together to use the discs to down. eventually destroy the Morbuzak in a climactic battle, resulting in the utter annihilation of the vines and the vicious plants grip on the city to diminish. Triumphant in their first great quest, Akmau. the Metru turned to the Colosseum, where they would show that they were indeed Equals heroes of Metru Nui. Devious but before being guy. able to claim their victory and present the great disc to Turaga Duma, the Toa Metru were sidetracked in Onu Metru by a crowd of panicking Onu Matoran, urging them to descend into the depths of the archives and help seal an underwater leak that threatened to flood the entire district. We wouldn't want that. In the darkness of the archives, the Toa struggled to act as a cohesive team, constantly bickering and interrupting each other's elemental attacks. Little did they know, but they were being stalked by a highly intelligent, shape-shifting Rahi known as Kraka, who was angered Kraka. by their intrusion into her territory, but also deeply curious about the nature of the Toa. Right. Observing their discordance, Kraka used their conflict to her advantage to confuse the Toa and further her agenda. Sowing seeds of distrust and conflict in the group, the Toa Metru came close to killing each other before Nuju oh, stepped in to calm the team, Who's uncovering Nuju? the crafty shapeshifter's plots. In a climactic battle with the Kraka, Nokama managed to trick her into assuming a combination of the bodies of all six Toa Metru, overwhelming the telepathic shapeshifting Rahi with information and allowing the Toa Metru to escape. With the battle behind them and the cracks in the archive sealed, okay. the Toa returned to the surface of the city with an important lesson in trust learned. <laughs> Part 4. Trials of the Toa Metru In the Grand Colosseum of Metru Nui, the Toa Metru finally made their first public appearance to the assembled crowd. Wow. Presenting the great disc yeah! to Turaga Duma, the Toa Metru prepared to yeah! be officially sworn in as the protectors of Metru Let's Nui. Let's go! But little did they know that Duma, secretly Teradax in disguise, would make it much, much harder for them. Belittling their quest for the discs and decrying them as useless, Duma ordered the Toa to pass a great test to prove they were not imposters and deserved to be the guardians of the city. Ah. Yet again, the Toa failed to show unity, tackling the task individually and refusing to work together. You fools! And so, as Duma ordered the Vaki to swarm the Toa, three of their rank were captured, Nuju, Wanua, and Onua, while oh, only that's Vakama, Nuju. Okay. Matau, and Nokama managed to escape. With the remaining Toa Metru framed for Likon's disappearance and the Vaki on high alert, oh, Teradax prepared him. to enact his final plans, still in the guise of Duma. And so, after many confrontations with the Vaki and the Dark Hunter pair of Nadiki and Kreka, the three remaining Toa Metru slowly and painfully began to learn to work as a team. Nice. As they unlocked their mass powers one by one. Nokama using her Mask of Translation to commune with a rampaging Rahi Horde, and Matau using the Mask of Shapeshifting to fool Nadiki and Kreka, using similar tactics the shapeshifting Rocky Kraka used on him <laughs> to sow discord between the Dark Hunters. The Rocky Kraka, huh? All this time, Vakama continued to be beset by twisted visions of the future, foreseeing a vast web covering Metru Nui, his own face contorted into a monster, and a failure to save his team and the city. Throughout these adventures, the three Toa encountered yet another monstrous, intelligent Rahi known as the Tatarak, who emerged from a crevice the in the ground, demanding an answer to a mysterious question. After temporarily incapacitating the mysterious <laughs> speaking Rahi, the battle-weary trio sought refuge on a Vaki transport in Po Metru, still seeking to find the missing Likon and free their missing comrades. You gotta find Likon, he's the only in guy the I know. <laughs> Nuju, Bring Onua, back and Likon. Wenua strove constantly to free themselves from their cell, but continue to fail yet again. Is it me or is this like a, such a morally gray? <laughs> I thought it'd be a children's show with good guys and bad guys, bro. I just want... I like Lee Khan because he's good, and everyone else I can't fucking and figure out. And non-stop bickering, with some even giving up, accepting their fate. It was then that a mysterious figure emerged from the depths of the prison, a Turaga, who simply told them that they could easily get out if only they activated their unique mask powers and worked together as a team. Under the instruction of this strange figure, the three Toa began a journey of self-discovery of their own. Ah. 
Meanwhile, in the scuttling Vaki transport, Vakama, Nokama, and Matau discovered a multitude of eerie spherical storage containers. Upon placing his hand on the surface of a container, Vakama was struck with another vision of a Matoran sealed within, her eyes gleaming a crimson hue. Awakening from his reverie traumatized, Vakama opened the containers, revealing only emptiness within. What? Before they could investigate further, they were beset by the Dark Hunters, skirmishing with them across the fields of Pometru before narrowly escaping with their lives. Wow. At this time, in the prison of the Dark Hunters, Wanua and Oniwa ceased their work and argued amongst each other, frustrated with the trivial task given to them by their Turaga. It was then that Oniwa's Who's mask Turaga? power inadvertently activated, commanding his comrade to take a seat and discovering his mask of mind control. Simultaneously, Nuju discovered the powers of his mask of telekinesis, using his mental force to tear down a prison wall and allowing the three Toa to escape alongside the mysterious elder. Mr. Toa, using his tear mask down this wall. To through the caverns of Po Metru and find a route out, it wasn't long until the Toa Metru were finally reunited at last, sharing tales of their exploits. Okay. The elder then revealed himself to be Leekon, his power drained and fully oh my God, it's Lee Khan! after he had transformed these six Matoran into Toa Metru. While Vakama believed they had completed their mission and saved what he believed to be the heart of Metru Nui, Lee Khan was disappointed in the Toa. In all their bickering, conflicts, and side quests, they had failed to address the root of the problem and uncover Teradax's true plan, which involved the endangered Matoran. All his attempts to weaken the city, from the brutal Vaki to the vines of the Moruzak, and even to the capture and detainment of the Toa, had resulted in a populace ready and willing for subjugation and control. I see. And so, deep in the catacombs of Po Metru, the Toa finally uncovered the truth. Turaga Duma was an imposter, and the real Duma's body was kept in suspended animation. In oh the my god! Forms. Part 5. <laughs> the Great Cataclysm. <laughs> Rushing to confront the false Duma, the six Toa Metru, alongside Turaga Likon, sped towards the Grand Colosseum. But they were too late. The robotic Vaki had rounded up all the Matoran, placing them in hibernation within the many spherical pods they discovered earlier. Okay. Upon confronting the false Duma, they learned he was Teradax in disguise, yes. and his plan to take over the Great Spirit was well underway. As a note, Teradax specifically placed the Matoran into these spherical pods, which would induce amnesia and make them forget everything about their lives in Metru Nui, so that when Teradax eventually woke up these Matoran, they would only know him as their ruler. Right. As another side note, these are actually the <laughs> lids to the canisters that the Toa Metru came in, which is some more pretty fun toy set integration, even where the packaging is concerned. And yes, you can fit a full Matoran inside this sphere. Wow, incredible. Teradax's virus to render the great spirit Mananui Komatose had taken grip over the Matoran universe, causing the now slumbering great spirit robot to plummet from its orbit. In a cruel twist of fate, the robot was ready to return to the star system that started it all, the remains of Spherus Magna now split into the three celestial bodies. But as it orbited around Aqua Magna and broke its orbit, the Great Spirit Robot plummeted, crashing into the waves of the ocean planet. That it did. Massive earthquakes struck the entire Matoran universe, with widespread devastation wreaking havoc on the internal mechanisms. I don't... In the destruction, Teradax began to siphon and consume Metro okay. Nui's power source for himself, prepping to take Mata Nui's place as the prime intelligence in command of the robot universe. So he wants to the run events of this great cataclysm were widespread, resulting in several major and climactic events to simultaneously occur across the universe. Okay. Some of the events I'm about to describe relating to the great cataclysm are too too relevant for the story as a whole. Uh -huh. Just keep them in mind because I'm saying them now because they chronologically take place at this time. And don't worry, well, I will mention Great Cataclysm in the future when they become relevant again. I'm just telling you them now because it happens in chronological order. The most important of these don't worry is about probably it. what happened to the Baraki, don't which worry we're about, about it. to get to. If don't you worry recall about it. from last chapter, Rise of the Brotherhood, the Baraki were the six warlords who were basically perfect physical specimens who once ruled over the I'm kind of a Baraki. six kingdoms which united the lands Baraki of the Obama. <laughs> Although eventually they were captured and sent to the massive jail, which was the pit. As the robot struck Aqua Magna and shockwaves cascaded over the world, the great prison of the pit was smashed open, with the prisoners being engulfed in the black waters of Aqua Magna. As radiation leaked from the damaged robot and mixed with the force. Said, Do you need to copy my notes, Big A? I see you're not taking many. No, it's all up here. 
It's all up here. Thank you very much. I don't need your notes. I'm very, I'm waters solid. waters of the ocean, a yeah. mutagenic substance affected the prisoners, I've got... twisting their physical forms and transforming them into full-on water breathers. Okay. Most notably, the once proud Baraki warlords were mutated into grotesque, animalistic monsters, cursed to lurk the depths of the ocean. Bro, everyone gets mutated As in this. As the Baraki escaped, they murdered Hydraxon, who was the warden of the prison and member of the Order oh, wasn't of Matanui, he a good guy? who trained the Toamata himself. Elsewhere in the universe, the southern continent, which housed the pivotal Mount Valmai and sacred mask of life, split apart, with a section of the continent breaking away from the mainland and skyrocketing upwards, bursting okay. forth onto the external shell, and finally settling as a floating island outside of the main robot, on the surface of Aquamagna's ocean. <laughs> the villagers who survived the harrowing events came to call this island Voya Nui, Voya Nui. Voyage in the Matoran language. Sadly, that's going to be important. Jovan, the former Toa of Magnetism and member of the team who saved the Great Spirit, perished in this ascent. On this island, two agents Sad. of the Order of Matanui were stationed. Brutaka, who was deeply shaken by the event and believed the who Great the Spirit had either perished or abandoned the universe, and his companion Axon, who stood firm in his faith for the Great Spirit to one day return. Despite their disagreements, both warriors stood guard in secret over the Mask of Life, continuing to fulfill their duties. In Karda Nui, the heart of the universe, the mutagenic, irradiated water... <laughs> is the Great Spirit a, a person, or is it like a general idea that... They're, they're, all, they're just living in a big robot that someone else made. It's the AI that controls the robot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but <laughs> what it never left then the robot's still there Build into the dome filling the base of the heart of the robot with a great swamp coalescing on the ground of Cardanui Stalactites on the ceiling of Cardanui were dislodged as the remaining Avmatoran who had once lived in the caves above Fell into the dome with the stalactites and established villages upon the surface of Cardanui even the Makuta fortress on Destral was because all of the characters are also robots. Do you think that every one of them has a universe inside of them? Full of littler robots that each have universes inside of them? Wasn't safe. With think massive about damage being dealt to the Brotherhood headquarters. Think about that. Some Makuta, specifically Makuta Icarix, began to question Teradax's grand plan, which thus far had resulted in chaos across the universe. In the aftermath of the Great Cataclysm, the Great Spirit Robot's camouflage system was accidentally triggered, forming a dense jungle island on the face of the robot, which would come to be known as the Island of Mata Nui. Pipes inside the robot had leaked I its remember this. source, energized protodermis, which spurred plant growth and created the island's diverse climates. If you recall back to the prologue, energized protodermis was the substance that sparked the war between the Glatorian, causing the core war yeah. to start and the and planet the to be ripped apart. It had pretty amazing and magical transformative properties as well. Now, this energized protodermis leaked out across the universe. I do remember that. Many of the animals and species within. Many Rahi who had been roaming free around More mutation Nui also escaped to this island refuge in the chaos. And finally, in a last ditch attempt to save the system, the Toa Mata, protectors of Mata Nui, were launched from the heart of Karda Nui in their canisters, ready to awaken from their slumber and spring to action to restart the core of the robot and perform their duty as a failsafe against a cataclysmic event <sighs> such as this. Okay. Tragically, they were launched too late, and the damage done to their canisters from the fall caused them to malfunction. Sealing the Toa Mata inside the dormant canisters and plunging them to the ocean of Aqua Magna around Mata Nui, where they would lay in slumber for another thousand years, slowly losing all their memories and forgetting their training. But most grievous of all, the tremors reduced much of Metru Nui to ruin. Oh, the no. archives were destroyed and the Rahi within escaped. The great hub of Li Metru, its vast cables and chutes, fell to the destructive forces and became a mechanized jungle of chaos. Holy God, it's God like Metru's Sauron. were ravaged by the quake as well, and the experiment labs were released to wander in the night. The temple of the Great Spirit, the most sacred structure of Metru Nui, was nearly completely destroyed. Much of Ta Metru was overcome the with fall of Rome. protodermis, and the Ko Metru knowledge towers fell to ruin. As Not the Teradax knowledge towers. the power of the city, the Toa Metru sought refuge and retreated to seek out a safe haven, 
with the remaining Vaki and Dark Hunter pair still in pursuit. <laughs> Sir, another Dark Hunter is in a knowledge tower. <laughs> oh, In his greed, fuck. Makuta Terran has activated a shadowy absorption power, sucking in both Rahi and Dark Hunters and absorbing their essences. And so, the former Toa Nadiki met his fate besides Kreka. Combined and overridden with Pterodax's will, guilt in his heart. As the Toa fled the city, Vakama came to a revelation. Combining the six great discs, he was able to forge the legendary Mask of Time right when he received yet another vision showing him the way to the newly created island of Mata Nui. As they rode across the Sea of Protodermis, Makuta Pterodax blocked off their escape route in a new winged form, the power of the city surging through him. To buy his team time, Vakama confronted Pterodax with the newly created Mask of Time, okay. placing the mask over his in a last-minute bid to slow time around them. Why don't they use the Mask of Time to go back in time? Vakama was overwhelmed with the power of the mask, unfamiliar with how to operate it and slowing time around both himself and Pterodax. Leekon appeared at that moment, blocking Pterodax's shadow hand with a shield, Lee sacrificing Khan. himself for Vakama. What the a resulting goat. blast was fatal for the Turaga and the Vahi fell from Vakama's head into the ocean. Pterodax, freed from the mass power, dove from the wall after it. And so with his last breath, Likon gave Vakama his mask and uttered his final words. I am proud to have called you brother, Toa Vakama. In his grief, Vakama discovered his mask power, that of invisibility, and went once again to confront the winged- Likon's my favorite character so far. With the Vahi lost in the sea, the enraged Likon's Pterodax goat. attacked Vakama, and in a final battle against this evil force, the six Toa Metru, having finally learned unity, sealed Pterodax in a temporary Toa seal to buy time for their retreat. With the battle behind them, the Toa set out for a new refuge, sailing through a new crack made in the robot's external shell. It was Matau who had flown ahead of the transport and first beheld the new land above. Nokama carved small images of the Toa Metru into stone to document their journey, okay. as they last left the winding, darkened tunnels and sailed onto a gleaming ocean, dazzling with an island that would come Wait, they're out of the robot now? Part 6. Mutation With Metru Nui destroyed in its Matoran population in slumber, the Toa Metru were defeated, only able to celebrate a small, temporary victory over Teradax. They're on top of the... Uh, the most okay. monumental task still lay ahead to return to the broken Metru Nui and recover the Matoran population, preparing them for a new life on the island of Mata Nui. On their return oh, just to leaving. Metru Nui, the Toa yet again faced many trials, combating the much more intelligent prototype to the Morbizok plant that Pterodax had discarded, what? and learning much more about the mysterious powers of Energized Protodermis. <laughs> yeah, again, I'm really skimming through these adventures here. The no, Toa you're actually not. had quite no, a you're lot not. of adventures before returning no, to you're Metru Nui. Not. I'm just jumping to the most important ones, but definitely, if you want the full experience, be sure to go down to the links in the description below where I've linked some of the major compilations of the Bionicle storyline. I think the one that I'm describing right now was actually the plot to one of the Game Boy games where the Toa <laughs> faced off against the prototype plant for the Morbuzak, which was actually named Karzani, and there was a lot of really interesting character stuff that went into that, even based some sort of a Rocky Nui that would become relevant later on in the story. But it's just so much to talk about right now. We gotta move past the most important events. So again, check those out if you are interested in these characters and learning more about their personalities. As the Toa Metru made their way back to Metru Nui, battling newly mutated monsters and creatures as they went, a darkness descended on the formerly great city. Summoned by Pterodax to free him from his seal and conquer the city, the Vizorak hordes descended on Metru Nui, led by the devious Rudaka and Sidorak, the so-called king of the Vizorak. As a quick recap from last chapter, Rudaka was the devious woman who transformed the Toahaga into Rahaga. I know who Rudaka in turn is! the favor of Makuta Teradax, and now serves as basically his right hand woman. As they advanced towards Metru Nui, the Toa saw a large number of Rakshi, Rahi, and webs covering the dark and crumbling city. The city's archives had been broken, and the Rahi were roaming free around Metru Nui, left to their own devices. Traveling along the ocean, the ship was struck by a fierce storm that capsized the crew. Okay. The Toa were washed ashore, and their transport was utterly destroyed in the process. Okay. Still prowling the city, but cut loose from their original programming, the Vaki remained an ever-present threat, but the real danger was up ahead. As Vakama brazenly led his team into the heart of the city, 
they were ambushed by the Vizrak spiders using their paralyzing weapons. You fucks. Hung high above the Great Colosseum and cocooned by the Vizrak, the Toa Metra were bit by the vicious Rahi, injected with Vizrak venom, and mutated into half Toa, half Rahi freaks called Hordika. <laughs> no longer Toa Metru, these were the Toa Hordika, uh, nightmarish versions another of themselves toy to buy. who struggled to retain a grip on their sanity. As the Toa Hordika were released to plummet to their deaths by Rudaka, they were saved at the last moment by the former Toa Haga, using their nimble Toa Rahaga Haga. forms to navigate through the sky and seize the Toa what? as they fell. What? They took them into the ruins of Gametru, where the Rahaga told the Toa that the Hordika venom they had been injected with <laughs> needed to be neutralized, or else the venom would be- The further we go into this, the more every single word is a fucking bionicle word. It used to be like there would be one and I could use context, but now it's like the Rahaka Toa, Flaka Floa, <laughs> In the Hordika Metria, it's like fucking crazy. I can't understand it. Make their mutations permanent. Their only hope was a fable. Highly intelligent Rahi spoken of in myths and legends called Kitangu. A powerful Rahi gifted in the knowledge of venoms and their counter agents, and possibly possessed the power to heal the Toa. Just a quick recap before we move on to the next section. In part two, I describe the powerful Kanohi Avoki. <laughs> The Mask of Light, which the Rahagas stole from the Brotherhood Fortress on Destral and fled before being transformed into Rahaga themselves. They actually stole this alongside the Makoki Stones, which was a tablet detailing the powers and abilities and weaknesses of the entire Brotherhood of Makuta, which had then been split into six Makuta. parts in a bidding war led on by the Dark Hunters. Hakuna Matata. Basically, all you need to know is that the Tohordika go on a grand quest to find all six pieces of the Makoki Stone to unlock the Kanohi Evoki, which the Rahaga had hidden away in order to prevent from falling into wrong hands. For all intents and purposes, this is basically a team building exercise which has no major ramifications on the story and essentially is just a tale told to show the Tohoridika getting accustomed to their new bestial forms and even learning how to fight as part of it. Not could, really too relevant. He could literally be making it up and I wouldn't know. He could literally be making it up. He could literally be making up these words as he goes and I'd have no idea. The story, but it is there if you do want to check it out. Biomedia Project does have this entire story which was told through web animation. At the time, <laughs> honestly, these web animations aren't really too riveting, so we're going to skip past them both story-wise, although if you really want to dive into it, they are there, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend wow. it over some of the other more gripping Bionicle material. Fake fan. This guy's a fake fan, I gotta Part say. Seven. Betrayal. This guy's a fake fan. If you didn't watch the web Over animation... Over the course of their adventures as Toa Hordika, these newly mutated heroes had to become accustomed to their new forms, perfecting the power of their Rotuka spinner weapons and focusing on suppressing their animal instincts. Mm. However, while some of them, like Nokama and Nuju, excelled at using their new I know forms those are. for good, Nuju's Fakama, the ice, whose mental ice and emotional state was deteriorating lady. rapidly, frequently left the group for long walks, consumed by his guilt over failing to save the Matoran and his team. Egged on by snide remarks by Matau, who blamed him for their transformation, Vakama was plummeting into despair. On one of these walks, he was ambushed by the Vizorak, who paralyzed him and brought him before Rudaka. Taking advantage of his emotionally vulnerable state, Rudaka convinced Vakama that his friends no longer cared for him, playing to his insecurities That's and fucked. promising him the That's loyalty and power of the Vizorak horde should he choose to lead by her side. Little did Vakama know, but this was all a ploy to usurp Sidorak, the king of the Vizrak Horde, give the Horde to Vakama, and then free Teradax with the elemental powers of what? Vakama's team members. But so, with his mind muddled with Hordika <laughs> Venom, a confused and angry Vakama succumbed to Rudaka, oh, no. pledging his loyalty to the Horde and allowing his Venom to take over his Don't mind. Don't let the Venom take over your Under mind. the leadership of Rudaka, Vakama's first mission was to ambush his former friends and capture the Rahaga which he successfully accomplished under the cover of night. Leaving only- Wait, are all six of the Bionicle... Toa... Metru? <laughs> I'm sure I'm nailing this. Are they all dudes? I thought the ice one was a lady, but they're- She's not? He's not? Blue one's a girl? Oh, water's a girl. Okay, no, comma's a girl. Okay. Because I feel like so far all the women they've shown have been like... Backstabbing snakes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like maybe the writer had a divorce or something. <laughs> Norik barely alive to tell the tale, Vakama returned to the Colosseum with the captured Rahaga, now the leader of the Horde. 
However, just before they were captured, the Rahaga managed to this parse is the Tongu from inscriptions within the Great Temple, conveying to the Toa Hordika where to find the mysterious Rahi. Underneath an icy underground mountain beneath Metronui, Kitangu revealed himself. Kitangu? To help them Who's Kitangu? They prove themselves using their Hordika forms. And so the Battle of Metronui commenced. Breaking through the Colosseum's defenses, the five remaining Toa Hordika converged on the Horde, with Matau grabbing Vakama and dueling him one on one. Ah. Meanwhile, the behemoth Kitangu smashed through the throne room, confronting Sidorak and Rudaka. The devious Rudaka slipped away, revealing her betrayal to Sidorak, but only a moment before Kitangu smashed Sidorak to the ground, damaging his body beyond repair and utterly killing him. You fool! Meanwhile, Matau and Vakama Never battled her. alone with Matau apologizing for his harsh words and asking Vakama to rejoin the team. In a moment of hesitation, Matau seemingly plummeted to his death, but coming to his senses, Vakama saved his teammate, redeeming himself and rescuing Matau seconds before his demise. Let's go! As the rest of the Toa Hordika freed the Rahaga and joined the fight, Vakama used his newfound command over the Vizorak Horde to disperse their ranks, leaving only a cornered Rudaka. Preparing to end the fight, the six Toa blasted her with their elemental powers. <laughs> but to their dismay, this was exactly what Rudaka wanted. As the Toa funneled their elemental power to defeat her, a piece of the seal they had used to bind Teradax broke off from Rudaka, causing a ripple effect to eventually free Teradax himself. Teradax's shadow projection enveloped her body, whisking her away for further misdeeds. And yet, Despite Teradax being unleashed and Rudaka escaping, the Toa Hordika had proved they had overcome their differences and worked as a team, <laughs> gaining the favor of Kitangu, who reverted them back to their original Metru forms with a wow, special Wow, nice. Anti-Venom. Anti -venom. So, with the Vizorak threat demolished and the Matoran capsules free for rescue, the Toa began the long and arduous process of transporting the Matoran to their new home. Part 8. Fate of the Vahi. Okay. As the Toa made their way back to Mata Nui on airships carrying the slumbering Matoran, nice. Vakama held back one final mission forefront in his mind to search for and retrieve the missing Kanohi Vahi, Mask of Time, which was lost during their oh, battle yeah, with Teradax that. many moons ago. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Shadowed One, leader of the Dark Hunters, was furious with the loss of two of I his most valuable him. assets, Nidiki and Kreka, who he assumed had been killed by the Toa Metru. Nope. And so, with the Vizorak Nobody dies gone, in this. the Shadowed One made preparations to return to Metru Nui in person to get revenge for the loss of his two agents. Accompanied by his bodyguard Sentrak and a time-sensitive dark hunter named Voparak, whose sole purpose was to track the Vahi, what does he time left sensitive under the color mean? of night and sailed for what remained of Metru Nui. Just a quick fun note about Voparak. He was created by the <laughs> Shadowed One in order to... You know, every time you come in and say just a quick, it adds up. I just want you to know it adds up. They're not, even if they're individually quick, they're not, they're collectively not quick. Protect the Mask of Time. It was literally his only purpose. The Shadowed One made him from an experiment to be time sensitive and detect the Kanohi Vahi or Mask of Time wherever it may appear. Unfortunately, this came with a very dangerous side effect. Voprak's skin emitted temporal radiation, which means that if you touched him, even just for a few seconds, you would be aged thousands of years making him literally have a living death touch and essentially becoming a living weapon. As such, he was one of the most- You're touching him right hunters, now! Although he was rarely- You're touching him right now! Other than to track down the Kanohi Vahi. And you sure bet that this power is definitely going to backfire at some point. Just wait and see. After searching through the rubble and waves, Vakama finally recovered the Kanohi Vahi, nice. which had been damaged in the battle and leaking time energy in every direction, affecting the wildlife and plants around it. After repairing it with his mass-making abilities, Vakama was struck by a mysterious attacker who claimed the Vahi and left him unconscious. Thank you for the sub. Awakening in a dreamlike state, Vakama found he was no longer a Toa. In fact, his body had reverted to a powerless Matoran. After spending what felt like a few days in this strange mirror world, Vakama slowly started to discover that all was not as it seemed, and he was actually placed under a deep illusion by Makuta Teradax, who had found him unconscious on the beach and wished to confuse him and keep him in a trance-like state. Mm. Right as he was about to break free of the illusion, a strange organic creature affixed itself to Vakama's face, giving him a vision of the future. In his mind, Vakama encountered a noble Toa of Sonics named Krakua, the last bastion against unknown evil forces defending a lone tower. 
In his vision, Krakua approached him, warning him of threats to come and explaining Holy the shit, coming so of a new Toa team known as the Toa Inika, who would make a, a new perilous team. quest into the darkest place imaginable. Krakua relayed to Vakama crucial information. Without these oh, Toa shit. Inika, Krakua would never become a Toa, and his defense against the dark forces oh, would not shit. ever become to pass. That's a cool scene. <laughs> with note here, the organic creature that affixed itself to Vakama's face is a very special time-sensitive Rahi when placed on your face. It can give you flash-forwards to the future, and even open a path of communication between yourself and someone in the possible future. As to who placed it there Wait, and why it attacked... do you go to Warden or you pen? Or oh, Warden's at UPenn. Okay, never mind. I got you. I understand. I understand. Warden's at UPenn. I see. 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 Okay. Oh, God. There's another. Okay. Half of a comma specifically. All of those answers are coming later. You need to be an Ivy Leaguer to understand Bionicle lore. Yeah, I think I. This exists in this particular story for two main reasons. Number one is so Vakama can have some sort of a understanding of what's to come so he can help advise the next teams of Toa, specifically the Toa and Nika, which were just mentioned. And number two, I mean, it's classic sequel bait, giving a character a flash forward of something darker yet ahead and showing some sort of so true, King. heroes that would face that darkness sometime in the future, literally just teasing what's to come. This specific vision would not really come to pass until several chapters later in chronological order. We'd actually see this at around chapter 5 or 6, if my calculations are correct. <laughs> so just stay tuned until then, and I will be referencing it. I will be. As to what I exactly will be. this creature is and who placed it there, the explanation is also coming. But one thing the Bionicle writing team liked to do was see things really early in advance and then pay them off years later. This payoff would happen literally years later, so just sit tight for now. Understand that there's some sort of special time-sensitive organic Rocky that can give people visions and connections to the future, and if you can accept that, then you're all good. Before he got a chance to finish, however, the creature was ripped from Makama's face, and he found himself face-to-face -face with Makuta Teradax once again, who after big a short bad. altercation informed him that the Vahi was in the possession of the Dark Hunter Voparak, who had knocked Vakama unconscious when Teradax stumbled on his body. This forced the Toa of Fire and the Master of Shadows to work together to retrieve the Vahi. As Vakama and Teradax made their way to the Dark Hunter's camp inside the Great Temple, Kitangu emerged from the shadows to challenge Teradax to combat, sensing his dark presence. Leaving Vakama to infiltrate the lair of the Dark Hunters and combat the Shadowed One's bodyguard, Sentrak, alone. As the two battles raged inside and out of the temple, Kitangu began to buckle under Teradax's blows, while Vakama succumbed to Sentrak. Uh. Just as Teradax was about to deliver the killing blow to Kitangu, a powerful blast rocked the temple, sending all four combatants flying at the feet of the Shadowed One. Quickly chaining Kitangu and holding Vakama and Teradax at bay, the Shadowed One challenged Vakama, saying he would pay for destroying two of his most trusted operatives. It was then that Vakama urged the Shadowed One to take a closer look at Teradax, revealing that in fact, Teradax <laughs> had been the one to kill Nadiki and Kreka, not the Toa Metru. After seeing elements of both fallen hunters in Teradax's armor, the pair of powerful villains began he to battle. He wore their bodies the in Shadow his armor? The disintegrating eye beams destroyed much of Teradax's chestplate and both of his wings. Vakama saw his moment and took the Mask of Time from the Shadowed One by surprise, swooping down from the air using his jetpack launcher. Blasting a laser from his eye beams, the Shadowed One shot Vakama, sending him falling to his apparent death. The Shadowed One wanted to head after the fallen Toa, but Teradax threw him at the fallen Voprak in his surprise, causing the Shadowed One to age several thousand years just in contact with Voprak's skin. Barely escaping with his life, the Shadowed One vowed war on the Brotherhood of Makuta he aged and thousands Teradax of years himself, and he escaped with his life. starting a major conflict between the two evil organizations that would have major future ramifications in the universe. Vakama barely had a moment to flee the scene of the battle when Teradax caught up to him, cornering him in an old reclamation chamber. With no other options, Vakama threatened to destroy the Mask of Time, which would cause all reality to become undone in a cataclysmic blast. And so, Vakama struck a deal with Teradax, proposing that he allow Vakama to depart with the Mask and leave the Matoran, Kitangu, Turagaduma, and the Rahaga in peace for one whole year. 
What? Naturally, Pterodax was outraged, but with no other options and weakened from his battle with the Shadowed One. He agreed to the terms, vowing he would descend upon their island home one year from that day to threaten the Matoran with darkness once again. Okay. As Fakama warily retreated Why would he to agree to that? Pterodax came upon an abandoned Matoran sphere, which contained the shifty Pomatoran Akmau, who had betrayed the Toa Metro oh, I remember that. long I wrote... ago. Awakening him from his slumber. I wrote Akmau equals devious guy. <laughs> remember that? Okay. Akmau. This guy's devious. And feeding his mind with lies and twisted tales, Pterodax gained himself one new faithful servant, Akmau who would go on to infiltrate the island of Matanui Don't and trust him. be a troublesome thorn in their side. Don't trust him. He's devious. Eventually, all of the Toa Metru reached the new island of Matanui, safe from Pterodax's wrath for one year. The Rahaga, Kitangu, and Turaga Numa like agreed to stay behind in Metru Nui, preparing it for their eventual return and rebuilding the city brick by brick. However, the Toa Metru had one final problem. The Matoran were still comatose in the pods. And Open the so, pods. Vakama sacrificed his Toa power to awaken some of the Matoran, becoming a Turaga in the process. The other Toa followed suit until all of the Matoran were awakened. Oh, they gave up the their powers? The spheres caused the newly awakened Matoran to lose all their memories of Metru Nui, including those of the Toa Metru and Pterodax. The newly transformed Turaga would tell them a false story concerning why they were on the island of Mata Nui, in order to protect them from the Makuta who had arrived there a year later. To why? honor their Wait, time why? as Hordika and respect the power of nature, Turaga Nuju chose to never speak Matoran again, communing only in the language of the Rahi and using the efforts of a translator named Matoro to communicate with the rest. <laughs> Waiting for the prophesied Toa Mata to come, the Turaga and the Matoran began to live in the era known as the Dark That was from a Flash game! But that's a tale for that next That was from chapter. a fucking Flash that, game! We've concluded Chapter 3, Legends of Metro Nui. Yeah! Previously on Bionicle Retold, Chapter 3... I'm getting water, Legends I'm getting water. I don't need the recap. Nui. I'm getting water. Dystopia! Under the fist of Makuta Teradax, operating incognito as Turaga Duma, the great city of Metru Nui, or the brain of the robot, once a beacon of safety and light, has been transformed into a cruel surveillance state. Robotic emotionless Vaki patrol the streets, peering into the thoughts of the populace and making dissidents disappear. The brave Toa Metru fight back against the oppressive government, but are too late to stop Teradax's evil plans. As a shadow is cast over the great spirit, the Matoran of Metru Nui fall into a deep slumber, losing their memories as the robot plummets from orbit into the oceans of Aqua Magna, causing catastrophic damage in a great cataclysm. All right, I didn't miss anything, did I? The between the Makuta I and would the hate to miss even a minute. A fragile one-year peace with Pterodax is earned. And on the shores of their new home, the island of Mata Nui, yeah, the I know about this. We just watched this. Their powers to awaken the Matoran, they gave up their powers, they woke them up and told them a lie. To the next generation of heroes. This is Bionicle Retold. Yeah! <laughs> I'm pulling XQC. <laughs> the journey starts now! Chapter 4 Infection. Mm. Prologue Aftermath of the Cataclysm. With the Toa Metru's courageous rescue of the Matoran of Metru Nui, we just, we just saw this. At a crossroads. He had succeeded in his plan to plunge Mata Nui into slumber, but yep. without a workforce to be influenced and controlled, he was left the ruler of an empty city. Yeah, why? True to his word, he left the island of Mata Nui alone for one whole year, during which the Matoran's memories of Metru Nui faded as they established their own unique culture, formed Matoran gardens, in one year? and constructed villages across the island. <laughs> All this time, the energized protodermis continued to transform the island's wildlife and plant life, they forgot about their homeland in one year? Full of danger and beauty. During this time, the corrupted Matoran Akmau <laughs> ingratiated himself with the other villagers, integrating Dude. into society as a secret agent of... Are you kidding? These 2003 Flash games from, like, fucking legofan.net and putting them in the lore is so fucking funny. ...of Makuta, his mind filled with lies. One year after Teradax's confrontation with Vakama over the Vahi, his attacks began in full force. 
from a shadow plague spreading across the land to infected Rahi turning vicious and assailing the Matoran. Teradax did everything in his power to keep the Matoran in the dark <laughs> and prevent them from rediscovering Metronui. This period came to be known as the Great War, where brave Matoran the defended War. their homes against the feral Rahi, controlled by infected Kanohi masks which placed them under Teradax's thrall. Elsewhere, 100 years into this dark time, the Matoran villagers Wait, of Voya Nui, the island which housed the Mask of Life, built a village on the shore of the island. It was named Mari Nui, and it brought joy into the tough life of the island's inhabitants. Okay. But this happiness was not to last, because during a great hurricane, the landmass containing Mari Nui sank beneath the waves. Ah, tragic. In a cruel Climate change. Fate, the six Baraki warlords had built a fortress of their own directly beneath Mari Nui, which was utterly destroyed during its descent. Just a quick refresher from chapters one, two, and three. So the Baraki warlords were a group of people no, who I tried know. to overthrow I know. the great spirit Mata Nui during their time as rulers of the League of Six Kingdoms. Of course, this revolt was thwarted by Makuta Teradax himself, and these people were sent to the pit, which was the massive prison. Unfortunately, during the Great Cataclysm, the robot sunk into the seas of Aqua Magna and the pit was ripped open, which allowed all of its inmates to escape. During this time, the radiation from the energy source for the Thanks robot for the right punch. mixed in with the black waters of Aqua Magna, changing it into a mutagenic substance which transformed the Baraki from prime beings who were the height of their power into these grotesque monsters. <laughs> it also, however, did give them the ability to they look the same to me and made them resemble sea creatures like Kalma here representing a squid. The massive impact released cool. air bubbles from the nearby airweed fields and encased the city, allowing the Matoran of Mari Nui to survive beneath the sea. During the brief time that these Matoran That's were exposed insane. to the in the waters, their bodies became bigger and stronger, undoing much of Karzani the Mad Titan's works. After this catastrophe, the Mari Nui Matoran soon forgot their life on the surface and began their new life underwater, <laughs> taming Hydruka. The Bionicle are a very forgetful folk. The Mari Nui Fortress and forming their first Matoran Council. The Matoran began to be preyed on by the creatures led by the Baraki, though they never knew the nature of their enemies. In the meantime, the war between the Dark Hunters and the Brotherhood of Makuta raged on, with some of the brutal, modified Skakti being drafted into the Dark Hunter force and seizing a Brotherhood fortress. Quick refresher from Chapter 2, the Makuta experimented on the Bro, Skakti can... people, transforming them no, into I violent warriors. They became psychopaths and shit. warriors were actually drafted into the Dark Hunters due to their fighting prowess. One of these Skakti named Zaktan found an encrypted record of Teradax's plan. Zaktan then learned the intricate details of this evil plot and vowed to make use of that information. On yet another island How? in the universe, the Komatoran Mazika and his mentor worked as scholars on the Trenkron Peninsula, studying many fundamental questions about their universe and the nature of the Matoran species. <laughs> Among their discoveries was the location and nature of the Makuta species, uncovering their secret antidermis forms. Oh, another not that. <laughs> recap from Chapter 2 the Makuta species evolved into a gaseous state. All of the Makuta that you see are actually robotic exoskeletons <laughs> controlled by the Makuta spirit inside, which is called antidermis. For all intents and purposes, they are just like ghosts. They need to possess these mechanical skeletons to even move around and create actions. However, if they are outside of this armor for too long, the Makuta will die. So they essentially need a robotic skeleton so they can contain their antidermis essence inside the bones. On this peninsula, a treacherous Kamator named Voltraz sought to obtain Mezeka and his mentor's research, murdering the mentor to gain the secrets of the Makuta for himself. In his brief, Mezeka vowed revenge on Voltraz, sparking a vicious knew. rivalry between the two Matori. In a grisly battle over a canyon of razor-sharp crystals, Mezeka impaled Voltraz on a spike, leaving him for dead. Knowing that Voltraz had devious intents and possessed knowledge of the Makuta, Teradax sent one of his underlings, Makuta Gorast, to revive Voltraz and induct him as an honorary member of their ranks. Okay. Likewise, Mezika was inducted into the Order of Mata Nui, who was given the job protecting Are they the good? Matoran from They're good guys? like Voltraz. During their conflicts, Mezika saved a day Matoran of Sonics named Krakua, who had also come to join the Order in time. If you may recall from Chapter 3, Toa Vakama in Metru Nui received a vision of the future from a being known as Toa Krakua, Toa of Sonics, who warned him of many threats to come and told him of a future Toa team. 
Yeah. Of course, the Matoran in the yeah. story named Krakua would become a Toa later on in the storyline, <laughs> but of course, it's just being seeded in right now, so in chronological <laughs> order, you just keep remembering who Krakua is and how his path towards the Order of Mata Nui is going to take shape. Okay, should I write that Part down? One, a new Krakua, home. important. Welcome to the island of Mata Nui. A paradise home reclaimed amidst the darkness, Mata Nui was home to diverse elemental climates thanks to okay. the transformative effects of leaking energized protodermis from the robot's power source. I'm the taking a quiz at the end. Tawahi was home to a I'm taking a biological lore trees. quiz at the end. In the center of a volcano, the great castle of Takoro was erected. The Takora. heart of Mata Nui. Okay. On the highest slopes of this volcanic mountain range was the region of Kowaki, an Kauai? icy wilderness with a spectacular city <laughs> Ay -ay -ay -ay. the mountain. This was the Kokoro village, with knowledge sanctums and passageways through the ice carved what? throughout the mountains. Why is there an ice village on top of a volcano? The, the mountains was the region of Lewahi, featuring the treetop village of Lekoro, home to the Matoran of air who tamed mighty gecko birds as flying steeds. Gecko birds. To the center of the mountain was a great tunnel to Onuwahi, where an underground mining village called Onukoro stood firm as the refuge of the Matoran of Earth. As the I tunnels see. reached the surface of the island, they branched off to Powahi, a vast desert where the sculpture artists and the sand, of Sa yeah, a village of stone, stone. Sorry. And finally, stretching out from a great waterfall on the bay of Mata Nui water. was Gakoro. City of Water, yeah. erected on massive lunes. Yep, I'm figuring it out. <laughs> the island home was named Mata Nui, after the great spirit worshipped by the Matoran. Okay. Led by the former Toa Metru who now served as Taraga, the villages of Mata Nui lived in peace and harmony, united in their defense against Makuta's Rahi forces. A tribalistic culture evolved on this remote island, with ancient tales of Mata Nui's battle with Makuta being told with rocks and stone. Who's... Above them in the sky soared the mysterious and ever-present Red Star, the booster pack satellite to the Matoran <laughs> universe that was merely a mysterious celestial object to the Matoran. Most interesting of all, however, okay. was that the island of Mata Nui held a secret. The base terrain was generated by the automatic camouflage system of the robot's faceplate, accidentally <laughs> triggered during the Great Cataclysm. In the center of Mata Nui was a grand temple named Kini Nui, okay. which unbeknownst to the Matoran... Wait, are they living on the robot's face right now? Is the island of Mata Nui just the outside face of the robot? was created okay. and installed by the great beings during their construction of the Great Spirit's planetary exploration system. Upon landing on a foreign planet, the Kini Nui contraption would deploy from the face of the robot, using its spires as antenna-like sensors for Mata Nui, informing him of service events while he was observing a planet. Deep within the Kini Nui Keep was also up, a bro, safe you're slowing the rest of us down. <laughs> to enter or exit the surface of the robot, should passageways be needed to go back and forth. It was mm. here that the Matoran carved out a life for themselves amidst the dark, and where our main story begins. What? I just want to start off this chapter with a quick recap of <laughs> Chapter 2. In a preemptive strike against the Brotherhood of Makuta, the Order of Mata Nui secretly stashed away several Av Matoran, or Matoran of Light, in the hopes that the Brotherhood of Makuta would not realize where they went because they posed significant <laughs> threats to the Makuta, who are beings of shadow. And since they're Matoran of Light, they could transform later on into Toa of Light, which would make them big threats against the Brotherhood. During this time period known as the Time Slip. <laughs> Did he say here's where our main story begins? <laughs> The Order of Mata Nui took several <laughs> Asmatoran and scattered them across the Great Spirit Robot. John, thank you for the gifted. Altering the color of their armor, although sometimes not always perfectly, as well as completely wiping their memories of ever being Asmatoran or their previous lives. One of these Asmatoran was named Takua. Right now, he believes he is a Tamatoran. Despite his blue mask, which again was because he what was a an Matoran, so they didn't really alter the colors correctly, kind of stands out on a Tomatoran or Matoran of Fire to have any blue components, Takua genuinely believes he is a Tomatoran. He's also the closest thing to a main character Bionicle has had throughout several different years, so definitely remember his name. This He's is the main character? Matoran or Matoran of Light, but he doesn't know that at this point. Over the many years of his life in Takoro, Takua was dissatisfied with his work. 
Unlike his close friend Jalen, okay. who was renowned for his fighting prowess and named captain of the Takoro Guard, oh. Takua was always more interested in exploration and adventure rather than fighting or staying in one place. Seeing a steep decline in his work, Takua was banished by Turaga Vakama, who did this almost <laughs> as a favor to Takua, who knew he would have a much more fulfilling life <laughs> the Game Boy on game? the island as a traveler. <laughs> Over his many adventures, Takua met with each Turaga of each village, rescuing them from various traps set by Teradax. He hasn't taken his normal trust. pills. Over the course of this is where Dream got it from. Takua activated an ancient mechanism within the Kininui Temple. This is the main character. Burst of energy shot forth from the temple. What about Lee battles, Kwan or whatever? Giving him a significant amount of head trauma and causing him to yet again lose all his memories. This happened so Little often. He or even the Turaga know, but he had inadvertently reactivated the Toa Mata failsafe, summoning the six Toa canisters that held the Toa Mata, which had been aimlessly floating. In oh. The the legendary Toa would soon arrive, heralding the end of the Dark Time. Just, Just a quick recap. Is confused, at the end of Chapter 1, I described the Toa Mata, an elite team of Toa whose sole mission was to protect the Great Spirit and prevent him from any takeovers. Kind of like what's happening right now. They've been trained directly by the Order of Mata Nui, specifically Hydraxon, in order to defend Mata Nui from any attacks, and were sealed within special Toa canisters yeah, to I know. launch from the heart of the robot in order to be immediately transported to any area that needed repairs. They're like White However, Blood Cells. However, unfortunately, these Toa canisters malfunctioned during Makuta's takeover during the Great Cataclysm, and as such, the Toa canisters were launched all the way up into the air and crashed down into the ocean of Aqua Magna, where they would lay floating in dormant status for thousands of years. Mm. Part 2. Quest for the Masks The thousand years floating aimlessly in the ocean had taken a toll upon the Toa Mata. Their organic tissue had decayed over the years, leaving them in a state of disassembly. Yeah, I bet they have this no memories. hibernation had also left them with amnesia, forcing to rely on external information. Pre-watch. <laughs> Pre-watch, bro. You know what I did this morning? I woke up and I watched all fucking nine hours. Pre-watched. And so, when Takua's actions in the Kirinui summoned the canisters to the island, the six Toa washed ashore on a golden beach, unaware of where or even who they were. Now that's dedication. They were the Toa Mata, <laughs> separate oh. and not yet whole. Tahu, Toa of Fire, and leader of the group, awoke powerless on the beach. Wait, until so this is what Noki Hao, Mask of Shielding. This is what kids Just would buy and play with. Energy came over him, and his elemental powers awoke. Sensing the heat and warmth of Takoro, he rushed into the charred forest. Mistaking him as a threat, Jaller and the captain of the guard attempted to trap Tahu, but before any major conflicts, Taraga Vakama Fuck stepped yeah. in, bowing to Tahu <laughs> and encouraging Jaller. Not kids, heroes. <laughs> Wait, did I just get a raid? <laughs> the second we got to these Bionicles, my viewership went up. <laughs> Which, by the way, I thought would be at 200 people tops for this fucking two-hour stream. Why are any of you watching this? Jaller and the guard to do the same. Meanwhile, Gali, Toa of Water, emerged in the bay near Gawahi. Immediately attacked upon her awakening by a monstrous reptilian... Hassan ended stream? Did he finish all nine hours or is he taking a break? <laughs> he starts earlier than me. Did he finish the whole stream or is he is he going to finish it tomorrow? I don't like, It is 8:10, right? Everyone else is doing this. I can't be the only streamer watching this fucking lore on 8:10. That would be crazy. It's Bionicle Day. Karakava under the sway of Teradax. Gali discovered that she wore the mask of water breathing, aka the Kanohi Kaukau, Kau, and controlled the element of water itself, fending off her attacker and swimming to Gakoro. Liwa, Toa of Air, headed straight for the treetop jungle of Lewahi, feeling at home swinging from the branches as he discovered his mass power of levitation, the wow. Kanohi Miru, and command over the element of air. Kopaka, cold and calculating Toa of Ice, oh. cautiously explored his surroundings. What a shocker. Using the Kanohi Akaki, the, the mask Toa of Toa of Ice would be cold and calculating. A Komatoran Matoro who had been spying on him from afar. Komatoran Brought to Taraka Kopaka was the first who began to understand Taraka Nuju Kopaka. Meanwhile, Pohatu, Toa of Stone, had been discovered by a group of Pomatoran, and thanks to his friendly nature, had already introduced himself to the village of Pokoro, who hailed him as a hero. Okay. Nonua, wise Toa of Earth, 
stumbled upon a Matora named Onepu in the caves of Onuwahi, who brought him straight to Taraga Wanua to be told of his purpose. Eventually, all six Toamata met with the respective Taraga of each region, okay. who quickly realized Based. these Toamata were out of practice, had forgotten their training, and needed to go forth on a quest to regain oh, full control I see. of their powers. Much like the Toametru themselves faced many trials and tribulations to learn to work as a team. And so, the Turaga sent the Toa Mata on a quest to discover five more masks that he had scattered across the island of Mata Nui for each Toa. Wait, With what? With the special power to wear multiple Kanohi masks at once, and taking advantage of all their powers, these Toa Mata were especially equipped to seek out these masks, and gain all six mask powers throughout the whole team. They just collecting all Easter these egg masks hunted them bonus, to train the them or what? The ability to unlock special golden Kanohi masks, <laughs> which had been forged long ago by Artaka himself to grant the Toamata the power. I bet these cost more at fucking Target, dude. <laughs> you don't want to be the kid without the fucking golden Kanohi mask, dude. You don't want to be broke. You better beg your parents at Christmas. Of all six great Kanohi at once. Specifically, these were the Kanohi Howl. Mask of shielding. Six dollars extra. Kauka, <laughs> mask of water breathing. The Kanohi mirror. Wait. Mask of levitation. They sold random booster packs. You had to buy random blind booster packs to try and get golden masks. <laughs> they they loot box children with this shit. Patient. The Kanohi Akaku. Mask of X-ray vision. <laughs> the Kanohi Kakama. Mask of speed and the Kanohi Bakari, <laughs> Mask of Strength. Each of the six Toamata began their quest with one of these six masks for each of them, and they each had to collect all six for themselves to unlock their golden Kanohi. That's ridiculous. Setting off on his quest, Pohatu Toa of Stone sped through the icy landscape of Kowaki on the hunt for his next mask. In his hurry, he barreled into the irritable Toa Kopaka at super speed, who saved them both from an avalanche. With Kopaka reluctantly agreeing to let the friendly Pohatu travel with him, who insisted they'd be more efficient as a team. This began the start of one of the most enduring friendships in the story of Bionicle. Feel strong, man. On the cliffs of Mount Aihu, Pohatu and Kopaka stumbled upon the rest of the Toamada, who had finally gathered together as one to get to know one another and discuss their quest. Despite Tahu and Onua arguing to stay together, the Toa split apart. Oh no. Just then, a large earthquake rocked the earth and the ground split with rain and hail falling around them. The Toa realized this was the work of Makuta Teradax, and immediately began a search. Bro, why is the red fire one always the leader in any type of kids show? You know what I'm saying? Like, what? <laughs> what the fuck? Edgy? Or coolest? <laughs> Meanwhile, Takua Because it's the red, because he's Kawa, fucking cool. <laughs> disoriented and confused. <laughs> Observing the events from afar, a panicked Gamator named Maku summoned him, asking if he had seen Toa Gali. The village of I wouldn't Kora know because this is not for kids. <laughs> as Teradax had seized the opportunity to assault the village and test the strength of the Toa one by one. Takua arrived in Gakoro by boat to find a capsized house, which he worked hard to bring back to the surface and rescue Turaga no Kama and the rest of the Gakoro. Animation Kora. out of control. As the terrified Matoran fled, Takua watched as the powerful Toa Gali emerged from the ocean, trading blows with the Tarakava uh. and pushing it back in a great struggle. And so, over the course of many months, these Toa embarked on their great quest for the masks. Sometimes they all got their own masks. Together, sometimes alone. During this time, Takua continued to wander around the island of Mata Nui, his memory slowly returning as he learned more and more about each village. In the stony village of Pokoro, Takua encountered the entire populace in the grip of a plague, which he discovered had been spread by infected <laughs> holy balls. Rocks using a popular Holy sport shit. native to that region. Bionicle predicted Rescued COVID. Rescued by Toa from the grips of some vicious Rahi scorpions, Takua realized the source of the disease was Akmau, the devious Pomatoran who had conspired with Teradax to infect the population. Akmau equals Pokora. devious! His treachery revealed, Akmau pleaded innocence and fled the city for a time. After further adventures and many friends made, Takua found himself in the treetop village of Lake Oro, which was under ambush by the insectoid Nui Rama Rahi, controlled by Teradax to test the Nui Rama Rahi. In a stunning attack, Liwa was defeated by the swarm of insects, with his Kanohi mask replaced with an infected Miru, placing him under Teradax's thrall. In the ensuing battle, Tragic. the Maymatoran riding oh, birds were brought down and captured by the Nui Rama. 
And so, in a climactic battle, Onua Toa <laughs> so many bursts through the walls climactic of the battles. battling Liwa one-on-one -on -one and finally managing to free the Toa of Air from his mind control. As this was happening, the other four Toa Mata continued their quest for the masks, okay. also discovering and collecting the hidden Makoki stones in the process to gain oh, there's stones too, enemy, huh? the Brotherhood of Makuta. Are those in the blind the bags? sparks of conflict began to fly between the Toa, with Tahu lighting an entire tree on fire to retrieve one single Kanohi mask. Much to the dismay and anger of Gong, who had seen him destroy the habitat of several nesting birds. At the same time, Takua continued to meet new Matoran, like Matoro, translator to Turaga Nuju and keeper of the Turaga secrets. Turaga Nuju, chief engineer of Onukoro. Of Onukoro. Of course, he continued to stay in close communication and contact with his friend Jaller, captain of the Takoro Guard. Of course. Along his journeys, Takua encountered the mighty Toa as they fulfilled their own quests, witnessing epic battles and even <laughs> assisting some of them in uncovering mysteries and claiming their own masks. Okay. So just a quick note here, the story content that's being covered right now was featured in a game called the Mata Nui Online Game. This was many fans' very first introduction to Bionicle all the way back in 2001, and is considered to be one of the best examples of Bionicle storytelling. It was essentially a choose-your-own-adventure game where you played as Takua as he explored throughout Mata Nui, going to the different villages and meeting different characters, and essentially witnessing the story of the Toa from a second- Actually goaded game. <laughs> in hand view. It was a really, really great game that unfortunately I've kind of had to gloss over really quickly oh, in this analysis, tragic. especially because there's so much content to get through. So definitely if this interests you, if the world seems interesting, you can actually play the Mata Nui online game on a website called Biomedia Project, which I've linked below in the description. So feel free to download it and check it out. <laughs> it's one of the best pieces of Bionicle content ever, and I feel really bad for summarizing it in a few sentences. Part 3, The Void. <laughs> Finally, after months questing for the masks, the Toa Mata successfully collected their six no, masks no, of power. No. As they headed for the great temple of Kinunui <laughs> in the center of the island to claim their powerful golden Kanohi, Makuta Teradax rallied his forces for a counterattack, sending his infected Rahi in swarms to assault the temple. But the Matoran were ready, and years of defending their villages had sharpened their combat skills. In his many journeys, Takua had assembled a group of Matoran from each village to fight alongside him. Known as the Chronicler's Company, they held back the Rahi long enough for the Toa to claim their golden masks and descend into the Makuta's lair beneath Kini Nui, in the passageway from the face of the robot <laughs> to the deserted sphere of Metru Nui. As the Toa descended into the That's darkness, a four -hour the game. Chronicler's Company, aided by Jallers, Captain of the Guard, and Onukoro's Usselry forces, fought on. Upon entering the gate to Mangaya, the Toa were attacked by two Manas crabs, powerful infected Rahi that served as personal guardians of Teradax's lair deep within Mangaya. Just then, the Toa recalled ancient visions they had seen along their journeys, urging them to remember who they were and merge together into the powerful Toa Kaida. Tahu, okay. Kohatu, and Onua combined their energies to transform into the towering Toa Kaida Akamai, Avatar <laughs> of Valor. While Liwa, Gali, and Tohaka merged to form the titan oh, wait, they mix? Warua, Avatar of Wisdom. Now, look, I know what you're probably thinking. What on earth are these? I, I guarantee you don't. <laughs> I guarantee whatever you think I'm thinking is not what I'm thinking. And why did they just come out of nowhere? Well, unfortunately, the thing is, since I'm having to summarize this story relatively quickly, a lot of the story scenes that hinted at this being possible were just kind of glossed over. So let me just give you the quick and dirty version of it. Essentially, every inhabitant of the Matora universe has the power to form a Kaita, which is the bionicle form for a combination or some sort of greater being. So these Toa Kaita are actually three Toa coming together, Tahu, Onua, and Pohatu forming this one, yep. and Liwa, Kopaka, and Gali forming the other one. Yep. This ability was programmed in by the great beings to allow certain members of the universe to form together, essentially combining their collective force to solve any problem which required, say, <laughs> physical strength 
or extreme unity. And yes, you may have guessed this already, but these are essentially these set combiner models, which honestly I think is something that's pretty cool because in universe, you're literally combining three of the sets just as you are in the set form themselves to make these larger Titan yeah. characters. I know. Powered up in their they made the forms, lore off the to the Toa toys. struck back against the Manas Crabs, utterly defeating them and clearing the path to the lair of their ultimate enemy, Makuta Teradax. Just then, a wave of destruction swept... I wonder how much of this is scripted versus off the cuff. <laughs> Dude, you know this guy could do this all right now off the cuff. He just knows it in and out. ...across the Toa Kaida, separating them back into their original forms. Before they got a chance to confront Teradax himself... This is one take. Six ...shadowy figures emerge from the walls, mirror reflections of the Toa Mata themselves. Oh my god, Shadow Toa? Valiantly, ...the Toa realized that these shadow reflections were perfectly matched themselves. And the true test was to accept the darkness, hatred, and evil was as much a part of them as any sentient being. By acknowledging their shadow <laughs> counterparts were a part of them, the oh, I have to buy to these too. Them into themselves, ending the threat and proceeding to confront Teradox. In the meantime, with the combined efforts of Takua's Chronicler's company, the top Big A looks like he's having his soul ripped out by Teradax. <laughs> Oh no! Call the fucking Matanui! Call the fallen the Toa, awesome. dude! The Rocky I think Teradax has got me in his clutches! Outside the temple. In this lull in the conflict, Taraga Wanua was escorted to the surface, giving Takua a tip about a secret passageway into Mangaya from Onukoro, so he could watch the Toa battle Teradax and tell the tale of their exploits. And so, as Takua descended into the tunnels, the Toa Mata entered the final chamber, ready to face Teradax. In the center of the room, a swirling vortex of robotic components and objects faced the Toa. A Matoran, oh pitted God. and rusted with an infected mask, walked out to them. Someone new? Like eyes staring from empty sockets. This was Makuta Teradax, who had taken the guise of a Matoran to taunt the Toa, hinting at the true nature of his power. As the Makuta faded back into the vortex, dark tentacles lashed out at the Toa, who were beaten back no matter what they tried. Slowly, the Makuta ceased his attack and gazed down at his defeated opponents. In a final rally, the Toa mustered together their elemental powers and sent a wave of energy at the Vortex. Uh -huh. Before they could truly defeat Makuta, he faded away, his voice echoing through the room that they could never defeat the Void. <laughs> All this conflict and buildup was merely a test by Teradax to see how oh skilled my God, it's the Toa Mata really again. were. Satisfied by his test, Makuta retreated deeper within Magaya, readying his next plans. But so as the Toa were transported back up to the surface of Mata Nui, Takua was left behind, surrounded by the discarded parts and damaged rubble from the battle. Instead of taking the path back to the surface, he noticed a separate passageway, a secret tunnel to a massive subterranean network of hives and pods. Okay, Here, weird. Takua watched as creatures within the pods began to stir, slowly awakening the horrors within. Oh my god. <laughs> managing to escape it's like through the Matrix. an automated portal system, Takua was ejected onto the beach of Mata Nui, still reeling from the battle he had witnessed and unaware of the threat to come. Little did he know, but the discovery of this hive signaled Makuta Teradax's next attack, and peace would be short-lived. Oh my god, what is this found footage? Part 4, Terror of the Swarm. Weary after their recent fight with Teradax and mm. uncertain of his next plans, the Toa Mata emerged onto the surface of the Kini Nui Temple. Before a moment's chance to breathe, a Matoran burst from the shrubbery, terrified and traumatized from a mysterious attack. He would only utter one word from his mouth, over and over again, Bullrock. <laughs> Recap from chapters one and two. As Dude, you probably give me a know break! Now, everything that's happening give me a break! in the Matoran universe is occurring in the body of the Great Spirit I, Of robot, course I know that! Is a colossal robot the size of a planet that can actually lay down on the surface of a planet underwater and have a cloaking camouflage system on its face. Makes total sense. every time this Mata Nui robot wants to survey a world, it just lays flat and <laughs> lets its face stick out above the water. The cloaking is actually pretty cool. <laughs> Essentially, the metal faceplate of the robot is covered by an artificial layer of foliage and sand, which allows it to stay hidden during its procedures. However, the main thing is that once it is time to take off, as I mentioned in the previous chapters, there is a full-on cleansing mechanism to wipe all of this foliage and sand off of its face. To do that, the Mata Nui robot employs these small robots called Borok, 
whose task is literally just to cleanse the surface of the face. How is it world. the bad guy then? Of course, now is the island Mata Nui. The Borok also have a secret. As I mentioned in chapter 2, all Avmatoran who achieve their destiny, like our friend Takua here, transform into Borok. So essentially, at any point, an Avmatoran could be transformed into a Borok should they be needed to be called upon by the Swarm. This also the wipes swarm. all of their memories and personality, leaving behind only a robot, which is a husk of its former self. Okay. It's a pretty effective way of using the Matoran universe's own inhabitants to be the cleansing mechanism, just in case any Borok get damaged while repairing the surface of the face. So that way, you can just take some Avatoran and replace them. <laughs> Deep within the catacombs of Matanui, Makuta Teradax uncovered an ancient mechanism to prematurely awaken the Borok, triggering their cleansing protocols to wipe I the face see, of Matanui. I see, I see. Remember back in Chapter 2 when Makuta Mutron bridged his mind with the horrible entity Tren Krom and discovered the yes, secrets of Trent the Matoran Krom. universe? Well, if you don't, that's why I'm here. When he relayed this information to Makuta Teradax, not only did it lead to Teradax's revolt and eventual takeover of the Great Spirit Robot, but it also led to one crucial piece of information. Teradax discovered exactly how to prematurely activate the Borok. You just said system, that! Which you is just why said that 30 purpose. seconds ago! And so all over the island, thousands of Borok with unique elemental abilities awoke with a singular mission. Tanak with fire abilities burnt large swaths of forests, with Galak summoning flood tides and Parak shattering stone foundations. Levok used acid attacks to channel dangerous streams of poison, while Korak manipulated the element of ice to weaken Shows even the respect. hardest of substances. <laughs> Finally, the dangerous Nuvok tunneled deep within the ground, hollowing out sinkholes and swallowing all right, entire focus villages up. whole. While the Borok were all simply mechanical shells, the real danger were the Krana, the brains the, of the Borok. The Krana? Created by the great beings by exposing Matoran remains to energize Protodermis, the Krana controlled the hive mind of the Borok and had the unique ability to control any inhabitant of the Matoran universe when placed on their face. Through a unique technical <laughs> interface designed by the great beings, Krana could override the base programming of any Matoran or okay. even Toa to use their powers to accomplish They're like face hugger, tasks. okay. And finally, Deep within the robot itself lurked the Barag Queens, controllers of the Borok and directors of the hive mind. What? As an extreme security measure, the nest of the Barag was sealed shut, with the only way okay. to bypass the seal and override the hive mind being a complex mechanism requiring 48 different chronos from each of the six <laughs> Borok types. As you might be able to guess, these chrono were the main collectibles for the year of 2002. And boy, were there a lot of them. You see, each of these six types of Borok had eight different chrono. Oh my fucking and each of those god. Eight had two different forms. Oh based my on fucking they were god. Active or dormant. So, really, that's a lot of chrono in total. The other thing that I want that's to make That's disgusting. That is ridiculous. Is that members of the Matoran universe at this point do not know that they're living inside a giant robot. No, so while why they would kind they? of have an understanding that Krana are used to control the Borok based on some sort of hive mind, they don't really understand where the Borok came from, why their mission even is to cleanse the surface of the island, or that they were once Avatoran. Really, all they know is that the Borok are trying to destroy their homes, which is pretty unfortunate because it is supposed to be something positive for the Great Spirit Mata Nui to cleanse its face, but Teradax triggered it early, which is... Bro, just so many children getting upset at their parents because they don't have fucking the last 48th mask. <laughs> 48 is such an absurd fucking number to blind bag. Causing all this problem. Meanwhile, as the Toamata rushed to Takoro to save the village, they found it overrun by Borok. Released by Makuta Teradax immediately after their 96, I'm sorry. Died, Active and deactivated. We're surprised to see that unlike the Rahi or Makuta's other pawns, the Borok made no moves to attack or harm them at all. They would simply defend themselves if attacked. Nevertheless, the Toa sprung to action, Gali and Liwa combining the power of water and air to create an immense cyclone that swept through the first wave of Borok, leaving only the Krana behind. Mm. Turaga Vakama then emerged from the shadows Turaga Vakama. and shared his knowledge of the Borok with the Toa, explaining that they needed to seek out 48 different Krana to unlock the hive and shut down the invasion. And so, the Toa set off on a two-pronged quest to delay the destruction of Mata Nui while disabling and collecting each Krana to put an end to the Borok threat. So sick. Part 5. The Borok Wars 
Over the course of several months, the Matoran and Toa staged a brave fight against the relentless Borok hordes. An Onu Matoran engineer named Nuparu created a genius invention in a bind. Scavenging destroyed Borok parts, he created the Boxor and burst through the tunnels of Onu Boxor, devastating Borok as he went. Throughout this struggle, Pokora was invaded, and its entire population we'll evacuated this. to Gakuro in a major upheaval. All along the way, Takua followed the Toa on their quest, chronicling their actions and heroic deeds. In the treetop village of Lake Horo, disaster struck. <laughs> They're like and mechs for mechs. Conversion from the Borok. He created mechs for already, including Taraga Matau, was assimilated by the Borok's Krana, becoming slaves to the hive mind. <laughs> Despite his lone attempts to free his village, Toa Liwa also succumbed to the Krana, then confronting Onua deep within the jungle. The wise Onua Remender... laid his weapons down, telling Liwa that his will was stronger than the Krana. The music is so good. himself worthy of being a Toa. Tearing off the Krana from his face with all the willpower he could summon, I will Liwa not! overcame this obstacle, and together with Onua, Nuparu's boxer vehicles, and even the help of Takua and Captain of the Guard Jaller, freed the village of Lekoro. Good Finally, shit. With all 48 Krana collected, the Toa agreed to descend to the Borok Nest and end the threat of the Borok once and for all. Nice. And so, as they journeyed into the depths of the nest, the Borok readied to wipe Gokoro off the face of the map, taking the evacuated population of the Pomatoran with it. The brave Jaller and Takua <laughs> led the Matoran counterattack, defending Gakoro <laughs> from the ever increasing threat. Despite the efforts of the Matoran and Nuparu's Boxer inventions, the threat was dire. <laughs> And with the Toa deep underground, the Mator were fighting a losing battle. Oh no. Meanwhile, as he traveled deep into the tunnels, Tahu grew wary of Liwa, suspicious that he was still influenced by the power of the Krana. Although Onua had faith in his fellow Toa's willpower. But so, after I'm... facing many trials to strive towards the center of the nest, Liwa proved his allegiance time and time again, and the Toa finally made it to the center of the hive. Good job, Liwa. Using their 48 Krana on the slots in the floor, they unlocked the inner nest, opening six passageways into the dark. <laughs> Within these tunnels, the Toa Mata discovered mighty exo they split up or of what? armor, remnants of the great beings <laughs> as a failsafe against the Borok. These exo Toa may actually seem pretty familiar. It's because that throughout the Brotherhood of Makuta's actions in chapters one, two, three, they actually use these exo Toa to replicate the strength of a Toa and fight in their armies. Right. Essentially, the Exo Toa can either be worn as a suit by a current Toa to power up their abilities, or they can operate on their own as robotic shells and can even be controlled by them. Energized Protodermis was the mysterious substance that had the incredible power to create, I do. I do transform, know that. or even destroy. This was the substance that sparked the core war and arguably the entire Bionicle story itself yep. because yep. it was the major resource being fought over in Spherus Magna. Yep. Submerged within the mysterious energized protodermis, the Toa Mata were physically transformed. They're gonna get mutated again. Into beings far more powerful than any Toa in existence. <laughs> Armed with powerful new mouths, Holy weapons, shit. and solid protodermis armor, they became the Toa Nuva, rising from the ground in their striking new forms. As <laughs> Holy shit. The Toa Nuva. I'm sure there's another set of toys to buy every year boulders of earth rained down upon them tahu nuva activated the power of his how new these are the ones you had shield okay and was surprised to discover that he had shielded not only himself but his entire team as the toa slowly came to the realization that their new forms allowed him to share mass powers amongst each other liwa activated the mask of levitation the miru nuva while puhatu used the mask of speed the kakama nuva, to propel this newly transformed toa team from the depths of the hive back out to the surface in okay. Gakoro, with the fight over, the Matoran busied themselves with preparing the land. Krana were harvested and placed in a massive pit where they cannot infect any more mines. Can't build this. With the mindless Korok now acting as mere robots, Matoran were able to use their powerful forms to reconstruct what they had destroyed, the Borok acting as a force for creation rather than destruction. In the aftermath of the battle, Takua and Jaller enjoyed a brief moment ha! of respite, celebrating with the Gamatoran and Pomatoran. Specifically, Huki, who was leading the Pomatoran guard, as well as Holly, one of their Gamatoran companions. Hey guys, I just thought of Stuck in the illusion oh, of a. Oh, no, 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 no! No, go back! No, wait! In the meantime, the war with the combined effort, Gali discovered that she wore the mask of water breathing, aka vision of the future. In his ex caught up to him, placed with an from empty sockets. This was Makuta Teradax. Who had taken the guise of a Matoran to 
before he could summon, Liwa overcame this obstacle, and together with Onua, Nuparu's Boxor vehicles, and even- Previously on by- Previous- The Toa felt a rumbling beneath their feet. As the floor gave way, the Toa Mata were thrust- 2.30, yeah, it was, it was right here. The tubes of bubbling- this is, it, this is it, this is it. He became the Toa Nuva. This is it. Surprised to discover that he had shielded not only himself, but his entire team. As well, I was going to say, I <laughs> I'm not restarting. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not going to restart. But I, <laughs> I was going to say, the reason I paused it was because I thought of a really hilarious joke that anybody coming in, if you want to use it, just come into a video that's obviously hours into it and then say, just got here. Can you restart? <laughs> Troll face. That, I mean, that is a funny joke. And it's original too. Whoever does that is going to be one of the fucking funniest people alive. So, uh... The Toa slowly came to the realization that their new forms allowed them to share mass powers amongst each other. Liwa activated the Mask of Levitation, the Miru Nuva, while Puhatu used the Mask of Speed, the Kakama Nuva to propel this newly transformed Toa team from the depths of the hive back out to the surface. In Gakoro, with the fight over, the Matoran busied themselves with repairing the land. Krana were harvested and placed in a massive pit. I'm sorry, there's a first time chatter, G Potato. I never watched the show, but I had a bunch of the random toys and I took them all apart and made my own custom ones that were 10X cooler than what they were supposed to be. And the extended universe that 11-year-old me Crade came up with was way more complicated than even this. <laughs> All right, well, I can't wait for the fucking 10-hour video that you make about your own extended universe. Where they cannot infect any more minds. With the mindless Borok <laughs> now acting as mere robots, Matoran were able to use their powerful forms to reconstruct what they had destroyed. The Borok acting as a force for creation rather than destruction. In the aftermath of the battle, Takua and Jaller enjoyed a brief moment of respite, celebrating with the Gamatoran and Pomatoran, specifically Huki, who was leading the Pomatoran guard, the as well as Holly, one of their Gamatoran companions. Looking out to the ocean, Takua was thankful for the end of the Borok Wars, but was unaware of the danger lying ahead, and mm. how this was only the first stage in Teradax's plans to overthrow the Great Spirit and seize the Matoran populace for himself. That Teradex. Previously on Bionicle Retold, Chapter 4, Infection. Danger on Mata Nui. After the Great Cataclysm wiped the minds of the Matoran of Metru Nui, Taraga and Matorans seek refuge on the Recap. Paradise Recap. Island Recap. Mata Nui on the face of the robot. Summoned by an ancient mechanism, the Toa Mata arrive on the shores of the island, their memories fragmented from centuries adrift at sea. The brave Toamata battled the darkness of evil Makuta Tiradex and the terrible menaces he unleashed that threatened the Toa and the world. In the depths below the island, the Toa faced their greatest threat, the Borok Swarms, an ancient safeguard to clean Wasn't the even surface that bad. of the they, robot. It was like cleaning robots. They beat At the him climax easy. climax of this conflict, the Toa were thrust into the mysterious energized protodermis, emerging as fully evolved Prime Toa Nuva. These Toa Nuva would need all their power, all their skill, and all their wisdom to combat even more dangerous threats on the horizon. This is Bionicle Retold. You know what? His passion is infectious. <laughs> Every time I think I'm totally checked out, he does an intro, and it gets me kind of back in. I do like the intros, bro. I do. I'll say it. I like the intros. They got a good fire to them. The journey starts now. Chapter 5, Light. Part 1, The Borok Call Strike. <laughs> it's a strike? Across the island of Mata Nui, <laughs> celebrations ring out. With the threat of the Borok behind them and the Toa Nuva more powerful than ever, Matoran and every village began the slow process of rebuilding and retaking the land from the wreckage. As Toa Tahu there is a quiz. To Tahoro, Taraga Vakama took him aside and secretly gave him the Kanohi Vahi, the powerful mask of time to be used in emergencies only. Okay. In this time of peace and rebuilding, six mysterious objects appeared atop yeah, the Yeah, we know Toa about Sutras, this already. Symbols of the elemental power each Toa Nuva held. 
So to give some context for this, the Toa Nuva are not like normal Toa. They're one of a kind, and their elemental abilities are so powerful that they don't actually work the normal way. Oh. Instead of just being innate to the Toa Nuva themselves, these elemental energies are fed to the Toa Nuva from these special Nuva symbols. If these symbols are in friendly territory, then their elemental powers remain, and they're much stronger than any normal Toas. But there's a catch, because if these elemental symbols were to ever be removed from friendly territory and stolen by enemy powers, then the elemental powers would vanish, leaving the Toa Nuva powerless. Artaka actually created these in anticipation for the Toa Mata to be upgraded one day, which is why they even exist in the first place. It's kind of a catch-22. They give the Toa Nuva awesome powers, but at a cost. As the Toa Nuva trained and honed their newfound increased elemental abilities, they were unaware of a growing threat. With the Barok, Queens of the Borok, sealed in stasis deep underground, yeah. the failsafe was automatically activated in the form of the Borok Call. Six elite Borok with unique elemental abilities and uh, personalities of their own. What? Why is there always six? Free the Barok. As they awoke from their chambers and emerged onto the island, they encountered the Nuva symbol. Aren't the Bar Borok just cleaning robots at the end of the day? There's a secret six cleaning robots with unique personalities and elements and shit as a fucking failsafe? Bulls whose innate elemental abilities were the key to unlocking the Barog Seal. They're like Roombas! So, as the Borok Call split up to steal the symbols from the Matoran, the Toa Nuva began to lose their powers one by one over uh -oh. the island, confused and afraid. Uh-oh. Soon, these now powerless Toa Nuva would have to face the combined might of the Borok Call, with only their own strength and skill. And these elite Borok were a formidable force. Ta'anak Call wielded the element of electricity, striking at the Talkoro Guard and Captain Jala to access Tahu's symbol. Gala Call was the Borak Call of Magnetism. Ga Gala Call was the Borak Call of Magnetism. What? The fuck are you the saying? The vacuum, sucking the air out of his surroundings to render Toa Onua helpless and steal his symbol. Parak Call wielded plasma, melting his way through to Bahatu's symbol. Nuva Call controlled gravity, hurling massive objects with his unique abilities. Okay. Finally, strongest Damn, I kind of remember these. Call, who was gifted with the element I remember of the Sonic way these looked. His opponents, project Sonic Force fields, and even generate concussive blasts of pure Sonic energy. Just a behind-the-scenes explanation for why these exist. Thanks. So when the Borok first came out in 2002, they were one of the LEGO Group's most popular toys and outsold many <laughs> expectations. And so to attempt to recapture the popularity of the original 2002 Borok, the LEGO Group just basically did the same thing, but in silver. Essentially, for all intents and purposes, they were literally identical models. And as you can probably guess, the Borok call didn't quite sell as well as the original Borok, because most fans were wanting something new. Yeah. That something new would come later, but for now, that's why the Borok Call even exists in the story. Oh, good. And so I'm glad it was plot-driven and not sales-driven. The Toa Nuva set off on a quest to regain their elemental Nuva symbols and stop the Borok Call from reawakening the Barok and the Swarms. Along their journeys, the Toa Nuva collected new sets of Kanohi Nuva, hoping to supplement their abilities with the elemental powers now drained. Throughout these journeys, mm. Gali discovered a carving of the Toa Metru, the first evidence of them that they were not the first Toa on the island. A three hour stretch break that here in a second. was a story for far later, and soon the confrontation with the Borok Call was nigh, and as a six powerless Toa Nuva descended into the Borok Nest yet again, they were met with a ferocious battle raging before their eyes. The Exo Toa armor suits had been automatically activated, wielding all their power against the forces of the Borok Call. Okay. As the mechanized guard succumbed to the power of the Borok Call, Tahu summoned the Kanohi Vahi, slowing time around them for just long enough for Gali to form. That's the time mask, fight. okay. Using all of her willpower and joining forces with the other Toa Nuva, Gali and the others connected to their Nuva symbols mentally, flooding their elemental power into the symbols and into the Borok Call. What? Not built to handle the full might of the Toa Nuva, each <laughs> Borok Call succumbed to their own abilities gone haywire. Uh, okay. Ronak Call was trapped in a never-ending field of electricity, while Levok Call hurtled miles into the air from a blast of air. <laughs> Magnetic fields hurled half-destroyed Exotoa parts through the air, crushing Gala Call. Nuvok Call's immense gravitational abilities crumbled his body inwards, creating a miniature black hole. 
Oh. <laughs> Pot Rock Call melted far below the ground in molten plasma. Jesus. And devastating sound waves ripped Korok Call apart. <laughs> Exhausted, the Toa Nuva collapsed to the ground. Their mission complete, and Nuva symbols were yeah! With the threat of the Borok Call finally over, and the swarms behind them, the Toa emerged back onto the surface of Mata Nui, weary from their trials. Part 2. A Time of Peace. <laughs> Following the defeat of the Bora Call and the triumph of the Toa Nuva, celebrations yet again rang out across the island of Mata Nui. In a great ceremony, the Turaga honored key Matoran who were vital This in is the part two of, of chapter five, keep up. The Rahi and Borak attacks. This naming ceremony continued a long-standing Matoran tradition, where certain Matorans' names were elongated and modified to signify... Haven't they only lived in the island for one year? Which is a cultural aspect of the Matoran. Alongside these new names, the Matoran were also rebuilt into new and more powerful forms to signify their accomplishments. <laughs> so here's why this actually works. Back in 2001 when Bionicle first launched, LEGO designers drew from the Maori culture in New Zealand, essentially taking words from their dictionary and translating yeah. them directly into Bionicle terminology. Okay. Unfortunately, not all of these translations were 100% accurate, and many of them were offensive to the Maori culture. <laughs> One cultural appropriation lawsuit later, and we have Naming Day, an in-universe event to slightly change the names of certain characters, just enough so they remain recognizable, but enough so that they do not fall under exact male words. For instance, Jala, spelled J-A-L-A, becomes Jaller, spelled J-A-L-L-E-R, and so on and so forth. They also use this as a justification to update That's the Matoran so films. That's so funny. Originally, Matoran or That's the Tohunga so the first funny. Called were released as Happy Meal toys. So they were pretty small and admittedly pretty cute, but didn't have too much articulation. Well, in 2003, two years later, LEGO actually made full-on Matoran sets. And mm. so, they actually managed to include a full-on upgrade in the story itself to justify the set change as well. I guess it kind of makes sense in-universe, and they did the best with what they could to change the names, although it is admittedly a little clunky. <laughs> During the ceremony, Matoran honored included Jala, brave so captain funny. of the guard and defender of Takora, <laughs> his companion, the chronicler Takua, and Huki, Po Matoran Koli's Sports champion, among many others. That's so fucking as the Toa funny. continued to train and hone their skills as a unit, the Matoran continued work on their daily tasks, preparing for a grand Koli tournament to celebrate the Toa Nuba. A unique sport developed. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached one full Oppenheimer. <laughs> We have reached one full Oppenheimer of Bionicle lore, with two more to go. ...on the island of Mata Nui, Koli started off as a simple game with weighted rocks and balls, Stretch. and over the years, was altered and improved to include specialized staffs and tools to compete in the game. Every Koro across Mata Nui competed in Koli, and for the upcoming Grand Tournament, competitions were held as semifinals across the island until a massive three-way game would be held with the top Nolan three Nolan could never, is all I'm One saying. One of these competitors was a Gamatora named Holly, who had participated in I'm the... I'm sorry, I, I hate to rewind it ever, but <laughs> this is part of the lore. This Flash game where you play fucking hockey with the Bionicles is part of the lore? One of these competitors was a Gamatora named Holly, who had participated in the defense of her village against the Borok and honed her newly developed athletic skills to become a champion of Koli. Having spent a considerable amount of time with Jaller fighting against the Borok, Holly knew exactly who she'd be up against in the Koli tournament, and spent the following months honing her body, mind, and will. I could have watched Oppenheimer, but I'd rather watch a masterpiece. <laughs> purity and more across the many villages. Oh my god, look at these Over games. The of these adventures, look at these Holly games. <laughs> in the regional tournaments with her partner Maku, eventually earning Gakoro a place in the upcoming Grand Tournament. During these journeys, she met fellow Matoran like Kongu, airman of the Gakko Bird Force, Nuparu, the engineer who built the famed Boxor vehicles, and Matoro, translator to Turaga Nuju. As a recap from Chapter 4, many of these Matoran played a pretty significant role in Takua's adventures across the island of Mata Nui, where he met different villagers and got to know the different cultures across the island. And keep these names in mind, because some of these Matoran would become much, much more relevant in the future chapters of this story. As the Matoran busied themselves in preparation for the tournament, the Turaga delved deep into discussion about when would be the right time to reveal their origins, and potentially start a mass migration back to Metru Nui to rehabilitate the great city of Legends. Okay. On the eve of the tournament, a decision <sighs> okay. was made. 
After the game was over, the Tewanuva would be summoned and told the great tale of Metru Nui, learning of the true origins of the Matoran and the Turaga's past lives as the heroic Tewa Metru. But of course, if you've been following this series, you've already heard the tales of the Toa Metru in Chapter 3, Legends of yep. Metru Nui. So don't recap it. Part 3, Quest for the Seventh Toa. Hours before the Koli Championship, Jaller wandered through the now empty Jaller. city of Takoa, <laughs> Jaller now. searching for his partner Takua. <laughs> With the entire population of the city housed in the massive Koli Arena in preparation for the game, Jaller had free access to the deepest caverns and normally restricted tunnels of lava. Okay. In these lava chambers beneath Takoro, Jaller found Takua examining a strange totem across a boiling river of lava. Distracted by his newfound discovery, Takua failed to realize he was late for the tournament and that the you lava fool. levels were steadily rising. In a volcanic blast, <laughs> the totem was knocked from his hands, melting away and revealing the mysterious Kanohi Avoki, the Mask of Light. Oh my god, he just found so it? Here's a brief history of the very powerful artifact. Dude, I mean, the we know. Or the Mask of Light. You've said it multiple Years times. Ago, the being known as Artaka created the Mask of Light on his island as a safeguard in case the Brotherhood of Makuta, who used Shadow as their primary weapon, ever turned evil. Which, of course, they did, so he definitely <laughs> was in the right to create it. It <laughs> Good remained call. on Artaka's island for thousands of years until, of course, the brother of Makuta turned evil, and one of their agents, Makuta Kojol, stole it during a raid on Artaka and brought it back to the Makuta Fortress in Destro. There it sat for hundreds of years until the Toa Haga, as we mentioned in the previous two chapters, raided the Brotherhood of Makuta this Fortress so and tough. retrieved the Avoki, and were unfortunately mutated into Rahaga in the process. Oh, the man. Kanohi Avoki remained in the possession of these Rahaga until the events of 2005, or Chapter 4, where the Toa Metru transformed into Toa Hordika and had to unite the Makoki Stones to claim the Kanohi Avoki from the Rahaga and bring it back with them. And if you're not confused already, the Toa Hordika... Transformed back into Toa Metru, went to the island of Mata Nui, and placed the Kanohi Avoki in safekeeping in Takoro until Dude, I can't. I seriously can't. Now. I can't. So essentially, all you need to know is that it's an ancient artifact, the Turaga stored it in Takoro, and to So it say Takoro. that! You really don't need to know so the say that. if you don't really care. Although it's pretty interesting to know the history behind this artifact. The other thing that you may or may not have forgotten about Takua, and it's really important, is that he is not actually a Tomatoran. No, a no, he's not a Tomatoran. He's an Avgator. He has a blue ha a helmet. Light in disguise, and was displaced from his original home when the Order of Matanui secretly hid Avmatoran all across the Matoran universe in preparation in case the Brotherhood of Makuta <laughs> intended to turn against all of the Matoran of Light. I can't. Takua himself dude, doesn't my brain, even know dude, he's an Avmatoran. Okay, I'll be honest with you, my brain is starting to like reject. It. It's starting to like physically reject some of these words. <laughs> I can't keep up. I can't keep up. It's like he's fucking waterboarding me a little bit mentally. I I can't. It's gabagool, dude. I can't fucking keep up. I followed some of it. I swear to God, but it's so fucking. And for all intents and purposes, he just uh... believes himself to be a Tomatoran. But just remember, he's actually a Matoran of Light. It also explains why, despite being a Tomatoran, there's a lot of blue coloring on Takua. I know! Of course, Afmatoran can alter the color of their armor in whatever color they wish, and the process that Takua used probably wasn't that good, so despite trying to blend in as a Tomatoran, he has a lot of blue armor. So it's a little bit confusing, and that explains it. In a sudden oh. volcanic blast, <laughs> yeah, that explains it. Thanks. I hate to be confused. Takua about to be engulfed in lava. Just then, Toa Tahu Nuva swooped in to rescue Takua activating his Mask of Shielding to defend the Matoran from the oncoming lava. Catching a glimpse of the Mask of Light, Tahu gave the two Matoran strict instructions to present the mask to Turaga Vakama, after the tournament was over, of course. Turaga so, Vakama. as Jalor and Takua rushed to the stadium, the Grand Koli Finals Tournament began. Oh, shit! In a series of intense matches, Polly swept the competition, crowning Gakoro. I'm gonna pause again, but anytime in a show, like a kid's show when I'm growing up, or in a video game, when you have like the Coliseum episode where they have to fight increasing challenges, it's always my favorite part. It was like one of my favorite parts of Hollow Knight. It's one of my favorite parts of like a bunch of games. It's so fun. I love Coliseum side stories. <laughs> tournament arc. Yeah, tournament arcs. Or in Pokemon when Ash does the Pokemon League and he has to fight Gary. It's so sick. As a champion of the tournament and leaving Pokoro and Takoro in the dust. As the players gathered in the center of the field, Takua inadvertently revealed the Mask of Light, 
which activated at his touch due to his secret Afmatora nature. But Takua was irresponsible and shirked from his duties, instead shining the light <laughs> They're kicking it back and Jala, forth? Tricking the Turaga and the crowd into naming Jalar as the Herald of the Seventh Toa, bearer of the Mask of Light. <laughs> After gathering for a brief meeting to discuss the future of the mask, the Turaga sent Jalar and Takua on a quest to find or summon the Seventh Toa, a new Toa of Light who would wear the Kanohi Evoki and provide a massive advantage over Makuta Teradax. After these events, the Toa and Matoran dispersed their own homes and roles. Holly wished her companions luck on their journey and All right. embarked on a quest of her own. I have to ask this question because it's gonna it's um, it's hurting my head every time. The Toa are the big good guys, and the Matoran are the small good guys. Am I correct? Okay, thank God. I I literally I, they just keep saying it over and over, and I can't understand really. Okay. Okay. Visit temples across the island. It's just based on size. Destiny. And during all this, in the darkness of Makuta's lair beneath the island, Teradax grew anxious, seeking to stop the coming of the seventh Toa, whose powers of light would pose a significant threat to his shadow. Yeah, you don't want and that, so, Teradax. He was forced to unleash grotesque reptilian creatures known as Rakshi from the shadows, born from his own shadow and flesh to execute his will as the sons of Makuta. As Toa Gali Nuva meditated at the great... Okay, I, I'm getting way too into this. Because <laughs> I'm asking legit questions now. But why would Teradax, who at one point ruled the entire fucking world of the giant robot, he just had a fake... He, he like pretended to be the leader, but he ran, he ran everything. He was running it all. Why do this? Everything he's done has made his own power weak. He ruined the whole robot so he could be living in the shadows and have no... What was the fucking point? He had... He already was the leader. Great temple of Kininui. The ground beneath her split. Three Rakshi soaring outwards towards Takoro. With the urgent emergency alarm sounded, the Matoran of Takoro were ordered to evacuate the city immediately while Toa Tahu stood as the final defense against the onslaught. In the ensuing battle, Tahu was injured, his mask scratched by the poisoned staff of the Rakshi. Mm. Unable to continue his fight, Tahu was forced to flee as the Rakshi destroyed his home, Takoro, in their search for the Mask of Light. As the poison slowly oh God. spread throughout his body, infecting his mind, Tahu swore vengeance on Makuta and the Rakshi, watching a now-destroyed Takoro sink into the lava, never to be rebuilt. Makuta Teradax was equally angered, as Jalar and Takua had set off with the Mask of Light mere hours before his Rakshi attacked the village, and they had managed to slip from his grasp. Meanwhile, unaware of the ticking clock and Takoro's destruction, Jalar and Takua Tiggy. continued their quest to uncover the Seven Toa, unsure of where to go and what to do. As they <laughs> blindly followed the light of the mask, their journeys took them across the island, from Lake Hora, where they encountered Toa Liwa, and Kokoro, where they were rescued by the aloof Toa Kopaka from another set of unleashed Rakshi. As the Toa Nuva headed to the remains of Takoro to convene with Tahu and Gali, Takua and Jalar continued on, entering the dark tunnels to Onukoro for their next journey. In the depths of these catacombs, Takua was separated from Jalar, and was cornered by a mental projection of Makuta Teradax himself. Teradax threatened to kill Jalar should Takua not bring the Mask of Light to him. And while Takua refused Teradax's demands, he soon abandoned the quest, feeling the responsibility to protect both the mask and his friend was far too much for him. After a brief quarrel, Jala resolved to find the seventh Toa himself, accusing Takua of abandoning his duty yet again. All this time, Tahu and Gali continued to battle waves of Rakshi, desperately fighting them back as Liwa and Kopaka rushed to their okay. location. Okay. At this time, news of Takoro's destruction had not yet reached Onua and Pohatu, and the Rakshi's strength began to overwhelm the remaining Toa. Focus! Watching these battles through the eyes of his Rakshi, Focus! Makuta unleashed yet more Rakshi, who wielded the powers of fear, anger, and hunger in their rampage searching for the Mask of Light. Witnessing these new Rakshi soar through the air, Holly hurried to warn the Toa. But her warning what is was too late. Ambushed by the new Rakshi, Tahu was struck with a blast of anger, which mixed with the poison in the system, accelerating the Who's, infection. Okay, Tahu's As the red guy? rushed to pursue the Rakshi deep within Onukoro, Takua emerged alone in the subterranean city, admitting he had abandoned his quest and left Jalar alone with the Mask of Light. Okay. However, he was finally able to warn Bohatu and Tahu was a hothead. <laughs> and he arrived in the nick of time, for just then, the Rakshi burst through the walls of Onukoro, 
okay. seeking out the Mask of Light and following Takua's scent. Hot on their heels were the remaining Toanuba, who emerge in a climactic confrontation with the Rakshi. Struck with a blast of anger from the Rakshi, Tahu finally succumbed to the poison in his veins, oh, turning no. against his comrades in a fit of rage. During this fight, Takua barely escaped with his life, with Onua being forced to sacrifice I hope he becomes a good guy again in a after realizing the power of friendship to escape from the Rakshi. And so, with both Takoro and Onukoro utterly destroyed, Tahu barely contained by Kopaka's ice, and Jaller and Takua split up and adventuring alone, the fate of Matanui was more dire than ever. Part 4. Coming of the seventh Toa. All right, who's going to become the seventh Toa? After a traumatizing experience deep within Onukoro, Takua was overwhelmed with guilt and resolved to catch up with Jaller and rejoin him on his quest for the seventh Toa, especially after witnessing the Toa Nuva prove to be no match for the Rakshi when divided. Reuniting with Jaller, Takua apologized, promising to no longer... Pre-watched, I bet. But I bet this kid is going to become the seventh Toa. He's going to learn that the quest was inside him all along. And he's going to fucking put on the mask and he's going to be. What's his name? I don't remember his name. Blue mask guy. <laughs> Longer forsake his duty and continue Takua. to be on their quest. Yeah. Meanwhile, hiding out in healing pools besides a river, Gali concentrated on summoning all her power to purge the poison from Tahu's body. As she focused on cleansing Tahu, the other Toa continued the fight against the Rakshi, with Liwa nearly killed by a powerful combination of three Rakshi merged as one. Oh, jeez. Remember last chapter when the Toa Mata fused together into the powerful Toa Kaida yeah. and proceeded to destroy the Mata in the combined I guess, form of yeah. the three beings? Yeah. Well, they're not the only ones who can form Kaidas, <laughs> because the Rakshi can do it too. If oh, one shit. Rakshi was bad enough, just imagine <laughs> how dangerous three Rakshi merge into one being could be. And Monk could the, the Rakshi Kaida, the oh, God. that the slug-like Krata worms, housed within the Rakshi's armored shells, had the power to infect the minds of Matori, hinting at their true nature as spawn of Makuta. Over this time, Tahu was eventually healed, and the six Toa Nuva were finally united as one against the Rakshi. After much traveling, Takua and Jaller found themselves at the temple of Kininu. Mm -hmm. Taking the Mask of Light from go. Jaller, Takua held it in his hands, desperate for it to reveal the seventh Toa. Unexpectedly, a burst of light shot forth from the mask, destroying part of the temple to reveal a hidden carving underneath, a carving of Takua's own face. Oh, Before shit! To process that revelation, <laughs> the six Rakshi arrived at Kininu, <laughs> having finally caught up with Jaller and Takua. But they were not alone. Put on the mask, Takua. On the ground, the six Toa Nuva leapt into action, finally united as one powerful team with the poison cleanse from Tahu's body. Nice. Combining fire, air, and stone, Tahu, Liwa, and Pohatu formed a tornado of glass, sweeping through the Rakshi's ranks. Oh shit! Liwa and Tahu combined their powers to hurl molten lava at the remaining beasts, melting their armor and rendering the Krata slugs within powerless. But even with the combined unity of the Toa Nuva, they were too slow, and a Turok, Rakshi of fear. Managed to strike Takua with a powerful blast, paralyzing him with fear. Leaping Overcome your fear! Friend, Jaller rushed at the Rakshi with nothing but a standard knife, buying Takua enough based, time to regain his senses based but friendship. sacrificing himself in the process <laughs> and taking the full brunt of the two rocks attacks. Overwhelmed with the full might of the Rakshi, Jaller collapsed. His final Put the mask on! Takua to accept his destiny and don the Mask of Light. And so, in a stunning transformation, Takua knew exactly what he had to do. <laughs> Placing the mask of light over his own, a beam of light consumed his body, Holy transforming shit. him into the first Toa of Light, renamed Takanuva to reflect the honor bestowed upon this transformation. And so, in silence, Takanuva picked up Jaller's lifeless body and left Kininui to grieve alone. Part 5. Duty of the Seventh Toa. Bro, this is what I have. This is the Toa of Light. But I can't build it because it didn't come with instructions. Some time later, Takanuva spoke with Taragavakama about his destiny, promising that Jaller's sacrifice was not in vain and resolving to descend into Teradax's lair and confront him once and for all. Instructing the Toa Nuva to wait for his return, Takanuva descended into the tunnels alone convinced it was his sole duty to finally defeat the evil of Teradax. Unbeknownst to him, Holly snuck aboard his craft He's doing it solo? Rakshi armor to 
determined to chronicle his exploits as the new chronicler of Mata Nui now that Takua had been transformed. <laughs> Takanuva had no choice but to let her come along, warning her to hang back as he ventured into the inner sanctum of Teradax's Is this a Giga Chad now? As the Makuta's voice echoed throughout the chamber, Teradax emerged from the darkness, revealing himself to Takanuva and Holly. Resolved to defeat the Makuta and reawaken Mata Nui once and for all, Takanuva ordered Holly to go back to the surface and summon all the Matoran to the lair to witness the defeat of Teradax. Oh god. And so, Takanuva alone faced Teradax, who challenged him to a mock Koli match, taunting him that mentally he was still just a lowly Matoran, just the <laughs> fearful Takua who he had confronted in the cave. And so, as the population of the island slowly descended into the tunnels, the Toa Nuva protecting them from all sides, the battle between light and shadow commenced. Holy Pearling shit. balls of shadow at Takanuva, Teradax proved to be a formidable opponent, countering Takanuva's blast of light with his own opposing balls of shadow. As the fight went on, <laughs> neither balls. opponent losing ground, Takanuva and Teradax found they were equally matched as they stumbled into a pit of energized protodermis. The mysterious oh, no. mutagen that was housed They're gonna mutate the again. <laughs> and after a moan of suspense, Takuta Nuva, a new merged being, arose from the pool. Oh my god. Light and shadow had become one. And in a brief moment, the consciousness of both Takanuva and Teradax had been overrun with a singular drive to protect the great spirit robot and reawaken Mata Nui. In his new merged form between Makuta and Takanuva, Takuta Nuva opened the gate to Metru Nui, Takuta allowing Nuva. the denizens of Mata Nui to flood the passageway back to their original home. As Holly rushed through the doorway, Jaller's mask in hand, Takuta Nuva stopped her, fueling what remained of his life force into the mask and resurrecting Jaller in his Matoran form. Pause time. So this action is pretty hotly contested throughout the community, and for good reason. As you can probably guess, it's kind of debatable that a being like Takutanuva even had the power, ability, or knowledge to resurrect a dead member of the That's Matoran debatable? Universe. Now, if you go into the official explanation, it has something to do with the Red Star being a booster pack holding the quote-unquote digital souls of all the members of the Matoran universe, and somehow he was able to revive it just for that one moment to resurrect Jaller, but... Honestly, it's kind of just something you have to accept. And thankfully, <laughs> this never actually happens again. What is that? <laughs> that is like so... I've accepted a lot of things. That wasn't any different to me. That was... <laughs> that In no way was that outlandish compared to what I've seen. <sighs> again, the entire Bionicle story. And so for a Lego theme that ran for 10 years... I can honestly accept it as just one of the very few retcons that the story had to include over its 10 year long run. Especially if you compare it to something like Ninjago, which retcons itself multiple <laughs> times every few years, this is a pretty minor- Oh, watch your fucking mouth, okay? We're still a Ninjago stream at heart. <laughs> hey, watch your fucking mouth, bro. It's a fucking- <laughs> This is not a competition. Don't try to fucking split the people, alright? <laughs> Oh, I didn't know there was a Bionicle Ninjago fucking uh, war, bro. Comparison, and everything else about the story is very, very tight and locked down. So I can kind of excuse just this one small little resurrection because obviously... Everything else about the story is tight Lego and locked down. Lego wary about killing off a character on screen permanently in one of their first feature films. So I can see why they didn't do that. With oh his energy God. expended, Takuta Nuva collapsed under the gate. Makuta's antidermis spirit separated from his armor housing and Takanuva's spirit housed within the Mask of Light. As the mask glowed with light and Takanuva's body was reformed from this combination, a light shone across the Silver Sea, revealing the long-lost island of Metru Nui, their original island home. Wow, it's back. And as the population of Mata Nui returned to the surface, the Turaga held a grand meeting, revealing the ancient origins of their history as the Toa Metru, the tales of the great city of Metru Nui, and began preparations to reclaim the old metropolis. With the Matoran sailing off across the Silver Sea to repopulate Metru Nui and restart the brain of the robot, the denizens of the Matoran universe were now one step closer to reawakening the great spirit Mata Nui once and for all. And while the spirit of Teradax still survived in Antidermis' gaseous form, he would need time to rebuild and regain strength, and thus began a long-awaited time of peace for the Matoran. Wow. On the shores of Metru Nui, the Matoran migration from Mata Nui began. Wow. Old friends were reunited, with Turaga Duma and the Rahaga emerging from the city to <laughs> greet the new population. 
New buildings were built, and the great forges of Tom. Metri All right, I gotta ask the question: Who the fuck are the Rahaga and the Tar Taraga Duma? I know he said them before. I I can't. I couldn't tell you. I have no fucking idea, bro. What is the What is the Rahaga? They were so important. Check your notes. Did I write anything about these guys? Listen, I know that Akmau is devious. <laughs> That's it, bro. That's, I wrote Trend Crom frickin' laser beams. <laughs> the Iron Tribe, two memories. Through shown with fire once again. The city of legends, Metru Nui, was finally restored with its full population. I'll figure it out. I'll catch up. And Toa ready themselves for a new era of light and hope. Previously on Bionicle Retold, Chapter 5. Maybe they'll light. cover it here. Rise of the Toa Nuva. An ancient failsafe resulted in the reawakening of the formidable Borak Kal, who sought to free the Barag queens from their imprisonment. Yeah, we saw in that already. In the battle, Tahu activated the legendary Kanohi Vahi. Mask of Time, freezing the Borakal and allowing the Toa Nuva to gain the upper hand. In a brief time of peace that followed, Matora and Mykali, Huki, and Jaller trained to compete in a grand Koli tournament, while Takua Bro, stumbled this is actually a full recap. Come on. We Bokki, just watched this. Mask of Light. But with brighter light came darker shadows, and out of the darkness came the dreaded Rakshi, servants of the evil Makuta Pterodax. In a quest that spanned across the island, Jaller and Takua sought to discover and awaken the seventh Toa, only to find that Takua himself was destined to transform Good shit, into Takua. Takanuva, Toa of Light. After descending into the darkness to face Pterodax himself, Takanuva claimed a major victory over the Makuta, shattering his armor and paving a way back to the city of legends, Metru Nui. Great. And so, as the Matoran began a great migration back to their original homeland, great. they were unaware that Teradax had survived in the form of his anti-dermis spirit. No. The darkness was on the horizon. This is Bionicle Retold. <laughs> Let's go! Everyone here called out of work, right? Call out of work, call out of school, quit class. Told your significant other. Taking a break. <laughs> Chapter six. Good. The Ignition Good. Trilogy, part one. Divorced for this? <laughs> Got fired for this? Part one, the Daggers of Death. Mm. After 1,000 years of darkness, the Matoran had finally migrated back to their island home of Metru Nui. Nice. As the Matoran worked with Taraga Duma, the Rahaga, and Kitongu to rebuild the once great city of legends. Okay, I guess that's what Taraga it was. Taraga Nuju observed the stars and learned a grim <sighs> truth. After 1,000 years in disrepair, the great spirit Mata Nui was dying, and their efforts to rebuild and restart Metru Nui, the brain of the robot, were too little, too late. It was here that Taraga Duma told the Toa Nuva of the ancient Kanohi Ignika, the Mask of Life, oh, and yeah. its power as a failsafe to restart oh, yeah. the Matoran universe and save... Now, let me, let me give you guys a quick recap. Let me jump in. <laughs> let me jump in before he does. See, the Mask of Life is one of three important masks in the Bionicle lore. And uh, this one is particularly important because uh, a... Toa can sacrifice their life with the Mask of Life to restart the spirit of the robot, the great robot. So it's pretty important. It's like jumping on a grenade for the team. Um. So be ready for that. Mata Nui from death. Recap time. In chapter one beginnings, <laughs> we explained that there were three legendary Kanohi masks. The most important of which was the Kanohi Ignika, whose important role was to kickstart the mature universe and the great spirit's life should its life force ever dwindle. The way it works is that any member of the mature universe can wear the Ignika on their face, yeah. thus absorbing their life energy and sacrificing themselves to kickstart the universe, thus saving the entire world and yeah, the Yeah, bro, life. we already know Still that. I said it already. In the remote island sphere of Voya Nui after all these years, the mask of life lay dormant waiting for a savior to appear and kickstart the rebirth of the Matoran universe. Known as the Island of Doom or the Daggers of Death, 
Voya Nui was the tucked island away of doom in a or the daggers of, of death surrounded by treacherous waters and hostile lands the only safe way to reach the island was by toa canisters and so the six toa nuva set off you better buy some more on the mysterious island to claim the mask of life and save the great spirit from death while Takanuva stayed behind to protect metro Nui Damn. from absence Meanwhile, the light the toa is the most badass for the long journey to Voya Nui, trouble began to brew back on the now abandoned island of Mata Nui. Six dark hunters of the Skakti race heard rumors that Makuta Teradax had been hip hop <laughs> and many treasures lay in the Dark Lord's former lair. So as a quick refresher from <laughs> chapter two, the Skakti were a race of beings that started out as very peaceful. Yeah, but after being they went psychotic. I know by the Makuta, they turned into vicious and brutal warriors. In an effort to curb this violence, the Makuta made it so that each Skakti had innate elemental abilities. But they could only use it in conjunction with another Skakti, which means that at the very Skakti. least, two of them had to work together to actually use their powers. In Chapter 4, we met a green-skinned Skakti named Zaktan, who was a member of the Dark Hunters. I don't and know that. During a mission for them, I don't remember that. They inadvertently discovered traces of Makuta Teradax's grand plan to take over the entire universe, which he vowed to use that information for himself. As of right now, Zaktan is one of the only beings who at least has an idea of what Teradax's plan is, and even us as the viewers don't know the full aspect <laughs> of it. Years ago, Zaktan plotted with some of these fellow Skakti to overthrow the Shadowed One and take over the Dark Hunters with him in command. After reaching the inner chamber of the Shadowed One, their betrayal was uncovered, and in an attempt to execute Zaktan for his betrayal, the Shadowed One assaulted him with his disintegrating ideas. To his surprise, Zaktan's body instead dissolved into billions of protodytes, microscopic Rahi that now formed the entirety of Zaktan's body. As these insectoid creatures never stopped moving, Zaktan's body always appeared to be writhing, and each protodyte contained a portion of his consciousness and could function independently of his body as a whole. The Shadowed One surprises the rest, let them live, with Zaktan's mutated and deformed state serving as a reminder to never betray him again. Over time, Zaktan learned to use his new form to his own advantage. <laughs> I was texting Ari something about food, and someone said, no phones in class. <laughs> You're not my fucking teacher, okay? <laughs> Only this guy's my teacher. Allowing him to send parts Loop. of himself on the attack as a swarm, fly unhampered through the air, evade physical attacks more easily, and even slip through spaces too small for an insect. These six Skakti, led by Zaktan, officially broke off from the Dark Hunters, forming their own group called Paraka. It's always six. It's always six. That roughly translates to murderer or gangster thug. <laughs> and so, after sneaking away. Wait, when was this? Was this like fucking 2002, 2003? peak of like super hyper uh you know like g unit white people just loving hip-hop getting into it yeah gangster 2005 oh man that's so funny wait is there a song i actually kind of want to hear it wait How is this two minutes long? 
Baraka. Yeah. You can't ever get us, Baraka. No. We run the streets, who? Baraka. Yeah. What I say, Baraka, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One more time. Wait. Uh, I will say this. If Tupac hadn't been shot, this would have killed him. <laughs> okay, let's get back to the let's get back to the main video. Uh, away from the Dark Hunter Fortress on Undina under the cover of night, these Paracas scheme to loot Teradax's former lair, get rich with powerful artifacts, and cash out. Besides their Paraka, go Zach Paraka. Dan, this gang of villainous thugs comprised of Thok, a gangster and thug is so who funny, exploited conflict between the team and used it for his own benefit. Avak, a talented engineer with a powerful psychic ability to project the perfect living prison for his enemies. Radak, an intelligent, famed hunter with extraordinary tracking abilities. Hakan, an egotistical, cruel, and unpredictable brute disliked by many of his fellow Parakas. And Vezok, who is arguably the most dangerous of them all, with a calm and collected personality, yeah, he looks dangerous. With excellent tactical skills, and a high intelligence. As these former dark hunters arrived at Teradax's Mangea lair, they came upon his body, crushed and mangled by the fallen gate. Unaware of the true nature of the Makuta, the Paraka happily ventured onwards, ready to claim the treasures within. When Radak attempted to steal the Kanohi Krakan, Mask of Shadows, it revolted against his touch, activating an automatic defense mode to hurl bolts of shadow at any being other than a Makuta that tried to access it. Right. And so, giving up on the Krakan, the Paraka ventured deeper into the lair, coming across more and more ancient tools and weapons. One of these artifacts was the mysterious Spear of Fusion, created cool. centuries ago by Artaka with the power to merge beings together or split them apart. Right. Toying around with the spear, Hakan accidentally set it off in reverse upon Vezok, oh, you splitting fool. him in two. In Vezok's place were now two beings, a deformed half-being they dubbed Vezon, who was imbued with Vezok's tactical thinking but driven completely <laughs> mad, and what was left of Vezok, whose once calm, intelligent, and collected nature had disappeared. Damn, that's fucked up. A brutish, rage-filled being. <laughs> he just fucking destroyed him. The rage-filled Vezok attacked Vezon in a blind rage, and in the commotion that followed, the ancient Monaco Rahi awakened, guardians of who? Makuta's lair. As the Paraka fled Mangaya, the gaseous Paraka, go Paraka! implanting the idea into their heads to travel to Voyanui and claim the Mask of Life. <laughs> the Paraka, unaware that Teradax had given them the idea, decided to seek out the mask for fame, glory, and power, unknowing of Makuta's... Why would anyone want the Mask of Life, including Teradax? The only use it has is to kill yourself, to save the world. Paraka, go Paraka. It's <laughs> true purpose for the Mask of Life. As a recap of Chapter 2, the Makuta species evolved to no longer actually have any organic components. Instead, every Makuta exists in the form of what we call an antidermis spirit, which yeah. means that they can essentially possess any suit of armor or purely robotic yeah, being. Yeah, I'm aware. But that also means that if their spirit were to be left too out in the open for too long, then they would eventually die. However, this comes with an added benefit, because essentially the Makuta are like ghosts, which means they can act as spirits and influence the minds of others in their vicinity to do their bidding. <laughs> as the six original Paraka scattered and fled from the Monaco, Vazon took advantage of the commotion to seize the Spear of Fusion for himself, and began a journey to Voya Nui on his own. As the rest of the Paraka emerged on the shores of the island of Mata Nui, they discovered the original six canisters the Toa Mata used to travel Holy to the shit. island. Formulating a cunning scheme, Zaktan suggested that when the Paraka arrive on Voya Nui, they fool any native Matoran claiming to be a unique breed of Toa heroes, sent to protect and lead them. Oh, they faked it. As they it. began preparations to arrive on Voya Nui, Hakan secretly sent a message detailing their plans to the Shadowed One leader of the Dark Hunters, in the hopes that selling out his teammates would earn him a reward. <laughs> one by one, the Paraka arrived on Voya Nui, claiming to be Toa. 
It's Matorin, who had not encountered Toa since Jovan had led his team there in the Great Disruption, believed the Paraka's ruse, although some had their misgivings due to the blatant violence the Paraka displayed. <laughs> Immediately claiming to be their saviors, the Paraka put the Matoran to work to drain the Lake of Lava and construct a massive stronghold. Within this Paraka stronghold, Zaktan collected I bet you could buy that. <laughs> energies in a large vat, though he did not realize its Strongholds are a great toy to sell. ...and preserve the life of the Makuta, which had anchored to the Paraka <laughs> back in Mangaya Lair. As Zaktan spent more and more time alone in the darkness of the stronghold, under the thrall of the spirit of Makuta Teradax, he began to ponder dark designs, evil contraptions, and mm. mysterious science. Who hasn't? Zaktan summoned Avak to his chamber to create strange launchers from mysterious ideas planted in his head by Teradax, one of which was stolen by the Matoran Garan, who grew more and more suspicious of the Paracas presence on Voyanui. Meeting with a few other trusted Matoran, Garan examined the launcher, realizing it was a weapon constructed to fight the Matoran themselves. Realizing the Matoran were growing suspicious of them, Hakan and Avak joined together to create a creature of fire and stone, summoning it to attack the Matoran near the base of Mount Valmai. Okay. While Hakan controlled it, Avak drove it away from the villagers, pretending to defend the Matoran. The two false Toa boldly <laughs> defeated the monster, winning the admiration of the Matoran at large. And yet, oh, they Garan faked and his it, companion I see. Balta remained suspicious, following the Paraka and overhearing them discuss their past as dark hunters. <laughs> Appalled, Garan officially formed the Voya Nui resistance team in their mountain <laughs> hideaway, consisting of himself, Balta, and four other Matoran named Kazi, Dalu, Oh, there's Hiraka, four more. <laughs> there's six total, the huh? In prologue to this series, we revealed that Velika was actually no normal Matoran. In fact, Velika is the great being in disguise. Okay, I was going to guess and I was wrong. <laughs> I thought I remembered. I thought Velika was like fucking um, someone else. <laughs> but I, I remembered. I remembered that uh, she was something. Who actually is responsible for giving sentience to the entire Matori so universe. So that's God? And so you may be wondering what he's doing just kind oh, of him. running around on Voya Nui. Well, essentially, he joined the Matoran resistance team mostly just to observe his so-called creations and to see how they interact with each other and how well the Matoran could fight back. Another thing to note about Velika and the rest of the Matoran on Voya Nui is that every single Matoran on that island was actually sent there by Karzani, the Mad Titan. Right. In I forgot one, about Karzani. Artaka and Karzani, <laughs> the brothers, had a rivalry. And Karzani, who was given right. his own realm and a job to repair all Matoran, was slowly driven insane. It was and the Joker robot. Matoran, he instead just mutilated them and gave them weapons to compensate. So essentially, these Matoran are a lot shorter and more deformed than your normal Matoran, but they have pretty powerful tools and weapons to fight back against anyone who would attack them. So, Of course, every Matoran sent to Voyanui was sent from Karzani's land before he was driven even more mad and just closed off his gates and took all the Matoran in that he had still left as his own servants. And we'll get to that in a second. Okay. Meanwhile, Zaktan's plan was nearing completion. Okay. Under the influence of Teradax, Zaktan created thin Zamor spheres of antidermis. Dude, that is a great question. Every new piece of biological information that unwillingly gets planted in my head is displacing something else. <laughs> what memories am I losing <laughs> to put this shit in, dude? and realized it had the power to bend the mind of any Matoran, turning them into feeble-minded slaves. Placing a prominent Matoran leader under their sway, the Paraka ordered him to gather all the Matoran for a meeting, where they plotted to place the entire there goes the wedding. under the sway of Teradax. <laughs> and so, that night, all but the six members of the- I literally made that exact comment an hour ago and you didn't read it. I'm fucking sorry. I'm sorry, EJ Cook. Oh, poor you, dude. People are making the same fucking joke for three and four hours now. Jesus Christ. <laughs> the Matoran resistance had gathered together, and with the power of Avax's new Zamorosphere launchers, the Paraka succeeded in enslaving the minds of nearly every Voyam Nui Matoran. Tragically, the Matoran resistance team was too late, and as they returned to their village, they discovered the entire populace transformed into mindless slaves, laboring day and night to end the volcano. As Matoran fell into the lava and perished, or were outright killed by the Paraka for working too slow. Paraka, go Paraka! I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm pausing one more time. 
I feel like within 48 hours, all of this will be out of my head except for Go Paraka. <laughs> I think if there is one thing of this whole thing that's going to be sticking with me, it's going to be the Go Paraka song. That's going to be stuck in my head for 10 years. That'll probably never get out of my head and everything else here will drop instantly. And that wasn't even part of this video. That was a separate video I had to fucking watch. ...in darkness and disrepair, its only hope was the powerful team of Toa Nuva en route to the island, guardians of peace and justice. Part 2, Fall of the Toa Nuva. Mm. After traveling through the oceans around Voya Nui, the Toa Nuva finally made landfall on the west coast of the mysterious island, unaware of the dangers now present on the island. Moving inland, they were spotted by Hakan and Radak, who attacked the Toa Nuva with a hail of boulders that kickstarted a massive battle between the two forces. Even with all six Toa Nuva against just two Paraka, the battle was vicious, and neither side managed to gain the upper hand. Hearing the sounds of battle on the far side of the island, the rest of the Paraka <laughs> rushed to join the I'm fight. Sorry. I have to pause again. <laughs> I'm just desperately trying to get Ari to get food. And so I'm, I'm checking my text. And... You guys remember Keith, the sponsorship guy? He helped me with all the... He did, like, um, the Minion sponsorship. He would be in here and, like... All right, well, he hasn't brought... I mean, you know, for understandable reasons, he hasn't brought me a sponsorship in eight months, <laughs> nine months. But he texted me now with a picture of the Veil's chat message saying, Takuma and Takama, these nerds need to learn about Labia and Majora. And he said, I've never laughed harder at a chat comment. <laughs> this, is, this is my bro's like first message to me in months. <laughs> bro, I want a deal. I want a fucking sponsorship deal. <laughs> You're lurking, kid. You're lurking my fucking... <laughs> Is he wrong? Is he wrong? Unaware that in this disruption, <laughs> Balta, a member of the newly formed Matoran resistance team, had Give me a bionicle deal, bro. We're in. Spheres to study them. Uh. Radak proved to be almost unstoppable, causing the Toa to concentrate on him while the other Paraka arrived. Unaware of the Paraka's abilities, the battle quickly went south for the Toa Nuva. Hakan defeated Gali with a mental blast, Avak imprisoned Toa in the perfect jail. And after a brief but intense sword fight, Tahu was overwhelmed by Zaktan's prototype swarm. Liwa, Pohatu, and Onua finally downed Radak, but were subsequently defeated by the other Paraka, with Liwak's arrow blade snapped completely in half. In an instant, the battle was over just as it began, with the Toa Nuva completely overwhelmed by the surprise attack. That's kind of crazy. Them of their mass and weapons, the Paraka beat the main the heroes Paraka straight up the easy? Toa's lifeless bodies into the fiery depths of Mount Valmai. Meanwhile, back on Metru Nui, Paraka Jaro became OP. suspicious about the prolonged disappearance of the Toa Nuva and attempted to question the Turaga, who refused to answer him. Furious, he ordered a strike in the city, ordering all reconstruction work to stop until the truth was revealed. Knowing that news of the rapidly approaching death of the great spirit Mata Nui would destabilize the Matoran populace and spread panic, the Turaga refused to relent, only stating the Toa were away on a great mission and urging Union. the Matoran to return to work. <laughs> <laughs> However, Turaga no Kama pitied Jowler and secretly informed him of the dire consequences of the Toa Nuva's quest and the fact that it had been many months without any word from the famed heroes. And so, Jowler decided to take the initiative and set off for Voya Nui to help the Toa Nuva with a team of five other Matoran. Among this company was Hala. It's always gotta be six. It's gotta be Kongu, six. Who had aided the Toa in their previous adventures. Kongu. The captain of the Lake Horo Gekko Air Force who led efforts the Lake against Lake Horo Gekko Air Force. Ago. Nuparu, the Onu Matoran engineer who created the powerful boxer to use against Oh, I remember the those. Dog. I remember those. Uki, the sports champion of Pokoro. And Matoru, <laughs> the translator to Turaga Nuju and soul keeper. Just the, the sports champion? They just put the he fucking Bionicle Messi in there for no Tora reason? Of Light, who was eager for an adventure. The Matoran and Takanuva traveled through an underwater chute to find themselves on a narrow strip of land in the south of Metru Nui's dome. After scouting ahead for some time, Jaller found a tunnel leading to the south. He could not tell what was beyond it, and Takanuva decided that, as a Toa, he should go in first. Yeah. When he ventured forth into the tunnel, however, he vanished from sight, despite the bright light he was exuding. Despite repeated efforts, the mysterious tunnel seemed to absorb all light and sound. 
After several failed attempts to pass through the tunnel, Jaller instructed his friends to travel through in groups of three. Jaller, Huki, and Kongu went first and immediately disappeared from view. Nuparu told the remaining two, Huki and Matoro, to tie themselves together so they would not get lost. In the darkness of this mysterious passageway, Matoro felt a presence clutch his hand. Okay. Initially scared, Matoro realized okay. that it meant him no harm. I got food coming. I, that's a big relief. Also seeking a way out of the tunnel. Okay. And so, as they ventured on, Matoro gripped the hand of this mysterious stranger, leading them onwards. He emerged to find Takanuva and the rest in front of him, but as he turned to see who had grabbed his hand, the stranger let go and disappeared back into the tunnel. To not alert his fellow companions, Matoro chose not to mention this peculiar event, and the company continued onwards. I'm focusing, I'm focusing. By land. Little did he know, but this mysterious presence was actually the consciousness of the Kanohi Ignika, Mask of Life itself. Mm -hmm. Seeking a new bearer, the mask had decided to test the morality and worthiness of Matoro, who had passed this first test by being willing to help a complete stranger when he himself was in a time of need and what a surrounded hero. by darkness. Back on Metro Nui, Taraga Duma discovered that Takanuva, Jalar, and his companions had left for Boya Nui. Enraged, he summoned the Taraga to his chambers and accused one of them of revealing their secret. Finally, Nokama stepped forward, confessing she had informed Jalar of the Toa Nuva's Wait, quest, why? but had not anticipated he would set out for Voya Nui and take the city's last defense, Takanuva, with him. In the shadows around Metro Nui, the Dark Hunters, led by the Shadowed One, searched for the Mask of Time. Realizing that the city Time. was undefended, okay. they prepared to strike. Okay. Meanwhile, on Voya Nui, the Matoran resistance team were holed up in their mountain hideaway on the slopes of Mount Valmai, anxiously awaiting Balta's return with the intel gained from the Paraka stronghold. Okay. They were interrupted by Piruk, who brought <laughs> bad news. Five of the Paraka were coming their way, oh, no! by six strangers. You're going to get fucked. These strangers, of course, were the powerless Toa Nuva, who Zaktan had ordered to be thrown in the burning fires of the volcano. Just then, the ground shook and the volcano erupted, disturbed by the nonstop mining underneath. As the Paraka fled the molten lava, the Toa Nuva began to slowly regain consciousness. Wait, Taku they're not dead? Up to Pohatu, who raised walls of stone to keep the lava at bay. With little time to spare, Liwa carried Gali to safety as Pohatu helped Onua to his feet. Liwa During carried scramble, Gali to Kopata safety as Pohatu helped as Onua. Northwest to escape the hot lava. As the maskless, weaponless Toa Nuva <laughs> Maskless? They were watched and followed by the Matoran resistance team, who had mistaken them for allies of the Paraka. And so, just as the Toa Nuva made their way down to safety, they were confronted by the Matoran resistance team. And despite their efforts to explain that they were Toa, Tahu and the others failed to convince Garan and his team. Oh my god, this is false Toa. It's relentless. The There's no breaks. A quick skirmish broke out between the two groups. He's the melting my brain. The Matoran, but easily I can't due to grasp it. State. To buy the Toa some time to discuss strategy, Tahu generated a wall of fire, but it was too late. Gali was hit by Dalu's enhanced weapons. Gali was hit by Dalu's weapons. Degree and drove her into madness. Who's and Dalu? Outraged, Kopaka proceeded through the wall of fire and quickly <laughs> froze three of the Matoran, while Tahu attempted to subdue a now mad Gali as she rampaged through the wilderness. Onua and Liwa kept Kopaka from using lethal force, and the battle came to an uneasy pause where the Toa once again attempted to explain who they were. But the wary Matoran would not budge, and the two sides ready for combat once again. Okay. Near the base of the mountain, Balta fled with a Zammersphere in tow. What's a Zammersphere? The Vezok who chased him in a brute rage. Terrified, Balta hid inside a cave, which was promptly sealed shut by Vezok, leaving him there to die. Just as Balta was about <laughs> to slip into unconsciousness, a mighty axe cleaved the cave oh, entrance shit. Into, and he stood facing the Titan Axon member of the Order of Matanui, who had been stationed on the island years ago. Well, like a Axon million years ago, right? To go to his friends and tell them to stop fighting the Toa Nuva, and then departed. Encountering Gali stumbling through the woods, Axon healed Axon! her mind with the of truth, and sent her back to join the other Toa Nuva, promising to reveal himself and his intentions when the time was right. If you recall from chapter four, Axon, <laughs> the guy wielding an axe, yeah. and Brutaka, the brutish looking guy, hey, were helpful the two names. Order of Mata helpful Nui names. members stationed on the island of Voya Nui, who were essentially the sworn protectors of the Mask of Life. Of the Mask, Unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately, during the Great Cataclysm, Brutaka lost his faith in Mata Nui, oh, believing that the Great Spirit terrible. had forsaken them and slowly falling closer and closer into darkness. 
Axon, on the other hand, he kept his faith. steadfast in his resolve and essentially stayed as the sole protector hey, good of man. the Damascus good man, as well as the Matoran of Voyanui. During this time, Axon has been biding his time and essentially trying to decide what is the right time to strike against the Paraka, whereas Brutaka was beginning a downward spiral into darkness, harboring ideals to claim the mask of Drinking. life for himself. Drugs. Back at the base of the mountain, the Toa Nuva found themselves in a standoff against the Matoran, right as Balta rushed in and urged his comrades to stop fighting the Toa Nuva. As a show of faith, Onua removed his armor, making himself vulnerable in front of the Matoran and promising he would not <laughs> fight back should they attack him. Dude, Convinced it would be so funny if this guy... <laughs> The, yeah, the longer it goes, the more he started throwing in made-up shit. <laughs> It'd be funny if he based the first hour on the fucking movies and then realized no one would know and just kept fucking spinning. Because a lot of these clips have been the same for fucking four hours. Gesture, Garan ordered the rest of the Matoran to stand down, and the two factions allied against the Paraka. During all of this, the Paraka themselves were facing some internal conflicts of their own. Angered that the rest of the gang hadn't confirmed the Toa Nuva were dead, Zakan lashed out at the rest of the Paraka, ordering them to find and kill the Toa Nuva at all costs and have the Matoran. Ooh, work the bad guys never win the second fight. The they Not never win the second the mystery fight. Mystery of what happened to Vazon and where he went. As Zakan left the stronghold, the devious Hakan lurked behind him, curious as to why Zakan was so urgently attempting to claim the Mask of Life. Hakan discovered Zakan deep in conversation with the mysterious Brutaka. Axon's former companion, and watched as Brutaka was struck with a Xamar Sphere that, to Hakan's surprise, I don't know what a Xamar Sphere is, I swear to God. Rather than susceptible and weak willed. Zaktan, who knew all along Hakan was trailing him, made efforts to lead him closer to Brutaka in his angered state, hoping the Titan would dispose of Hakan for him. During all this conflict on the island, the brave company of Jaller, Takanuva, Matoro, yeah. and the rest of the Matoran ventured onwards over the dangerous land passageways to Voya Nui. Yeah. They proceeded along a narrow land bridge, surrounded by a violent ocean, and neared a stone archway, leading to a dizzying path that ran between two mountains. Okay. There, Huki discovered a great Hookie. mask, left over from a fallen warrior, and alerted There's his There's always friends. masks. Takanuva tried it on, and hearing Holly's thoughts, realized it was a Suletu, Mask of Telepathy. <laughs> the group then stopped to rest, Jaller keeping first watch while Takanuva scouted ahead. Plagued with confusion and fear over his experience in the tunnel, Matora was restless, and in the dark of night, he reached out to Jaller to discuss his fears, but was interrupted by Takanuva's return. He had seen a Matoran on the other side of the archway, and so the group moved closer to the arch. As the six Matoran passed through the gateway, yes. Takanuva was repelled back by an invisible force field, which then blocked the Matoran from field. returning back. As the group realized the barrier was built to keep Matoran in and beings of light out, Takanuva gave up and began his return to Metru Nui. Nowhere else to go. <laughs> he just gave up. Meanwhile, the Matoran <laughs> proceeded along the path, unsure of what dangers awaited them in this mysterious land and why the invisible gateway had herded and locked them in. <laughs> Part three. Oh God, that was a big part. That part was really draining me. Without their Toa protector and friend, <laughs> I need a new episode. I need because you start. I need a recap. Actually, I need a recap. This one's been hard. A vast cliff. As scuttling noises were heard all around them, they were beckoned. I need a recap, bro. Soon, quickly surrounded by an escort of Manas Rahu, the powerful beast who once guarded Teradax's lair. Okay. Their Matoran guide led them into a huge. Cabin, that part was hard. Populated by more twisted and anguished Matoran where common laws of nature did not seem to apply. Mm -hmm. A volcano erupted in burning ice. Screams echoed from the ground itself. Volcano and ice are always together in this show. Holly observed a terrible metal castle far in the distance, comparable in size to the Colosseum of Metru Nui and covered with twisted and jagged towers. Soon enough, they encountered the mad titan Karzani. Karzani! From the legends of Taragatoa. Holy shit! Again, to recap chapter one beginnings, Karzani was one of the most powerful beings created the Joker the bot. Matoran universe by the great beings, whose job was to repair damaged Matoran and send them back to their respective homelands. However, after suffering a humiliating defeat at the hands of his brother Artaka for the Mask of Creation, Karzani was driven more and more insane, and after the great beings departed, he began to lose his skill of repairing Matoran, just mutilating them and giving them weapons to compensate. Yeah. Because of this shame, he began first sending Matoran to Voyanui, which is why all the Matoran on Voyanui 
look kind of deformed and are wielding very strange weapons. And after this, as Turaga realized that any Matoran sent to Karzani's land was never sent back, they began to just block off all paths of entry to his land, which drove Karzani even more insane and caused him to enslave all of the remaining Matoran he had right. on his island as his own personal Not a great guy. Karzani has essentially remained there to this day and has been completely unaware of any of the extra. Well, this is like a million years ago. Just sticking to his own. In team. real life, and As more than that in this game. companions were brought before Karzani, the mad titan <laughs> confirmed the legends about him were true, but did not recognize the names of Makuta or Matanui. At his order, strange and grotesque Matoran emerged from the darkness to take off. Oh, shit. And Karzani ordered Jaller and the rest to take off their masks. In a show of defiance, Jala refused, stating his mask had once belonged to the great Toa Lee Khan and would never be separated from Oh, he's got Lee Khan's mask. Response, I forgot about Lee Khan, dude. Lee Khan's Lee the goat. The mask of alternate futures to force a vision on Jala and the rest, depicting what would have happened had he not sacrificed his life for Takua months ago in their battle with the Rakshi. Startled and overwhelmed by the horrific vision, Jala took <laughs> off his mask and succumbed to the rule of Karzani. Oh, geez. Just then, Matoran workers brought the company sets of strange new masks as symbols of their identities being stripped away in servitude to Karzani. Only Kongu managed to avoid this mask, okay. slipping on the Suletu they had found abandoned on the path earlier. Karzani then ordered all of them to tend to the fires, with the exception of the chronicler Holly, who was to tell Karzani of the goings on in the outside world. Okay. As the rest of the Matoran were sent to a colossal firmus, Holly engaged in deep conversation about the current events of the Matoran universe, explaining to Karzani the dire mission to save Mata Nui. Karzani, of course, scoffed at this mission, believing none in the universe to be more powerful than himself and Artaka, and not believing any tales whatsoever of the great spirit Mata Nui. Okay. As the hours passed, Wasn't he alive when Mata Nui was... ...and sat down on a rock, only to hear it scream underneath as her feet slowly began to turn to stone. After Holly recoiled in fear, the mad titan Karzani began to chuckle, warning her that all the rocks around them were once Matoran, forcibly turned to stone. Jesus for Christ. For no work. In the meantime, Jesus the Christ. other five Matoran managed to slip away from their mindless work at the furnace, discovering a stone tablet that detailed Karzani's fall to madness and his original purpose in the universe. Realizing their lives were in immediate danger, this is like Karzani hell in a Lego leave, Bionicle Jara comic. And the other four Matoran made haste to escape the realm immediately desperately searching for any exit in their search they yeah, Ari's calling me <laughs> you know what's funny <laughs> hold that thought <laughs> hey babe oh you're in class are you gonna uh get food or anything oh okay I do uh yeah whatever you think is good uh, I've sort of been in class myself so um no, nah, it's just we've both been learning. Uh, okay, I will. Yeah, you get whatever you think is good. Get whatever you think is good. Yeah, well, if you don't want anything, I, I can order. I just want you to, if you're hungry, get something for both of us. But only if you're hungry. If not, I'll just order. So just text me. All right, bye, babe. Just tell me. Text me. Whew, both of us just putting in the hours in class. What was I gonna say? Oh, I was gonna say, is like, um, stumbled upon an old mysterious Avmatoran who, despite being completely insane, managed to explain that he was once the builder of all Toa canisters <laughs> back in the. This is like, this is basically what religion is. <laughs> At least to me, it's just some dude made it all, and they just ramble. You know, they just made a fucking nine-hour fucking lore. This guy did this thing, and this guy did this thing, and and then, but like, we treat that very seriously. And then this is like, oh, it's just bionicle. The Avmatoran <laughs> refuge of Karda Nui, the heart of the robot, explaining that six experimental Toa canisters were stored in a secret chamber beneath Karzani's island. This mysterious builder led the five Matoran into the depths. Done listening to Holly's tales, Karzani brought her to the furnace, only to discover her five companions were missing. Fearing they escaped. That Matoran would oppose him, he scoured his island, both with his eyes and mind, and located them in the vault. Dragging Holly behind him, Karzani advanced towards the vault to punish them. By this time, deep in the underground chamber, Jalar announced his plan to retrieve Holly and escape in the canisters, 
but the Builder objected and told them the canisters were only for Toa. Ignoring him, Jalar instructed Nuparu to decipher the canisters' workings while the other four left to get Hali. However, they were stopped by Karzani, Hali in his grasp, who denounced them as liars, believing that there were no such thing as Toa or Mananui, and prepared to destroy the canisters. Okay. Thinking fast, Matoro goaded Karzani into using his mask and showing him the worst vision possible, <laughs> a future in which Mananui were to die and the Matoran universe with him. At okay. the end of the vision, the Matoran were shaken by the tragedy, but Karzani even more so, astounded that Mananui had greater power than him. <laughs> the Matoran seized their chance, collecting Holly and entering the canisters, while the mysterious builder elected to stay, having been heartened by the knowledge that Matanui was not dead yet. Okay. The Jaller's group activated the canisters and departed Karzani, setting a course for Voya Nui. As they left, Karzani realized that Holly's tales were true, and that Matanui, for all his great power, was currently asleep. Intending to fill this power vacuum and expand his empire, he began to follow the Matoran. All right, he wants to get stronger. Part four, Reign of the Piranha. Oh, I need a new chapter, dude. I need a new As chapter. As Jalar and their friends faced their trials in Karzani's realm okay, of madness, so the, okay. conflict was brewing on the island of Voyanui. Okay. Lurking behind Brutaka, Hakan Real politic. <laughs> fallen warrior a deal. Brutaka would help Hakan dispose Go of Zamor, and Hakan would procure more Zamor spheres filled with antidermis for Brutaka to make him more powerful. Of course, neither had any intention of keeping their word whatsoever. But with this shaky alliance struck, Brutaka and Hakan began heading back to the Paraka stronghold. Meanwhile, as Avak and Thok okay. searched for the Toa Nuva throughout an area of Voya Nui known as the Green Belt, they suddenly came to a realization. Rahi wildlife, <laughs> trees, and water were so plentiful across the Green Belt despite the rest of the island being mostly a barren wasteland because the mask of life must be hidden somewhere. Ah, uh, yes! And Zaktan had been focusing their efforts on the volcano as a distraction to claim the mask for himself under the Green Belt. That makes sense. Furious with their leader and intending to confront him once and for all, the pair of Paraka rushed back to the stronghold. Confronting Zaktan, Avak used his mental powers to generate the perfect prison <laughs> that produced ear-splitting sounds every time Zaktan tried to break out, driving the prototypes out of their minds. Oh, maybe they made him watch Hawk this. Hawk appointed himself the new leader of the Paraka, but Hakan arrived with guns blazing, thinking they had staged a coup and wanting in on the action. As Avak was struck with Hakan's blast, he nearly lost focus to maintain Zaktan's prison, causing Thok to turn against Hakan in a rage. Just then, Hakan introduced Brutaka, who advanced inward, intending to kill all six Paraka with his bare hands and claim the antidermis for himself. <laughs> okay. The so the bad guys are just fighting each other. And the Matoran resistance team had chosen this exact time to also strike against the Paraka stronghold. <laughs> of course. Tricking an approaching Radak into bashing in the door, the Toa Nuva and Matoran slipped in, retrieving their tools and moving inwards to reclaim the Kanohi masks and gain back their full strength. By this time, Radak had stumbled upon the chaos within the stronghold. Avak and Thok were Who's fighting Radak again? as Hakan watched gleefully. Radak, realizing Hakan was behind all of it, approached Hakan from behind and threw him into Avak, <laughs> knocking the cage master unconscious and freeing Zaktan from his prison. At that exact moment, the Toa Nuva blasted open the eastern door, armed with their reclaimed masks and tools and accompanied by the resistance team. Okay. Zaktan tried to rally up his fellow Paraka to fight, but they stood back, realizing the Toa could defeat Zaktan for them. <laughs> Resorting to desperate measures, Zaktan offered to give Rutaka the secret of the Antidermospheres if he could help him. And so, in one mighty swing of his sword, Rutaka downed all six Toa oh, and shit. six Matoran, ending the conflict before it could even begin. The Matoran were taken with the Paraka to be interrogated by Radak in the Chamber of Truth, while the Toa were left in Rutaka's hands. Dumping interrogated the, in the, the Chamber of Truth, very 1984. Brutaka left them to drain their elemental powers and eventually die. As the Matoran Wait, why is he the goat? was taken to the interrogation chamber, Dalu regained consciousness and began to study her surroundings. As Zaktan boasted about his second victory over the Toa Nuva, admiring their masks, Dalu saw her chance to flee and escaped alone. Running into Hakan, she was briefly recaptured until Zaktan caught up with the pair. Who the fuck's Dalu again? Blaming Zaktan for his negligence in letting her loose, Hakan confronted the Green Paraka in an argument that soon turned violent. And so, in a vicious fight that ended with Hakan defeated and crushed by a boulder, the blue Dalu one managed okay. to escape once again as the Paraka fought each other. Resistance member, I got it, 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 I got it. Separated from okay. the group and roamed the slopes of Mount Valmai, 
discussing the power of the Mask of Light. Okay. As this discussion quickly turned into an argument over who would claim it first, Thok saw his chance to seize more power and push... This is more complicated than all of human history, Game of Thrones, and Lord of the Rings combined. Radak managed to climb back up, attacking okay. Thok and attempting to throw him off the cliff in turn. Back in the stronghold, as alliances began to crumble all around... Strength. Him, Wisdom. Strength. Wisdom. Vazok, who in turn told him he already had made a secret deal with Radak to kill the rest of them, <laughs> but offered to spare Avax's life once they found the Mask of Life. Just then, the two Paraka There's so much double crossing Axon, for a kid's show where I don't know any of the characters. All this chaos and make the first move. Tricking the Paraka into a cave of Voyanui's knowledge, Axon triggered a cave in, temporarily trapping Avak and Vazok within. Okay. So, as Axon rushed to confront the other Paraka, he found them brawling amongst themselves, with all six members engaged in a massive free-for-all. Okay. Havak and Vazak burst free from the cave, and the conflict between the six Paraka and Axon spanned to undiscovered regions of the island, where all seven combatants stumbled upon the remains <laughs> of a seventh Toa canister. What? The one that Vazon had used to get to the island. Claiming Vazon had become a servant to the Mask of Life and was beyond their reach, Axon prepared to strike down all six Paraka at once, ending their blight upon Voya Nui. Cool, but do was it. attacked from behind by Brutaka, knocking down <laughs> the two titans. As Axon and Brutaka squared up to battle, the six Paraka entered an uneasy truce, fleeing from the conflict between the two former friends. As they fled, okay. Akan devised a devious scheme to steal Brutaka's power for themselves, and looped in Radak, Thok, and Avak on the plan to create a Xamar Sphere that siphoned the power of its target into the user. <laughs> Dude, as all this happened, I'm so fucking this, lost! Underneath Voya Nui, somewhere on the island, Vazon discovered the Mask of Life calling to him, taking advantage of his maddened mind to convert him into its own servant and protector. Upon arriving in the majestic Chamber of Life, Vazon attempted to seize the mask for himself, but was instead cursed by it. The mask fused Vazon to an enlarged spider Rahi named Fenrak. Zammer Sphere, the power okay. Of foresight and the ability to absorb kinetic energy. And cool. the mask itself fused to Vazon's head, making him one of its guardians. Okay. Vazon remained in the chamber for the next few weeks, toying with the Sphere of Fusion and waiting for his quarry to arrive. Okay. And so, as the fighting died down and the island settled in for the night, the six Toa canisters that held Jaller, Holly, Kongu, Huki, Nuparu, and Matoru <laughs> began their approach to Voyanui in the midst of a great storm. As lightning crashed above, a bolt from the Red Star lanced downwards, striking all six canisters and transforming the Matoran within. No longer were they mere Matoran adventurers. Now they were powerful and unique. Ah, uh, six Toa, new toys. Lightning coursing through their veins. Lightning and Toa. emanating from their very bodies. These were the Toa in Nika. As six <laughs> new Toa spirit stars appeared in the night sky, the time for new heroes was upon us. I see. With the six Paraka scattered, I Axon see. and Brutaka still continuing their nonstop battle, and the Toa Nuva imprisoned and alone, the fate of Voya Nui and the world was more dire than ever. Near the interrogation chamber of truth, Balta awoke and freed the rest of his comrades, save Dalu, who had already escaped. It was then that Velika introduced the resistance team to a pool of energized protodermis. The ancient oh my god, they're going to mutate too? Magna apart millennia ago and claimed they could use it to free the Matoran from the effects of the Makuta's antidermis. Quickly gathering the substance and Xamar spheres of their own, the Matoran resistance team took refuge back in their hideaway to plan their next moves. Meanwhile, ashore on the island, Jaller and his companions awoke in their strange new bodies, still reeling from their sudden transformation. Yeah. The Toa took shelter in a cave to plan their next actions, and as they examined their new armor and masks, they discovered that the masks themselves were somehow sentient and alive, oh, and shit. their maskless faces gave off bright, blinding glows. <laughs> As they experimented with their new <laughs> abilities, the six Toa discovered that their elemental powers were entwined with innate lightning, and their unique mass powers could even... Oh, uh, commercial. Stadium. Inadvertently using the power of his Kanohi Aiden, the Mask of Spirit, Matoro's body crumpled to the ground as his soul flew onwards, spotting the Matoran resistance team nearby. He reported this to the other Toa, who agreed to meet these Matoran and ask him about the island. Okay. At the Matoran resistance's mountain hideaway, the six Toa Inika finally met the Matoran rebels and yeah. discussed their situation. Armed with new energized protodermis Zammer launchers developed by the Inika, <laughs> the Toa Inika and Matoran managed to free many enslaved Matoran while catching up with Axon, who had been badly injured by Brutaka and made them promise to stop the unhinged warrior at all Energized protodermis Zammer launchers is such a tough 
a great battle began. Okay, new toys. The stronghold's automated defenses. Mm. The Toa rushed in, Badass. preparing to end the menace Badass. of the Palaka once and for all. While the Matoran rushed into the fortress to find and free the Toa Nuva, the Toa Inika clashed with the Paraka in one-on-one -on -one duels. Nuparo engaging his Kenobi. Oh, that's hype. The mask of that's probably cool as hell. Zaktan far away from the battle. Deep within the fortress, the Matoran resistance team encountered ancient carvings and historical documents seized by the Paraka. Mm -hmm. Documents that spoke of a village that once existed thousands of years ago named Mari Nui that had sunk into the black waters of Voya Nui in a devastating catastrophe. Of course. <laughs> Mari Nui was first mentioned in Chapter 4, Infection, which was essentially describing how the Matoran had built a grand village atop the island of Voya Nui, but in a catastrophic accident, the landmass containing Mari Nui sunk beneath the waves yes. and essentially Thank caused you. the Matoran I to needed be that. forced to adapt to this underwater New shirt too. Creating and farming large bubbles of airweed to Oh yeah, I remember the airweed. And encase their city in obstacles. <laughs> Smoking we'll that airweed, you know what I'm saying? Underwater city very, very soon. So the hints are kind of being laid down here first. Wait. Just then, Hakan put his devious plan into motion, firing the... 2000s were the peak of human civilization. It's been a downhill. That's a real ad. Yeah, someone in chat said it was to move along and I had to check. ...and arranged to also be overloaded with Brutaka's strength. And so, in a blast of energy, Brutaka's raw strength and power was drained from his body and transferred to Hakan and Thok, who forced him to finally reveal the secret location of the Mask of Life underneath the green belt. We'll find out where that is right after I pick up my food. I'm too fucking hungry. It's right here. But even when the hope is gone, with their move new along, strength, move Hakan along. Hakan defeated the remaining five Toa Inika and the rest of the Paraka, leaving all the combatants imprisoned in the fortress as they headed. To I got a green tea to give me the energy Hakan, I need. Race for the Mask of Life. Having defeated Zaktan in battle, Nuparu returned to the fortress to find a devastating sight before him. His Toa and Nika comrades were reeling from the fight, still imprisoned in the fortress, while Brutaka... <laughs> Freaking Zod Demon comes into chat and says, Hey, is this the nine-hour Bionicle lore stream? <laughs> no, bro. This is the other one. This is a different fucking stream. Stupidest fucking question I've ever heard in my life. Avak, Radak, and Bazar lay uh, besides I, I them, know, all weakened and bruised from battle. Just then, Axon arrived, still wounded, and while he desperately wanted to head directly for the Mask of Life to stop Hakan and Thok, Jalar convinced him to stay with them and band together as one. As the Toa realized the best way to stop the pair of overpowered Paraka was to return Brutaka's power to him, it became clear that only the remaining Paraka, namely Avak, knew how to do that. And so, okay. an right. uneasy okay. Wait, I don't want to miss alliance between the Paraka, Axon, Brutaka, and the Toa and Nika was four. Court, yeah. All four separate parties working together against the larger threat. <laughs> While the Paraka created a unique Xamar sphere that would reverse the effect of Brutaka's power theft, Axon warned Jaller of the many guardians protecting the Mask of Life and discreetly handed him a glowing Xamar sphere for use in emergencies. God, these Xamar spheres are so the alliance left frequently the used. Belt, while Axon stayed behind to tend to his former friend Brutaka. As they scoured the green belt, Hakan and Thok turned on each other and began to fight, devastating their surroundings and exposing the entrance to the 777 stairs, <laughs> secret hiding place of the Mask of Life. <laughs> okay. Following this trail of destruction, okay. Toa and Nika and the remaining Paraka confronted them, launching their surprise weapon and restoring Brutaka's yes, I'll take a quiz after this. him in a flash of energy, leaving every member involved unconscious save for Zaktan, whose prototype nature saved him from blast okay back in the fortress brutaka's power and strength returned to him in an explosion of energy and despite axon's promises of forgiveness brutaka refused to submit and the two former friends prepared for deadly combat within the paraka stronghold how long have they been fighting before the toa Inika, the paraka slowly came to banding together under zaktan's lead once again as they descended the 777 stairs okay paraka Soon afterwards, the Toa and Nika regained consciousness, quickly following the Paraka in a race to the Agnika. 
As they ran down the steps, the Paraka came to a fork in the tunnel with the left path blocked and descended the zone of nightmares. <laughs> there, they came face to face with a grotesque being with golden skin, the legendary Urnak. That's the zone of nightmares, final boss. Who had been manifested from their worst fears into flesh and bone. Collapsing to the ground in fear, the Paraka recoiled from the sight of the monstrous being. All except Zaktan, who challenged Ernak to a battle. This is the this is the fucking darkest creature of the zone of nightmares. This looks like a kid just had the wrong toys. He built it wrong. He just put different pieces together. Of wits. Realizing Ernak was merely an illusion of fear manifested by the mask of life, mm. Zaktan threatened to kill the rest of the Paraka to purge the fear from their minds, thus killing the false Ernak as a result. Claiming that the horrors in his past deeply changed him and that he was the true embodiment of fear itself, Zaktan passed the first test and forced the projection of Ernak to melt away. Okay. Meanwhile, the Toa Inika soon came to a fork in the path, but this time the left path was open and the right path to the Paraka Zone of Nightmares was closed off. As they headed down the path, the Toa Inika came face to face with a projection of Toa Likan, who warned them to turn back before they met the same fate as him. Ignoring the warning and continuing to press onwards, the Toa Inika came face to face with some of the many monsters, beasts, and evil beings that threatened them during their time as Matoran on the island of Mata Nui. Facing them was the insectoid Nui Rama Rahi, the fearsome Muwaka, the dreaded Borok and Borok Kal. Yep. The exact Rakshi Turak that had killed Jalar as a Matoran. Bring back all the toys. Kuda Teradax himself. As the Anika leapt into battle, they found themselves radiating with lightning and elemental ability, and despite their intentions, they killed every single one of their opponents. Jesus. <laughs> in an instant, the bodies of their enemies shifted before them on the ground in the forms of the Toa Nuva. Recoiling in horror, the Toa and Nika were convinced they had been tricked into slaying the Toa Nuva, and oh, their new see. powers had spiraled out of control. I see. All except Jalur who took the lead and convinced the rest of his team that this was a trick by the mask of life and that they must press on despite their fears. As they right, get you, Jaller. Words, the corpses vanished behind them and they realized it was all an illusion. Back in the Paraka stronghold, the heated combat between Axon and Brutaka raged on. Brutaka used his Kanohi Olmak to open a dimensional portal to the field of shadows behind Axon and tried to force him into it. Meanwhile, the Matoran came upon the Toa Nuva, who had been enslaved by Antidermis and weakened by a device that drained their elemental powers. Yeah. Utilizing their own Zamor launchers, the Matoran freed the Toa Nuva and informed them of the existence of the Toa Inika. Back in the catacombs below the island, the Paraka continued their quest, finding themselves trapped in individual cylinders as the water... Just with the Toa Inua and the Toa Inika and the fucking Paraka and Axon and Baraka, that is 20 characters. That that alone is 20 different characters. <laughs> and that is just what's happening in this scene. That's what's happening right now. The level beneath them began to rise, filling the room with a mysterious black liquid. After the events of chapter three where the great cataclysm Rutaka, destroyed most I'm sorry, of the Matoran <laughs> universe, a lot of its radioactive energies, energized protodermis, and other materials began to seep into the black waters surrounding the pit jail, transforming it into a pit mutagen, which transformed the Baraki from proud warlords into grotesque underwater freaks. <laughs> this same black pit mutagen was about to mutate the Paraka very slowly before they actually did anything. Just then, a voice rang out amongst the chamber, an ancient recording of a great being itself. The voice stated that the Paraka would be released if they all pulled their levers at the same time. But if one of them pulled his lever early, then only he would be released, free to claim the match oh, shit. for himself. Prisoner's himself dilemma. Alone. Scrambling to each pull the lever first, Radak managed to be the first to free himself. But to his confusion, pulling his own lever freed all six Paraka, exposing the group to the mutagenic black waters of the pit. Unaware of these mutagenic effects, the Paraka swam through the passage, eventually encountering the Lava Chamber Gate, where they prepared to battle the Toa Inika, who were currently facing their own trials. Within the Chamber of Death, the Toa Inika encountered the recorded voice of a great being as well, who stated that in order for them to pass, one of them must sacrifice his or her life. Jaller nearly volunteered for the sacrifice, but his guilt and fear held him back. Having been killed once before by a Rakshi, he was traumatized from the experience, paralyzed <laughs> by fear. In his place, Matoro volunteered, 
claiming that yeah i mean dying is yeah, that's the, the yeah i'm sure you died that is a traumatic experience as an interpreter and not a warrior he was of the least use to the team as a beam of energy shot forth from the ceiling matoro was seemingly destroyed but his body was reconstituted and the voice proclaimed that they had passed the trial I see. As the Toa and Nika continued onwards, facing unique enemies like enlarged protodax and the being known as Umbra, sworn guardian of the Mask of Life and servant of the Order of Mananui, they finally approached the Great Lava Chamber Gate and the Paraka laying in wait for them. In a brief battle, Kongu inadvertently created a massive cyclone that buried the Toa and Nika beneath the bridge, and the Paraka left them for dead to claim the Mask of Life. Okay. As the group approached the Chamber of Life, the Paraka were finally reunited with the mad half-being Vazon, who wielded the Spear of Fusion. Mm -hmm. Fused to the back of his head was the legendary Kanohi Ignika, Mask of Life, which had siphoned Vazon's mind and turned them into its protector. Vazon offered to give it to them if they had killed Vazon, but Zaktan discerned that Vazon couldn't even give the Ignika to them if he wanted to. Vazon then used the Spear of Fusion to merge Vazok and Radak into a monstrous giant, which lashed out in a blind rage, defeating the other Paraka. Back in the Paraka stronghold, the battle between Rutaka and Axon raged on. With Axon They've been fighting for an hour! Outwardly treasonous actions against the Order of Mananui would summon the omnipresent Jailer Botar, who would send Rutaka into the Pit Prison. As previously mentioned in Chapter 3, when the pit jail was struck during the Great Cataclysm, most of it sunk beneath the waves. And despite Botar still transporting prisoners there to this day, most of the pit has essentially been destroyed, and all the water seeping in causes any inhabitant to be teleported into the pit to be automatically mutated by the black water. Right. In its days of glory, in Chapter 2, when the pit was still fully operational, Botar teleported prisoners there such as the Baraki Warlords in their failed revolt against the Great Spirit, Mata Nui. Driven to rage by Brutaka's corruption, Axon attacked with unbelievable force, shrugging off Brutaka's attacks entirely. In desperation, Brutaka looked to the vat of Antidermis, looking for a power surge increase, but Axon destroyed it before he could reach it. Managing to strike down Brutaka with a blast of power, Axon left Brutaka unconscious and Makuda Teradax's spirit unleashed from the Antidermis vat yet again. In a flash of blinding no! energy, as Axon foretold, Botar, the jailer of the Order of Mananui, materialized, taking custody of Brutaka and warning Axon that any attempts to interfere with his punishment would be met with the same. Nevertheless, Axon privately vowed to free his friend and redeem him back to the light. <laughs> back in the chamber of the Mask of Life, Vazon separated the rampaging Paraka fusion back into Vazok and Radak, both falling unconscious from the strain. What is As the Toa and Nika came face to face with Vazon oh, and Fenrak, final guardians of the Mask of Life. And the jail doesn't exist anymore. How is the where is the jailer taking him? Managed to force Vazon back into the lava. But the Mask of Life still fought to protect itself and test the Toa and Nika, mutating Fenrak into a monstrous card ass dragon. As the fight recommenced twofold, the Paraka slowly regained consciousness, biding their time and watching the Toa fight Vazon and his mutated beast. Just then, Jala realized that the mask you just covered that? Fuck. <laughs> ordered Kongu to read its thoughts Fuck. with the mask of telepathy. Oh. To his surprise, Kongu discovered the Ignika desired Matoro as its bearer, rather than Vazon. Transferring these thoughts into Vazon's mind, Kongu sent the half-being into a rage, distracting mm -hmm. him long enough for Jala to fire Axon's special Zammer Sphere, which froze Vazon and Cardass in space. I can do this. Matoro I can do this. But before Matoro had a chance to claim the Mask of Life and save the hey, life of the great spirit robot Matanui, the Paraka what? sprang into action, seizing their chance to take the Mask for uh, themselves. Um, In this commotion, the Mask of Life no, began to glow, still. blasting upwards through the 777 <laughs> stairs with the Toa and Nika and Paraka in hot pursuit. Oh, if he knows a little bit. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Holly was oh my god! How are you gonna <laughs> do this? Just as all seemed what lost, I'm trying. Ray, I'm trying. I might go 1.5 speed or something here, pretty soon. Sickened by the change in because he talks so fast. What about for Listen to him right now. And die. His final act to save a Toa he never. He never breathes. He just the mask of life plunged to the ocean. The Toa and Nika were forced to hang back. Not for nine hours straight. He does it, it's Little dense, know, and every third word I don't know. 
and sensed that many Matora deep underneath the waves needed help and assistance, and so plunged down beneath them. I forgot. And as they stood on the bay of Voyanui, Axon and Botan approached the Toa. No talking during class. Foreign resistance team leading the now freed and recovered Toa Nuva behind them. Naturally, the Paraka quickly fled back, deciding to watch from a safe distance and not attract the ire of the combined forces. Hey. You and so, in over. the aftermath of the battle, the Toa Nuva met the Toa Inika for the first time, marveling at their mysterious... I ain't restarting shit! I heard all of that! I know everything that just happened! During this time, Botar spoke briefly with Tahu, informing him that the Toa Nuva's destiny was to retrieve and follow an ancient scroll of preparations as decreed by the Order of Mata Nui. I see. As such, I the see. Toa Inika were told to continue the quest for the Inika alone, for it was not the destiny of the Toa Nuva to save Mata Nui's life just yet. To keep the Toa Nuva's mission completely secret, not even Jala nor his team were informed of where they were headed next, and Tahu's promise to see them when this was all over turned out to never be fulfilled. After That's sad. Settled, Axon volunteered to watch over the Matoran of Voya Nui, finally coming into the light as their public protector and leaving the Toa Inika free to pursue the mask of life beneath the waves. As the Toa Inika descended into the depths of the black waters surrounding Voyanui, this chapter of their story closed, and the fate of the great spirit Mata Nui and the entire Robot Mator universe hung in the balance. With the stakes higher than ever, and the two Toa teams embarking on separate, crucial quests for Mata Nui, this ends Chapter 6, The Ignition Trilogy, Part 1. <laughs> Previously on Bionicle Retold, Chapter 6, <laughs> The Ignition Trilogy, Part 1, Doom. Part 1? Down to catastrophe. After thousands of years in disrepair, the great spirit uh. Mata Nui, sentient energy source behind the robotic Matora universe, is dying. In a perilous quest to claim the Kanohi Ignika, Mask of Life, and kickstart the rebirth of the robot, the Toa Nuva traveled to the dangerous island of Voya Nui. There, they faced a sound defeat at the hands of the brutish Paraka, rogue dark hunters unwittingly yep. influenced by the spirit of Makuta Teradax, who yep. sought to claim the mask for his own purposes. Concerned with the fate of the Toa Nuva, the brave Matoran Jala assembled a party of courageous Matoran to venture to Voya Nui. Yep. After a harrowing journey across the hellish realm of Karzani, six new heroes washed ashore on the beaches of Voya Nui. Mutated by cosmic lightning from move the red along, star and blowing from along, electricity yeah. coursing through their veins, they became the Toa Inika. Taking the fight to the Paraka and aided by powerful members of the Order of Mata Nui, these Toa fought and they won. But before they could claim the Mask of Life, the Ignika dove deep between the black waves of the dark oceans below Voya Nui, sensing Matoran in danger and lives to be saved. This is Bionicle Retold. Let's go! We're running it. Yeah, if I fail the quiz, we'll watch it again tonight. <laughs> Bro, I just wish this whole video could be like three hours long if he just did only the recaps. The recaps Chapter are good. Seven, the Ignition Trilogy, Part 2, Sacrifice. Prologue, Ancient History. Thousands of years ago, the great spirit Mata Nui created the six Baraki Warlords, Radiant and noble, these Baraki were the prime beings of the universe, and divided the realm into a league of six kingdoms. Mm -hmm. Their rule was firm and absolute. I remember, and as their power I remember. Grew, so did their ambition and greed. Plotting to overthrow Mata Nui and claim total control over the Matoran universe, the six Baraki began to raise armies amidst their kingdoms, preparing for a great revolution. But they lost. But one among their ranks was uncertain of their success. Hoping to gain the favor of the Brotherhood of Makuta, he sold them out. And in a preemptive strike, Makuta Teradax, general of the Grand Army of yeah, Makuta, Teradax when he was a good guy, defeated the Baraki's gathering armies and captured the six treacherous warlords. But he stole their idea. Before the traitor could reveal himself, the mysterious Botar, servant of the Order of Mata Nui, revealed himself to the assembled warlords and Makuta, teleporting the Baraki Put him into the, the, of the, yeah, pit prison the pit as penance for their crimes. Thousands more years passed in darkness, where the Baraki stewed and rotted away in their confinement. When Teradax himself enacted his grand plan to overthrow Mata Nui and cast him into a deep slumber, the Great Cataclysm's violent earthquakes ripped the Yeah, they got the out and then they became weird fish the people. Waters of the pit. 
Yep. No longer were the Baraki prime physical specimens. I've seen this. I've seen Instead, this. They were now grotesque, hideous creatures of the deep, cursed to live beneath the waves of Aqua Magna. In their escape, the Baraki began to seize control of what little land they could beneath the ocean, erecting a massive stronghold above the ruins of the pit. But their brief rule was not to last, and during a freak accident, a chunk of land broke off from the island of Voyanui and crashed deep beneath the waves, carrying a small population of Matoran with it. Utterly yeah. demolishing this Baraki stronghold, oh, yeah, the crushed their, yeah. was Mari Nui settled beneath the waves, with the Matoran farming the potent airweed disturbed by its landing <laughs> to form colossal spheres of malleable oxygen, <laughs> keeping the mutagenic waters out. Furious and scattered, the Baraki were driven even deeper within the ocean, becoming yeah, more twisted tough. and deformed as their hatred for the Matoran of Mari Nui grew. I mean, and their singular drive I can to see why they hate the them. Black Waters grew even stronger. Yeah, get out. They don't want to be in the Black Waters. Years passed with the Matoran of Mari Nui unaware of the Baraki's presence and barely managing to survive. This is still world, recap. Being picked off one by one by vicious sea creatures or unknown threats. But all that was about to change as the Kanohi Ignika, Mask of Life, oh, sensed their I terror see. and dove deep beneath the waves. The future of the Baraki, Matoran, and all the universe was about to change, and a great conflict beneath the waves was primed to begin. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about the story, it was actually covered all the way back in Chapter 2, Rise of the Brotherhood, in a lot more detail. But of course, I wanted to recap it now, just so you know the most relevant bits for this particular legend. Part 1, The Lost Land. Well, Welcome so to Mari Nui. A former coastal village now sunk beneath the waves. This lost land stood as a bastion against the darkness of deeper waters, anchored to the island of Voyanui by a cord of solid protodermis, left over from the eruption of Mount Valmai ages ago. Mm -hmm. In this underwater village, Matoran farmed the precious airweed, harnessing it in grand bubbles to keep out the mutagenic water. Over the years, this society radically diverged from all other civilizations, with the Matoran growing stronger, adapting to become great swimmers, and even experimenting with unstable... It's like uh, Avatar 2. ...to deeper to more and more unexplored parts of the ocean. At the heart of this underwater refuge was the Matoran Council Chamber, inner sanctum where the Matoran of Mari Nui would gather monthly to discuss the latest issues and defense strategies. Here, the Matoran formed a direct democracy, with different Matoran leading the meetings each month. Thank you, Oyster. This council chamber was the largest <laughs> room in all of Mari Nui, with a vast. <laughs> they know the fucking political system of the underground water bubble city in the side fucking area of Bionicle Lore? Dome ceiling that allowed light through crystal skylights lined with light stones. Items that floated down from Boya Nui were also stored here before being moved to the Matoran. He knows like their fucking chief export and shit. And worship to the great spirit Mata Nui. But as more and more Matoran began to mysteriously disappear each day, a state of emergency was declared throughout the underwater city. The current council leader of the month, a lay Matoran named Defalak, ordered a search of the perilous <laughs> black waters of the pit to investigate these disappearances and launch a preemptive strike against these mysterious threats. It was at this time of exploration and upheaval that the Kanohi Ignika, Mask of Life, plunged deep beneath the waves surrounding Voyanui, sensing the Matoran of Mari Nui in grave peril. As the glowing golden mass descended into the deep, it was observed by the Matoran of Mari Nui, who sent out a search party to retrieve it, unaware of its true value. Mm -hmm. But deep in the darkness of the pit, the Baraki also watched the Ah, uh, the Baraki are going to get it, huh? ...prepared to seize it for themselves. Twisted yeah. by their time beneath the waves, the six former warlords reconvened for the first time in ages and plotted to seize the Mask of Life together, hoping its transformative power Welcome could provide to the salvation, deep. <laughs> curing them of their mutations. The first of them was the cold and ruthless Kalma, Baraki. whose mutations gave him regenerative properties and squid-like features. Commanding an army of giant squids, Kalma was a formidable threat and was responsible for breeding an army of smaller sea squids, parasitic life forms that could be fired from special Creeps launchers. from the deep. Next was Elek, a bitter but cautious former warlord, suspicious of the other Baraki in his firm belief that one among their ranks had betrayed them. Deep sea descent in river. 31, 32, 33,000. Downside. Prepare for impact. Fire 
Some say it's a hostile place inhabited by the strangest creatures. Others that it's a prison for the most dangerous outcasts. Legend has it that the only hope of ever getting out of there is a mask that every deep sea creature has been craving for years. A mask they say everyone is prepared to fight for. This is good lore. Life to possess. <laughs> Wait, this but is so much easier to understand. Of finding out is to go there. And see for yourself. <laughs> yeah, but what's their GDP? <laughs> Bro, I think I can just watch all the commercials back to back and I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get it like a fucking kid. This guy's telling me their fucking direct dem democracy system and how the fucking Taratui. We're only exist in 0.1 seconds of the lore. They just do their, they do the fucking uh, janitorial work on subsection B. And it's like, fuck, dude. Yeah, this is like some Paramore style 2000s. That shit rules. All right, I gotta go back to the video because I. <laughs> Time is of the essence. <laughs> Alec led his own <laughs> army of venom eels and was protected by a brutish lieutenant uh, named Nocturne. Who this is evanescent. <laughs> Moving onwards, Mantax was the most secretive of the Baraki, who spent most of his time alone, lurking beneath the sand with his incredible hunting skills. He too led a unique army of underwater rays, using them as packs of hunting animals to forage for food and prey amidst the ocean. Okay. Most dangerous of all was the scheming Takadox, always seeking an edge over friend and foe alike. He was the most skilled of the Baraki at planning, seeing life as a game board and everyone as pieces to be moved to see which. <laughs> Despite not being physically strong, Takadox's greatest <laughs> ability was a powerful hypnotic sway, which he could use to command the minds of lesser beings. Takadox used his hypnotic ability to continually hypnotize Karapar, the fifth Baraka oh, who true Sigma. had a strong mind, but whose mental skills were eroded due to centuries of Takadox's hypnosis. The strongest and most brutal of the Baraki, Karapar devolved into little more than a brutish bodyguard, commanding an army of Keras crabs and pit war tortoises to ride into mm. battle. And lastly, they were led by Prydak, the vicious and arrogant shark-like Baraki whose wit and speed propelled them to the top of their ranks. Establishing himself as the alpha male of a group of Takia <laughs> sharks, Prydak transformed them into his personal legion, becoming one of the most dreaded forces of nature. These six Baraki met and schemed as they discussed plans to seize the mask of life for themselves. In the past, they had seen no strategic value in attacking Mari Nui, so they let the Matoran be. But now that the Ignika was about to fall into the possession of these underwater Matoran, things were about to drastically change. Right. Part 2. Darkness of the Pit As the Baraki plotted and formulated plans, the Mask of Life fell into the possession of a Ga Matoran scout named Kyrax. As she took hold of the mask and brought it back to Mari Nui, the raw energy of the Mask of Life leaked out, bringing inanimate objects to life all around her. Little did she know, but every being who touches the Mask of Life is cursed with a unique and twisted power, which in this case was to bring objects around her to life and sentience. As seaweed and plants sprouted mouths and began to scream and writhe around her, Kyrex recoiled in horror, terrified by the raw power of the mask. Just as she was about to be overwhelmed by the plants come to life, a Pomatoran hunter named Dekar leapt into action, saving her from their grasp. Terrified into silence, Kyrex gave the mask to Dekar and fled without any other words. Meanwhile, deeper in the ocean, Takadox began to form schemes of his own. 
hypnotizing LX Lieutenant Nocturne to deliver the masked to Takadox. LX Nocturne? After being caught by Kalma, Takadox managed to convince him that he was spying on Mantax, whose secretive and destructive Dick nature <laughs> caused many of the Baraki to not trust him in turn. And as the two Baraki began to scheme against Mantax and followed him deeper and deeper into the pit, they were ambushed by the monstrous Zyglak, who had retreated into the depths of the Black Waters eons ago who the after fuck being is driven Zyglak? from that the familiar. in the early days of the Matoran universe. Right. If you recall back to Chapter <laughs> 1 beginnings, the Zyglak were hideous, lizard like creatures created by right. the great beings by accident. They were right. opposed by the hand of Artaka and the right. very first Toa I shouldn't have asked. I wish I hadn't asked. succeeded in driving them from the face of the Matoran universe. In a quick skirmish, Takadox and Kalma struggled to free themselves from the grip of the Zyglak. Thinking fast, Takadox directed his hypnotic abilities to Nocturne once again, provoking him to rush at the Zyglak and allowing himself and Kalma to escape. Nice. During this brief nice. conflict, the Matoran of Mari Nui geared up for an underwater exploration into the waters of the pit. Council leader Defalak and his close friend Gar <laughs> gathered a small strike force of Matoran on an expedition to the Undead. Bro, I don't care Matoran, about the council leader's the close friend Gar. And a Ga Matoran named Idris clustered together in Defalak's ramshackle submarine and descended into the depths. As they delved deeper and deeper, they came upon the territory of Prydak and his Takiya shark army, who attacked their craft from all sides and utterly destroyed their submarine. In the commotion, Sarda was tossed out as bait for the sharks, mutating into a water breather in the process, while the rest of the Matoran were captured by Pryder. This guy does know more about bionicles than the rest of us know about literally anything. <laughs> Dekar, the that Matoran is true. Currently held Descartes? The life, began to ponder the nature and powers of the mysterious Kenobi. <laughs> Descartes is pondering the nature and power? by a vicious venom eel. And despite all his attempts to harm or kill the creature, Descartes was unable to injure the creature whatsoever. In shock and fear, Descartes witnessed a massive swarm. Oh, it's like Rene Descartes, dude, the philo philosopher. City, led by the Phil <laughs> philosopher, dude, I can't even speak. I'm losing my brain. States. My language but center is shutting down. My language center is shutting down. My brain is melting. Because <laughs> it's all filled with fucking Mata Nui and shit. Meanwhile, Takadox ordered Karapar through hypnosis to kidnap Kyrex for information regarding the mask. And although the overall interrogation had proved to be a failure, Takadox and Karapar both learned that the Mask of Life was still in Mari Nui. Right. Fearful that Elek's attack would totally destroy the city and the Mask of Life, Takadox ordered Karapar to stop Elek while he took Kyrex back to the city as a gift of peace. In turn, Karapar managed to force Elek to stop launching attacks on Mari Nui in case the Mask was still there. As the commotion took place, the large army of Venom Eels had begun their assault on Mari Nui. Venom the eels. brave Matoran fought hard to defend their homes and defeat the Eels, but due to Dekar's healing presence, no damage was done to the army. <laughs> Quickly realizing it was the fault of the Mask of Life, <laughs> Dekar rushed to remove it from the city, planning to smash the mask to pieces in an isolated cave far from the city. Check the Meanwhile, bibliography in the, the Matoran dictionary. Takiya sharks, Gar and Idris made plans to swim for the city as quickly as they could, no matter how many dangers awaited them. Their companion, Defalak, was still being interrogated by Prydak, and the other Matoran began to lose hope that he would ever break free. <laughs> as the two Matorans staged their escape, Dekar was spotted by Kalma and Mentax, who chased him to the isolated cavern. And in a swift stroke, Dekar brought a sharp rock down on the Mask of Life, sending shockwaves of energy as he cracked the surface of the legendary Kenobi. Third edition? Kenobi. Just then, Kalmar seized Dekar with his tentacles as the Ignika fell from his grasp. But the sentient nature of the mask Breakfast. acted to defend itself. Breakfast to the to third edition! With life energy <laughs> and transforming it into a 300 foot long monster. The massive growth and transformation of this creature drove it mad, and as it writhed through the waters, both Dekar and Kalma what were knocked the unconscious, fuck with Mantax quickly burrowing beneath the sand to escape its unfocused wrath. As Prydak continued interrogating Defalak about the Mask of Life, growing tired of his stalling tactics, they were interrupted by the maddened 300-foot eel, which had dove deeper into the ocean with chaos in its wake. In the chaos, Defalak caught up with Gar and Idris, barely managing to return safely to the city, with news that Sarda, the Tamatoran who had accompanied them. Hey, look, my name's Brandon, right? Brander means strong or tough one. Strong, tough Matoran. How about that? Was lost and likely killed. <laughs> Little did they know that Sarda was rescued by a mysterious stranger, but that story is for another time. 
As the Matoran made their escape, Mantax <laughs> caught good up to with see you. and filled them in on the chaos unfolding around them. As the two Baraki headed for the cave where Descartes planned to destroy the Mask of Life, Elec and Karapar quickly followed them, suspecting you need a that recap? secretly knew the truth of who betrayed them years ago and planning to confront him. As the Baraki approached the cave, they found that Descartes was long gone, and in his place was a mysterious golden-skinned stranger, partially mutated by the Black Waters. This titan was Brutaka, who had recently been teleported deep into We're the only five hours in? I know, it feels like ten now minutes. It just flies by. Future, <laughs> it's just been Baraki flying by, dude! Of life at once. If you recall from Chapter 6... Brutaka was the former member I know of the Order who of Brutaka is. Don't insult me. He broke me. off from his friendship with Axon to pursue his own intents and seize the Mask of Life for himself. After aiding with the Paraka, Brutaka was defeated by Axon in a great battle that smashed Makuta Teradax's anti dervis back <laughs> and was teleported by Botar to the remains of the pit prison. Dude, for you know what's sad? Is before I would be like, I don't understand any of those words. What's sadder is I understood all of those words. <laughs> In at least that sentence, I understood all of those words. I actually knew exactly what he was talking about. Yeah, the battle with Axel where he smashed the fucking anti-dermis prison that fucking Teradax is in. I understand that 100%. That's bad. Fortunately, though, because the pit prison is basically pretty much destroyed underwater, this only brought Brutaka one step closer to the Mask of Life. As the 300-foot eel was distracted by the lights and glow of Mari Nui, it swam towards the city, with the Matoran rushing to smash their lightstones and plunge the city into darkness. As it approached the cord anchoring Mari Nui to Voya Nui, the eel was distracted by the sounds of a great battle raging inside the cord itself, a battle that we shall revisit shortly. As the eel reached the cord, it slowly began to squeeze, forcing the mm. unknown combatants closer and closer to the entrance of the Black Waters. Amidst this chaos, Descartes regained consciousness and saw the Mask of Life laying beside him. As he reached out and touched it, the mask shone with light and radiated a desperate call for help. For the first time in its existence, the mask felt fear. Okay, in this what? physical contact, the mask <laughs> shared all its memories and deep history with Descartes, who was overwhelmed by this onslaught of information and the true nature of the Matoran universe. Okay. While bolts of energy flew as the six Baraki worked together to subdue the 300 foot long eel. Arriving at the three hundred foot long made a beeline for Dekar, who was still stunned by the power of the Mask of Life. But before he could claim the mask, Brutaka was dragged deeper into the black waters by a giant squid, and Pridak <laughs> broke off from the battle to seize the mask for himself. Just as Pridak made contact with the glowing mask, it reacted violently, glowing with immense power and energy. In the mask's blinding light, life energy radiated outwards, okay. surging massive transformative beams in every direction, and changing the course of destiny for the six Toa Inika, <laughs> who had just begun their descent into the pit forever. Okay. Part 3, <laughs> Descent into the Deep. Let's go! As the Baraki, Maturin, and Brutaka <laughs> clashed over the Mask of Life, the Toa okay. Inika had finalized their preparations and began their descent into the depths of the Black Waters. Traveling through the hollow cord that anchored Mari Nui to Voya Nui, the Toa Inika were immediately embroiled in a non-stop three-way battle with the Zyglak beast. Otto, and it's better. Half being Vazon, who had followed them. No, from the Otto. Of the Mask of Life. Otto, we don't need to watch House. We're, I'm into this. Okay, you don't understand. I love Bionicle now. I really get it. <laughs> I'm shaking for no reason. <laughs> I. It's just really good. The thing is, you don't understand about Baraka and Axon. That's what you don't fucking understand. Is there used to be brothers, and now they're fighting, and like it's really it, you, you need to fucking to get that. Brutaka. <laughs> As the Zyglak captured Vazon and dragged him away, the Toa Inika continued to blast through their ranks, voyaging deeper and deeper to the depths of the ocean. Just then, as Descartes touched the Mask of Life and it sent out a transformative cry for help, the six Toa were struck by its energy. Their very bodies Who's your favorite character so far? <laughs> ocean environment. No longer were they um, Toa I now, like they were new, the Paraka. Toa, That's my favorite, because they have a funny rap. That were perfectly suited to their new habitat. But I think, yeah, Lee Khan is the, the only the good guy that I like in the whole story. As and he was four hours ago. The, mask, the po and Dekar, strangled by Kalma and close to death, was transformed into a reincarnation of the long-dead jailer of the pit, Hydraxon. 
Memories flashed through Descartes' mind as ancient history was reborn before his eyes. He witnessed glimpses of Hydraxon's early life as member of the Hand of Artaka and his recruitment into the Order of Mata Nui by the first Toa, Helrix herself. He saw Helrix. himself train the six Toa Mata in tests both physical and mental, <clears throat> building their team bonds. He witnessed Hydraxon train his personal energy yeah. from Spinax and use the powerful beast to test the Toa Mata. And as the six yeah. Toa Mata descended into stasis in their canisters, Dekar witnessed firsthand <laughs> how Hydraxon was assigned to be the guardian and jailer of the pit prison, with a fleet of emotionless Maxilos guards protecting him. Who are Maxilos? And then there was darkness. When the Great Cataclysm struck and demolished the pit, Hydraxon was gravely injured. And to all of history, his story ended when Takadox, stumbling upon the injured jailer, took the opportunity to finish him off once and for all. <laughs> But to Dekar, these memories were lost, and the power of the Mask of Life overwrote his consciousness completely, bearing his original personality. In Dekar's place was the mighty Hydraxon, Titan Jailer oh, of the Order of Mata Nui, with a quest to capture everyone in the open ocean, friend oh, or foe, shit. as he believed them all to be escaped pit prisoners. <laughs> as this happened, the new Toa fought for their Why lives would the Mask of Light do that? Long Venom Eel. Kongu unwittingly used his new Kanohi Zap, the Mask of Summoning, and summoned countless normal Venom Eels. Matoro then activated his new mask, discovering to his repulsion that it was a Kanohi China, the Mask of Reanimation. Kanohi China? A deeply immoral power to allow its user to give artificial life to any corpse or dead body. Oh, shit. Resurrecting them to serve as brainless servants. <laughs> There's a Necromancer world. mask Using in this? The mask, Matoro reanimated the long-dead carcass of a Takia shark, setting it forth against the mighty eel. Huki, using his new mask of gravity, forced the eel to rapidly sink to the ocean floor, knocking it unconscious and ending the chaotic battle. Appalled nice. by the gruesome power of his new mask, Matoro vowed to never use it unless under extreme circumstances. <laughs> Throughout the events of Chapter 6, the Kenobi and Yuka, or Mask of Life, wished to continue Just say to never the use it, bro. Will power of Matoro. As a Matoran, it tested him deep within the dark tunnels to Karzani's lair, and it also tested him in the Chamber of Death, where Matoro volunteered to sacrifice Chamber himself of Death's for tough his one. friends. Now, bestowing this very corrupt and immoral mask on Matoro was the latest in a long line of tests of Matoro's morality and willpower. Mm. With the battle won, the Toa approached the city of Mari Nui, but the Matoran were wary of these six strangers and asked that they prove themselves as Toa by fighting back against Dude, Karpar's they always got to prove army, themselves. Which was ransacking their airweed fields. <laughs> as leverage... Was that Karpar's carp crab army? Is that what he said? Demanded one among their ranks stay with them while the other five Toa undertook the quest. And so, Matoro stayed behind, soon realizing the power of the Ignika had changed them forever and he could no longer breathe air. In these airweed fields, the remaining five Toa were ambushed by the Baraki. Claiming to be fellow prisoners of the pit like them, the five Toa managed to trick the Baraki into trusting them. But this ruse only served to further confuse the Matoran of Mari Nui, who drove out Matoro from their city, thinking him to be allied with the Baraki. I As see. Matoro fled the city, he was captured by Hydraxon and taken to what remained of the pit prison to be confined in a solitary cell. Yikes. Distrustful of the Toa, the Baraki placed the five remaining members in sea caves while they discussed amongst themselves what to do with them. Okay. And what to do with the Mask of Life, which had fallen into Pridak's possession following the events of the battle. What is it? It doesn't it do anything for you. None of the six Baraki could agree on how to use the mask or what to even do with it. They decided to temporarily place it in Nocturne's safekeeping, thinking the brainless lieutenant would merely protect the mask and follow their orders. Oh, but the what if he... Nocturne soon discovered the mask granted him the curse of death, and everything he made <laughs> physical contact with immediately shriveled and died. <laughs> Overjoyed with this terrible new power, Nocturne abandoned his post, taking the mask with him. <laughs> Unbeknownst to him, but cracks in the Wait, mask why, made by Dick. Why does the mask of life just seem to give everybody weird, terrible powers? What? What? <laughs> car were seeping life energy, and uncontrollable forces began to permeate the animals and creatures around the mask, including a microscopic plankton like Gadunka, which began to ever so slowly grow in size. As the Baraki Not the, seen, the five Toa made plans of their own to escape, with Holly using her mask of kindred oh, to mimic I'm the hypnotic I'm gonna dunk up my head underwater and not bring it up, dude. I am losing my fucking mind. As the five Toa quietly made their escape, they came upon some unique Kordak blasters and firearms, designed for underwater destruction. 
Coming back up to Mari Nui, Holly acted fast, asking Kongu to use a blast of air to push Devlak outside the air bubble, and swiftly saving him in a sphere of water. Stating that if they wanted to kill the Matoran, they had the power to do so, Holly returned Defilac to safety, and in turn, earned the trust of the Matoran of Mari Nui. Nice. Swearing to protect the underwater city and reclaim the Mask of Life, the Toa were renamed the Toa Mari, symbols <laughs> of their duty to protect the city. Spending up to cover more ground, the Toa oh, Mari good. They're a new version, new the toys. To search for the Mask of Life, encountering their own trials along the way. In a desperate battle that ended in stalemate, Holly made a truce with Mantax, who was also searching for the mask on his own, and the two agreed to temporarily help each other locate the mask and defend against the vicious sea creatures. Jaller and Kongu confronted Kalma and Karapar, and were immediately engaged in a battle with energy-sucking squids. Of Meanwhile, course. <laughs> Nuparu and Huki were trapped in an undersea Why not? <laughs> attacked by Alex's army of eels and knocked unconscious. During all this time, Takadox's location was unknown. While all this was happening, Matora remained in confinement in the remains of the pit prison, alone with his thoughts. As Hydraxon, jailer of the pit, went off to track down more escaped prisoners, Matora was left to be guarded by an automated Maxilos security robot. A Maxilos security surprise, robot, okay. The Maxilos robot began to speak. <laughs> and the voice behind it was darker, deeper, and one Matoro recognized immediately, for it was the voice of Makuta Teradax himself. Oh, shit. In chapter two, we discuss the evolution of Makuta and how they exist in an anti-dermic state, which is fully gaseous and basically for all intents and purposes like a ghost. Every Makuta in this form can possess the body of a robot without a mind to think of its own. Yeah. Just like the automated Maxilo security robots here, as well as influence the thoughts and perceptions of others around them. This comes with a big downside though, because if a Makuta stays in the antidermis state for too long, then they'll eventually dissipate, eventually just killing the Makuta themselves. So they do have to find a host at some point. Right. In chapter six, when Axon smashed the antidermis vat, Makuta Teradax's spirit was released, and eventually yep. somehow he made it down to the waters of Mari Nui How? and possessed this Maxilos robot. As Matoro claimed that Teradax would never win, and the Toa would triumph over the Makuta, yeah. Teradax only laughed, and in a single swing, he freed Matoro from his cell. The reason why Teradax was now on his side, or so he claimed. Why? Wary of Teradax but thankful for his newfound freedom, Matoro agreed to keep Teradax's identity a secret. Why? Just as he had kept the secrets of Taraga Nuju safe for years <laughs> upon the island of Mata Nui as his soul translator. <laughs> Leaving the cell together, Pterodax instructed Matoro to travel with him to regions unknown and deeper parts. Of you think the ocean. he one-taked it? Yeah. As Matoro and Pterodax traveled do. together, the five remaining Toamari continued their search for the. I think he spoke for nine hours Ali straight. And Mantax traveled together, while Jaller superheated the waters around him to force a truce between him, Kongu, Kalma, and Karapar. In this uneasy stalemate, Jaller proposed an alliance with the Baraki, promising to revert them back to their original prime form should they retrieve the mask. Kalma and Karapar agreed, with one condition, Prydak would have to be killed, as the two Baraki already suspected him for knowing the truth about who betrayed them eons ago, and hiding it from them. Meanwhile, Huki and Nuparu came too, blasting past Elexiels and heading for Mari Nui to regroup. In deeper, darker waters, Teradax and Matoro encountered <laughs> hundreds of Takia sharks. I like to think someone just asked him, hey, what do you think about Bionicle? <laughs> and then held up a camera. And he's like, oh, if you asked, and then just free ball this for nine hours. <laughs> Remnants of Pridak's vicious army. In a desperate battle, Teradax refused to help Matoro, forcing the Toa to activate his mask of reanimation to resurrect the bodies of dead sharks to rip their living kin apart. I thought he said he'd never battle, use it! But revolted at what he had to do to survive, Matoro could He said he would never use it! Who in turn was pleased at how quickly Matoro had used the immoral power of his mask. Yeah, he used it so quickly. As they delved to deeper <laughs> echelons of the pit and places long forgotten, Teradax led Matoro to the corpse of a Toa of Water, none other than the insane serial killer Toa Tuyet, who had killer. met the Matoran of Metru Nui in her quest for the Nui Stone centuries ago. <laughs> Recap time. In chapters 2 and 3, we met the dangerous Toa Tuyet, who lusted after the power of the Nui Stone. The Nui Stone was a dangerous artifact that allows any being to absorb the power... This is in my notes. This is in my notes. Toa Tuyet right here. I didn't write why, but she's in it. She's in the notes. We planned for this. ...of Toa in a wide radius, essentially taking all their powers and granting them onto the wielder of the Nui Stone, 
making them one of the most powerful beings in the universe. Toa Tuyet actually possessed the stone back on Metru Nui thousands of years ago, but after a series of murders that she framed on the Dark Hunters, right, Toa I remember her. Toa Nadiki eventually found out and confronted her. Yeah. During this confrontation, the Nui stone exploded and fragments of it were embedded in Toa Tuyet's chest, yeah. right before she was captured by Botar and taken to a mysterious location. Right. Now, the corpse on the ocean floor is presumably Toa Tuyet, or at least what appears to be her. But there's a few more things going on here that not even Makuta Teradax is aware of, which probably won't even be covered in this chapter alone. So as of right now, just know that at least in terms of what everyone thinks, this oh is the my fucking god. Toa Tuya. Oh my what is fucking it, god, be bro. Be sure to check in with the future chapters to find out exactly what's going on. Hey, you know it, brother. Toa you know it. Wouldn't miss it for the world. Over the battered armor and mask of the long dead Toa Tuya. Threatening to kill Matoro, Teradax demanded he resurrect the body of Tuyet in the hopes that she could provide clues to regaining the Nui Stone. As Matoro was curious himself as to what Teradax's plans entailed, he agreed to resurrect the lost Toa, using the terrible power of his mask to bring a semblance of life back to Tuyet's corpse. Yes. At his feet, the Kanohi He's using it all the time now. began to move, slowly coming together. What had been a pile of junk a moment before had now taken on a form. Other pieces of armor were rising up through layers of mud, <laughs> struggling to rejoin the rest. In a sickening and amazing display of power, the body that once belonged to Toa Tuyet rose from the floor of the pit and stood unsteadily, waiting for commands. Why is he... And that was when Matoro noticed something. Incredibly tiny, almost microscopic pieces of crystal embedded in the dead Toa's armor. These, proclaimed Teradax, were the fragments of the Nui Stone. And all he needed was the proper tool to recreate the stone as it once was. Teradax boasted that the tool was the ancient staff of Artaka, and the Toa Nuva were about to claim it for him. Interlude. Scroll of Preparations. Part what? 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 The interlude? The conflict happened beneath the sea, the Toa Nuva, original heroes of Mata Nui, were yeah. on a wildly different quest of their own. Yeah. Sent by Axon to fulfill a scroll of preparations to awaken the great spirit Mata Nui once and for all. Right. Toa Nuva set forth to fulfill this duty and prepare for the reawakening of Mata Nui. First okay. On the list was the task to awaken the Borok swarms in their proper purpose to cleanse the surface of the face of the robot I thought... and utterly demolish <laughs> the island of Mata Nui. That's Despite what they fought to stop them from doing. Within the ranks, Onua finally made the decision to free the Barog Queens, and all around the former island refuge of Mata Nui, the Bullrock began to awake and achieve their duty, ravaging everything to the ground. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Why the would they allow that? Makuta's lair, the core <laughs> leaders and generals of the Brotherhood of Makuta began preparations of their own. Telepathically contacted by Teradax to begin sending a full strike force to the heart of the robot, Karda Nui, the Brotherhood of Makuta began sending an army of Makuta armed with shadow leeches, specialized Rahi designed to drain the light from any Matoran and turn them into servants of the Makuta. Okay. On the side, Teradax ordered his top general, Makuta Ikarax, to intercept the Toa Nuva and seize the powerful staff of Artaka. Okay. As this was happening, the Toa Nuva in turn <laughs> ventured to retrieve the staff of Artaka, the second item on their list to prepare for Mata Nui's awakening. Right. With the unique power to recreate any broken object, the staff would be crucial in repairs to severely damaged sectors of the robot. Learning it had been stolen by the Dark Hunters long ago, the Toa Nuva confronted the Shadowed One, who made a deal with the Oh, Toa I forgot about the Shadow One. the treacherous Rudaka, who had betrayed the Dark Hunters ages ago to serve Teradax, and he would tell them where to find the staff. And so, the Toa Nuva traveled to Rudaka's home island of Zia, where they were caught in the crossfire between two rampaging Titan Rahi, the mysterious Tatrak of Metru Nui, who, who had been teleported across the lands and adventures of its own, <laughs> and the ancient Kanohi dragon, which had been transported to Zia oh, ages shit. ago by Toa Likon. The Kanohi dragon. In the chaos, they managed to capture Rudaka, and under threat of death, forced her to reverse her mutations on the Rahaga. And so, in a flash of energy and light, six Toa of old stood tall and firm after years of their powers drain. The Toa Haga had returned. Let's go! Returning to the Shadowed One and promising him that Rudaka was in the hands of the six Toa she had mutated long ago, who would show her no mercy. The Toa were then sent to the now abandoned realm of Karzani, where they encountered Mak From a distant past, two new heroes awake. Equipped with giant spears and the awesome Ratsuka Spinner, they're ready for any challenge. Bionicle Special Edition. Oh, that's it?
That wasn't that cool. There's no song. That's it, huh? Kuda Ikarax, who had seized the staff of Artaka first and defeated all six Toa Nuva in battle. As ordered, Ikarax headed straight for the black waters of the pit to deliver the staff to Teradax, with the Toa Nuva in hot pursuit. Part 4 Terror of Karzani. Mm. Karzani's back, back. In the waters of the pit, Teradax <laughs> led Matoro and the mindless, reanimated body of Tuya to a I can't believe I said that. Ikarax. Along the way, they encountered Holly, who was confused and horrified to see Matoro leading the dead body of a mysterious Toa with him. Pterodact remained physically silent in the body of the Maxilos robot, but telepathically threatened Matoro. Should he warn Holly of Maxilos' true identity, he would kill them both. Knowing the Makuta meant his word, Matoro kept Pterodact's true identity a secret, but also secretly warned Holly in a coded message that something was wrong, and he was in serious trouble. Okay. In two parted ways, Holly hurried to gather the other Toamari and help Matoro. At this point, it's time to revisit some prior events and investigate what some other major players in the universe have been up to. Cool. In Chapter 1, we met the noble Toa Lesovic, leader of the universe's first Toa team, who tragically lost his entire team to a swarm of Zyglak in a fatal mistake. <laughs> Guilt ridden and denouncing his Toa status, Lesovic <laughs> returned to his village in sorrow, prepared to lay down his Toa tools forever. His Toa Before, tools. He discovered that in his time away, the Taraga of the village had gone mad and banished the entire Matoran population to the realm of Karzani, where ah. they would never be seen again. Among these hey, were Lesovic's happens. old friends, Sarda, a Ta Matoran, and Idris, a Ga Matoran. As fate would have it, Sarda and Idris had been on Voya Nui when Mari Nui sank beneath the waves and were the two Matoran sent on the submarine mission earlier this chapter. Since that point, <laughs> Lesovic spent I cannot keep thousands up. of years wandering the universe, looking for his friends and trying to redeem himself. On his journeys, okay. Lesovic met Toa Jovan, fought the Rahi Nui, defended an island from a group of Vizorak, and cool. explored unknown lands in the south. His wanderings often took him as far north as Karzani's realm, but he failed to get past the Manas guards protecting it and find his friends before they were sent to the southern continent. Following Karzani's departure from his homeland, Toa Krakua, now full-fledged member of the Order of Mata Nui, yeah. sought out Lezovic and told him that Karzani had allied with the Zyglak and was going to attack Mari Nui. That brings us to weeks ago. We're in the first Matoran expedition. <laughs> this is Black so Wars. hard to follow. The submarine was ripped <sighs> apart, and the Ta Matoran Sarda was presumed dead. But just as Sarda was about to be ripped apart by Takia sharks, Lesovic arrived just in time, fending them off and saving his old friend. But there was no time for a reunion, for they had spotted the mad titan Karzani, now mutated beyond recognition by the waters of the pit. Look at him now. For the mask of life on his own quest. In a brief battle, Karzani trapped Sarda in a horrific vision, mutating Lesovic into a water breather as well. As Karzani fled, Lesovic and Sarda met up with their old friend Idris, and the trio vowed to destroy the mad tyrant once and for all, and Based. stop him from gaining the power of the Mask of Life. As Karzani ventured deeper into the ocean, he came upon Teradax, Matoro, and the reanimated Tuyet. Oh, in big a fight. battle, Teradax seized control of half of Karzani's Manas Crab army, causing the powerful <laughs> Rahi to rip each other to shreds. Enraged at Karzani's attempts to trick him with visions of doom, Teradax lashed out at the Titan in a devastating mental blast, ripping Karzani's mind to shreds and oh, sending shit. it into the depths of the ocean. Following Karzani's tumbling body, Lesovic, Sarda, and Idris devised a trap to ensnare the wounded Titan once and for all. As Teradax, Matoro, and Zombie Tuyet left the battle and continued onwards, the trio of Toa and Matoran engaged the still wounded Karzani in combat. And after yeah. a brief but intense fight, Karzani was temporarily defeated. And in a flash it's always of temporarily. Energy, blinding light, the omnipotent Botar <laughs> materialized before the four combatants. How many times Karzani you're going to use Duel of the Fates in this nine hour video? His fight finally over and his honor redeemed, Lesovic left Mari Nui, accompanied by his companion Sarda ready for more adventures ahead. Okay. Meanwhile, at the edge of the pit, Ikarax arrived to deliver the staff of Artaka to Teradax, who dismissed him and attempted to use the staff to recreate the fragmented Nui stone from Tuyat's armor. Yeah. Acting fast, Matoro rushed at Teradax to prevent him from gaining the ultimate power of the stone. Don't give him the stone. 
just oh, no. as Herodax was about to recreate the Nui Stone, Brutaka appeared out of nowhere, oh, shit. revealing he had been following the Makuta for weeks <laughs> and seized the Staff of Artaka. Over his many weeks in the pit, Brutaka had been given time to reflect and ponder on his actions and the betrayal of his closest He's a good guy now? and came to the realization that his greed would lead him nowhere. Overwhelmed Holy with shit. Guilt, Brutaka summoned Botar and gave him the Staff of Artaka for safekeeping, overcoming his personal greed and lust for power and taking the first step Based. on his long journey back to the light. Telling Matoro to get back to his friends, Brutaka prepared to hold off Teradax for as long as he could, buying Matoro time to escape as he battled with the Dark Lord. In the chaos as Matoro fled, the reanimated body of what appeared to be Tuyet crumpled to the ground. And in the ferocious attack, the two titans were forced into a stalemate. To buy himself some time to recover, Brutaka told Teradax that the Mask of Life was in the hands of the brainless brute Nocturne and was ripe for the taking. Forced would to break off the engagement by this news, Teradax left and warned Brutaka that their fight was not over. Right. <laughs> and so, the final countdown was about to begin. I feel like I've seen that shot a hundred times. Seeking cosmic rays, the mask of life began to curse all around it, with its current bearer, Nocturne, none the wiser. The resurrected Hydraxon continued his patrols around the pit, Nocturne in his sights as one of the most notorious escape prisoners. Matoro had reconvened with the okay. Toamari, who had formed an uneasy truce with some members of the Baraki, while others, okay. like the treacherous Takadox and their leader Prydak, Was that a Pikachu? The robotic Maxilos robot, possessed by the spirit of Makuta Teradax, was on a direct course to the Mask of Life, which in turn was slowly succumbing to its sustained damage. Time was about to run out for the universe, and in these final moments, everything was about to change. Holy shit. Part 5. Final Moments. As Nocturne held the Kanohi Ignika oh my Mask God. of Life, I'm so scared of this chapter. Granted, I'm so scared of this chapter. He walked. Just then, Hydraxon was the first to encounter him, and in a quick fight, Nocturne was soundly defeated. As Hydraxon stared at the Mask of Life, small pieces of memories began to flash before him. The original memories of the Pomator and Dekar, <laughs> whose dying will was to destroy the Dekar. Mask of Life, which he deemed too dangerous to be kept intact. With this small part of Dekar's consciousness fueling his actions, Hydraxon prepared to fire upon the Ignika and destroy it once and for but all. But don't you need it? But his blast was knocked off course. It's the only way to Hulk, save the world. He arrived first with Mantax to protect the Mask of Life. In the explosion, the Ignika fell in possession of Mantax, who was cursed to drain the energies of all around him and strengthen Mantax in the process. Reveling in his newfound power, Mantax broke off his shaky alliance with Holly and left with a mask in hand. Hydraxon. Dude, everyone betrays head. each other in this show. And finally reunited at last, the six Toamari assembled to assess the situation and plan their next steps. Okay. The Toro warned the other Toamari that the cord of cooled protodermis connecting Voyanui to Marinui must be destroyed <laughs> for Mananui to be revived, which would allow Voyanui to sink back down to rest in place on the surface of the robot. This destruction would immediately kill all Matoran living on Voyanui and in Marinui. So, so don't do it. Mari hurried to get them to safety as their first priority. Oh, you evacuated them. I'm going to try to boil this down in the simplest possible terms. So this is the great spirit Mananui robot. So you've got the head here, you've got some sort of a body with a chest plate and whatnot, and it continues from there. Okay. So, of course, this was basically the standard configuration, and as I've said many times throughout many videos, the heart of the robot was Cardanui. So you've got right in here the heart of the robot, KN. This is essentially what serves as the power source for the entire robot. Okay. Above the sphere of Cardanui was a... He's definitely doing this at work. <laughs> this is absolutely a workplace digital whiteboard. He did not bring this at home place called the southern continent and this is essentially just a piece of armor that is inside the robot that matoran were living on to perform maintenance during the great cataclysm a portion of the that's cool that warden broke off yeah. and rocketed upwards so it burst a hole from the southern continent right here so now there's a hole directly to cardanui it broke through the chest plate of the first <laughs> outer shell of the robot and skyrocketed upwards <laughs> to the surface of the waters of Aqua Magna. So essentially this is the island of Voyanui. 
It was once part of the southern continent, but now it's essentially broken off and become its own thing. So of course, that means that the waters of Aqua Magna, particularly the mutagenic waters, are now starting to seep inwards into Cardinu right. through the hole it created, right. causing a great waterfall to be formed and essentially filling up the base of Cardinui with a swamp. But that's not really relevant for right now. What is relevant, though, is that during a freak accident <laughs> several thousand years later, yeah. the coastal village of Mari Nui, which was on Boya Nui, Bro, sank down. How, how, how does it take thousands of years to fill this up? There's a big hole. Down ...back beneath the ocean and rested somewhere near the Cardanui hole spot right here. So we've got Mari Nui underwater, part of Boya Nui above water, and then, of course, on top of Boya Nui, we have Mount Valmai the secret hiding place for the Mask of Life. So eventually when Mount Valmai erupted, you've got a ton of molten protodermis cascading down the island. This molten protodermis went down the side of Boya Nui <laughs> and connected itself to Mari Nui underwater, forming this core <laughs> that eventually got cooled over time. This is so fucking ridiculous. Into the water. <laughs> and that's what this whole core thing is. To kind of expand out from here, you've got the whole island of Mari Nui here, this cooled molten protodermis cord that's essentially a spike that's anchoring Boya Nui, the larger island in place. So essentially what the Toa Mari need to do is if they want to repair the great spirit robot, right? They've got to repair and plug the holes in the exterior wall as well as the hole above Karta Nui. And in doing so, they got to somehow get Boya Nui back down. And they realized a way to do this. So actually, Makuta Teradact explained part of this to Matoro and Matoro was sharing it with the others. But what they had to do is essentially just destroy the cord here. Mm. If you blow up the cord, then Voyanui will come crashing back down to the original spot it was supposed to be. But of course, this is pretty That's catastrophic. And it will destroy all life on the island of Voyanui, as well as completely destroy Mari Nui in the process. Right. So obviously they have to do some sort of evacuation first. But if the Toa succeed, then Voyanui rockets back down Let's uh, get rid of this extra stuff here. Would destroy Mari Nui, plugging back the hole, and then Boya Nui would have been no longer on the surface of the water. And now you've got the hole completely plugged in to Karta Nui, which is stopping this great waterfall from flowing inwards and essentially repairing this no, large exterior I get it. I get it. to the robot I get itself. it. So I get it. that's essentially what the goal is of the Toa Mari to do. Mm. The other thing that I do need to mention is that don't forget, the Paraka from last chapter are actually still hunting after the Mask of Life. Go and Paraka. And have been tailing the Tomamari along their journey. So we'll be seeing them pop up very soon. And one final thing. In order to actually resurrect the Great Spirit Robot, someone needs to actually bring the Mask of Life into Karda Nui. Because that is the heart of the robot. They have to somehow get past through the hole while Voya Nui is plummeting down to kickstart the heart of the robot once again in the process of it falling down and Voya Nui returning back into place. Right. So if you wanted to revive or at least prevent Mata Nui from dying, you got to get into Karta Nui with the Mask of Life first. So that's essentially where the stage is set, and we can get back to the story now. <laughs> in these final hours, the Toa Mari made preparations to save both the Matoran of Voya Nui and Mari, leading both One the take, dude, that guy is with the help of gangster, Axon, protector of the Matoran of Voya Nui. The Toa temporarily housed the population of both cities in these safe tunnels to prepare for the descent. He is fueled by raw passion. I give him that. During this migration, the Toa Mari were ambushed by the Paraka, who had been mutated into reptilian snakes. Zaktan took Paraka, some of the Toa hostage as the Paraka swarmed around the Toa in a brutal ambush. Just then, Axon came to the rescue, charging in to defend the Matoran and managing to capture the Paraka under the watchful eyes of the Order of Mata Nui. With the brief battle behind them, the Toa Mari prepared for their descent back into the deep. Right. Housed in an organic half-beast, half-machine, the Toa Mari's armor and weapons were repaired as the powerful transport blasted through the waters to carry them into battle. And as the Toa emerged from their transport, they were immediately attacked by the armies of some of the Baraki, who in turn were chasing after Mantax for the Mask of Life. Yeah. Arriving on the that scene tracks. of the battle were freaks of nature transformed by the mask, like Gadunka, the microscopic plankton now in a massive stature and fueled by a drive to consume. As Holly, Nuparu, Huki, and Kongu engaged the sea monsters, Jaller and Matoro rushed after Mantax to claim the Mask of Life. 
Okay. Ambushing the Baraki with his powers of fire, Jowler separated Mantax from the mask, only for it to fall back into the hands of Hydraxon, who once again prepared oh, to the mask of life. Just then, the Maxilos robot appeared <laughs> on the scene, finally revealing his true identity as the puppet master Dark Lord, Makuta Teradax, to uh -huh. all who stood before him. Defeating Hydraxon in a duel and leaving the mask on the seafloor, Teradax only stood by as Matoro seized the Mask of Life, making no attempts to stop Matoro and stating that he had his own reasons for the Toa to succeed, and that he what? had not lied in the beginning when he claimed he was an ally to Matoro. Elsewhere, the Baraki met at the Razor Whale's teeth, where Mantax revealed that they had been betrayed by one of their own thousands of years ago. Before he could reveal the traitor through a tablet he found on the ocean floor, explosions from a fight between Maxilos and Hydraxon, who now knew Teradax's true identity, caused an avalanche. Takadox exposed himself as a traitor by stealing the tablet and trying to kill Mantax, but the other Baraki did not kill him, instead opting to keep him around just as long until they recovered the Mask of Life. Okay. Immediately afterwards, they were confronted by Maxilos, who revealed himself as the reason behind Everybody is years ago. Makuta Teradax. After a brief battle that left five of the Baraki seemingly unconscious, Takadox presented the ancient Tablet of Transit to Teradax, which had been carved centuries ago as proof of his loyalty to the Brotherhood. Takadox hoped to be spared and offered to betray his fellow warlords once again, but instead, Teradax cast him into a horrific vision of his sea insects turning on him and left him to suffer. Sea insects? Oh, sea insects. While he was distracted, the Baraki, who had faked their unconsciousness, gathered their armies. They ordered them to attack the Maxilos robot, damaging it beyond repair and departing with their armies, intent on acquiring the Ignika again. Hydraxon then found the damaged Maxilos, but noticed that it no longer held any sign of Makuta Teradax, who had once possessed it, but now had mysteriously transferred to another oh, unknown host. Interesting. The Toamari, once again reunited with the Ignika, fired their blasters at the cord and destroyed it, sending Voyanui plummeting to the depths. Did they evacuate everybody? Voyanui to pieces and sank ever deeper towards its original location on the robot. Pulled along in its wake, the Mask of Life was tossed into the current with the Toamari and Baraki in hot pursuit. Catching up with the Mask, Matoro seized it to make a beeline for the gap to Cardanui to restart the heart of the robot. Okay. As he swam, the color slowly faded away from the Mask and all around it felt its life force weaken and die. Wait, what? Matoro had been too late, and the great spirit Matanui was dead. <laughs> Refusing to let their journey end that way, Matoro still continued on his path to Kodanui. What? That was the whole point! The universe. To buy him time, Jalar and the rest of the Toamari made a final stand against the armies of the Baraki and their vicious attacks, fully prepared to sacrifice themselves for Matoro. As Voyanui continued its ascent, Matoro managed to catch up, slipping through the holes in the Cardanui Dome and plummeting down a vast waterfall in the heart of the robot, just before the Voyanui armor plate slammed into place. As the Toamari fought a losing battle against the Baraki and their armies, Jalar realized he would have to make the ultimate sacrifice. Do it, Jalar. A Nova Blast. What the An extreme ability that would prove <laughs> fatal to all around the vicinity of the explosion. The Nova Blast is the ultimate expression of Matoa's new. elemental power that would kill all six Baraki, their armies, but also the remaining Toamari with it. Oh, Despite God. the protests of his teammates, Jaller prepared this suicide detonation, superheating the water around him and radiating with fire and Jaller, stop trying to kill yourself. Meanwhile, as he fell, Matoro felt a strange sense of peace and purpose. Slowly donning the Kanohi Ignika, Mask of Life, Matoro was overwhelmed with information, viewing the entire history of the mask and learning how to activate its sacred power to restart the heart of the universe. Okay. And so, as the consciousness of the mask merged with his mind and Matoro fell through the heart of the robot, he prepared to commit the ultimate sacrifice. Using the last remnant of his individuality, okay. Matoro used the power of the Ignika to teleport the Toa Mari safely back home to Metru Nui. Oh, wow. Reversing their mutations and allowing them to breathe air once again. Wow. And in his final moments, Matoro felt no fear. He knew his friends, the Toamari, had succeeded, and they could resume their lives in Metronui. The Turaga and Matoran across the city would know his friends as true heroes. But Matoro, he never considered himself a hero. As Matoran translated Anuju, as noble Toa Inika, and as Toamari, all he ever tried to do was his duty. Mm. And now, that duty had led him to his destiny. 
Since the day the Mask of Life chose him as its bearer, all roads led to this moment. Matoro's energy mingled and merged with that of the Mask, only to be released in an incredible explosion of light and power and life that surged through the Great Spirit. In that instant, Matoro, Toa of Ice, Keeper of Secrets, and Hero truly died so that Mata Nui can live Holy again. shit, first real death in the whole series. <laughs> no one could explain the wonderful feeling that swept across the universe, but all knew the reason for it. Back safely on land in Metru Nui, Jaller deactivated his Nova Blast charge, and the five remaining Toamari sat in silence, remembering their comrade and friend. In a grand ceremony to honor Matoro, the population what a of hero. Nui celebrated his life and sacrifice, bathed in the warm glow he was of a true friend. Nui's light. The Toamari's fight was over, and all their trials had led to this moment. Epilogue. Scroll of Preparations. Part two. How how was the there of the so Greek many hours left? <laughs> the quest for the Toa Nuva was Wait. far from over. Thank you for the gift, these Watanabe. Death, uh, still thank you very much. The great slumber. The Nuva's how duty it? still remained. How? Revive the great spirit Mananui and restore him. They did that. Side. And so, while they had failed to recover the staff of Artaka, the Toa Nuva continued on their quest to fulfill the Scroll of Preparations. Tahu and Kopaka went to Artadax to quell a series of active volcanoes, while Onua and Pohatu journeyed to obtain an artifact known as the Heart of the Visorak, controlling the Visorak hordes to gather in Artadax, wiping the, the scourge of the insect Wait, it's, spiders it's, it's, off the face of the universe <laughs> once and for all. With the Visorak extinct, meanwhile, Liwa ventured to what remained of Mana Nui to find a sundial, ordered by a librarian very loved around here. telepathic voice inside his head. Gali also went to Mata Nui to mark the location of the Red Star. While doing so, she activated her Kanohia Kaku and discovered that the to the shock, Kaku. there was movement within the mysterious satellite and potential living telescope? beings trapped deep in space. As she hurriedly went to find the other Toa Nuva, <laughs> she was transported by Botar to Daxia, where the Toa Nuva were reunited. Bro, there, Botar there is no way the people at fucking Lego that worked on this 99.9% .9 of them did not know any of this shit <laughs> when they're making it. So there's no way, dude. Gave them the staff of Artaka, which was used to repair the damage done in the Great Cataclysm as the final item on their scroll of preparations. With their list complete, the Toa Nuva were ordered to gather in the mysterious realm of Artaka, where their next mission was about to commence in an epic final battle in the heart of the robot, Karda Nui. Previously on Bionicle <laughs> Retold, Chapter 7, The Ignition Trilogy, Part 2, Sacrifice. In a deadly countdown to the death of the Matoran universe, the this is the big one. Nika this is the big one. If we can make it through this, it's all downhill from here. If we can make it through the Ignition Trilogy, Part 3, then we're good. Okay, this is where I really need to fucking, we gotta steal up. We gotta fucking steal up. You gotta grit your teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Mask of life spiral deep beneath the black waters of the pit, forever changing Fuck! the course Fuck! of destiny for the Matoran dwelling in the underwater city of Mari Nui. Hunted by the exiled Baraki warlords and encountering ancient hunters brought back to life, the Toa Mari, led by Jala and Matoro, fought bravely beneath the waves. As they struggled to bring Mata Nui back to life, they were unexpectedly aided by the Dark Lord Makuda Teradax, who pulled the strings of their success for his own mysterious reasons. And finally, in a tragic sacrifice to save the life of the Great Spirit Robot, Matoro donned the Mask of Life, giving his own life to save the universe. And in faraway lands, the Toa Nuva, original team of heroes, sought to fulfill the Scroll of Preparations, an ancient document detailing a list of tasks to prepare for Mata Nui's revival. Along their journeys, they restored the Rahaga to their rightful forms, resurrecting the powerful Toa Haga, and ultimately gathered in Artaka to face their final destiny. This is Bionicle Retold. Let's go! <sighs> Chapter 8 the Ignition Trilogy, Part 3, Rising. Part 1, Siege of Karda Nui. 
In the darkness of the Brotherhood of Makuta's lair, factories churned and dark experiments on Krata worms brought vile shadow leeches to life, parasitic insects capable of draining all light and morality from Toa or Matoran. After delivering the staff of Artaka to Teradax within the pit, Makuta Ikrax returned to their fortress on Destro, eager to test his new shadow leeches. Calling for his Matoran servant Voltraz, the twisted Ta Matoran with an ancient rivalry with Mazika, Ikarax drained what little light was left in the devious Ta Matoran's heart, completing his first successful test of the insectoid creatures. During his missions for the Brotherhood, Voltraz discovered a secret entrance to Kata Nui, the heart use, of the Matoran universe, and I can reported hear his findings to the assembled Makuta. Still deep in the waters of the pit in his Maxilos form, Makuta Teradax telepathically received the news and ordered all available Makuta to venture into the core of the universe and seize the land for the Brotherhood. Okay. And so, the gates of the Brotherhood's Destral Fortress swung open, with an army of oh, Makuta shit. sweeping forth, headed straight for Kata Nui, the heart of the robot. Leading this strike force was the aggressive yet honorable Makuta Antros, general of the Brotherhood's oh, army shit. and New characters. commander of their legions. Wielding the Kanohi Jutlin, Mask of Corruption, Is there a commercial? Antros possessed the unique ability to break down any inorganic object with a single thought. Close behind him was the incredibly ambitious Makuta Biddle, who followed Teradax only to gain more influence <laughs> Link and keep his worth. Biddle wore the Kanohi Mochi, Biddle. Mask of Time Duplication, which allowed him to summon past versions of himself to fight as his own personal legion. <laughs> That's kind of hype. <laughs> Aiding them was a fanatical Gorast, a true believer of Teradax's plan who was willing to face death to see it carried through. With the Kanohi Fellness, Mask of Is there of six? I bet there's six. Gorast had the incredible dangerous ability to disrupt any natural powers of an enemy via touch, which she could use to interfere with the Toa's innate elemental abilities. Assisting them from above was Makuta Vampra, the mute hunter who never spoke oh. a single word, using his Kanohi <laughs> Avsa, Mask of Hunger, to drain positive emotions from his target. In addition to the warriors, two top Brotherhood scientists were brought along to assist their research and creation of new Rahi. The first of these scientists was Makuta Chirox, infamous for creating vicious Chirox. and destructive Rahi. Okay. His rival was Makuta Mutron, an eccentric, nearly insane scientist who specialized in mutations that were extreme. in nature. Both scientists swore copies of the Kanohi Shellek, which allowed them to deafen or mute targets. Neither scientist had respect for the other's mutations, driving a professional and personal rivalry between the professional. two. Professional. And finally, there was Krika. <laughs> Where do they the do science? and regretful Makuta, who believed that nothing good would come out of Teradax's grand plan if it succeeded, but supported him out of fear and self-preservation. Krika wore the Kanohi Crast, Mask of Repulsion, which allowed him to repel any object away from himself at high speeds, including the ground itself, which he used to fly through the air. <laughs> and as the hordes of Makuta rushed to Kardanui with their shadow leeches, seeking to turn the entire Matoran population Yo, I to have darkness, the mask on my face. Ikarak stayed behind, <laughs> tired of following Pterodax's orders, and believing the attack on Kardanui to be a suicide mission. Oh yeah, definitely. Okay, so I just introduced, or at least reintroduced, <laughs> many characters that really haven't gotten a lot of focus until this particular chapter. So I wanted to take this time to really address Holy which of these are really shit. important to follow throughout the course of this Holy chapter, and which shit. ones you can kind of just see as background enemies or background Makuta. So first off is Makuta Krika. So Krika is really the closest thing we have to a quote-unquote good Makuta. Again, as I mentioned, he's very reluctant to follow He's one of the good ones. Plan. And actually, he was the Makuta to free, secretly, Makuta Miserix. He spared Miserix's life, who was the original ruler of Makuta thousands of years ago. So Krika has already kind of revolted against Teradax in his own ways. 
And what's really important is that Makuta Mizrix, who was the original leader of the Brotherhood of Makuta, will actually be reappearing this chapter. Holy shit, I moves. can't so wait. Just remember that in the past, <laughs> <laughs> he was kind of thrown out by Teradax, overthrown as the ruler. But Holy Kuka shit, Miserix is back. And instead took him to a deserted island instead of killing him. So Miserix will be coming back in a bit. With those folks aside, basically what we have next is Makuta Antros here. Honestly, Antros is just the leader of the army, but really he doesn't have that much to do character development wise. He basically just stays steadfast as a strong leader for the Makuta. So. He's the main guy you'll see in many of the fight sequences mm. and many of the aspects where he's leading the Makuta into battle in Cardanui, but his character doesn't really do too, too much. Character development. Same goes for Vampra over here because Vampra is literally mute. Vampra does not speak whatsoever. There's not a lot of character <laughs> stuff going on here. So you can really just see Vampra as another one of oh, the Oh, Chad, I'm getting sword of the lore. I'm turning into Vampra. Next up, really the only thing you need to remember about Makuta Chirox here is that she's very, very devoted to Makuta Teradax's plan. She's willing to risk anything to make it happen. So just remember that about her character. And she really doesn't ever change. She's just very much a fanatic for Makuta Teradax. Makuta Biddle here is basically just another enemy. Not really much to do character development wise, but just some other enemy for them to fight. Okay. And the two scientists that we've got here are really only important during these scientist scenes. They actually have a really fun interpersonal dynamic between them because they're very much rivals, not really respect. Well, he really each loves it. There are many He really truly loves it and I respect that. When they appear they're relevant. He loves again, the little stuff, he loves the big stuff. He loves the little interactions, he loves the jokes creating stuff for the Makuta. And that's why they've been brought alongside for the ride. Now Makuta Icarax here actually, as I mentioned, sits out most of the action, at least for the first half of this chapter. He becomes very, very important in the later halves of this chapter, where he actually kind of joins the fray and starts to embark on his own personal missions that deviate from Teradax's main plans. Mm. But for the most part, you're not going to be seeing Icarax for a lot of the early parts of the initial Karda Nui invasion. So you can kind of just set him aside for now and just remember that Icarax chose not to go to Karda Nui because Thank you for the 30 months. <laughs> Teradax's plan to be crazy. And speaking of Teradax himself, we last saw him in the Maxilos form in the Mari Nui chapter, which was last chapter. Yeah. And Teradax basically just will not appear throughout this entire chapter until the very end because he's been setting a lot of stuff up on his own, very mysterious things going on with Teradax. So there's kind of a big reveal near the end of the chapter. I'm not going to spoil it here, but that's why you're not actually going to see him for basically. The reveal all is that Teradax, Teradax is somebody. He's really the guy pulling the strings behind all of these Makuta. <laughs> he's the one who mysteriously sent all of the Makuta to Cardanui. He wanted to make sure they were all there. So there's something he's planning, and you're going to find out in a little bit. <laughs> And finally, the last thing I wanted to mention is the Matorid <laughs> Voltraz here. If you recall back to chapters 1 and 2, Voltraz was one of the most evil Tomatorid. He murdered a ton of people and essentially murdered the mentor of the Matorid Mezica. So Mezica or Mezeka has this very strong rivalry with Voltraz and presumed him dead. So when Mezica thought he killed him, mm. Voltraz actually was recruited by the Brotherhood of Makuta to be a Matoran spy for the Makuta. <laughs> At this point in the story, he's basically just serving Icarax, and oh he God. will actually crop up. This quite is a the lot. most However, complex Voltraz web of lore. Kind of have their own story that's completely <sighs> tangential to Cardanui. It's still pretty important, but it's not really too related to the main events. So only try to remember them or remember that they're relevant for their own particular parts of the story. They actually go explore some alternate dimensions. Things get really crazy. Doesn't really matter for the main Cardanui plotline. And with all those Makuta summed up, it's time to get back to the main story. In a swift attack, darkness descended upon Cardanui. The seven Makuta blasted through the secret entrance to Cardanui, taking the Avmatoran population by surprise and converting each village one by one to darkness with their shadow leeches. The Makuta strike force split up, one half led by Antros to infect the villages, with the other half led by Krika to descend into the swamps at the bottom of Cardanui, blocking off any escape routes. In this decisive attack, all Avmatoran villages succumbed to darkness, save for one. 
and just as the final village was about to be destroyed, a colossal rumbling <laughs> shook the stalactite villages of Tardanui. <laughs> the Toa Mari had just succeeded in their quest to restore Voyanui, plugging the hole in Tardanui's Is Atriok worried that real life will feel bland after this? <laughs> completing his noble sacrifice and restarting the heart of Cardanui. Yeah, man, as I just, donned the I can't imagine anything ever living up to this ever again. incredible light engulfed the surroundings, mm. the three Makuta who had been laying siege to the final village were struck with this outburst of light, permanently blinding them. Disoriented and enraged, Antras, Vampra, and Chirox faltered in their attack, allowing three Avmatoran from the final village, Tanma, Solek, and Photok, to strike Who are back, these? quickly trying to gain the upper hand with their customized jetpacks and blades of light. As the battle continued, the three blinded Makuta called for their newly turned Shadow Matoran to merge with them. Oh my god, they're merging. The telepathy. As the battle for the final Kadanui village raged on, the six Toa Nuva were granted the honor to set foot in the realm of Artaka. Having completed the scroll of preparations to prepare the universe for Mata Nui's awakening, nice. the six original Toa were greeted by the mysterious Artaka, who had opened the gates of his oh, fortress this for guy. the first time in millennia to welcome in the Toa. All around them, an indescribably ancient yet young voice rang out from the <laughs> fortress, the rocks, the trees, and even the air itself. As Tahu listed off the completed tasks from the scroll of preparations, Artaka was pleased. Materializing from the very air in front of them were sets of strange armor, weapons, and masks. Oh, new toys! These were the adaptive armor pieces, Artaka's greatest creations. Wherever the Toa should journey, the armor would adapt to their surroundings. No terrain, no climate, no wind or wave would ever again be their master. And as the Toa Nuva donned their new gear, their surroundings Holy began to morph before their eyes, shit. teleporting the six heroes to the world that feeds the world. The heart of the Matoran universe, Karda Nui. When their vision finally cleared, they were in midair, high above a strange Matoran village. Somehow their armor had shifted in a hundred ways, making it possible for them to stay aloft. But there was no time to wonder about that, for all around them, a battle raged in the sky. Go, Toa Nuva! The voice of Artaka echoed throughout this new land. Go and find your destiny at last. And so, in a blinding flash of light, the six Toa Nuva appeared on the scene. Tahu, Toa of Fire, now sprouted quadruple jetpacks and a blazing shield quadruple of fire. Quadruple jetpacks. Golly, Toa of Water, <laughs> utilized a high-powered scoped <laughs> rifle complete with aerodynamic fins on her mast to soar through the sky. Sick. Liwa, Toa of Air, was truly in his element, soaring above <laughs> the ground with dual jetpacks and an energy sword. Only two Kopaka, jetpacks? Toa of Ice, now sported metallic wings and a laser scope on his adaptive Akaku. Kohatu, Toa of Stone, had his armor morphed to an orange color, with dual propeller claws to keep him afloat. And Onua, Toa of Earth, used ankle-mounted propulsion engines in conjunction Onua has with done a nothing the entire pump. show. The entire the six, Toa six hours. He's never been Makuta, mentioned. They quickly realized that the Makuta could only see through the eyes of their shadow Matoran. Targeting the corrupted former Avmatoran, the Toa temporarily drove back He's the had no Makuta, impact. giving him a chance to meet up with Tanma and the other Avmatoran to discuss the situation. Oh As Kohatu God, examined again. their surroundings, memories flashed before his mind, and he soon realized that not only had the Toa been to Kardanui before, but it was the source of their original power. Quickly Holy catching shit. up on recent events, the six Toa Nuva realized that Matoro had sacrificed himself to save the universe, yeah, it was and based. that Kanohi Ignika, Mask of Life, had fallen somewhere in the swamps at the base of Kardanui. Oh, it still exists? Eventually, the team decided to split up. One half of the team, consisting of Tahu, Gali, and Onua, would fly down to the swamps to search for the Kanohi Ignika, while Kopaka's team of himself, Pohatu, and Liwa stayed to fight Antraz's Makuta strike force. And so, <laughs> as the Toa Nuva split up on their separate missions, the final battle for the Matoran universe was upon us, and the stage was set for the ultimate clash between Toa and Makuta. Part 2. Elsewhere in the Universe while the Toa Nuva fought bravely in Kadanui, other Toa teams throughout the universe were pursuing their own vital destiny to awaken Mata Nui. The Toa Mari, led by Jaller, were sworn in as the official guardians of Metru Nui, and were immediately thrust into action to defend the city from the rampaging Kardas Dragon, which had left Voya Nui after being separated from Vazon and had been drawn to the Grand City of Legends. Meanwhile, the Toa Haga, recently restored from their Rahaga forums and back in the action, had turned over the devious Rudaka into the custody of the Order of Mata Nui, and were given a new task, 
find and destroy the elusive Makuda Pterodax, who had last been seen in robotic Maxilos form, but whose spirit was nowhere to be found. To aid them in their task, the Order of Matanui delivered the Paraka Zaktan to their custody, who had a special telepathic link to Pterodax due to his prolonged antidermis exposure during the events of the Voya Nui saga. As the Haga received their mission, Gaki was struck with a terrifying vision from her Mask of Clairvoyance, which showed the Haga journeying to a place All of right, death, catch me up, what happened? <laughs> and that one among them would never return. I didn't miss so much. During this time, the Order of Mata Nui dispatched many of its most powerful agents elsewhere in the universe. What happened? What happened? with trials of their own. The most interesting part? No, I didn't miss his it. personal temptation and surrendered the staff of Artaka to both. Wait, I kind of want to know what happened. What the happened? The Order of Mata Nui rescued him, fitting him with a breathing helmet to survive on land again and declaring him a probationary member of the Order. Brutaka's first mission it brought all him to makes the city sense of Nui, where he was accompanied no. by Toa Helmets. No, I can figure it out. I can catch up. I can figure it out. Toa of Sonics, who had finally passed his trials to become a full member of the Order. Okay. In Metronui, this Order of Matanui strike team recovered the ancient sundial of Matanui, <laughs> which Toa Liwa had left in the archives according to a they got the sundial, great. Head, sent secretly by the Order during their time achieving the Scroll of Preparations. Using a Kanoka disc of shrinking, Brutaka miniaturized the sundial, placing it in the care of Toa Krakua. Okay. Elsewhere, Botar and Trinuma, another member of the Order, were on a secret supply run to the weapons manufacturing island of Zia to prepare for Brutaka's next mission. Unbeknownst to the pair of Order agents, but Makuta Ikarax, pursuing his own goals, had also been lurking on the Who's island of Zia, and in a surprise attack, he ambushed Botar and Trinuma, using his magnetic power to crush Botar's armor, killing one of the most powerful members of Botar's the Botar's dead?! Barely escaping with his life, Trinuma managed to store the weapons elsewhere and hurried to report the tragic loss to Helrix. Managing to seize Pterodax's old Mask of Shadows, Makuta Ikarax returned to the How the fuck could Botar die? Fortress, crowning himself as a de facto leader of the Brotherhood in Pterodax's absence. Back on Metru Nui, Takanuva, Toa of Light, patrolled the streets, defeating vicious camps of Frostilis Rahi that preyed on the Matoran and serving as guardian of the City of Legends alongside the Toa Mari. Yeah, good Just shit. Just then, Makuta Ikarax descended upon the city with a sole target in mind, Toa Takanuva. As Ikarax deployed his shadow leeches, Takanuva was struck by surprise, and to his horror, the leech began to suck the light from him, no. draining the gold from his armor and filling no. his mind with dark thoughts. In the final moments <laughs> of this agonizing struggle, Takanuva managed to blast the leech with a thin ray of light, just before he succumbed to unconsciousness, collapsing on the ground. Pleased with this display, Ikarax swiftly departed Metru Nui without alerting the Toa Mari, hoping he had permanently turned Takanuva to the dark. He sent one Dimensional leech. Interlude 1, <laughs> Trials of Takanuva. When he awoke, Takanuva uh, what found is himself dimensional? deep beneath the archives, and realized that as a result of his light being partially drained, he now wielded control of both shadow and light. Just then, Toa Helrix, leader of the Order of Mata Nui, and Toa Krakua of Sonics approached him. Using the mental powers of a specialized Kratana Rahi, Helrix cast Takanuva in a vision of the past. The Toa of Light watched as memories flashed before his eyes, showcasing the Toa Mata training in Kata Nui and being sent to slumber. The visions delved deeper into the past, showing the construction of the great spirit robot himself and how the Mata Nui AI consciousness took over from the entity Tren Krom. It's Tren Krom again. the heart of Kata Nui and filling the entire land with lethal energy storms. As Takanuva awoke from his vision, Helrix and Krakua informed him that if the Toa Nuva succeeded in awakening Mata Nui, these devastating energy storms that powered the heart of the robot would be unleashed once more, destroying everything in their path except for the spherical Kodrex structure within the swamps. Helrex then tasked Takanuva with a vital mission, to warn the Toa Nuva to take so refuge within the Kodrex should they succeed and aid them in their battle against the Makuta. As a recap of Chapter 1 Beginnings, the Kodrex was... <laughs> So why do they even want to do it? Why are they trying to wake the robot up to begin with? What did they get out of it? They were living on an island peacefully. He's tripped out, by the way. Why? What? The whole point is to get the... the every step of the way, it causes destruction. If they wake the robot, it kills everyone in the city down here. And destroying the island killed everybody in the island. It was a mysterious metal sphere housed within Karta Nui, which is the heart of the Great Spirit Robot. Inside this metal sphere were six giant light stones, 
which were designed to be fueled by the powers of the six telemata. If they fuel the elemental storm trooper Hawaiian these shirt, that's actually so they base. They essentially use these to shock the heart of the great spirit Mata Nui, reawakening him should he ever fall into slumber. Think of it as a giant defibrillator for the massive Mata Nui robot. Now, of course, as soon as you wake him up, the massive energy storms inside his heart would consume any living being within Karta Nui, killing them instantly because it's essentially a massive factory of energy deep within there. As Takanuva agreed to follow Helrix's plan, Brutaka emerged Noted, from the sir. Shadows, Noted. introducing himself as a member of the Order of Mata Nui. Having heard tales of the once greedy fallen warrior, Takanuva was suspicious of the Titan, but was forced was forced to let Brutaka assist him with the power of his Kanohi Olmak, Mask of Dimensional Gates. Krakua then handed Takanuva the shrunken great sundial of Mata Nui, explaining that the great beings themselves had forged the sundial for a singular purpose, to locate the Kodrex in Karta Nui. And so, Brutaka activated the power of his Olmak, ripping open an interdimensional oh, is it gateway. P? Shit. As Takanuva prepared for his journey, Journey through the inner space between dimensions to teleport to Karta Nui, Brutaka struggled to gain control over his mask, which had been severely damaged in the pressurized waters beneath the pit. As Takanuva rocketed through space and time, he viewed glimpses of other worlds beyond space and time, pushed through <laughs> countless alternate timelines by the power of the damaged Olmak. For every decision made in the core universe, an alternate timeline sprung up where a different outcome occurred. Oh my the god, there's a bionicle of multiverse? multiverse were endless. <laughs> Branches of energy rippled through the timeline, and Takanuva found himself thrust from our main so timeline. So it doesn't matter. Into a it doesn't matter what we're learning. When he came to, he found himself surrounded it in a doesn't forest matter. of black trees and dying grass. Within this strange parallel universe, he came upon a majestic city of silver rising from the barren wasteland. Within the city, he encountered a breed of biomechanical beings known as Kastora. Subs, I'm and sorry. over his time spent in this silver city, he found the Kastora to be devious, unfeeling beings, and encountered the Spectral Mask, where after many trials and battles, Takanuva earned the respect of this mysterious being, which opened up a new dimensional gateway for him on his long journey back to our core universe. Okay. Dimensional Interlude 2, <laughs> The Kingdom of Dude, Mata I can't Nui. do it. I can't do it. I'm, Enter I'm... the Kingdom Universe. <laughs> As Matoro rushed to I'm save the life it. of the Great I'm Spirit Mata Nui, he I'm faltered for it. just a moment, failing to reach Karta Nui in time and dooming the entire universe to darkness and death in this alternate version of our main world. In his failure, Matoro was disgraced, and all in the Matoran universe shunned him, naming him the Disgraced One, and forcing him into life in solitude in a tiny hut to himself. As the Matoran universe collapsed and fell into disarray, a mass migration of all species fled in panic from the dying universe, seeking refuge on the island of Mata Nui. It was in this time of chaos that the Order of Mata Nui finally revealed themselves, teaming with Takanuva to beat back the Brotherhood of Makuta and stop them from escaping. In the narrow tunnels to Mata Nui, Huki and Pohatu were tragically killed by rampaging Rakshi, and Jalur, Tahu, and Kopaka were too late to save them. To force the Makuta in, Takanuva erected great barriers of light to instantly destroy any beings of shadow, and in right. this final act of power, Takanuva of this universe used his remaining light energy to create a team of six Toa from the Voya Nui <laughs> Resistance Team plus six Kata, new Toa! transforming into a Turaga in the process. In this act of sacrifice, Turaga Takanuva established the kingdom of the Great Spirit, where all previously warring species worked together in harmony to survive. <laughs> he then named Toa Helrix, Turaga Duma, Rudaka, the Shadowed One, the Skakti Warlord Nektan, and a Ninra Ghost Weapons Manufacturer as members of this ruling council. What? The Dark Hunters became he put his the Shadow One? Forces, and the Toa assisted in keeping the island of Mata Nui together, as well as creating new land to expand this glorious kingdom. <laughs> 10,000 years after the establishment of the kingdom, <laughs> Wait, the Takanuva of our prime reality found himself careening through interdimensional gateways. What the finally fuck is going on? Of energy and what the on fuck the is going on? Of Nui. Landing a meeting with his alternate Taraka self, Takanuva was tasked with a new quest. Recent attacks on the kingdom had increased in ferocity, and somehow the Rakshi commanded by Makuta Teradax were slipping past the barriers. They just of casually went 10,000 years in the future? They promised to help Toa Takanuva return to our prime universe should he assist the kingdom in their defense against the beings of shadow. What? And so, Takanuva was armed with a power lance and Midax Skyblaster cannon, teaming with Tanma, <laughs> now Toa of Light. 
before embarking on their mission. Dude, I, Toa I have no on idea. Visiting I'm, I'm first, lost. Convincing the I'm lost. Toa of Ice to accompany them as a chance to be seen as a hero again. And so the trio set forth to the abandoned Powahi Borok tunnels, encountering the Powahi Borok tunnels, Hakshi sporting shadow armor, which allowed them to pass through the barriers. After a long fight with the Rakshi, the three Toa watched as a monstrous behemoth emerged from the darkness. This was Makuda Teradax. He had driven Makuda Ikarax from his armor and possessed it, and went on to absorb all other Makuda in his essence. Okay. As Takanuva, Tanma, and Matoro engaged this monstrous <laughs> opponent, Toa Tanma was disintegrated completely, but oh, not God. before he and Takanuva were able to knock the Mask of Shadows off Teradax's face and destroy it. Oh, good job. In a last-ditch attempt, Makuda Teradax created a Shadow Hand to absorb Matoro into his essence, and while Takanuva attempted to stop this, Matoro willingly let himself be absorbed, overpowering Wait, the will Matoro of Teradax sacrifice from himself again? and sacrificing himself to destroy the Makuda. Didn't he already do this? Returning to the surface, surface alone, Takanuva told the populace of the brave sacrifices of Matoro and Tanma, staying just long enough to see a statue made in honor of Matoro <laughs> until asking the alternate Brutaka of this universe to use his Olmak, he did. ripping open yet another dimensional gate for Takanuva to travel to destinations unknown oh and get closer god. to our prime universe. Oh my god. Part 3. Rise of the Oh Ignita. my god. Back in Kadanui, the Toanuva's battle against the Brotherhood of Makuta raged on. As Tahu, Onua, and Gali dove down into the mist-filled swamps of Kadanui, Kopaka, Pohatu, and Liwa had a chance to talk more Part with three of Kata Part Nui, Three, learning of their past while defending the village from attack. In a brief moment between battle, Solek, the Matoran of Light, told the Toa of the mysterious, fragmented keystone, a device that, according to legend, had an important role to How play. How many hidden devices are there? Giving Kopaka his piece of the keystone, Solek explained that there were five other hidden keystone pieces scattered across Cardanui, and the Toa Nuva would need to collect them to awaken the Great Spirit. <laughs> Meanwhile, Liwa and Tenma managed to ambush and capture a flying Shadow Matoran who turned out to be Kirop, the former oh, of course leader it did. of the Avmatoran village. Of course it After did. After Tahu's team arrived in the swamp, they decided to split up in order to cover more ground in their search for the Kanohi Ignika. While searching, Tahu discovered the massive spherical Kodrex, hurled backwards by the sphere's powerful energy field. As Tahu crashed into the swamp, he was discovered by Makuta Krika, who now sported a monstrous, insectoid appearance due to his exposure to the pit mutagen in the swamp. Oh, of course As he Krika does. approached the fallen Toa of Fire, he began to explain his personal philosophy and motivations, <laughs> all while using the power of his mass to drain the heat around Tahu. Desperate for help, Tahu then used his remaining power and launched a fireball into the air as a signal mm. to his teammates. Oh shit. Meanwhile, deep within the Makuta Shadow Leech Hive, which had been erected on the ceiling of the Kardanui Dome, Neutron and Shirox, the two Makuta scientists, were hard at work creating a monstrous rocky beast by order of Andros. As they bickered over the qualities of the beast, Shirox summoned a Shadow Matoran to him throwing the helpless servant into the vat and creating a foul and gruesome Rahi. Arriving at the cave, Antros explained his plan. The arrival of the Toa Nuva had foiled their plans to convert all the Kardanui Matoran to their side, and in order to win the battle, they would need to call on Makuda Ikarax, self-proclaimed leader of the Brotherhood, to turn the tide. Wary of underestimating their opponents, Antros sent the Rahi Abomination out to distract the Toa long enough for Mutron's personal assistant, a shadow Matora named Vika His to PA. split past the Toa and summon Ikarax. Back in the swamps of Kata Nui, Onua fended off wild Nui Kopin Rahi, searching for the Mask of Life. All right, I hope he then, finds it. He was ambushed by Makuta Biddle, who used his time duplication mask to surround Onua with an army of his past selves. Yep. Thinking fast, Onua engaged in battle, and as his adaptive armor shifted to mirror a strange blaster Biddle was wielding, Onua struck Biddle with a sphere of energy, sending him plummeting to the swamps below. And as Onua fought Biddle, Gali was attacked by Makuta Goras in another part of the swamp, but not before claiming another keystone for the Toa Nuva. As Goras struck Gali with her light draining stinger, Tahu's emergency fire blast rose in the distance, and as Gali struggled to get free, Onua arrived on the scene. With Gali saved from Goras and the Makuta temporarily defeated, Gali and Onua rocketed off to save Tahu and reunite with their team leader. While the Toa Nuva searched for the keystones in the Ignika, the Mask of Life itself was sitting deep beneath the waters of Kardanui Swamp. 
reaching out with its life energy, the consciousness within the mask of life drew the particles drifting through the swamp water to build itself a body. Inspired by Matoro's sacrifice, the Ignika wished to experience life and serve as a hero like Matoro and the rest of the Toamari. And as this new being generated a skyboard, he flew out of the water, sensing the Toa Nuva up above, hoping to establish the first friendships of his life. And with that, the most powerful Toa in the history of the Matoran okay. universe was born. Okay. Toa Ignika, sporting the consciousness Holy of the shit. mask of life itself. Interlude. <laughs> the Federation of Fear. No more interludes, bro. As Takanuva hurtled through the multiverse and the Toa Nuva faced trials and danger in Holy Kardinu, shit, Toa Ignika is of here. The was occupied with a singular task. Find and kill Makuta Terra. It's so badass, I'm and shaking. So, the order tasked their probationary <laughs> member, Brutaka, to assemble a team of outcasts, rejects, and criminals to find and free the former <laughs> Suicide leader squad. of Makuta. Makuta Miserix, who Teradax had Oh, they gotta find Miserix. And were secretly saved from death by Makuta Krika. And so, after preparations were made and an odd assortment of beings were assembled, Brutaka approached a prison cell holding five criminals, captured by the Order of Mata Nui. As the prisoners awoke in a daze, Brutaka approached to explain their mission, stating that there were two, and only two ways they would ever be allowed to leave their cell. <laughs> either by carrying out a mission for some friends of his, or by being promptly killed and dumped in an unmarked grave. All the inmates had something in common. They all dealt with the Brotherhood of Makuta at some point in their lives. First up was Rudaka, former queen of the Vizorak, who betrayed oh the Brotherhood my God, to the Dark no one Hunters, ever leaves and the betrayed show. the Dark Hunters as well. Now both sides wanted her dead. Next were Takadox and Karapar, oh, former all the villains. whose armies were crushed 80,000 years ago by the Brotherhood, who had been quietly kidnapped from the waters of the pit and recruited for this team. Sulking in the corner of the cell was the fourth member, the disgraced Makuta Spiria, who had fouled up an experiment on the island of Zakaz so badly that his own people marked him for death. <laughs> this was, of course, the Makuta responsible for mutating the Skakti race into criminal thugs, oh, yeah. barbarians, and warriors. <laughs> and lastly, there was Vazon, who had recently been saved from the Zyglak who dragged him away in the pit and now found himself face to face with the rest of the strike force. Right. Despite Vazon's objections that he had never had any dealings with the Brotherhood and they likely confused him with his other half, Vazok, Brutaka forced him in line, revealing the second thing that the band of criminals had in common with each other. They were all completely expendable, and their deaths would make no difference in the great. The expendables! Of the As such, this Federation of Fear was made up of the perfect candidates for a suicide mission. So, if you're a fan of DC Comics, it's probably pretty clear exactly what this is. The Federation of Fear is basically Bionicle's answer to the Suicide Squad. And this is actually a direct influence because the writer of Bionicle, Greg Farshti, is a big fan of comic books. Now this story serial is probably one of my favorites throughout all of Bionicle, and it really does wonders to <laughs> Vazon's character, making him one of the funniest and most entertaining characters in the entire Bionicle world. If the Federation of Fear is Bionicle's version of Suicide Squad, Vazon is definitely Bionicle's version of Deadpool. And unfortunately, <laughs> because I have to recap the story as quickly and concisely as possible, a lot of Vazon's most funny remarks and actions really aren't covered too closely within this retelling. So if you are interested in this concept and want to learn more about this, definitely go check out the Federation of Fear online story serial, which actually is fully hosted on Biosector 01 today, which is the biggest Bionicle wiki. Brutaka and his team, Rudaka, Vazon, Karapar, Takadox, and Makuta Spiria, had arrived on the shores of the island of Stealth in a small boat. As soon as Rudaka recognized the skyline, she began to protest. Stealth was the home of the late Sidorak, her former comrade, and his people. Worse, Rudaka had set up Sidorak to be killed, and it was likely everyone on Stealth knew that. But Brutaka insisted they would need a bigger boat to get where they were going, and this was the easiest place to get one. The only other team member to voice an objection was Spiria, who believed Brotherhood of Makuta agents were waiting in every village to grab him. Just as Rudaka began to question Brutaka as to how they would purchase a boat, she was swiftly bound by Karapar, and Brutaka approached the Steltian craftsman with a deal. He could give them his largest boat, and in return, they would surrender Rudaka to him, or he could claim the bounty for one of the most wanted beings on Stelt. As they bartered, Takadox snuck away, hypnotizing the crew of the ship with his mental powers to wow. jump overboard, while Vazon distracted the trader long enough for Brutaka to knock him unconscious, ending the ruse and claiming the boat for the Federation. <laughs> 
after days of sailing, Makuta Spiria made his move, betraying the team and summoning a contingent of Zyglak to commandeer the boat. Despite this quick and sudden betrayal, Brutaka made no attempt to stop the rogue Makuta, and as Spiria changed course to seek revenge on the Skakti, his Zyglak armies were beset by members of Elex species, allowing Brutaka to regain control of his team and threatened to reveal Spiria's location to the Brotherhood should he attempt to betray them again. It was then that Brutaka revealed the sixth member of the team, the devious I Dark Hunter six. Mariska, I knew there'd be six. I knew there'd be six. to follow them and intervene with Brutaka's allies should any member betray the team. <laughs> Journeying to the southern regions of the universe, the Federation Lariska. of Spears came across a barren island, where the weapons collected by Botar and Trinuma had been deposited. I can't believe I told my friends I would be busy tonight. Deposited <laughs> in haste following the attack by Makuta Ithorax. Just as the squad of anti-heroes approached the central cavern on the small <laughs> island, they began to hear the sounds of a massive organism breathing. A wet, hollow sound as if inhaling through mud. Before the Federation had a chance to flee, vast walls of rock suddenly sprang up from the shoreline, forming a 200-foot-high wall around the island and cutting the team off from their boat. Sharp spears of stone erupted from the ground itself. Okay, I'm gonna try something. <laughs> I'm gonna... I need to do a quiz. One quiz. If I get one question right, I'm going to 1.25 speed. Because <laughs> there's no way I finish by midnight and that'll be the end of Bionicle Day, you know? Bionicle lore quiz. Bionicle quizzes. Uh, how much do you know about Bionicle? Oh, God. This is not mentioned. <laughs> Who wrote Bionicle? Uh, he just said it, right? Wasn't it Greg? Did I get it right? What was the prototype name for Bionicle? <laughs> That's not in there. That's not in there. BioQuest. <laughs> What's the largest Toa team? <laughs> I don't fucking know. <laughs> it's, not, it's not in there. <laughs> Who is Toa Lee Khan? Oh, I know that. He's, well, I don't know which one of these he is. He's a leader. He's a leader of the, this is Toa Mata teacher, Toa Mata leader. Toa Maori leader? I don't know. I assume he's a leader. He's a Toa Mata leader. How many times is Rattler rated? Three times. What does Carta mean? <laughs> I don't fucking know. Carta, 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 Carta. Carta is the is the, what he called the. It's the heart. Prefix for iron. Oh fuck me. Effie, I'm gonna guess. <laughs> Who is the seventh Toanua? Takanuva. Easy. Easy. Okay, that one counts. I know that one. That's the right answer. I, I shouldn't know this. I shouldn't know this, but I do. So I learned something. Uh, Who's the main villain? Fucking Pterodax, bro. That's good enough. That's good. <laughs> Holy fuck. That's good. I'm going 0.25, at least for a little bit, dude. I think I got to we got to make some progress. Impaling the wings of Makuta Spiria, who attempted to flee. <laughs> All around them, a slimy, repulsive voice <laughs> echoed from deep within the cave. A massive tentacle shot out, wrapping itself around Brutaka and pulling him inside. The next moment, he was in the presence of something so horrible, so alien, that it took I, all I his can't willpower even tell just to difference. hold on to his sanity. I can't even this tell the difference. was Tren Krom. Oh my god, it's finally Tren Krom. A crimson mass of tentacles emerging from a gelatinous central core, with two dead yellow eyes that somehow followed every movement without ever moving themselves. To recap the prologue in Chapter 1 <laughs> Beginnings, Tren Krom was the original entity the great beings created, which was a purely organic <laughs> being, to rule the entire It literally sounds universe, the same. We're still constructing the modern new AI. Of course, once they instated Mata Nui as the great spirit ruler of the entire robot, there was really no more need for Tren Krum, and he was cast off to live the rest of his life in exile on a remote island where he was basically cut off from the rest of the Matoran universe. Mm. Now, Tren Krum has the power to invade the mind of any Matoran universe member who approaches him, and unless they're members of the Order of Mata Nui who have their minds mentally shielded, he can really just read every single one of your thoughts and even sometimes invade your mind, controlling your body. 
Trenkrom's appearance is also completely disgusting and horrific. There is no canon image of Trenkrom throughout the entire Bionicle history because the writer Greg Farsty preferred to leave his appearance up for interpretation. Greg Farsty. He said, any being to gaze at him for too long will be driven mad because their minds just simply aren't built to comprehend like Cthulhu. What they are <laughs> of course, behind me, I've put a fan illustration of what Trenkrom could look like just for purposes of illustration. The entity seemed over time to have merged with the stone floor and walls of its cave so that lurker and place of concealment were one. The acrid stench of decay hung over everything, and in vain, Rutaka tried to break free of the grip of Trenkrom's tentacle. He could feel the strange being trying to probe his mind, but so far, Rutaka's mental training had allowed him to resist. Nice. If that should fail, he knew the secrets of the Order of Mananui would be exposed to this monster. As Trenkrom demanded they tell him what wonders had come to the universe in the millennia since his exile, Lariska stepped up, claiming that Trenkrom's universe was in danger, and if he kept them there, he Lariska. would be hurting the one thing he helped bring into being. Karapar edged slowly to the side, sword in hand. No one paid any attention, for all eyes were on Lariska, who had been grabbed by one of Trenkrom's many arms. Without the discipline Brutaka possessed, her mind was an open book to the entity. She screamed as a lifetime of memories were sifted through in an instant, crying out as she saw glimpses of the ancient mind of Trenkrom. Leave when with a $5 her, regret she collapsed leaving. on the stone floor, and in the distraction, Karapar began to make a move, raising his sword to strike the entity. Then, a third eye suddenly appeared directly on Trenkrom, one gazing right at Karapar. The Baraki froze in mid-blow. A shaft of energy shot out from the eye, bathing him in its glow. And in the next instant, Karapar shattered into fragments as if he had been made of crystal. There was nothing left of him but a pile of glittering dust on the stone floor. And with Karapar disintegrated, Trenkrom left them with his final words. He had helped birth a world of order, but the denizens of the Matoran universe had turned it into a universe of madness and fear. It was no longer worth saving to him. And he saw it as greater punishment to condemn the rest of the Federation to their deserved fate. Life in the universe they and their kind had made. <laughs> With no one taking the time to argue, they gathered up Rutaka and Lariska, fleeing the cave even as the stone walls that surrounded the island receded into the sand. Only Takadox paused to look back at the cavern where Karapar had died, wondering for a moment just what it would take to end the life of a being older than the stars. As the band of misfits journeyed onwards, they finally reached their destination. Looming out of the mist was an island of black sand and jagged rock, volcanic peaks and strange rahi arcing and wheeling through the sky. Okay. Despite the bright light that played off the waters around it, the island seemed to be in perpetual shadow. This was the island of Artadax, home to the imprisoned Makuda Miserix. As the squad crept into the tunnels deep beneath the okay. island, they heard the entrance slam shut behind them and realized the devious Takadox had sealed them in. <laughs> now down to just Brutaka, Why is that guy always betraying everybody for no reason? Spiria, the team oh, ventured God. ever onwards, with Spiria being threatened with death should he not join them. As they blasted past strange rocky and automated defenses, they came upon the largest occupant of the chamber, a massive dragon-like beast chained to the stone floor. All it's around it, a much smaller rocky, darting and dodging the shadow hand that occasionally shot out from the creature's chest. This 40-foot-tall creature was Makuta Miserix, original leader of the Brotherhood, now chained to the caverns and surrounded by strange, flying clock rahi with piercing sonic screams. Glancing around the chamber at the squad, Miserix caught sight of Makuta Spiria, and in an instant, activated his shadow hand, devouring Spiria's essence and absorbing his life force, for Spiria had been one of the first to side with Teradax in their revolt. Oh, now shit. down to just four, the Federation of Fear began to attempt to convince Miserix to join them, breaking his chains and freeing the monstrous dragon Makuta. Despite Rudaka's attempts to betray the team inside with Miserix alone, the great dragon was convinced by Rudaka's promise, a promise of revenge against Makuta Teradax in exchange for working with them. And so, as the dragon sprouted wings, Brutaka, Lariska, Vazon, and a stunned Rudaka climbed on his back. They <laughs> soared high above the island, just... pausing only long enough for Miserix to make a muttered vow to come back and destroy the place one day. Brutaka noted that the team's boat was gone. Takadox had gotten away. But it was of no concern to Brutaka, who stayed firm in his resolve. A storm was coming to this universe, and when it hit, there would be nowhere for anyone to hide. Shit. Miserix spread his Epic. wings and turned to the north, carrying his passengers into the unknown. Part 4. Shadows in the sky. Come on, As baby. the Federation of Fear Come freed on, Makuta Misrix and Takanuva continued spiraling through dimensions, Tahu's team of Toa Nuva in the swamps the of Karnu battled the armies of Makuta, uncovering secrets of the Kodrex and Keystones. High in the skies above Kardanui, the team led by Kopaka interrogated the captured Shadow Matoran Kira after Look, I seizing built his piece of the keystone. Look. After realizing the Matoran's mind had been twisted by darkness, the Toa decided to trick the Matoran of Shadow, Shit. allowing him to overhear a false conversation about a planned raid on the Shadow Leech Hive, the location of which the Toa had still not deciphered, but hoped to trick Kira into leading them there. As expected, the loyal Shadow Matoran blasted through his makeshift prison, making a beeline for the secret location of the Hive, with Kopaka, Pohatu, Liwa, and the Av Matoran right on his heels. 
Just then, the team of heroes encountered the monstrous Rahi the Makuta scientist cooked up, and just as they were about to succumb to the jaws of the multi-headed monstrosity, Toa Ignika, the consciousness of the Mask of Life, rocketed into action, using the power of life to rapidly age the creature, sending it plummeting to the ground and dying of old age. In the commotion, the Toa failed to recognize that this mysterious, mute stranger was actually bearing the Mask of Life, but readily accepted all the help they could get, and together they flew onwards to the Shadow Leech Hive. As Kirop approached the Shadow Leech Hive, Vikan had already fled to summon Ikarax, and the scientist Mutron watched as the Toa and Matoran approached in the distance. Yeah. Barring the door shut to buy himself some time, Mutron conjured up several illusions with his unique powers, disguising the vats of Shadow Leeches as solid rock. Okay. Just then, the Toa blasted the door open, with Kopaka staying to fight Makuta Mutron while the rest of the Toa flew deeper within the hive and searched for the Shadow Leech Vats, unaware they were right before their eyes. As Liwa, Pohatu, Toa Ignika, and the Athmatoran soared through tunnel after tunnel, they grew confused, passing by all the disguised vats and venturing deeper into Makuta's <laughs> lair. Just then, Just look Liwa around. and Pohatu turned in fear, and directly behind them was a snarling white-skinned Rahi, primed to attack. Little did they know, but this was actually Toa Ignika, who Mutron had rejected another illusion over to trick the Toa into fighting amongst uh, themselves. I see. As Liwa and Pohatu attacked the disguised Toa Ignika, the Mask of Life reacted angrily, slowing their life processes to end their existence. Jesus. Meanwhile, as Kopaka <laughs> continued to fight Mutron, he was dazed for a split second by fear powers, allowing Mutron to use his mental abilities to begin to drive the Toa of Ice insane. And as the battle with Mutron raged on, Pohatu and Liwa begged Toa Ignika to stop killing him, realizing in shock and confusion that the mysterious stranger oh, was wearing God. the Mask of Life. As they pleaded with the mask, the other Makuta burst in the hive, and Tra's rallying Dampra and Shirox to defend their lair and strike back against I'll the go to 1.5 if Kopaka you want. Unconscious with their powers of shattering I'll go to 1.5. Three Makuta reinforcements proceeded to use their power screams to knock out the rest of the fighting Toa Nuva and Matoran, ending the battle within the lair. As the Toa fought within the Shadow Leech lair, the Shadow Matoran Vicon, scientific assistant, touched down on the Makuta Fortress on Destro using a tablet of transit to gain access to the Brotherhood Fortress. Shocked, Vikan saw Ikarak sitting on Makuta Teradax's old throne, wearing Teradax's old Mask of Shadows and fresh from killing the teleporting Botar. Despite Ikarak scoffing at the fact that Antroz would attempt to give him orders, he agreed to go to Kardanui and join the fight, if only to persuade his fellow Makuta to abandon Teradax's plan and side with him instead. As Vikan returned to Kardanui, Ikarax gathered his weapons, <laughs> preparing for war. Oh, he doesn't stop. Meanwhile, within the Shadow Leech Hive, Pohatu managed to escape captivity with his powers of stone, freeing Toa Ignika, who slowly began to trust him again. Thinking fast, Pohatu activated his Kanohi Kakama Nuva, Mask of Speed, and vibrated through the Shadow Leech Vats, shattering the glass and casting the Makuta into mayhem. In the confusion, the Toa Matoran and Ignika escaped, with Toa Ignika using his powers of life to snap the semi-organic stone holding up the hive bringing the Makuta crashing to the ground. As both sides regrouped for a final battle in the skies, Makuta Ikarax arrived on the scene, rendezvousing with his fellow Makuta and agreeing to defeat Toei Ignika and claim the Mask of Life. Can you if stop pretending you're not reason. having fun? <laughs> and so, the last battle over the villages of Kardanui began, with the Makuta flying over the village, spreading shadow over the remaining village of light. Just before breaking off from the formation, Mutron and you Ikarax struck me. the roof of Kardanui. You caught me. I'm having a little blast, dude. To a I'm faking it. I'm loving this. I want to go for even longer. Powers to destroy all the Matoran homes and light vines. Revealing the hiding place of the Toa and Matoran, they were stunned to find it completely empty, for the Toa had flown back to what remained of the Makuta's lair to seize their piece of the keystone. And so, when the Makuta returned to their lair, a heated battle began. Antros fired off deadly beams of heat vision, only for Kopaka to form a hail of ice, redirecting them at the Makuta and piercing his armor. As some of Antros's antidermis essence began to leak out, Chirox and Kirop engaged Pohatu and Liwa, and in a thrilling conclusion to this epic battle, Ikarax activated his powerful gravity abilities, sending all around him hurtling downwards to the swamp, including Pohatu, the Avmatoran Photon, as well as Antros and his Shadow Matoran servant Radiac. While the battle was completely over, Kopaka and Liwa broke off from the attack to dive after Pohatu, spiraling down to the mysterious Swamp of Secrets. Up to this point, <laughs> Toa Ignika had not participated in the battle because he was too overwhelmed by the course of the fight. I'm overwhelmed However, too, Toa Ignika. I can relate. Swamp, Ignika was enraged, flying directly at Ikarax with his Blade of Life. Recognizing the Mask of Life, Ikarax acted swiftly, using his density control power to let the blade pass through him, then increasing the density of his fist to punch Ignika off his skyboard. That's Just badass. As Ikarax reached down to take the Mask of Life, Ignika cursed him, that is badass. his evolution until all his antidermis transformed back into organic tissue, and dealing Ikarax waves of excruciating pain, for his armor was intended for energy, not organs and muscle. Capturing Ikarax and the scientist Mutron, Ignika prepared to fight the rest of the Makuta, who fled from the gruesome scene. And with the battle temporarily over, both the Toa and Makuta were scattered, wounded, and reeling from the climactic clash in the sky. Interlude, Destiny War, Part 1. 
As battles continued in Kadanui and Takanuva grew ever closer Destiny to War. his home universe, the order of Madanui Fortress on Daxia was on high alert. Brutaka's suicide mission had succeeded, and the colossal dragon-like Makuta Miserix had been brought to yes. the order's main stronghold. As Axon stood firm as a defender of Voyanui, he was contacted by Toa Krakua under orders of Helrix to return to the fortress at once, for all agents of the Order of Mata Nui were being recalled back to their stronghold to prepare for an all-out destiny war. Come on, as baby. Axon arrived on Daxia, he was brought face to face with his old friend, once mortal enemy, Brutaka, for the first time since their battles on Voyanui. Oh my god! Astonished Finally. to see Brutaka redeemed and once again a full-fledged member of the Order, Axon was overjoyed, finally reuniting with Brutaka. Wait, this but is there hype! Was no time to catch up. <laughs> For Toa Helrix had put out a major announcement. Axon and Brutaka finally years, friends again after five hours. First of the Order of Mananui's agents to respond was Mazita, the Komatoran warrior who had held a brutal rivalry with the Tomatoran Voltraz, now servant of Makuta Ikrax, for killing his mentor years ago in a senseless spree of murders. Mazika was training with fellow Order of Mata Nui agent Tobduck when he heard Helrix's call, and his first destination was to seek out and detain his old rival Voltrez, who potentially held great secrets to be used against a brotherhood. Sailing forth to the island of Stelt, Mazika tortured a Ninra ghost for information about Voltrez, learning that the devious Voltrez had paid that Matoran to build a sleek skyfighter for him. After learning that Voltraz was headed for Kardanui, Mazika made a beeline for the Order of Mata Nui headquarters, demanding to be told of the secret location to the entrance of Kardanui. There, he met up with his old partner Tobduk, who promised to lead him to Kardanui after Mazika helped him attack the Brotherhood of Makuta's fortress on Destro, in the hopes that they could force the armies of the Makuta to teleport directly to Metru Nui and be faced with the Order's most powerful legions there. Meanwhile, on the beaches of the island of Odina, Dark Hunter's stronghold, Ancient, the right hand of the Shadowed One, and secret double agent for the Order of Mata Nui, stood on the beach, waiting for Lariska to return from her suicide mission. As strange birds flew in unique patterns in the sky, Ooh, Ancient received a coded message from the Order of Mata Nui, convince the Shadowed One to side with the Order in their war against Makuta, or okay. kill him personally. Okay. Next on the list of the Order's allies was the resurrected Jailer Hydraxon, who had once fought alongside Toa Helrix in his I remember Hydraxon. Form, and would answer the call to battle once again. Plunging deep within the black waters of the pit, Toa Lezovic met up with Hydraxon, who had just received a list of secret orders from Helrix. As the two warriors paced through the now partially reconstructed pit prison, uh, Hydraxon came upon the four okay. remaining Baraki warlords. Pride I'm going to start saying out loud the words I don't know what they mean. <laughs> Nak, Kalma, okay. Mantax, and Elek, who he had rounded up and recaptured over the past few months. Promising their freedom and a chance to rebuild the League of Six Kingdoms, Hydraxon convinced the Baraki to fight with the Order against the Brotherhood, a chance the Baraki readily accepted I actually know all this. The land once this again. is amazing, I know all this. <laughs> back in the fortress of the Order, Vazon had been thrown back in a cell alongside I don't, Rudaka. Oh, I know who Vazon is. Were makeshift water tanks he's uh, what remained of the Paraka. He's all part of the Zaki, Paraka. Who had been sent off with the Toahaga on a secret mission months ago. In the opposite tank was a mad titan, Karzani, now driven fully insane. I know Karzani too, actually. Just then, the crimson armored Order of Mata Nui agent Trinuma opened the door to a cell. I don't know Trinuma. And despite Vazon's claims that they must have freed him to draw on his self-proclaimed great intellect and strategic expertise, Trinuma merely replied that the Order needed someone who could die horribly without being missed. And just like that, Vazon was recruited to yet another suicide mission. <laughs> As the Order began to make their moves, the first mission was to the Skakti-ruled island of Zakaz, where the Order wished okay, to make a Zakaz, deal with the no idea. warlord Nektan to arrange an alliance Nektan, between Nektan, no idea. As Axon and Brutaka were brought before Nektan, they lied, claiming that they had already gained the allegiance of other Skakti warlords to share in the spoils of war with the Brotherhood, and Nektan would be missing out on sacking their fortresses, looting their weapons, and slaying their warriors. And so, Nektan agreed to lead his Skakti forces That's in a battle Nektan. against Makuta's armies, and first in their sights with a contingent of vicious Rakshi, sons of Makuta, on a neighboring island. Meanwhile, the Toahaga were on mission for the Order of Mata Nui to uncover oh, the secret shit. hiding place of Makuta Teradax. Led by the devious Zaktan, who now was little more than a head and spine floating in a makeshift fishbowl, the Toahaga <laughs> had arrived in the gates of Metru Nui with a terrible mission, destroying the Colosseum, for Makuta Teradax likely seeped in gaseous form beneath the structure to secret caverns below. As the Haga okay. arrived at the Colosseum, they were confronted by Jalar and the Toamari, who were on edge due to the mysterious disappearance of Takanuva and willing to defend Metru Nui at all costs. Yeah. Despite the Haga attempting to explain their mission to find Makuta Teradax They're and destroy obviously the good Colosseum guys. in the process, the Toamari refused to believe them, and seeing the Haga as a threat to the city, Holy the two shit. Toa teams engaged in a destructive conflict throughout the city of Metru Nui. Okay. As this was happening, Trinuma explained Vazon's mission, to arrive at the Makuta Fortress on Destro, where he would likely be killed, and pretend to betray the Order of Mata Nui, announcing an attack on the Makuta Fortress in the hopes that the Makuta would activate the ancient teleportation engine within, which could move the entire stronghold anywhere in the Matoran universe. 
As Vazon was captured on arrival, to his surprise, he was led to the only Makuta left on Destral, a lone warrior named Tridax. Who this is was a the new sole guy? Makuta left to guard the fortress while Entraz's strike force and Icarax were away in Karnak. Why are they adding new Just then, Makuta? A blast rocked the side of the fortress, and to Tridax and Vazon's surprise, the fortress was already seemingly under attack. Mazika and Tobduk had arrived to bring their deceptive plan to motion, hoping Tridax would teleport the Great Fortress and all of the Makuta's armies to Metru Nui. Far to the west, Prydak watched as another Brotherhood of Makuta fortress outpost I don't know and smiled at the sight. He had been fortunate since his release from the pit. His captors had provided him with ships and the resources with which to raise Wait, an army. Wait, the main from bad the guy? In the universe, Prydak had found ex-Dark Hunters, exiled Vortex, even a Skokti or two for his crew. That's a... Before no, Kama wait. even had a chance to devise a battle plan, Prydak had sounded off without him on a voyage of conquest. His men had routed the forces of the Makuta who That's occupied Teradax, this place, yeah. but had found no actual member of the So who the fuck's Makuta, Tridax? For all of them were occupied in Karnak. Teradax and Tridax? And as Tridax claimed this Makuta refuge, he discovered the pieces to a grand tablet on the wall, inscriptions detailing dark plans and evil schemes. Thanks, Life Abs, for 30 months. Message, Prydax sent his armies outside as he alone sat and read the inscriptions. For this was the grand plan of Makuta Teradax himself. Teradax. Meanwhile, back on the islands near Zakaz, Axon and Brutaka stood on a steep rise overlooking a battlefield. The boys, below, back together. The assembled might of the Skakti of Holy shit, look at this. With a small army of <laughs> Initially, the Skakti look at this stop motion. Losses, but they were capable of something that the Rakshi could only pretend. Rage. Hungry for victory and filled with hatred for their enemy, the barbarians regrouped and tore through the Rakshi ranks. To Axon, it was overwhelming, thrilling, and sickening all at once. And as the Skakti distracted the Rakshi battalions, Brutaka and Axon crept past the battle and came upon an ancient sanctum. Before them was the pool of mysterious green antidermis, the original pool where the great spirit Madanui first created the Makuta long ago. Discovered by order of Madanui informants <laughs> as the source of all new Makuta, Axon and Brutaka made plans to destroy the vast pool once and for all. Yeah, destroy and it. the threat of potential new Makuta. As they prepared to strike, the waters of the pool suddenly exploded upwards and outwards. Foul, scalding liquid struck Axon and Brutaka, seeping into the openings oh, in their masks. Oh, no. It hissed and writhed like a thing alive, burning wherever it touched. Temporarily blinded and in pain, the two warriors staggered and then stumbled, plunging into the pool itself. Oh, Back in the shit. Shadow Lord's lair, Ancient managed to convince the Dark Hunter ruler to ally with the Order of Mata Nui, his hatred for the Brotherhood of Makuta fueling his actions above all. As the Shadowed One recalled all Dark Hunters to fight for the Order, their first mission was to seize the island of Zia, pacifying the local Vortex and preventing them from joining the Brotherhood, like their devious Rudaka. With the population of Zia imprisoned and corralled in a matter of hours, the Shadowed One had grown bored, coming across a Vortex worker frantically clearing rubble to seize a treasure deep within. Binding the worker with crystal If the Shadow One staff, is bored, why doesn't he just watch a nine hour Bionicle video? That's endlessly entertaining. The deeper he got, the more visibly upset the Zeon natives seemed to be. Several feet down, he came upon a proto steel box. Burned into the lid was a symbol of the Brotherhood of Makuta. Opening the box carefully, the Shadowed One's eyes widened as he gazed upon a mysterious set of virus vials, which may soon make him master of the universe. And in the far edges of the universe, skies darkened as the great Makuta dragon Miserix roamed free once again. Yep. Announcing to all corners of the world that he was back, Makuta Miserix began his sole mission to find and kill Makuta Teradax in the hopes of finally getting revenge on the man behind his suffering for eons of years. Yeah. During all these events at the start of the Destiny War with the Brotherhood of Makuta, Toa Hel It does feel kind of weird that we're not watching this in IMAX. <laughs> Original I, I feel like it, we're not the getting the full Nui, sat in the command chamber of her fortress on Daxia. The war against the we should rent a theater begun, and it had not begun well. Although the order through the Dark Hunters now held Zia, they had been unable to dislodge Makuta forces from the island of Nidra. In other places, the order's surprise attacks had met unexpectedly fierce resistance from Rakshid and Exotoa. With battles erupting on multiple fronts and the brunt of the Makuta's legions currently occupying Kardanui, Helrix had little to do but watch and wait observing where the Great War would lead. The greatest conflict in the history of the Matoran universe had just begun by her hand, and the outcome would change the destinies of all who called the Matoran universe home. Again, going back to the comic book references, this time with Marvel, the Destiny War, which was led by Toa Helrix, the leader of the Order of Mata Nui, is basically Bionicle's version of Marvel's Infinity War, where everyone rallied together from all different parts of the universe against a major threat. This is why there's just so many characters doing so many different things throughout the universe, because all of this is culminating in one final battle. But we'll get there in a second, and the outcome of in at a least second. the movie version of Infinity War is remarkably similar to the Bionicle version of Destiny War, but we'll get there in a little bit. Part 5. Swamp You said a second! 
As the Destiny War broke out throughout the universe, engaging all major players and factions, the Toa Nuva and the Makuta and Karta Nui were none the wiser, engaged in their own heated conflict for the heart of the great spirit, Mata Nui. While Kopaka led his team in raids on the Shadow Leech Hive in the skies above Kata Nui, and the Mask of Life rocketed upwards in the form of Toa Ignika to join the fight, Tahu, Onua, and Gali were still locked in battle with Makuta's Krika, Goras, and Biddle in the swamps below Karta Nui. Still battling with Krika, Tahu had just sent up his emergency flare when Gali and Onua rushed to his aid. In the skies above, explosions echoed from the fight with the other Toa, and Makuta Goras, Biddle, and Krika rushed to save the falling Makuta Chiroks, who had been caught in Ikarax's gravity blast. In this lull in the conflict, the Toa Nuva in the swamp were stunned to encounter a clearing of Av Matoran. Watching from a distance, they observed as the Av Matoran lay on the ground, writhing as electronics replaced organics, and the once sentient individual beings evolved into the mindless Borok. To Tahu's horror, he realized that all the Borok they had fought on Mata Nui years ago were once Av Matoran, and this was a natural part of their life cycles. In this clearing now filled with Borok, Tahu and his team claimed another piece of the Keystone, dropped by a Matoran that had now been fully evolved into a Borok. From there, the Toa Nuva of the swamps had little time to ponder this dramatic reveal about the true nature of their world, for the Makuta were distracted by the falling Chiroks, and now was the time to strike. In a surprise attack, the Toa launched into a volley of attacks, each temporarily knocking out their opponents to claim yet another piece of the Kiso. During this brief conflict, the Makuta of the swamps were distracted yet again by a telepathic message from the other Makuta in the skies. Ikarax had fallen, and the Kanohi Ignika, Mask of Life, had created a Toa form of its own, who had bested the Makuta with a fraction of its power. Stunned by this revelation, the Makuta were too late to prevent Tahu's team from escaping to the Kodrex, and instead decided to lay in wait for the Toa near the Kodrex entrance, ready to ambush them at their destination. In the swamp, Tahu and his team arrived at the Kodrex, where they met steep resistance from the Makuta. Despite Krika's attempts to have a conversation with Tahu and convince him that both sides were doomed to lose should Paradox succeed, the hot-headed Tahu really continued Toa? attacking Krika with fireballs. Forced to lower his density, Krika allowed the flames to pass right through him, only half-heartedly fighting back. For Gali and Onua, however, their opponents lashed out with unrestrained force. As the battle continued, Krika informed Tahu that he should check his surroundings, and as Tahu looked behind him, he watched as the other Makuta from the skies, led by Antros, were on a direct course to the swamp. And as all available Makuta rallied around the Swamp of Secrets, the Toa were about to be overwhelmed. Dimensional Interlude 3, Empire of Fallen Toa. Thousands of years ago, in our prime universe, the deranged serial killer Toa Tuyet attempted to frame the Dark Hunters yes, for her I remember this. around the city of Metru Nui Six hours ago! Stone. But unlike our main universe, just as Toa Likon confronted Tuyet, in this dark mirror alternate world, Toa Nidiki instead chose to side with Toa Tuyet, and the pair of corrupted Toa killed Likon. The Dark Hunters were successfully oh. blamed for the murders, and Tuyet set about convincing the other Toa that they were better off forcefully protecting the Matoran, forming an empire in order to deal with threats. Along with the Dark Hunters, the Brotherhood of Makuta were targeted for extinction, and the weapons manufacturer Ninra Ghosts were also attacked because their creations could potentially be used against the Empire. The existence of the Toa Mata was discovered, and Tuyet sent the signal to launch their Toa canisters, freeing them to join the Toa Empire. As Taragaduma was publicly opposed to the Empire's ruthlessness, he was quietly dealt with, with Tuyet toppling his rule and establishing her grand regime over all of Metru Nui as a base of operations for her new Empire of Toa. While some, okay. like Toa Lesovic, fought back, sticking to their morals and values, most of the Toa Mata came to serve Tuyet, as their loss of memories made it easier to mold them to accept this new status quo. Sure. Years passed, and this ruthless Toa Empire grew in power, killing all those who opposed them and imprisoning the rest in secret torture chambers within Metru Nui. It was at this time of expansion and oppression that a great portal opened in the sky above this alternate Metru Nui, transporting the Toa Takanuva of our prime universe to this dark mirror world. Encountering the Matoran Kapura in the streets, his old friend from the island of Mata Nui, Takanuva was shocked to see the Matoran beg for his life before him, and statues of the <laughs> Toa Mata lining every street. As Kapura begged Takanuva to let him pass, the temperature dropped sharply all around them, and in an instant, Kapura was locked in a foot-thick shell of ice from the neck down, just enough to make him feel the excruciating pain of the intense cold. As Kapura cried out in pain, Takanuva looked up to see Toa Kopaka descending upon them, accompanied by Toa Tahu. As they demanded to see Takanuva's identity tablet, Kopaka brought his sword to his neck, imprisoning him as an enemy of the Toa Empire. Tossing Takanuva in a dark cell, Tahu merely laughed at his protests, refusing to answer his questions and locking him deep within the Colosseum of Metru Nui. As Takanuva examined his cell, a weak voice echoed from behind him. Illuminating the cell with a fraction of his light power, Takanuva saw a Matoran hanging from the wall, with chains around his wrists and ankles. Fuck! This imprisoned Matoran was none other than Takua, <laughs> an alternate version of Takanuva himself that had never become a Toa of Light. Freed by his variant, Takua began to explain the history of the Toa Empire universe, and how he, like countless other Matoran, had been left to rot in prison for not meeting the Toa's strict productivity requirements. When Gali and Karzani's Matoran re-education facilities failed, and even hours of Vaki conditioning failed to break the will of Takua, they had simply dumped him in the cell for all of eternity. 
As Takanuva took in Takua's tales of the state of this universe, he was resolved to immediately escape and return to his main world, but not without trying to improve this dark mirror dimension first. Escaping from their cell, Takanuva and Takua crept through the archives, which to Takanuva's disgust had been converted to a twisted trophy room of fallen foes, a museum of conquest and suffering. A long dead and mounted Vizrak Harpa stared from the shadows with glassy eyes. A collection of weaponry was nearby, each item identified with a small inscribed tablet. The Staff of the Shattered One, Spear of Fusion, Zammer Sphere Launchers, Rotuga no. Launchers, and more. Next to those was the most amazing sight of all. The my react video on YouTube of this is going to be longer than nine hours because I want to include all my reactions, so it's ethical. So it'll probably be a 13-hour upload of my video. I'm going to include some offline... <laughs> some offline... I'm going to think about it more, give some more... As the trio of escapees delved deeper within the archives, they came face to face with two hooded, cloaked beings of shadow, the Makuta of this universe. Behind them echoed a voice all too I just... familiar to Takanuva, the voice of Makuta. Terror. Not that it fucking matters. World, he wore a rusted and pitted Kanohi Hal, explaining that even touching his former mask of shadows would immediately alert. But I don't care about the alternate forces, universe. Threatening to kill Takanuva and his companions. Once you add a multiverse, nothing deals, matters. Stating that he was in opposition to Tuyet's rule, and his powers as a toe of light could help turn the tide of battle in their favor. Teradax and Makuta Krika offered Takanuva a deal. They would help him find this universe's version of Brutaka to transport him back to the main universe, but only if Takanuva agreed to help the Makuta claim a valuable artifact to fight back against the Toa Empire, the legendary Mask of Time. Which I was following along all Takanuva. through the underwater part. <laughs> this Mask of Time was en route to Metru Nui in the hands of a Toa And Toa then Empire they added the multiverse, the and now I can't Wallace, keep up. And led by fanatical Matoran Jawar, Takanuva's old friend in the Prime Dimension, now turned devout servant of the Toa Empire. Cooking up a specialized virus that gave Takanuva the power of flight, Makuta Krika and Teradax bid him on his journey, agreeing to protect Takua and Taragaduma while he was away. And so, Takanuva encountered the procession, introducing himself to Jalur, Kualis, and Bomanga. Claiming to be one of Tuyet's secret Toa enforcers, Takanuva managed to earn their trust, learning that the Brutaka of this universe had been killed by Toa Bomanga himself during the Empire's so-called lawful expedition to Voya Nui. Right before Takanuva this is where it was starts to, to get good. <laughs> a gust of wind swept past the caravan, and in an instant, the two Toahaga and Jaller were downed, and in their place was Toa Lesovic, who had spared Takanuva's life in the hopes that he would aid him in the rebellion against the Toa Empire. And under the cover of darkness, Toa Lesovic and Takanuva darted through the sculpture fields of Poemetri, leading Takanuva to a misshapen and haphazard throne of stone. Lesovic introduced him to this universe's version of Toa Pohatu, former enforcer for the Toa Empire, now leader of the resistance efforts against the brutal dictatorship. Pohatu explained that over time, he had grown wary of Tuyet's regime, and the final straw was the senseless massacre of four dozen Matoran, which Pohatu refused to be a part four of. Four dozen? After making contact with Lesovic, Pohatu had established a full-on resistance effort, comprised of <laughs> Makuta, Dark Hunters, and even Matoran within the Toa Empire's ranks as secret agents. Joining this resistance was the Matoran Akmau, who had been a devious trickster in Takanuba's prime universe, but in this world, <laughs> any being of... Akmau! Devious guy! Akmau! Devious guy. I know that from six hours ago. Opposing the Toa was an ally to Takanuva. As the resistance team met in Bohatu's secret hideout, their plan was laid out. Akmau would alert every available Makuta in the city, while the Dark Hunter Darkness would rally together what remained of their organization. Any Matoran or Toa willing to revolt would be drafted into the rebellion, and in one night, every force that sought to oppose the Toa Empire would descend upon the city in a full-scale assault. It was a dangerous plan, but Takanuva had no choice but to agree if he wanted any chance of breaking into the Coliseum and stealing Brutaka's old Olmat. It had all started out so well. Lesovic's band had made it close to the Coliseum before being spotted. As planned, Takanuva used his newfound shadow powers to blind the guards, Pohatu following with a massive fist of stone that cracked the walls of the huge structure. To yes. East, Makuta Teradax led Makuta Krika, Makuta Kojo, Taragaduma, and Takua into <laughs> battle. At first, they made short work of the Matoran and Toa who guarded Tuyet's fortress. Then, it <laughs> A Toa of strength on the walls, and to Will power! Storm, a hail of spikes impaled Takua, ripping his body to shreds and killing Takanuba's alternate self. Makuta Koljo fell next, his armor crushed by the Toa's power and his essence incinerated by a Toa of plasma. Forced to pull back, Teradax fled from his opponents, circling back to aid Lesovic's squad. The Dark Hunter Primal had run into Tahu in the eastern entrance, and in a surprise attack, managed to kill the Toa of Fire. As revenge, Gali summoned a sphere of water around Primal's head, suffocating him on dry land. Jesus. Toa Krakua hit Gali with a wave of solid sound, blasting apart her mask and armor, and Bohatu cried out too late, for Akmau had already dashed ahead and slain the fallen Toa of Water. A lot of people dying. He didn't get to enjoy his triumph long, for Kopaka flash froze Akmau, and a swipe from Onua's <laughs> claws shattered the Matoran into little pieces of crystal and protodermis. No, they're actually killing now, him. It was no longer one battle, but a dozen separate ones being fought at once, the line 
things moving back and forth. Oh, holy shit. Hatu fought his way into the Colosseum, but found himself too evenly matched with Onua to make much progress. Lesovic fell with an ice dagger in his shoulder, but rallied to blow Gopaka off his post high atop the Colosseum. Takanuva only could wince as a toe of ice hit the ground and lay still. As Takanuva, Teradax, and Darkness rallied to storm the gates of the Colosseum, a battle like no other lay ahead of them. All around him, allies fell and familiar faces cried out in pain and death. Surrounded by suffering, Takanuva found the resolve to charge ahead, blasting his way past a group of Toa and finally reaching the inner chamber, the throne room of Toa Tuyet. There, framed in the chamber doors, was Tuyet, Nui stone in one hand, mask of dimensional gates in the other. Takanuva barely had a chance to react before he was blown through half a dozen walls by a focused tidal wave, Tuyet immediately making the first move to kill the outsider. Takanuva charged, and the next few seconds were a blaze of battle. Lasers turning water to steam, waves crashing against walls, a race to see what would happen first, Takanuva drowning in the tide, or Tuyet drowning in darkness. When the fight was through, Tuyet stood once more triumphant. But just then, a distant sound echoed through the halls of the Colosseum, and as the two combatants surveyed the now demolished central square of Metronui, they could hear the sound of thousands of armed Matoran marching up to the building, finally rising up against the oppressive regime. Oh shit! In the distance, Takanuva could see airships and <laughs> it's a rebellion. Vessels, other Matoran, Dark Hunters, Vortex, and other beings, all bent on descending on the city, their eyes fixed on the Colosseum. In a moment of distraction, Tuyet activated the Mask of Dimensional Gates, intending to scour the multiverse to raise an army to return and crush the rebellion once and for all. As an energy portal opened in the center of the room, Takanuva seized the opportunity to steal the Olmac, snatching the mask from her face. Oh, the nice. second it lost contact with her, its power shut off and the portal began to slowly close. Takanuva, mask in hand, dove through, but Tuyet was not about to let him escape so easily. And even as he cleared the portal, she grabbed onto his leg, trying to follow him. <laughs> Blasting him with hard bolts of water, Tuyet caught his hand and tore the mask, causing it to float away in the space between dimensions. Okay, so Takanuva it broke. Takanuva turned back, and what he saw horrified him. Tuyet was halfway through the portal, trying to drag Takanuva back in. She was so consumed by rage that she never noticed the portal closing until it was much too late. Screaming as the gates of reality oh, slammed shut snap her in half? Tuyet's upper half was left in the void, and her lower half <laughs> in the Colosseum on her world. Holy Versibly, shit. Death came in. <laughs> Takanuva hovered in the inner space for a long moment. He Mercifully, death came instantly is number one, a very funny thing to hear in Bionicle, and number two, what I'm wishing for. <laughs> I'm not getting anything like that. I wondered what would happen in Tuyet's <laughs> universe with her gone. Would the Toa become protectors again? Would the Matoran take control? Or would some group of the Dark Hunters and Makuta become the new dictators? Perhaps someday, if he was able, he would return to find out the answer. Turning his head away from the remains of Tuyet, wondering how a Toa could go so wrong, Takanuva realized with a shudder what a fine line it could be between justice and tyranny. Tuyet's life had been wasted, but the lives of no more Toa would be lost if he could prevent it. With grim resolve, he resumed his journey to Cardanui, and as he opened a dimensional gateway which would finally bring him back to his core universe, it's time to return to Cardanui and return to the events of the core timeline and battles being fought and won during Takanuva's multiverse. Let's go, journey. core timeline! Part 6 Battle for the Kodrex. Meanwhile, back in Cardanui, the final battle was about to begin. As Toa Ignika held guard over Makuta, Ikarax, and Mutron, the rest of the Toa Nuva followed the Makuta deep into the swamp. Reunited at last and combining all the pieces of the Keystone, the six Toa Nuva engaged in the final battle for the Matoran universe. Hurtling towards each other through the air, each Toa locked in battle with each Makuta. After a brief struggle, I don't think I can do it, bro. Flown into the mist, I actually don't think I can do it. Krika, who had been attacked by Gali, finally decided to make his moves while the Makuta were distracted. Partially draining some of Gali's energy, Krika carried her off into the swamp, hoping to have a peaceful conversation. Liwa, Kopaka, and Onua failed to notice this, occupied with the rest of the Makuta while Pohatu battled Gorast one-on-one, -on -one, unable to deal any significant damage while the Makuta used the powers of her mass to disrupt his elemental power of stone. During this, Tahu managed to hurl a fireball at the plants below Vampra, causing a massive explosion and distracting the Makuta long enough to rejoin his friends. With Gorast distracted, Pohatu regained control over his elemental powers, reuniting with the Toa Nuka, I don't think I can do it, bro. Gali and Krika were missing. Still flying towards the Kodrex, Tahu ordered Pohatu to find Gali while he went off to help the others fight. Away from the battle, Krika spoke with Gali, still dazed from the attack. Revealing to her that he had secretly betrayed Teradax and left Makuta Miserix alive, Krika outlined the history of the Brotherhood of Makuta. As they spoke, Krika gave Gali a tablet of transit and told her to leave Kardanui before the other Toa could awaken Madanui so she could save herself from the death. If I do it on 2x speed, will I finish before notice, midnight? Continued to doubt Krika, who simply told her that he wished Does anyone know the math on that? <laughs> and show mercy, 
Rather if I 2x it, will I finish before death. midnight? Meanwhile, back in the former lair of the Makuta, Mutron's assistant Vicon was left to guard the equipment and Rahi experiments. One of these Rahi, the perplexing clock creature, attacked Vicon from a shattered vat with a piercing 12, sonic 15. Screen. To Vicon's confusion, he felt the shadow within him begin to drain, replaced back with his moral light and returning him to a Lamator. <laughs> and Vicon came to the crucial realization that the Rahi clock <laughs> held the power to revert the shadow Mator back to their true selves and cure the shadow leech infection. But just as Gali was about to ask Krika about the true nature of Pterodax's plan, a bolt of lightning coursed through the sky, and a crackling dimensional gate ripped open in front of Gali and Krika. Emerging from the portal was Takanuva at last. Due to his nature as a toe of light, Takanuva felt the raw energy of Karnanui fueling him, increasing his size to titanic scale and feeding energy and light throughout his entire body. Firing a bolt of light I'm listening. Takanuva forced I promise I'm listening. Takanuva's back. The swamp with a resigned look on his face. For he had tried to warn Gali, but with the arrival of a Toa of Light and Shadow, there would be no stopping them from awakening Mata Nui now. Retrieving the miniaturized sundial of Mata Nui, Takanuva shone light upon it, instantly locating the hidden entrance to the Kodrex. As Takanuva gazed at the sky, he noticed Pohatu soaring through the air, but due to his orange armor and altered appearance from the adaptive armor, <laughs> Takanuva failed to recognize him, and the darker, shadowy part of his nature instinctively pushed him to lash out with Shadow. Mistaking Takanuva for Pterodax in disguise, Pohatu prepared to attack this new Toa of Light and Shadow, only for Gali to step in. Bridging her mind with Takanuba's just as she had done when he was merely Takua on the island of Mananui, Gali learned of the multiverse of madness Takanuba had just... Multiverse of madness? His command over Shadow was the result of... It's just straight up Marvel comics with Legos. The armor titan before him was truly Takanuba, Pohatu apologized, and the three Toa flew onwards to reconvene with the rest of the Toa Nuva. Interlude. Destiny War, Part 2. As Takanuva joined the fight in Kadanui, the rest of the universe was engulfed in turmoil. The war between the Order of Mananui and the Brotherhood of Makuta raged on, and no faction or land was left untouched. Across the universe, each major player was embroiled in their own individual conflicts, unaware that their paths were all about to collide. Axon and Brutaka had just tumbled in a pool of antidermis, their fates unknown. Vazon had been captured okay. by Makuta Tridak, just as the fortress was attacked by Mazika and Tobda in a major diversion in the hopes that Tridak would teleport the vast fortress and what remained of its armies to Metrinu, where the Order would ambush them with all their forces. On the island of Zia, the Shadowed One, under command of the Order, had seized the populace, preventing them from supporting the Brotherhood, and he had just made a start I'm paying attention. His own on the island. It's just rotting my brain from the Kaidan, inside. Leader of what remained of the Baraki had discovered a tablet detailing Makuta Teradax's grand plan and learned of the intricacies on how to cast the great spirit Mananui into slumber with a concoction of special viruses, the viruses that the Shadowed One himself had just stumbled upon. As Kalma, Mantax, and Elec waited to receive word from Pridak on the war efforts, the only other remaining Baraki alive, Takadox, had sailed away, making schemes of his own. In other corners of the <laughs> He's universe, always scheming, the bro! The Rahi Kitongu waged a war against the Vizorak Scourge, driving the Makuta servants from their land and freeing their captives. Meanwhile, Toa Helrix watched the war from her inner chamber. There's so much meanwhile. And in the darkness of the pit, Hydraxon and Toa Lesovic finally left to join the Order of Mananui in battle. During okay. all this, a heated battle between the Toa Mari and Toa Haga had broken out, with the Haga resolved to destroy the... Yeah, I remember this! This, this was like an hour ago! And, for all. and all this time, the colossal dragon Makuta Mizrix soared in the skies of the universe. Oh, it's such a recap! It's like another... quest of revenge ...before being directed to the Colosseum, the same place the Toa Haga hoped to find Pterodax. All across the universe, the Order of Mananui launched surprise attacks on the Brotherhood of Makuta and used their allies to conquer key positions. The Brotherhood was taken unaware and lost their footing in much of the lands, though managed to keep up a resistance effort. As battles raged from Ninra to the Southern Islands, the Order of Mananui began to claim victory one by one. It was at this time that Toa Helrix began to set her grand plan into motion, fortifying the city of Metrinui with large walls and sentinels at every coastline, transforming it into a fortress. Okay. Despite the complaints of Turaga, Vakama, and Duma, the fortification continued, and Helrix ordered double agents on stealth to begin leaking rumors that the Great Furnace on Metrinui was being converted into producing a virus that could destroy Makuta armor, luring a final battle to Metrinui. With the main Makuta Fortress on Destral under siege, and Makuta Tridax tricked into rushing to teleport their armies to Metronui, the ultimate battle to end the war was about to begin. Oh, here we go! Back in the city of Metronui, here we go! the Toa Mori and Toa Haga were still locked in combat, decimating most of the city in their wake. As their fight brought them to the archives, Kualis activated his mask of Rahi control as a desperate measure, summoning a Can we get a recap? Yeah, I'll explain it all after this vid. Acting fast, Toa Hali blasted I will explain the entire Bonacle lore. to be a fatal error, for the enraged Rahi broke free from Koalas' control, rampaging through the streets of the city. Putting aside their personal feelings in this crisis, the Toa Mari and Haga reluctantly worked together to subdue the beast, teaming up to beat it back to the archives and sealing it deep underground. As the eleven battle weary Toa stood around the unconscious beast, the Toa I will Haga do an, a, uh, a seven-hour recap of my own. <laughs> I think I can summarize it, you know? Get down to the gist. For the, great spirit, the Haga revealed that the true secrets of the cosmos and its workings were somewhere beneath their feet, in a place that no Toa, Matoran, or Turaga had ever been. 
Right now, they had reason to believe Makuta Teradax had reached that place. Are Turaga right, the old already been too late. Toas? So, after hours of planning and half a day to convince the Turaga to support their endeavor, the Toa Mari and Toa Haga finally worked okay. together to create an entrance. I got that. <laughs> and as the Haga descended into the darkness, Six hours, 52 Toa minutes in, I got that. Turaga are the old Toas. <laughs> Should the Haga fail and Teradax were to escape. <laughs> Reluctantly agreeing to sit out the fight below the Coliseum, Based. Jaller and his companions watched Norik lead his team of Toa Haga into the tunnel as the entrance sealed behind them. Just then, a mysterious stranger materialized behind the Toa Mari. There's always a new mysterious the stranger. the heart of the Vizorak, the stranger introduced herself as Jomak, agent of the Order of Matanui, and bid the Toa Mari on a dire mission to summon the scourge of spiders to be trapped in their final resting place. Why? This heart of the Vizorak had been obtained by the Toa Nuva for the Scroll of Preparations months ago, and now was the time to use it. Wait, is there six so spider people now? Nui undefended, Jaller bid Huki and Kongu farewell to guard the city. Sorry, Huki and Kongu. Kali and Nuparu ventured to Artadax to summon the <laughs> Meanwhile, Toa Helrix, leader of the Order of Matanui, had yeah. chosen that time to take drastic action. Traveling to the island of Ninra, one of the last strongholds of the Makuta, and home to the weapons crafting Ninra Ghost Matorin, Helrix arrived at the site of a grand struggle between the Brotherhood of Makuta and the Order. The Makuta had kept a strong resistance of Rakshi and Exotoa on Ninra, which had yeah. held for most of the war. But after a recent climactic battle, their beach was now littered with dead Rakshi, and the Order had claimed victory. Terrible. Now, Helrix wandered the sands, occasionally picking up a piece of Rakshi armor, studying it for a moment, and then discarding it. Using the power of her mask of psychology... Rakshi are just like the animals, the right? An object ...simply by touching it. Her goal was simple. Since the Rakshi were created using energized protodermis, the Order wished to know every source of that substance used by the Makuta so they could capture or destroy those sources. Without them, no new Rakshi could come into being, and it would be far easier to defeat the Brotherhood by cutting it's off... Rahi? Of power What's Rakshi? What's Rakshi? beating them in battle. Rakshi are the sons of the Makuta? Sides, she saw an island directly okay. to their north. And Got it. And a glimpse of the scientist Makuta Chirok standing before a silvery pool, one that had a being emerging from it, made of pure Got energized it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Good. Good to know. I'll file that away. Pool, and summoned the intelligent Rahi Kitongu, who had agreed to temporarily break off his efforts to save the victims of the Vizorak long enough to help in the war. In return, Helrix had promised him that the Vizorak would never again be a threat to anyone else. Did anybody the own these spider bionicles? were about to fulfill. Arriving on the mysterious island, Helrix and Kitangu warily ventured forth, seeking the final source of Rakshi. Their destination had first seemed uninhabited, but that illusion didn't last long. Helrix spotted <laughs> things skulking among the rocks. They weren't Matoran or Rahi, but looked like something. First was person in chat something was to post a picture of them holding Air, ground, one of these spider bionicles with up. proof Somehow, that it's a you. That like a note saying, hi, H-Rock or no something. On this island, <laughs> just a large central cavern I don't know what I'll give you. I'll give you 20 bucks. Deep within this cave, Elrix <laughs> and Kitangu came upon a vast lake of energized protodermis, the largest source in all of existence. Rising from the center was a figure of a living being. A head, two arms, and a torso ending in the lake itself. Its features were barely there, and its substance was the silver color of energized protodermis. This was a mysterious protodermis entity who claimed to be a raw force of nature, born of creation and destruction. This entity explained how it had once lived in the core of a planet, until one day a portion of its substance forced its way onto the surface. It did not take long for the inhabitants of that world to discover its power or to begin warring over it. Right. But some of what makes up its form was taken and placed inside the Matoran universe, and so escaped before Cataclysm overtook that world. This was, of course, the events of the Shattering in the Core Warver Spherus Magna, spoken for the first time in the Matoran universe. Now, the right. energized protodermis had taken on a will of its own, experimenting on the island around it, and even allowing others, like the Toa Nuva, to make use of its power if it found their intentions intriguing enough. Are they going to transform? Threatened to destroy the entity of living energized protodermis. Seems like around the time they should transform into new toys. To cascade downwards towards the two warriors in a way. Yeah, protodermis is oil, basically. But antidermis is like also oil, but only for bad guys. Reaching a sub basement, Vazon encountered a Kanohi Olmak. Mask of dimensional gates in front of a large number of stasis tubes, which to his horror held twisted and dark versions of Takanuva, fully converted to darkness and plucked from the multiverse of madness to serve the Brotherhood in the war. Holy Before shit! Before Tridax was able to unleash the Shadow Takanuva army on the attackers, Mazika and Tobduck burst in, exposing Tridax armor to a proto steel eating virus and incinerating his antidermis cloud with Tobduck's staff, killing the Makuta where he stood. They just fucked him up. What the big bad guy died in one second to fucking armor eating parasites? spared his life, allowing Vazon to escape with the Kanohi Olmak to a random destination in the universe. Fleeing through a portal, Vazon left the fortress, and with their duty completed, Tobduck told Mizika where to find the Kardanui entrance. How many Who characters we learned about? Chasm Literally Chasm hundreds. The fortress began to crumble from their attack. Easily, the easily 90 plus characters, I feel like, I've, I've learned. 
plotting their next moves in service of terror. And if you count the alternate versions of all of them, then it's like back on the island of Zia, ancient encounter the one knelt over a small box of viruses, laughing to himself with a body of a dead vortex beside him, a crystalline protodermis covering his face. The Shadowed One then explained to Ancient that long ago, a Makuta by the name of Kojol had visited Zia with a stash Kojol? of viruses, looking to combine them into the ultimate weapon. The official story was that Kojol had succumbed to his own viruses, but secretly, Ancient knew that the Order of Mata Nui had him killed, but the viruses were never recovered. Trying not to look at That's where COVID well, came from. Ancient attempted to convince the Shadowed One to ransom the viruses off or give them to the Order, but the Shadowed One took him by surprise, stating that the viruses were the original mix that Teradax had used to overthrow How's it going? the great spirit Mata Nui. Wait. <laughs> Wait, did I get a raid from Toa Legend? <laughs> Holy fuck, dude. This guy knows his shit. What's up? It's no longer a secret. In an Good instant, to have you, a fellow fan. The shattered one's eyes, striking ancient. The veteran a Dark fellow Hunter fan. Disintegrated by the force of the blast. We are the Before same. The one was willing to kill even his most trusted advisor to keep this a secret. Weeks later, Prydak conveyed everything he had learned of Teradax's plan to his fellow Baraki. And so, Kalma, Mantax, and Elec traveled to Zia, hoping to strike an alliance with the Shadowed One, who they believed to be in possession of some sort of virus left by Makuta Kojol ages ago. Confronting the Shadowed One, the Baraki stated that if the virus was on Zia, he had it. But only the Baraki had the information on how to use it, gained from Prydak's knowledge of Teradax's grand plan. And so, the Shadowed One agreed to meet Prydak on neutral ground, in the abandoned land of Karzani, planning for Dark Hunters and Baraki to walk side by side into a new dawn. Meanwhile, back in Metro Nui, the city continued to be fortified for battle. Objecting to the Order's uh. goals to have Metro Nui be stage one for the final battle, Huki and Kongu were swiftly removed by the Order of Mata Nui, temporarily imprisoned so the Order could continue its work. He's so Under hyped, he's dancing. Above, Insane. <laughs> continued to delve deeper into the catacombs beneath the Colosseum, <laughs> traversing into the inner sanctums of the brain of the robot. Just then, in a crash of tearing metal and dust, Makuta Miserix plunged into the tunnels, teleporting directly beneath the Coliseum and confronting the Did we learn about Axon yet? Bro, have you been watching? We learned about Axon a fucking hundred years ago! Despite the protestations of Zaktan's floating head in the fishbowl, whose pleas for the Toahaka to kill Miserix were ignored. After what felt like hours of travel, the tunnel at last Actually, came wait. to a stop. It ended in a mid-sized chamber, lined with sophisticated machinery. But that wasn't what captured the attention of the Haga. No, they were focused on the two corpses in the room. Above them was a large scroll of text, and Gaki could only make out one phrase, Bara Magna. Scraping off a piece of the armor of the long-dead warriors, the Toa and Miserix were amazed to find that their armor was not made of protodermis, and the warriors sported mostly organic, decayed tissue. Holy Since shit, organic the warriors? the universe were made of protodermis, the mysterious corpses had to be from somewhere else, somewhere older, outside their known world. These were, of course, the bodies of Glatorian warriors. Bro, I just realized what I should have done. I should have recorded myself saying, oh my god, that's interesting. <laughs> And then like thinking for 30 minutes and then just played that on loop <laughs> and just not been here. Oh God. The the robot during the shattering, but we're trapped in the catacombs beneath the robot. And as the Haga, Miserix and Zaktan ventured. I should have sniper wolfed it. Front the darkness of Teradax. Meanwhile, Jaller, Holly and Nuparu set foot on the land of Artadax, placing the heart of the Vizrak. In Fuck, I should have thought of that. The Toamari prepared to summon the millions of Vizrak from around the universe, trapping them there. Just then, Takadok slunk from the shadows, revealing that he had been following them from some time. Dude, Trapping every... Amari in his way, <laughs> Takadok's this happens all the time. The Vizirak approached. Sunlight just reveals he's been following them the whole time. As the horde of Vizirak approached and the Toamari stood helpless on the beach, all... Spider photo lost. and chat? Just then, a voice began to rattle through Jaller's mind. Taunting him, he recognized it as the voice of Makuta Teradax himself, who, for reasons unknown, wished for the Toamari to be freed of their hypnosis. Laughing at the Toa for making such Wait, good someone, statues, someone got the Teradax picture? sent a sharp jolt of pain through Jaller's mind, leaving him with the parting words that it would be a shame if Teradax didn't have a chance to see Jaller's expression as he found out the truth. As a pain cut through the fog of Takadox's hypnosis, Jaller awoke, and with no time to even try and figure out why Makuta Teradax had saved them, he quickly... <laughs> Holy beast! Who is this? You didn't even tell me who this was. The guy said, this isn't me. Steampunker, who'd you get this from? Holy beast. We shook Holly and Nuparu awake. And as they fled the island, the volcanoes erupted behind them, instantly killing every Roland single Roland away. Decimating one of the most powerful armies of the Makuta, finally completing one of the major tasks on the scroll of preparations. 
Back All right, Froland, guess what? <laughs> You're a VIP. A portal opened in front of them, and Vazon rushed out, fleeing from the Destro Makuta Fortress's destruction. The mad half being had opened a portal to a random location, which just so happened to be directly in front of Helrix and Kitangu, just as they fled the wave of Protodermis. Charging through Vazon's portal, Helrix redirected its location to Teradax's lair below the Colosseum, seeking to confront the Dark Lord once and for all. As the portal closed behind them, that left only Vazon, holding the Olmac to his face, as the wave of energized protodermis crashed towards him. Barely having a chance to speak, Vazon cried out as he was transformed by the protodermis, fusing him to the Olmac and granting him Holy the ability shit. to open transdimensional gates. In an instant of madness, Vazon hurtled through the multiverse, and portals to other worlds began to rip open all across this universe and beyond. It was at this exact moment that Axon and Brutaka found themselves submerged in the pit of antidermis. To Axon's horror and surprise, the Antidermis had bonded with This Brutaka, is a while ago. Shared a unique connection to the twisted essence of the Makuta after his time on Boya Nui. Brutaka then began We're to finally back to this? voice that was not his own. Oh, and as shit. Brutaka seized Axon in a grip of iron and burning flesh, oh, shit. he used his Olmac to open a portal to the catacombs beneath the Colosseum. Catacombs. Instant, Axon and Brutaka materialized before the Toa Haga, Makuta Misericks, and Zaktan, <laughs> followed directly by the materializing forms of Toa Helrix and Kifangu. There was only Oh my god, everyone's here! For all around them, the voice of Makuta Teradax began to laugh. In an instant, a bolt of lightning arced out, shattering Brutaka's Olmac, for Makuta Teradax did not want them to be able to escape. At the same moment, a loud hum filled the room, and Zaktan's water tank shattered, leaving the former Paraka leader presumed dead, for he had known too much of Teradax's plan. The remaining combatants stood and faced the voice of Teradax, and their own final Holy battle- Holy shit, it's Thanos! Game. High above the catacombs below the Colosseum, the final battle for the Destiny had begun. <laughs> Surrounded by towering walls with weapons mounted on the top of each, the Trinui was converted to a full-on fortress. Weapons belching fire and smoke at the attack. Nice. Ships Defense. Of the Brotherhood of Makuta ringed the Defense. While flying Rakshi assaulted from every direction, firing bolts of energy from their staves while others pounded on the walls. In one section, a portion of the wall had already crumbled, and warriors fought in the gap, trying to keep the invaders out. By the time Jaller, Holly, and Nupara returned, the battle was in full force, and even Kuki and Kongu had been free to defend against the Brotherhood's forces, allowing the Toamari to reunite at last. Inside the Colosseum, Turaga Vakama rushed to a secure room, the chamber in which he housed the legendary... Kanoji Bro, there is no way any kid knew this lore. He halfway down the stairs when he heard... So who was this for? Her, Vakama found a dozen heavily armed Tomatorin scattered like Us. leaves in a windstorm. <laughs> The door to the chamber Giga had Chad. With age, and stepping through it was a being Vakama hoped to never see uh... again. A little over a thousand years ago, when he was still a Toa, Vakama had battled a being called Voparak. Surrounded Who by the a fox Voparak. Touched, Voparak now worked for the Dark Hunters and sought one thing in Metronui, the thing he now held in his great claw, the Kanohi Mask of Time. Looking back at Vakama with contempt, the Dark Hunter shrugged and left, rapidly aging any order of Mata Nui agent who tried to stop him. Resigned to the loss, Turaga Vakama rushed out of the Colosseum, prepared to man the defenses and muster the armies to battle with all the strength he had. And all mm -hmm. around him, Jaller watched as his city crumbled under the power of the Brotherhood's forces. Jaller should be dead. It's a retcon. Guard, Jaller had honed his mind with battle strategies. He's the captain of the Taco the Guard? Order had badly underestimated the ferocity of the Makuta attack. As he watched, the defenders of the wall fell back, and the invaders began pouring through. Metronui, oh, the city Lord. of legends, was almost lost, and it would take a true miracle for the Brotherhood's forces to be beaten. They back. need a miracle! Part 7, Mata Nui Rising. <laughs> As the climactic battle began... Both Let's go! The city of Nui, the Toa Nui Let's go! ...was to reach the Kodrex and reawaken Mata Nui once and for all within the swamps of Karta Nui. With Takanuva, Titan Toa of Light and Shadow on their side, the Toa Nuva prepared for one final battle against the Brotherhood of Makuta's most powerful... For Mata Nui! Meanwhile, Ikarax, still guarded by Toa Ignika, telepathically sent a message to his Shadow Matoran servant Voltras to rendezvous in Karta Nui and cause a distraction to allow Ikarax to escape. Soaring into Karta Nui, Voltras arrived in the Skyfighter, unaware he was being tailed by his mortal enemy, Maziga. He's who always being tailed. ...since gaining directions from Talbot and encountering Vazon in Makuta's Destro <laughs> Fortress. As Mazika moved to intercept Voltraz, he managed to distract the Shadow Matoran from his mission to help Ikarax escape. Consumed by rage at the sight of his mortal enemy, Voltraz changed course, making a beeline for Mazika. Just then, a mysterious dimensional gateway opened between them, an after-effect of the many portals opened by the crazed Vazon. In an instant, both Mazika and Voltraz were sent careening through the multiverse, hurtling towards another alternate universe, while Vazon disappeared into yet another portal, his newfound powers spiraling out of control. Seeing that his distraction had not come to pass, Makuta Ikarax sought to distract Toa Ignika in some other way to be able to free himself. As he taunted the silent warrior, Ikarax realized that the Ignika did not know it was designed with a countdown that signaled the time when the mask would absorb all life in the universe. After Ikarax informed Ignika that this countdown would end with the Kanohi's coloring change from its current state of silver to pure black, Ignika forgot all about his prisoner and sped down into the swamp to warn the Toa Nuva.
Yeah. Back in the swamps below Kata Nui, Tahu and the others collected their six keystones, reading inscriptions detailed on the stones as instructions to unlock the code oh, they did it. the heart of Mata Nui. At this moment, Toa Ignika arrived and told the Toa, using his new knowledge of spoken language, that he was not simply wearing the Mask of Life. He truly was the essence of the Kanohi Ignika, and on an unstoppable countdown to destroy the universe. Even okay. beyond that, Takanuva added that should they succeed in awakening Mata Nui, devastating <laughs> energy storms would decimate the entire region of Karta Nui. Yeah, we already knew that. The Kodrex as a safe space. We knew Refusing that. Using to give up, Tahu came up with a daring plan. Sneak inside the Kodrex, use the Mask of Life to awaken Mata Nui, and somehow escape faster than the storms could hit. And with that, the ultimate battle began. Clashing through the sky and spiraling down to the swamp, all eight Toa fought all eight Makuta, with Icarax and Mutron joining the fight. Words cannot describe the immense scale of this clash of epic proportions. Holy so shit! The <laughs> the on, Tom slipped away. <laughs> well, you might as well try. You might as well try. You've been talking. You've been people talking for six hours and forty minutes. You're not even gonna try. To unlock the force field around it, allowing the Toa to enter the mysterious structure while Takanuva and Toa Ignika kept the Makuta busy. Unbeknownst to them, Makuta and Tras managed to slip in behind them, trailing the Toa as they began to discover the secrets of their origins, the great spirit, and the nature of Matanui himself. Inside the structure, the Toa found six giant light stones and six pathways leading off in different directions. Liwa, Pohatu, and Kopaka then came upon three fantastical vehicles. Sporting Holy shit, the vehicles! Never seen before. Just as Pohatu and Liwa claimed their vehicles, seeing them as the perfect exit from Kata Nui, Antras rushed in, seizing the final vehicle and blasting out of the Kodrex, with Liwa and Pohatu in pursuit. Oh, I gotta buy the these. made their way into the Kodrex, Ikarax lashed out with shadow energy, threatening to destroy the Kodrex to stop the Toa from awakening Mata Nui. Takanuva left to try and restore the Shadow Mator into their original state, while Onua, Gali, Ignika, and Tahu tried to figure out how to awaken Mata Nui. Within the structure, the Toa Nuva came to a tragic realization. The Kodrex had been intended for them to shock the Great Spirit awake with their powers, but that would take time. And with the damage Ikarax had done to the structure, there was only one way they could awaken Mata Nui. If Toa Ignika sacrificed himself, using the energy of the Mask of Life to power the field himself. <laughs> Initially lashing out in anger at the suggestion and even attempting to kill Tahu, Toa Ignika only slowed after being reminded of Matoro's sacrifice mm. and what it truly meant to be a hero to make the ultimate sacrifice to save the universe. The Makuta were attracted to the noise of cracking metal, and Gorast, Gavla, and Vampra were sent to investigate. Surprised to find Ikarax destroying the Kodrex, the Makuta and Shadow Matoran began to attack him for deviating from Pterodax's grand plan to allow the Toa to awaken Mata Nui. As this epic battle of Makuta versus Makuta commenced, another skirmish erupted in the skies. Liwa and Pohatu used their battle vehicles to chase Entraz, while Kopaka flew after them, looking to regain control of his vessel. In a swift attack, they expelled Entraz from his craft, sending him hurtling to the ground while Kopaka seized Wicked. control of his ship. Back in the battle with Gorast, Vampra, and Ikarax, Entraz and Mutron quickly joined the fight to preserve Teradax's will, and in a brutal attack, they blasted Ikarax apart mid-teleport, sending each of his atoms scattered across the universe and killing the so-called leader of the Brotherhood once and for nice. all. Nice! In the skies above Cardinal, he's Lee, down! He encountered the scientific assistant Vicon, who told him of the clock Rahi and the curative powers of its sonic scream. Rounding up as many Shadow Matoran as he could capture, Takanuva brought the Avmator into the recently captured clock, where they began to slowly be cured of their shadow. Just in time for a cured shadow. Ikarax down, but Teradax still remains. Win and awaken Mata Nui for reasons unknown. Rushing to warn his friends, Takanuva made a beeline for the Kodrex, unaware that Makuta Krika had overheard his revelations about the energy storms and began to slowly piece together the true depth of Teradax's plan. As Takanuva hurtled downwards to the swamps, he was attacked by Chirox and Biddle, using his power of light to rend holes in their armor and force their antidermis essence out. Giving in to his battle rage and shadow side, Takanuva fired devastating blasts of shadow oh, from shit. every limb, tearing the Shadow Matoran from the backs of the Makuta and focusing his power on burning the Makuta within. Holy as shit! Caught the Matoran as they fell, <laughs> I thought he was a good guy. Calm down, Takanuva, bringing everyone back inside the Kodrex to discuss the plan to reawaken Mata Nui. Despite Takanuva's warnings that the Makuta wanted this to happen, the Toanuva felt that there was no other way to achieve their destiny. And so, loading into the vehicles and gathering as many Matoran as they could, the Toanuva prepared to leave Karta Nui, just as Toa Ignika hurtled towards the Lightstones to reawaken Mata Nui. As the Toanuva fled the Kodrex, Makuta Krika caught up to his fellow Makuta, desperate to save his companions. Despite not agreeing with Teradax's mission, Krika still felt respect and camaraderie with his fellow Makuta, and felt compelled to warn them of their fate. For if Teradax truly wished for the Toa Nuva to reawaken Mata Nui, then he knew the energy storms Takanuva spoke of would materialize before them, ripping the Makuta apart. In his horror, Krika realized that all eight of the strongest lieutenants for Teradax had been sent to a suicide mission as the pieces of Teradax's plan fell into place. Oh god. Catching up to the fanatical Gorast first, Krika begged her to listen to reason and help him convince the Makuta to abandon Karta Nui and save themselves. But seeing Krika as a deterrent to Teradax's grand plan, Gorast activated her mass power, making Krika lose control of his power of intangibility. 
and ripping his body apart from within. Jesus. And just like that, <laughs> Makuta Krika died, failing to save the universe. <laughs> Holy the Toa, shit. And even save his companions, at the hands of which he had just been killed. Inside the Codrex, Toa Ignika wow. began the process to sacrifice himself, channeling energy into the Great Spirit. At this very instant, in the lair beneath the Colosseum, Makuta Teradax was taunting those who tried to stop him, immediately sensing the power of the Ignika fueling the body of the Great Spirit once more. As Makuta Miserix lashed out at the machinery in vain, he was restrained by Axon, Brutaka, and Helrix, who realized he was damaging the very mind of the Great Spirit itself. Only chuckling, Makuta Teradax cast Miserix into a powerful illusion, transforming the enraged dragon into a painting of himself. In the same instant, <laughs> Makuta Teradax cast the Toa Haga into a what? powerful illusion. One where the battle was over, Teradax had been defeated. And I'm so invested now, I'm listening. As the Toa Haga happily sauntered out of the chamber, Teradax then turned his attention to the remaining foes, teleporting Brutaka, Axon, and Kitongu out of existence to the far southern reaches of the universe. Okay. And now, all that was left was Toa Helrix. Taunting the first Toa, Teradax promised to keep her imprisoned for all eternity in the mind of the Great Spirit, sharing his plans, dreams, hopes, and ambitions with her for as long as she remained sane. Anyone else would have been filled with dread at Teradax's words, but not Helrix. Instead, she saw an opportunity. She would be alive, her memories would be her own, and she would be in the center of Teradax's thoughts. Right then, she made a vow. She would not break. She would not crumble before the weight of his darkness. Yeah! No matter what, she would defy him. We will not break! To help others we will not As crumble! As Teradax that this wasn't over, Toa Ignika committed the ultimate sacrifice in the heart of Kardanui, kickstarting the heart of the Great Spirit Robot. Only Gali noticed a flash of darkness slip through the cracks between the Kenoki and Nika, and there was little time to ponder that as the energy storms began to restart all around Kardanui. Realizing that Teradax had betrayed them, the remaining members of the Brotherhood of Makuta tried fruitlessly to escape, save Gorast, who was stunned and driven mad by this treachery. <laughs> and so, each Makuta was disintegrated, one by one, with Holy Teradax's shit. main competition all taken out, leaving him the sole living Makuta in the universe. Climbing onto their vehicles, the Toa Nuva soared out of Kardanui, passing the clack creature which cured Takanuva just as the dome was enveloped by light. For the great spirit, Matanui had awoken again! Meanwhile, back in the grand city of Metronui, the battle continued to rage on. Okay. Just then, all around the combatants, everything began to change. The stars brightened overhead, the breeze turned warm, the earth shook in a gentle tremor. Somehow, all the warriors were certain. The great spirit had awakened. Yeah. Beyond the city walls, a storm rose, tossing the Makuta fleet about like toys. Yet that did nothing to deter the Rakshi, who kept on coming. They had broken through the walls in four places, rampaging through Tomachu. Just okay. then, Vakama and Jaller put a daring plan into motion. Hailing Krakua, Toa of Sonics, they convinced it's him to like Lord of the a Rings. series of sonic frequencies before he found just the right one to awaken the Borok that had been soared in the archives. The Borok. The <laughs> and so, the ground itself erupted before the Rakshi, and hundreds of Borok poured out with a singular mission, to reach and cleanse the island of Mata Nui. Okay. As the Rakshi attacked the Borok, the city slowly shook from a series of explosions, and a cry echoed from the highest towers of Kometru. There were fighter vehicles inbound. Holly looked up to see three incredibly fast aircraft soar over the city, bank as one, and head back to where the ships waited. One okay. slowed and dipped its wing to her, and she recognized Pohatu in the pilot's seat. The Toa Nuva had come home. <laughs> Peppering the Rakshi with blasts of light from their vehicles and decimating what remained of the Brotherhood ships, the Toa Nuva and Takanuva had arrived to turn the tide, and finally, the storm was over. Okay. The Brotherhood ships had sunk to the bottom of the Silver Sea, and while the walls around the city had been battered down, the rubble was littered with dead Krata. They stood Rakshi. strong! Metru Nui was safe. And as the Toa Nuva confirmed, the Great Spirit had awakened. The power of the Brotherhood of Makuta was broken for all time. Turagaduma and Turagavakama appeared side by side to announce that tomorrow would be a citywide day of celebration in the Colosseum. Only Toa Hali stood aside. Despite all the wounded and dying among the defenders, she could not help but feel it had all been a little too easy. True, there had been some unexpected help. The airships, the Bora, the storm. But they had faced an army of Rakshi. Something told her they should not have won, at least not with so much of the city still intact. Yeah. And as she returned to aid to the wounded and shook off these troubling thoughts, she failed to hear the sound of dark laughter on the wind. <laughs> Outside of the Matoran universe, uh, the I guess Teradax, right? In the heart of a massive cave, energy pulses coursed through rock. Machines which sat immobile for a thousand centuries shuddered and slowly moved, shaking the universe. Power raced through long disused conduits and streamed further and further from Kardanui. Water rippled around the barren island of Mata. Is he doing a voice? Of all life and vegetation <laughs> by Borok hordes. Powerful quakes shook the earth, and massive megaliths of mountain and bedrock crashed into the ocean. An immense chasm ripped upward through the middle of the doomed island, each side sliding toward the ocean as something massive pushed up from below. 
far away, to the south and east and west, water foamed and boiled as underwater shockwaves spread from the movement beneath the sea. Uh -huh. Gigantic whirlpools formed and disappeared. The sea itself heaved up towards the sky. <laughs> Two halves of the island churned, already frothing waters as they slid apart and dissolved into the maelstrom. Holy A tremendous shit. head made of metallic protodermis <laughs> rose from beneath the shattered remains of the once beautiful island. Water, soil, and rock cascaded off Was this a reveal? as it rose higher and higher into the sky. Like, Titanic shoulders. If you were watching this as a kid, was this the first time you realized that it's a fucking big robot? Or do you always know that? breached the ocean and an equally immense chest oh, it's a reveal. upwards. Slowly, <laughs> That's kind of sick. To its feet and towered above the clouds for the first time in a hundred thousand years. Yellow light gleamed from its eyes as it surveyed the ocean below. Mata Nui. <laughs> it's Iron Giant. Colossal eyes flashed for the briefest of moments before turning dark. Within the Grand Coliseum of Metronui, Turagaduma gave a thrilling speech, praising the exploits of the Toa Nuva in their efforts to reawaken Mata Nui. As he proclaimed that the Age of Darkness was over and they could finally live in the light, his words were cut off by a fleeting shadow that passed over the Twin Moons, uh -oh. and an ice-cold breeze cut through the Coliseum. Uh -oh. High above, the stars of Metronui were darting across the sky, spinning wildly. It looked as if the universe itself was being undone and remade at the same time. Slowly, the stars began to realign, coming to rest in a pattern both bizarre and horribly familiar. From <laughs> random stars in the sky, they had arranged themselves into a shape, the shape of the Mask of Shadows, symbol of Makuta Teradax. As Kopaka slowly <laughs> began to realize why Makuta Teradax wanted them to reawaken Mata Nui, a dark, humorless laugh boomed from every stone, every star, <laughs> from the ground, <laughs> the sky, the ocean. Matoran huddled in fear even as the Toa drew their weapons. As Tahu yelled into the sky, promising to fight back against the Makuta, Teradax only continued to laugh, explaining that when the Toa Nuva awakened Mata Nui, the antidermis spirit of Makuta Teradax had been in the brain of the robot already, and managed to slip in and oh, take the place of Oh, shit. Spirit. And so, the Toa Nuva had awakened Mata Nui's body, with Makuta Teradax's spirit taking his place. And to the Toa and assembled crowd, the voice of Teradax... So he's God now. How could they fight the air they breathed, the ground they walked on? For Teradax was no longer a physical opponent, to the he was of the, the universe. universe. He was their god. Omnipotent and all-powerful, the only threat to Teradax now was the spirit of Mata Nui himself. And as the great spirit robot's eyes turned red, the ground beneath the Toa's feet shook violently as a surge of energy flowed through all existence. Outside the robot, the mask of life was ejected from the Matoran universe, carrying the life force and spirit of Mata Nui. And as the Matoran, okay. Toa, and the Order of Mata Nui prepared for an eternity of misery under this reign of shadows, <laughs> their only hope now was the spirit of Mata Nui. Somewhere in the endless void between planets, the Mask of Life flew. Free of the bounds of the Matoran universe, it had turned from silver back to gold once more. It carried within it the mind and spirit of Mata Nui on a journey whose destination no one could know. Okay. If anyone were able to hear the being within the mask, one statement would have been clear, ringing through the void like the tolling of a bell. <laughs> I will return. Previously on Bionicle Retold, <laughs> Chapter 8, The Ignition Trilogy, Part 3, Rising. <laughs> Thousands of years ago, battles raged across the planet of Spherus Magna in the Cataclysmic Core War, shattering the planet in three chunks and decimating the population of Agori villagers and Glatorian warriors. In this extinction-level event, scientist kings known as Great Beings devised a last-ditch attempt at survival, sending a colossal Great Spirit Mata Nui robot hurtling into deep space to survey and collect data on other worlds, societies, and technology, with the hopes of returning after thousands of years to repair the planet. Thanks to a rogue great being, the inhabitants of this microcosm of a universe gained sentience, and over these thousand years, paved their own path forwards in the legend of Bionicle. As the evil Makuta Teradax overthrew the Mata Nui consciousness governing the robot, yep. and the Matoran universe plunged into darkness and suffering, yep. it's time to shift our focus to the now barren remains of Spherus Magna, and how this post-apocalyptic world evolved since the Shattering. This is Bionicle Rehold. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Ten years of history. Let's go, baby. Hold strong. Hold strong. Chapter, Chapter nine. nine. Is this nine of... Part one. Sands of Bara Magna. Welcome to the wastelands of Bara Magna. Nine of ten? a thriving, rich world full close. of life and resources, Bara Magna is now a husk of its former glory. 
With scarce food and water, only the strongest and most resilient managed to carve a life amidst the desert. Agori villagers, struggling to survive, were aided and protected by stronger Vlatorian warriors who defended their elemental tribes from the dangers that lurked in the sands. The deadly warrior faction of Skrall managed to coexist with these other villagers, forming a unique culture and society of their own. To the far north of the planet, treacherous mountains rose from the desert, an icy wilderness filled with the remnants of the great being's experiments. Like the shape-shifting Batera, robots programmed to instantly kill any being holding a weapon. Even further north lay the mysterious Valley of the Maze, mm. an ancient fortress of the great mm. beings from long before the Shattering. Mm. During the final stages of the Core War, the great beings ordered the Batera to construct an impenetrable labyrinth around their fortress complex, designed to keep the element lords from acquiring the ultimate power source housed inside. As some of the most powerful beings on Spherus Magna, the Element Lords survived the Shattering and were trapped for thousands of years somewhere in the northern regions. If you recall from the prologue, <laughs> He's back. the Element Lords were the nice shirt, of Spherus Magna, created by the great beings to have ultimate control over each of the elemental tribes. Of course, they're also the ones that started the Core War, and because of them, the entire planet was split apart. So essentially, these Element Lords are power-hungry and will do anything to regain the control they once had over the Agori and Glatorian. Now, just a bit of a behind-the-scenes info here as well. Now, the Element Lords were supposed to be the main villains of the Bionicle 2010 storyline. But unfortunately, since Bionicle was cancelled, they didn't really end up doing anything. And for the most part, their fate is left pretty much unresolved. We'll touch on this a lot more when we actually get into the epilogue for Bionicle. No, Behold, so stay tuned no, no, no no, I don't, I don't, I don't. If it's cancelled, I don't want to hear about what you think. That's, of experiments that's fan... Great beings littered the landscape. Largest of which were the scattered body parts of the first prototype robot, activated and destroyed years ago when its power source grew unstable. Colossal limbs, joints, and machinery stood stark against the desert sands, a reminder of the once great technology this world boasted. Directly following the shattering, a contingent of Water Tribe Agori, led by the Glatorian Water Harris Tribe Agori, ventured far south to the Sea of Liquid Sand. While most of their tribe perished en route, those who survived established the village of Tajun and created their own isolated society there. Likewise, the Ice Tribe migrated to the icy Ikonox village amidst the White Quartz Mountains, creating vast mines and villages within the ice, and discovering rich deposits of a precious metallic element known as Exidian, valued for its endurance and ability to withstand sand erosion cool. and rust. Soon, all aspects of society began to use Exidian for their weapons, armor, helmets, and even vehicles. Meanwhile, the Agori of the Jungle Tribe were embroiled in a vast political conflict, with the Agori population deeply divided between those who supported the war and those who did not. <laughs> Thus, their elders issued a challenge. Whichever it's an Iraq metaphor. The best settlement would be allowed to live in the small pocket of jungle on Bara Magna. However, the elders carefully arranged for neither side to have sufficient resources, forcing them to turn to each other for help. This cooperation healed their rift in the tribe as they worked to create the... Is this all now on a standing Pterodax Matanui or is it on the pieces of the land that fell off? Dude, fucking pay attention. This is on a different planet. This is on the original planet of Spherus Magnum that is cracked into three pieces long ago. You fucking gabagool. Twin villages of Tisara taking refuge in the shade underneath the fingers of the colossal prototype robot. Lastly, the Fire Tribe, boasting the largest surviving population on Bara Magna, took up residence in Volcanus, a pit of cooled lava that provided shelter and... Bara Magna is a piece of Spherus Magnum. The sand. Far beyond the civilized pockets of society, the open desert was the home of the Sand Tribe, who lived in the ruins, foraging for food and mentally regressing to the primal, animalistic Vorox and Zesk. North of the Black Spike Mountains, the Skrull race and their rock tribe following established a secluded empire, only venturing to civilized lands on rare occasions. And following the genocide of their race after the Great Dreaming Plague, the only two remaining... Bara Iron Magnus Lord, Carlson. <laughs> ...the game Desert Bandits, preying on travelers in their makeshift vehicles in Battlecraft. Soon, the four civilized tribes of... Holy Fire, shit, these Water, are kind of cool. ...and Ice began fighting over resources, such as the Exidian peddled by the Isagori Menace. Seeking to avert another war, a group of Glatorian, led by the grizzled Core War veteran Sertavis, developed a system of arena matches using new Glatorian fighters. Holy shit. Instead of fighting an all-out war, another the arena. They challenged each other by sending forth champions to the Grand Atiro Arena, a free city where combatants fought one-on-one -on -one to determine the victor with a strict no- That's kind of badass. The system prevented the needless deaths of both Agori and Glatorian. All four civilized tribes agreed, and the inhabitants of Bar Magna entered a new phase of their lives. Part 2. Fall and Rise of the Scrawl. As the Agori and Glatorian established their arena system and began to settle into the four separate villages, the Skrull warriors, led by the last surviving member of an elite breed of Skrull named Tuma, were cut off from their homeland after the global disaster of the Shattering. Following this, the Skrull resolved to tame the lands in which they found themselves. 
the volcanic, unstable, and dangerous territory north of the Black Spike Mountains. Mm. Although some parts of it remain too treacherous even for the Skrull to explore after tens of thousands of years, they became the undisputed masters of their empire. The Skrull ventured onwards, conquering more and more land and delving deeper into unexplored regions of Mara Magna. I do Tens think the MCU stole a lot of Bionicle lore. I do, I do agree. The warrior Brainar searched the Black Spike Mountain for supplies. As the snowstorm around them increased in ferocity, Brainar slowly lost contact with all other Skrull legions. And to his horror, he came upon all his allies brutally slaughtered, torn limb to limb by mysterious attackers. For the Skrull patrols had inadvertently awoken the Batera, silent, lethal shapeshifters who struck from thin air and vanished again. The Batera. As another recap from the <laughs> prologue, the Batera were robots created by the great beings to seek out and kill anyone holding a weapon on Sears. Oh, Man, yeah. Despite a last ditch attempt to stop the core war. Unfortunately, the Batera proved to be a little bit too effective, and eventually were about to decimate the entire population of the planet. I remember when the great that. Tried to shut them down. The AI programming of the Batera became too smart, locking out the great beings from their systems and continuing to operate to fulfill their prime directive: kill anyone they see holding a weapon. After the planet split into three chunks, most can't you just drop your weapon and they don't try to kill you anymore? Magna, where of course that's where the Skrull just rediscovered them today. As Brainar returned to the Skrull Fortress to report his findings, Tuba rushed to contact all other Skrull outposts and heard nothing but silence. Realizing all other outposts had been systematically destroyed by the Batera, which had followed Brainar back to the Skrull Empire Fortresses, Tuma led legions of Skrull out to combat the threat. In desperate battles and surprise ambushes, Skrull died en masse, and even small tactical advantages gained by warriors like Scronius, who discovered the Batera were machines. His name is Scronius? <laughs> in a violent massacre, most of the Skrull armies <laughs> took refuge in a forest of trees, only to find the trees themselves were shape-shifted Batera, leaving only Tuma, Scronius, Brainar, and a small legion of Skrull left. As they holed up in the remaining Skrull Fortress for the night, Tuma sent out search parties to retrieve food and supplies. As one single search party returned with firewood, Tuma realized too late that the firewood itself was Batera in disguise. And in a vicious attack, the Skrull Empire was nearly completely decimated, with Tuma forced to set the stronghold on fire to temporarily trap the Batera inside. And so, the beaten, weakened Skrull were led south, towards Bara Magna villages, forced to abandon their vast empire among the mountains. In the aftermath, the psionics imbued sisters of the Skrull, only female members of the Skrull species, established a separate haven from the males and lived in isolation, gradually descending into myth and legend as witches lurking in the shadows. As the remnants of the Skrull established a new base in the southern, civilized lands of Bara Magna, Tuma began to make plans to conquer the remaining four tribes so they would be better prepared for the Batera when they eventually arrived. To track their migratory patterns and hunting capabilities, the Skrull established regular Vorox runs in which they led captured what? into the Black Spike Mountains as bait for the Batera. During this time, the Skrull also entered the Glatorian oh, Arena cool. matches, winning resources and training their superior warriors in preparation for their coming conquest. As the years went on, new Glatorian were born, and warriors like Vastus <laughs> and Galu were trained by the veteran Glatorian Sertavis, who eventually passed away of natural causes. In a freak Vorox attack, the leader of the Volcanus fire tribe was killed by wild Vorox, and the Agori Ranu eventually came Just to the Just randomly, tribe, he died of natural causes? Elder ...across all the tribes. During the many Glatorian matches, a young... A fucking ancient and timeless Bionicle dies? In a match, rising quickly to what what is natural causes in this warriors, universe? The ...jungle village of Tassara. Culture evolved and Glatorian forged their own paths over the years, with a subculture of high octane racers and vehicle pilots developing to win resources and settle their own disputes through vehicle Holy combat. shit, that's a complicated Even bionicle. Story, like Perditas, gave up their arena posts to participate in these races, which stretched across the desert sands and provided a source of entertainment, danger, and even fun for some Agori and Glatorian. In the unexplored regions of the desert, the Iron Agori Samad continued his life as a bandit, clashing with roaming parties of bone hunters. Less civilized bone Agori hunters chose a life of bounty hunting and piracy, traveling in packs. Eventually, as the Skrull military force grew, Samad was recruited as a slaver for the Skrull, capturing any Agori traveling alone and forcing them into servitude to the Skrull Empire. Jesus. In the meantime, the water Glatorian Kida discovered it's an a underground kid's laboratory Lego near Kajus and made it her hideaway. Little did she know, but this was a secret laboratory of the great beings, and inside was proof of the Matoran universe. And Natural cause of death, magic. garage sale. <laughs> As Kina delved deeper into this conspiracy, her dreams of one day leaving the planet and meeting other sentient lifeforms beyond their barren desert were scoffed at by the other Agori and Glatorian, who dismissed her as a mad conspiracy theorist. As time went on and culture further evolved, vehicle combat was factored into the great Glatorian tournaments, which became more and more of a cornerstone of society. One Glatorian warrior, a fire tribe combatant named Malum, began to become more and more unstable, beating the jungle tribe Glatorian Vastus senseless in an arena match, only to be stopped by the ice Glatorian Strack. Jeez. Ranu and Akar talked to Malum about his growing rage, worried that he may cause the downfall of the arena system, but Malum refused to change his ways, and in a fateful match against Strack, Malum's rage consumed him. He's a bit of a hothead, you know? the ice tribe warrior, Malum was only stopped when the rookie Gresh and veteran fire Glatorian Akar stepped in to stop him. 
After Ikonox filed a formal protest against Malum, Elder Agori Ranu was forced to banish Malum to the Wastelands, where he encountered a group of Oroks and defeated the Alpha Male, becoming their new pack leader. <laughs> As the Gatorian evolved and their society grew, <laughs> the Skrall readied their blades and honed their warriors, prepping to seize heard about Alpha males twice in, in this. a grand defense against the Batera. Part 3. Fall of Atiro. As the Gatorian and Agori settled into life in the sands, one such Agori, a water tribe member... Calling Bionicle just some toys is like calling the Bible just some paper. <laughs> Over one of these many expeditions, Barrex was saved by Gresh, Strack, and the Water Glatorian Terex after being assaulted by Bone Hunters, who reassured the Agori that payment was not necessary when it came to saving lives. Just as the group was attacked by a pack of vicious Voroks, the creatures mysteriously retreated, revealing that the exiled, disgraced Malum was now leader of most Voroks packs and had chosen to spare the lives of the three Glatorian and Barrex. Back in the Atiro Arena, Gresh returned to face off against a Skrull warrior who yes. had challenged his village of Tessaram yes. over a desert oasis. Despite fighting bravely, Gresh was soundly defeated by the Skrull, who claimed <laughs> another victory for his tribe in a series of major successes for the Skrull race. The Skrull Over keeps time, crushing. As matches continued and battles were fought and won, <laughs> some Glatorian began to grow sick of the conflict, with Akar becoming increasingly bitter in his role as a Glatorian, and Strack growing more and more violent and reckless, losing his morals, and even becoming willing to sell out his fellow Glatorians. Wow, he lost his morals. Skrull warriors and search parties became more and more aggressive, blatantly stealing from the Agori and looting their trading caravans, defeating all those who opposed them in the arena. And as Kina, Akhar, and Gresh began to form strong bonds of friendship, they grew wary of the Skrull forces, who took what they wished. Wait, why does this matter? <laughs> back <anyway> <laughs> Meanwhile, I mean, Skrull cosmically, forces, why does this matter? But also in the lore, why does this matter? ...by Batera, who had begun their migration south far sooner than anticipated. Panicking, Brainar rushed to Warren Tuma, who pushed up his plans and ordered the Skrull to attack Atiro the next day, to prepare for the oncoming Batera onslaught and unite the warriors of Bara Magna against this threat. Unbeknownst to the Glatorian and Agori, there was a traitor in their midst. The opportunistic Ice Agori Metis, who seized his chance to gain riches for himself and sold out his fellow companions to the Skrull, detailing their hideouts, plans, and locations to Tuma. Claiming to know the secret weakness of the Batera, Metis forced Tuma to accept him as his partner in the hopes that he could seize control with the Skrull. The next day, the grand tournament in the free city of Atiro began, and Glatorian from all around journeyed to the Arena Magna to participate. Some Glatorian, like Water Tribe fighter Terex, were unhappy to be there, as the Water Tribe Agori had been continually beset by Bone Hunters, and all their fighters were in the arena, leaving the Agori... Did this storyline lead to the cancellation of Bionicle? <laughs> ...fences. Others, like Strack, were anxious to fight and prove their worth, training endlessly with other Glatorian to hone his skills. I As mean, the this is so the match, far... ...the jungle Agori Tarduk took the chance to wander outside the arena, exploring the ancient ruins near the city. In these ruins, Tarduk discovered a mysterious metal map detailing vast island spheres, a city within the brain of a robot, and the enigmatic red star at the center of it all. Consumed by curiosity, Tarduk returned to the arena to share his final Oh, I see. Only for the two to be interrupted by the disgraced Glatorian Malum, who had arrived at the arena to warn his fellow Glatorian. The Skrull were marching to the arena en masse, and not even Malum's Vorox hordes could stop them. Tarduk all right, we're, we're in an emergency situation. I got a 2x to speed this. We're, we have fucking 25 minutes left on Bionicle Day. The chance to quickly leave the arena. I have to take the quiz at the end of the day. To leave with it, setting off to investigate the great beings carving on the red star and the Matorian universe. After <laughs> other elders were quickly we are running out of time, bro. The Matorian there to defend the hero until the Agori could leave and make it to safety. Despite this defense effort, the Skrull numbers were overwhelming, and the Matorian were forced to escape and hide in caves. At least half a dozen Matorian were killed in the battle, and many Agori were scattered or lost. The Skrull had claimed their first major victory, upsetting the social. I might even a three X. Many of the warriors were forced to scatter and regroup. Does anyone have an app that can three X? <laughs> Meanwhile, the trio of Agori seeking the Great Beings' knowledge ventured further into unknown lands, unaware of the fall of a hero and destruction of the cornerstone of Agori civilization. As Tarduk, Crotitius, and Turbald ventured into the White Quartz Mountains mm -hmm. in a desperate search for answers in a way off Mara Magna, they stumbled uh -huh. into a den of vicious iron wolves. Just as the animals prepared to strike, they were called off by their master, the ancient Latorian Surel, who had been gravely injured during Sorrel. the war and presumed dead. Over Write that down. Spent alone in the mountains, I just gotta learn this shit for the quiz. Animals. I'm just studying for the quiz. Element lords, who had just managed to escape and break free from their prisons. Begging okay. the Agori to turn back, Sorrel warned them that the Element Lords were seeking the Great Beings' Valley of the Maze, hoping to gain the power element of the yep. held within for themselves and reestablish their rule over the planet. Before Sorrel and the Agori had a chance to converse more, the Element Lord of Ice, who had been watching them from afar, seized this chance to bury them in an avalanche, triggering a massive cataclysm of snow that was stopped last minute by the Element Lord of Fire, who took the chance to take out his competition and attack the Lord of Ice with a devastating firestorm. Jesus. As the two elemental beings clashed, the Agori fled, Sorrel opting to stay behind and protect his wolf pack. Leaving the White Quartz Mountains and descending to the eerie forest of blades, the three Agori ventured onwards, passing by the petrified statues of once proud warriors, forever fused in nature by the Lord of Jungle. At the sight of this gruesome forest, Kerbal decided to leave and return to civilization, bidding the remaining two Agori farewell. He just so, dipped. Tarduk and Cortesius ventured onwards alone, <laughs> determined to seek out the true nature of the great beings and save their people. Okay. The two Agori stepped foot in the forest of blades, they were seized by plant life, revealing the Element Lord of Jungle, who had been driven mad from isolation. Yeah. 
forever take the Agorias trophies and merge them with the forest, the Lord of Jungle rambled onwards. And out of nowhere, Kerbal returned with a torch, lashing out at the jungle lines and other oh, to escape. Nice. After a change of heart, Kerbal led the group onwards, reaching the river Gorgas, <laughs> where the three Agori were attacked by the element Lord of Water, who believed they I'm actually following it more. I'm Just following it more. <laughs> the river, challenging the Lord of Water in a duel. As the trio of Agori fled, they were saved by the element Lord of Rock, who lifted them onto the riverbank and questioned them about the valley of the maze. After Tardak revealed their noble intentions to save the race, the element Lord of Rock let them pass. The three Agori traveled along the bank of the river, keeping a watchful eye out for another element Lord attack. A few hours later, they reached the headwaters, and there before them was a massive archway decorated with ornate carvings. Written across the top in Agori were the words, Spirits wish. You have to actually pay attention, and then 2x is better. Exactly where their heart desired. And so, as the Agori stepped onto the arch, they found themselves back in a tiro, surrounded by ruins and burning flames. For despite mm -hmm. his resolve to uncover the secrets of the great beings, perhaps Tardak was only truly longing for home. Cortetius and Kerbal were on their feet now, looking around at the ruins of a tiro in shock. Tardak knew they would want to head back to their villages, and so did he. But mm -hmm. once he was certain Desara was alright, he resolved to head back north, make it through the arch, and find what he was seeking. Mm -hmm. He had set out to solve a riddle, and the element lords were seeking the same answer. It was still out there, tantalizing him, a question without an answer. But he would answer it somehow, and soon, for the true significance of the Red Star and its function within the Matoran universe and how it related to the Agori. The Red Star has got to be. Well, what exactly was the point of that story? Because the three Agori just basically ended where it started, and nothing really that major changed. Well, basically. <laughs> Sorry, one more time. Sorry, one more time. I'll do that on 1x speed. Just. Soon. For the true significance of the Listen Red this Star again. and its function within the Matoran universe and how it related oh, this is to way the too slow. was right within reach. This is way too so slow. You might be wondering, well, what exactly was the point of that story? Because the three <laughs> Agori just basically end up where they started, and nothing really that major changed in the plot. Well, basically, what you need to know from that is that the Element Lords are out there trying to find the maze of the great beings and find yeah. their way inside. Yeah. Some sort of a power source hidden inside. Not really sure exactly what that is supposed to power yet, but it'll become clearer as the story goes on. And ultimately, this was most readers' first chance to get to know the Element Lords and also kind of get to understand some of the history and backstory with the Core War in the novel or book format. Okay. Right. Now, of course, if you've seen the prologue video or have been following yeah. along to this point, this is probably all old news. So maybe the story didn't really offer much new things for you. It did. said, Tardock's journey to find the Red Star and uncover the secrets of the Matoran universe leads into a much, much more important story that we're actually going to cover in the epilogue of the entire Bionicle retold series because it actually takes place after the official ending of Bionicle. So stay tuned for that and just remember, Tardock desperately wants to find and discover the secrets of the Red Star. Yep. Part five. Tardock. Volcanoes. In the aftermath of their attack on the Tiro, the Skrull warriors began to expand their land and territory, preparing for the inevitable Batera invasion. Soon afterwards, Tuma and Stronius traveled to the secret haven of the Sisters of the Skrull, attempting to negotiate a truce in partnership with the secretive female members. Thousands of years ago, the Sisters of the Skrull had been given psionic abilities by the Lovecraftian entity Anana, who hoped they would destroy their male counterparts with their newfound powers. But instead, the Sisters actually believed that a great being named Angons had given them their abilities, and the legend of the great being Angons was passed on from generation to generation. All new Sisters wishing to someday locate Angons and receive more powers. Mm -hmm. Tuma used this legend to his advantage, claiming to know mm -hmm. the location of Angons. He attempted to arrange a partnership with the Sisters, but instead, he and Stronius were thrown out, only allowed to live because of this claim. On their way back to Roxas, they were assaulted by Batera, who had grown even closer to the southern regions. And then the treacherous Agori menace made his move, commanding Tuma and Stronius to throw down their weapons, shutting off the Batera's attack mode, and allowing the three travelers to escape. Having saved the leader of the Skrull and his right-hand man, Menace negotiated a higher position of power for himself with Tuma, and the company returned to the Skrull camp at Roxas. Meanwhile, following the destruction of the arena, many Matorian were forced to work odd jobs and take on other duties, as the Agori elders discussed how to resolve conflicts moving forwards. They had to work the odd jobs. The tribe took a job protecting caravans while he was ambushed by a boat hunter holding a detailed map of the entire village of fire, volcanoes. Quickly rushing to Warren Ranu and the others, Galu began to formulate the defense plan, aided by Gresh and veteran Just... Matorian Oh Just my god, wait, is there a commercial for this? To help defend volcanoes. While some that was hype. The of the jungle tribe believed the raid to be a diversion and refused to leave their hometowns unprotected. Other Matorian like Strat managed to be swindled or coerced into defending volcanoes. On the night of the attack, Akar ventured into the Vorox infested wilderness to seek an audience with his old friend Malam, now undisputed ruler of the Vorox Pass. While Malam agreed to launch a preemptive strike on the boat hunter camp to prove his strength and help out his old he refused to help defend Volcanus, for he wanted nothing to do with the village that had exiled him long ago. Killing dozens of bone hunters in a vicious battle, Malam and his Vorox packs returned to their camp. But despite the seeming victory, Akar was Someone leak me, I don't know, I can't find it. Days later, his suspicions were proven correct. Over two dozen bone hunters swarmed Volcanus, smashing past his defenses and overwhelming Akar, who defended the city as best he could as its lone warrior. Just as the bone hunters were about to strike him down, Kina, Tarix, Vastus, and an army of other Latorian appeared on the horizon, pushing back the bone hunters. In the aftermath, the other Latorian. I don't know how I'm gonna explain to my boss why I'm so tired in the morning. <laughs> you see, sir, it all started with uh, Spherus Magna. <laughs> and a little thing called the Core War. <laughs> explained why they had come. None among them had any allegiance to Let me pull up a whiteboard. Their old friend and veteran Glatorian mentor, Akar. It was at this time of chaos and discovery that... New from Bionicle, Glatorians prepare for battle. First up is Gresh, king of the jungle. A warrior with pinpoint accuracy. Super cool strike. Breaks the ice. The fiery Malum. A sharpshooter. And quite the hothead. They all want to challenge the mighty Skrull. Gresh loads up. He fires. Nice block. Gresh into attack mode. But Skrull is ready. Gresh is in trouble. Whoa, what a move. You can join the battle at BionicleStory.com. Ask your parents first. <laughs> Did you guys get your parents' permission to watch this lore today? 
I, did, I forgot, but you do need parents' permission to enjoy this. Far lore. from Bar Magna, on the planet of Aqua Magna, the Matoran universe was thrust into darkness. Makuda Terax had achieved his ultimate goal and cast the spirit of Mainui, held within a mask of life, out of the universe, sending it rocketing in the deep reaches of space. As the Order of Matanui, the Toa Nuva, and all the inhabitants of the Matoran, they're watching it with me. <laughs> the Kanoki Niga, mask of life, blasted towards the sands of Bar Magna, fueled by one singular thought. They're watching it with me right now. <laughs> Part six, the legend reborn. All across Bar Magna, the skies glowed in a brilliant comic streak to the stars. Tuma and Stromius, discussing battle plans and unification strategies, dismissed it as nothing more than a shooting star. In a brawl with a scrawl, now the comet has got to be the robot, right? To make his escape. In the wastelands, Gresh and Vastus conversed with Tarda, learning of the element lords in his quest for the red star and the Torn universe, and watched the glowing object fall to the surface of Bar Magna. In Volcanus, Kina and Akar ceased their practice duel, enraptured by the mysterious glowing comet. And in the barren desert, a swarm of Scarabat deals scurried across the dunes, scattering from the harsh light of the falling mass. As the Ignita smashed into the ground with a brilliant explosion, intense heat fused sand to glass as smoke drifted from its metallic surface. In an instant, the mask rose into the air, swirling the sand beneath. Oh, the comet is the mask. Two arms, two legs, and a torso formed from the whirling grains and turned solid. The Kanoki Ignita, now housing the spirit and consciousness of Matanui himself, had risen in Toa form at last. Holy shit! By his journey through the cosmos, Matanui stumbled, unaccustomed to his new form. It's Matanui as a Toa. He had slumbered and had awoken long enough to feel the presence of a Kanoki Ignita. Why did I say that? As the curious Arabax beetle approached Matanui, he inadvertently activated the cosmic power of his mask of life, temporarily transforming the beetle into a living shield with the powers of his mask. Matanui had little Holy time to ponder shit. the abilities of his Ignita, for he was beset by a crazed wild Vorox, who he was forced to beat back to defend himself. Just as Matanui defeated his opponent, ripping off his stinger tail as a makeshift weapon, he was approached by the devious Agorian Menace, who, unbeknownst to the society at large, had secretly sold out his village to the Squall. Watching the display from afar, Menace quickly made attempts to befriend Matanui, realizing he could be a powerful ally in the coming conflict. And so, as Menace drove Matanui back to Volcanus, they arrived just in time to see a brutal Victoria match between Akar and Strack. In this fierce battle, Akar defeated his opponent, earning Matanui's respect, who claimed Akar fought like a Toa from his world. As the devious Strack prepared to attack Akar from behind, even after conceding the fight, Matanui left into action, saving Akar and transforming his Borok Stinger tail into a full longsword. Soundly defeating Strack and earning the respect of the Agori who watched the fight, Matanui introduced himself as a Toa to Akar, and the two began discussing Matanui's origins, the Matoran universe, and proof of life outside Bar Magna. As they talked, the pair of warriors were interrupted by Kina. Why is God like a random warrior? To help Matanui in exchange for his promise to take her with him when he returned to his homeland. And so the three warriors set off, all eager to help Matanui return to his homeland and gain his help in defending their people along the way. Having discovered a secret chamber of the great beings deep beneath Tajun, Kina led the way. As they traveled through the canyons and desert passageways of Bar Magna, the three warriors battled vicious Scopio monsters while bonding with each other and explaining to Matanui how society functioned on the planet of Bar Magna. Eventually, the trio made it to Tajun and the He's like Jesus. <laughs> destroyed by Skrull and Bone Hunters, working together for the first time in history to seize more land. At Tajun, Matanui and his team quickly rescued a badly wounded Gresh, who had been the only Latorian left to fend off the hordes, and the team sought shelter in the mysterious lair of the great beings. Along the way, they encountered the Agori Barracks, who had also sought refuge in the secret lair during the attack. To Matanui's astonishment, the room was filled with ancient carvings, markings, and blueprints, detailing the creation and birth of the Matoran universe. To Matanui's surprise, Kina explained how she and many Matorians hated the great beings, for they had failed to stop calamity and simply disappeared into the night. But there was little time to ponder this revelation, for the warriors had to rush to the nearby jungle village of Tassara to warn them of the Skrull's allegiance with the Bone Hunters and rally the Matorian to fight together as one against a united force. Before they left, Matanui continued to experiment with the Agnika, bestowing raw elemental abilities onto Akar, Gresh, and Kina, transforming them into fully fledged Toa like heroes. As the four heroes arrived in Tassara, Akar used his newfound fire sword to gain the respect of the crowd, stopping the ongoing Matorian match to compel the Agori and Latorian to band together against the United Army of Bone Hunters and Scrawl. As the village elders discussed late into the night, Barracks noticed an Agori slip away from the crowd and sneak off into the night. As he tailed this mysterious stranger, he came upon him sharing information and secrets with the Scrawl. For this stranger was the traitorous Menace, who had informed the Scrawl that Matanui had rallied the Victorian and Agori together. Before he had a chance to react, Barracks was swiftly captured, and Kina, who had grown suspicious of Barracks for sneaking off and assumed that he was a traitor, was also captured. As soon as Matanui realized the pair had been kidnapped, he immediately set off for Roxas on his own, leaving Akar to guard the village of Tassar. This is like the Bible. Camp, Kina and Barracks resolved their differences. This is like the Bible. Approach the Victorian warriors, having set up a trap to lure them away from the villages using Kina and Barracks as bait. To their surprise, only one lone warrior appeared on the horizon, Toa Matanui, who had come to challenge Tuma in a oh, yeah. In a heated match, Matanui fell the mighty Tuma and claimed his shield in victory. Just then, Menace revealed himself as a traitor, ordering the Skrull and Bone Hunters to kill Matanui. But he was too late, for an army of Glacorian appeared on the scene, engaging in an epic battle between Glacorian, Bone Hunters, Let's and Skrull. Let's go! Kina, Gresh, and the others led the charge, <laughs> Matanui ran to confront the escaping Menace, using the power of the Mask of Life to transform him into a serpent, a cruel but fitting fate for the slippery traitor. As Menace slipped away, <laughs> Matanui rejoined the fight, and with the elemental powers they bestowed upon Glacorian, they swiftly beat back the opposing armies, ending the Skrull threat. In the aftermath of the battle, Matanui negotiated peace between all tribes on Bar Magna, and began nice. unite all the villages, reconstructing the colossal prototype robot left over by the Great Beings. Nice. Done, Matanui turned his gaze to the maze of the Great Beings, resolved to venture forwards and uncover whatever secrets lay inside, bringing him one step closer to returning to the Matoran universe and bringing peace once and for all. As the weeks passed, Matanui and his team marveled at the size and scope of the united mega village of Bar Magna. With Akar named lead defender and Ranu as the chief elder of the villages, the tribes of Bar Magna had finally united under one roof after thousands of years. But Matanui's quest had only just begun. Shortly afterwards, the only just begun. Barrix began a long journey to the Valley of the Maze. Ambushed by a group of wandering Skrull, Barrix was gravely injured, and Matanui was forced to continue alone while the rest of the Glacorian returned to the mega village to protect the city and heal the wounded Agori. Traveling north through the Black Spike Mountains, Matanui arrived at the Sacred Valley and entered the Great Maze, determined to reach the tower station in the middle of the labyrinth. Before him lay great Part two. Trials, and ancient machinery conjured by the Great Beings to protect their secrets, and Matanui would need all his strength, all his skill, and all his wisdom to make it inside and learn the secrets of old. Meanwhile, far away from the planet of Bar Magna, we were oh, back to the here. Coliseum of Metronui in the Matoran universe
Previously, on Bionicle Retold, oh my God. Chapter 9, Rebirth, Reign of Shadows. In a climactic Wait, is the last chapter? Tudui, the Kawahaga, Makuda Mizrax, and leading members of the Order of Matanui were soundly defeated. In a cunning plot to seize control of the entire Matoran universe, the spirit of the Dark Lord Makuda Terax overthrew the Matanui consciousness, assuming control over the colossal Great Square Robot, and casting the Mask of Light deep within the Void of Space. As Matanui discovered the desert world of Bar Magna and fought alongside Latorian warriors in a quest to return home, the Matoran universe was plunged into darkness. With warriors like Bazon, Bazika, and Voltraz plunging through alternate universes in a desperate attempt to get home, all eyes are on the Toa Nuba, Toa Mari, remaining members of the Order of Matanui, and even the Dark Hunters, as they lead an ill-fated rebellion against the Makuda from within, desperately struggling to fight back against the God of their world. This is Bionicle Retold. Chapter 10, baby! Chapter 10, Destiny. Part 1, Reign of Shadows. On the desert planet of Bara Magna, the Kenoki Ignika, Mask of Life, crash landed in the barren wasteland, forming bonds of friendship with the Katorian warriors and battling to find a path back to the Matorian universe and rescue his people. As Toa Matanui ventured across this hostile realm, we return to the planet Aqua Magna, where the Great Spirit Robot stands tall for the first time in a hundred thousand years. With the Kuda Terax established as Dark Lord of the universe, thus began a period of endless suffering. On the yeah. island fortress of Daxia, headquarters of the Order of Matanui, armies of Rakshi made landfall, sweeping across the fortified cities and decimating most order agents left to guard the main base. As precious few veteran agents like Trinuma fled the massacre, the Paraka vanished from their water tank prison, and the Dark Hunter Dweller, confined deep within the darkest dungeons of the Order's stronghold, fled his captivity in the chaos. The only remaining pool of energized protodermis in existence was held deep within Daxia, and quickly claimed by Teradax. The few members of the Brotherhood of Makuda who remained alive were enslaved by Teradax, forced to endlessly churn out new Rakshi before being swiftly eliminated, leaving Teradax the only Makuda left alive, save for the enslaved Makuda Miserix, who was stuck in the illusion of a painting for Teradax's amusement. In the aftermath, Makuda used his newfound godlike powers to recreate the Vizorak race, undoing the efforts of the Toa Nuva and Toa Mari to wipe out the scourge from the universe, and commanding the vicious spiders to sweep across the land in his name. In the vast city of Metru Nui, the majority of the Matoran population were enslaved by armies of Rakshi, with Matoran workers slaughtered en masse until the populace finally gave in, keeping the forges running to operate the mind and body of the Great Spirit Robot. The Taraga were subsequently imprisoned, with the devious Matoran act now placed in charge of city operations. What Matoran could escape sought refuge in the darkness of the archives, locating the shape-shifting Rahi Kraka, who agreed to protect the city's remaining population. And deep within these archives, the surviving Toa teams, agents of the Order, and the Dark Hunters convened, planting the seeds to a larger rebellion against the Makuda. As Rakshi roamed the empty streets of Metronui, killing or imprisoning all who ventured out, plans were made and speeches were given deep underground, with the Toa Nuva and Taka Nuva taking the lead as a powerful figureheads of the rebellion. Realizing they would be a bigger target if they stayed together, the Toa decided to split up, each covering different pockets of the Matoran universe to establish a secret communication network and intelligence system across the universe. Journeying to the ruins of the Makuda fortress on Destral, Taka Nuva and Pohaku hid in the darkness, scavenging through ancient artifacts and weapons to get an edge on Rakshi enforcers. Uncovering the colossal teleportation engine, Taka Nuva quickly summoned Toa Nuparu for his engineering skills to repair the engine, and Nuparu began the monumental task of reverse engineering the ancient and powerful artifact. Discovering the remains of the massacre on Daxia, Tahu rushed to convene with Vali and warned the others of the Rakshi army movements, who in turn was deep in research on the great beings, hoping to find a weakness to cripple the great spirit robot and the Kuda spirit from within. All these years, the Toa Nuva had strived to reawaken the great spirit robot, and now all their trials had led to this cruel, ironic final mission, destroying the robot which they had fought so desperately to awaken from within. As months passed under Teradax's reign, the Toa Nuva rallied the resistance effort and embarked on their own missions, forming ragtag teams with former enemies and dark hunters to cripple the Kuda's new form. As Tahu correctly assumed, it took Teradax time and practice to master the complexities of the Matoran universe and acclimate to his new form, and the resistance effort used that precious time to their advantage. In the ruins of the deserted realm of Karzani, Tahu led a strike force consisting of the dark hunter guardian, ancient keeper of secrets, the shape shifting female Rahi Kraka, Jomak, agent of the Order of Matanui with the Adam Reconstruction Power, and Lariska, former member of the Federation of Fear and Dark Hunter Assassin. Alongside them was the new chronicler, Kopi, who once aided Takua years ago on the island of Matanui as part of the chronicler's company. Their mission was to meet up with Onua, who had led his own team of Order of Matanui agents to seize a weapons cache to the south of the realm and rendezvous in the middle of the Forsaken Land. As the team discussed strategies and reassured Kopi's fears, Guardian left the campsite, wondering if there was a way off the universe and if their fight against the god of their world was truly a lost cause. In an instant, beneath his feet, the ground opened. Bonds made of solid stone wrapped around him, yanking him down into the hole even as he screamed. Then the barren earth slammed shut again and he was gone. Just like that, one of the oldest and most experienced dark hunters was killed in an instant, fused to the ground itself and crushed under tons of rock and soil. Leaping to their feet, Tahu and his team came to a terrifying realization. Makuda Terax had begun to master the ability to pinpoint the locations of individual beings in the universe, and was simply leaving Tahu and the rest of his team alive to toy with them. Sounds of metallic footsteps There will be a test at the end. There will be a test at the end. Dozens of exo Toa centuries, missiles loaded and aimed at the fugitives. As the Rabai shells spoke in the hollow voice of Makuda Terax, threatening to enslave or kill the dissidents, Tahu suppressed his impulse to leap into action and go down fighting. Learning from his past and drawing from his experience, Tahu kept a level head and stayed calm, preventing needless violence and bloodshed. As the team prepared to surrender and stage a future escape, the ground began to shake beneath them, and erupting from the catacombs below Parzani was Toa instantly generated a vast pit underneath the exo Toa, temporarily delaying them. As he caught up with Tahu, Onua explained how Rashi had killed the remaining order agents, seizing the weapons cache and preventing Onua from claiming the supplies. As Lariska began to brainstorm a new mission, Onua came up with a deadly plan. Makuda Teradax was clearly not fully in control of his new power, and needed Rashi and Exotoa to act as his eyes and ears on the ground. While Teradax was all powerful, there was still only one way to make new Rashi by transforming Krata with energized protodermis. And so, to stop the steady flow of new Rashi, they had to complete the mission the Order of Matanui began in the early stages of the Destiny War, destroy the final source of energized protodermis in the heart of the former Order Fortress on Daxia, now heavily guarded by the most powerful agents of Makuda. <sighs> Back in Metronui, Smoke billowed as an army of heat vision Rashi raced to Ho Metru to pacify the Matoran workers, led by the Scotty uh... Warlord Nectar, who had sided with Teradax against the will of his fellow Scotty Warlords. Desperately defending their home and blasting through the Rashi ranks, uh... the Kalamari too much the Bionicle! <laughs> as Tahu, Onua, and the rest of their team embarked on the long journey to Daxia, the rest of the Toa Warlords were much Bionicle! Toa Mari defending the archives while attempting to break the Toa out of their trance and kill Paka on a quest of his own. That left Liwa on a simple mission,
Meanwhile, on the Skakti island of Zakaz, the five Tuamari assembled with a new mission. Weeks ago, they had defended the archives against the Skakti warlord Nektan and his Rakshi invasion, who had allied himself with Makuta Teradas. Now, Nektan led his armies of barbarians south for purposes unknown. Having is this a sponsored stream? Yeah. yeah. Now, this stream is sponsored by the cancelled in 2010 Bionicle series. Following the widespread destruction of Zakia, the sea snakes that were once I'm showing how fun it is. Rumors were flying that they had been rescued and spirited away to Zakaz. They're thinking of relaunching it. Suffocating the Skakti guards on the shore, Kongu took the lead, and the five Tua ventured inland, with Kuki using his powers of stone to distract the Skakti patrols long enough for Holly to use her elemental power of water to detect an underground river leading straight to the largest Skakti stronghold. As the amphibious Tuamari dived deep beneath the water once again, they came upon a massive sanctum, where a Skakti warlord was delivering a rousing speech to a gathering of nearly 500 barbarians. As rallying cries punctuated a grand speech declaring their intent to rise up against Makuta Teradax himself, while the Toa, Dark Hunters, and Order hid in the darkness, a massive tank rose from beneath the ground, bubbling with energized protodermis. Before the Tuamari had a chance to even process the fact that the Skakti had somehow attained more of the substance, their attention was drawn to a group of prisoners being led to the pool. A savage Zyglak, a defeated and battered Vortex, a brutish Steltian laborer, and five of the Paraka, still writhing and gasping in their sea snake forms. Horrified, the Tuamari came to a realization. The Skakti would have no idea which specific beings to throw in the bubbling pool unless the idea was planted in their heads by the god in control of destiny, Makuta Teradax. At the Warlord signal, the three prisoners and the five Paraka were thrown to the energized protodermis tank. So engrossed were the Skakti that they failed to notice a strange, greenish cloud of antidermis emerge from a nearby lake, hover in the air for a moment, and then plunge into the energized protodermis tank. Okay. As the liquid began to froth and bubble, the Tuamari could see a shape forming in the silver fluid, something monstrous new. and horrible. As they watched in shock and terror, before their eyes, Six a new, new villains? form of life began to climb from the tank. <laughs> Elsewhere in the universe, the Baraki Pridax stood on a pedestal before his assembled legions of warriors and outcasts. He, Helma, and Mentax had rebuilt their legions, while Elec had returned to the sea to gather his own troops. They were poised to strike as soon as the Shadow One unleashed his viruses on Makuta Teradax. The universe would be theirs to rule once more. But then, there was nothing. The appointed time had come and gone, with only a violent Earth tremor to mark it. At first, Pridax thought that the Shadow One had succeeded, and the quake was assigned he had overthrown Makuta Teradax. But it became rapidly obvious that nothing had changed. Teradax was still in control, and now Pridax had a choice. March on Metronui and risk destruction at the hands of the Makuta, or stay put and risk rebellion by his legions. Seething with rage at the Shadow One's apparent failure, Pridax resolved to march on Metronui with the rest of the Baraki and their combined legions, rallying the armies to march on Makuta Teradax's Rakshi, Exotoa, and Vizrak forces in the city. In a chamber on the island of Zia, the stone floor was littered with the shattered remains of precious vials. There was no trace of the shattered one, but what once contained the vials of viruses. Every this is like the hardest thing I've ever done on stream. Pulverized in the front, <laughs> in his attempt to unleash the prototype viruses on Makuta Terrace. This is way harder than the, uh... Barely surviving to flee to other corners of the universe. Elden Ring, oh, the fucking, uh... The Order of Matanui had been teleported from the chambers beneath Metronui by Makuta Terrace. Locked in an endless illusion and desperate to find his comrades... I can't even remember the name, dude. I'm losing my fucking brain. ...finding himself on an uninhabited beach in the middle of nowhere. The tree sentinel. He didn't know where he was, nor did he care at the moment. All that mattered to him was where Makuta was, and he knew that answer. Somehow, some way, Axon was going to make it back to Metronui, and Makuta was going to pay for what he had done, even if it cost Axon his life. And finally, Toa Helrix, leader of the Order of Matanui, sat alone in her prison, with only the echoing thoughts of Teradax and a portrait of Makuta Misrix to keep her company. Knowing that the Torin population could never be convinced to stop working if their comrades and friends were killed as a result, Helrix came to a sickening realization. Defeating Teradax and This is where it gets really good. <laughs> of all beings that lived inside it. The very destruction Toa Inika, Toa Nuva, and Toa Haga had fought so hard to prevent, and Makoro had sacrificed himself to save. The planet outside had no known landmasses and no place to flee to. The inhabitants of the Matoran universe would suffocate or freeze in the darkness. As leader of the Order of Matanui, Helrix often had to make decisions that sent agents to their deaths. It came with a job. And so, Helrix resolved to stop Teradax before he killed or enslaved billions of innocents in the universe beyond. Closing her eyes and drawing on all her power. They should make collectible figurines of these guys. Their designs are really cool. <laughs> Part two: Trials of Vazon. As the inhabitants of the Matoran universe face their greatest battles yet, Vazon, Maziga, and Voltraz tumble through That's all their worlds, by the power of the Olmak, now fused to Vazon's That's a good face. idea. Two enemies cast out to dimensions unknown, Vazon continued ricocheting through the multiverse of madness. One moment, he was out in the sunshine of the Kingdom universe, seeing Matoran and Dark Hunters working together in perfect harmony. The next moment, everything had shifted, and he found himself in a mirror world where an evil Matanui spirit plotted to overthrow the great spirit oh, of Matanui. His body, his essence, and his mind had fused to that of the Olmak. Wherever he stepped, a new dimensional portal ripped open, and as time passed, Vazon gained more and more mastery over this powerful new ability. In a oh. flash of energy and light, Vazon tumbled oh. toward a portal through the sky, finding himself surrounded by sand in every direction. As he journeyed towards buildings and jungle trees in the distance, Vazon watched as the vast desert gave way to a lush jungle filled with workers away at constructing vast villages. Some of these workers were Lamator, but others Vazon did not recognize. For these were Agoru, and Vazon had found himself in the Spirus Magna alternate universe. Flashing back to thousands of years ago, when the great spirit Matanui robot had delved deep into the unknown reaches of space, the Brotherhood of Makuta and Teradax had chosen not to rebel against Matanui, allowing the colossal robot to fulfill its purpose and return to Bar Magna with the technology to restore the planet to its rightful place, recreating and terraforming the planet of Spirus Magna as it was in the old days. Here, Matoran, Agori, Hoa, and Latorian worked side by side to create a new form of society, rising to prominence among the stars. Incredible. Vazon encountered a variant of Tarda, who assumed he was a Toa and brought him to the villages of this strange new world. Vazon watched as Toa like Jalar and Kongu worked alongside Latorian like Resh and Kina, and most surprising of all, saw that the Brotherhood of Makuta, who in this universe had never revolted, overthrew Tuma and his Skrull legions, taking over command of the Black Armored Warriors to defend the villages. But before wow. Vazon had a chance to comprehend the changes of this world, they were interrupted by a vast army on the horizon. Platoons of Skakti bellowed war cries as Rudaka led her vortex kin towards the village, all led by Makuta Misrix in his dragon form. Bone hunters rushed towards the village and all around, Toa and Latorian prepared to defend their villages. As Vazon tried and failed to activate his innate teleportation abilities, the world began to slow and freeze around him. As color faded from the universe and time began to stop, a voice echoed in Vazon's mind, a voice that claimed to be a great being from our core universe. <laughs> Eons ago, this great being made the error of touching the mask of life. As a result, everything around him, furniture, equipment, even rays of light, came to life. For their own safety, his what? rulers imprisoned him.
Hundreds of thousands of years ago, the coal bar for energized photodermis rips I'm EP. Kickstarting the events of the legend of Bionicle. I'm very EP. The created the first Toa far earlier to repair the planet and protect it from the inevitable cataclysm caused by the shattering. Instead of creating the great spirit Matanui robots, the great beings refined and perfected the Toa design, granting them the smaller statures of the core of our universe, both greater agility and enhanced elemental and Kenogi powers. The Toa was sent underground with containers to hold the energized photodermis and the duty of repairing all the planet's damage. And after five years, this task, dubbed the melding, was successfully completed. In the aftermath of the melding, the great beings continued to reside in the valley of the maze, adding crystal and iron fortifications to the fortress at its center. To create an order of true peacekeepers and servants of the light, the great beings brought the <laughs> race into being. <laughs> Armor, Don't Scientologists armor, believe this? <laughs> this is what Tom Cruise actually <laughs> believes <laughs> happened in the real world. The stage was set for two mortal enemies to collide, hurling towards each other in a final clash. Just then, there was a second moment of darkness and disorientation. In a flash of blinding light, Mazika and Voltras found themselves plumbing towards the ground, barely escaping a vast lake of energized protodermis as they fell before a massive tree bend with gold metal. In seconds, the two Matoran of ice and shadow had been transported to the melding alternate universe. As the Matoran awoke, dazed from their journey, they were approached by Toa Maku and Matoran Helrix, who assumed Mazika and Voltras were other Toa, given their smaller forms. Mazika and Voltras soon realized that in this world, Toa were Matoran, and Matoran were Toa, and they would be forced to blend in, lest they draw the attention of the Makuta, heroic protectors of the land. Explaining they were seeking passage home, Mazika and Voltras were brought before Makuta Teradax of the Melding Universe, who explained his purpose to uphold the values of unity, duty, and destiny, no matter the cost. In this world, a Makuta must be utterly without doubt or fear or any trace of shadow, with years of meditation required to claim the noble title. As they ventured through the Valley of the Maze, Makuta Teradax saluted Gorath and Ikarax, also wearing pristine white armor, and brought them before a vast council chamber illuminated by dim light stones hanging from the chamber ceiling. As voices began to echo from the dark, and flickering light illuminated the outlines of six mysterious figures in the darkness, Makuta Teradax of the Melding Universe introduced Mazika and Voltras to the great beings. Announcing he had used his telepathic abilities to peer inside their souls, Makuta exposed Voltras as a being filled with darkness, stunning the great beings by this flaw in their creation. As the group conversed, the great beings explained that they were aware of the multiverse and their counterparts in the vast, uncounted realities that exist. It was only a matter it's of less than an hour. It's less than an hour. Walls, and to the great beings, the chance to dissect and study Voltras was an alluring opportunity. And so, Mazika was offered an exchange. The great beings of the Melding Universe would allow him to be returned to his universe, so long as they could keep Voltras to study him, to understand what went wrong in his creation. In return, they would allow Mazika to choose one being from their universe to go with him to our prime dimension, to keep the balance between realities. While Mazika at first refused, his noble heart unwilling to doom even Voltras to an eternity in a separate reality, the great beings made it clear he had no say in the matter. Makuta Teradax had seen the rock in his spirit, and peered into a distorted mirror, and fully supported Voltras's punishment. And as the Shadow Matoran was dragged away by other Makuta, Mazika made his choice. Calling on the white armored Makuta Teradax, he made ready to return to the main universe and bring a powerful new ally to turn the tide. Back in our core universe, on the planet of Aqua Magna, Makuta Terax, in the huge robotic body that once belonged to Matanui, surveyed the world he stood on. There was nothing but water as far as the eye could see. Despite the waters teeming with life and escape pit prisoners still struggling uh. to survive, to Terax, all their struggles were beneath him, and there were worlds out there, teeming with life, waiting to be conquered. Terax pondered to himself, why should he be satisfied with ruling a universe inside this body, where he could master a true universe of planets and suns and stars? This robot body had the power to lay waste to cities, to shatter mountains, to subjugate entire planets, and yet Matanui had not used any of it. And so, Teradax made his decision. Once he had crushed the final remnants of rebellion inside him, he went back into the Red Star above and began his journey of conquest, starting with tracking down Matanui's spirit in the Mask of Life on Bara Magna, and crushing him and all he cared for beneath his feet. But just then, his thoughts were interrupted. Teradax felt the presence of another Makuta. Did you see the, the only what is this, Makuta, the Bionicle this what? Of a painting. This had to be something else, someone else, and there was only one answer. This new Makuta had come from an alternate universe, and Teradax was about to come oh. face to face with himself. In a blinding flash of light and energy, Mazika and the Makuta Teradax of the Melding Universe materialized in an uninhabited portion of the southern continent. As darkness began to creep over the valley, Mazika was surprised to see the Melding Teradax drawing light from the region to prepare for battle. For despite the fact that the Makuta of the Melding Universe had purged all darkness from their souls, they had total control over light. And what is darkness but the absence of light? And so, walking down the now darkened path, the two allies made their way out of the valley as their quest truly began. Approaching a sacked and demolished village of Vomitorin, Masters of Gravity, Mazika and the Melding Teradax discussed the circumstances of the core Teradax's fall to darkness and how easy it may have been for the Melding Teradax to do the same. Their conversation was interrupted when all around them the winds rose. In a moment, they had gone from gentle breeze to screaming maelstrom, so powerful it knocked Mazika off his feet and sent him tumbling towards the edge of a ridge. Landing among the ruins, Mazika's impact shattered the long dead corpse of a Vizrak into fine black powder. Now that he looked around, he could see the other bodies of Vizrak spiders scattered here and there. The villagers who had lived here had gone down fighting. But then, a voice came from the dead mouths of the Vizrak all around. Teradax recognized it as his own, but touched with madness and evil. As the heroic Melding Teradax proclaimed himself as truly stronger than the Teradax of this world, for overcoming the temptations he could not, the mouths of the Vizrak corpses only laughed. You're lost now? <laughs> Bless Bess, you're lost now? You were, you were good until just now? And shadow energy swirled about their hands, for Teradax had his own army of beings from alternate universes, and an apocalyptic final battle was nigh. Part 4, The Many Deaths of Toa Tuyet. The Thousands many of years deaths ago, of Toya Tuya. The deranged serial killer Toya Tuya sought the power of the Nui Stone. I know Each this. Part, the to absorb, energy to the of the stone, to Bro, you've said this eight times in this video about Toya Tuya and the Nui Stone. Anyone who stood in her way, Tuya nearly succeeded in her quest. But after being thwarted by the efforts of Toya Lihan and Nidiki, she was imprisoned by the order of Matanui by the teleporting titan Otar. Officially, she was brought to the prison of the pit, where she allegedly lived out the rest of her days in confinement. And in the depths below Mari Nui, Toya Matoro and Makuta Teradax in the form of Maxilo's robot encountered the dead body of what appeared to be Tuya. And while Teradax's attempts to rebuild the Nui Stone with a sack of Artaka ultimately failed, all in the Matoro universe believed Tuya to be dead, and she slowly faded from history. But that is only the history you know. For secretly, the order of Matanui we wish to gain the power of the Nui Stone for themselves. Teleporting to yet to a pocket dimension where no Toa existed, the Order of Matanui interrogated her for thousands of years, studying the fragments of the Nui Stone embedded in her armor and managing to extract samples of the powerful artifacts safely from her armor. To cover up this research, the Order of Matanui traveled to an alternate dimension where they found and killed the Toa Tuyet of that world, transporting her corpse
that ancient Nui stone along the way. After 2,000 years passed, and Tu yet grew more and more powerful, she finally arrived back in our core dimension, materializing in the archives of Metro Nui right at the peak of Paradox's reign. Meanwhile, in the archives below Metro Nui, the Torin had formed their own resistance movement, aiding the Toa in their missions to relay information and free their Eight hours, the baby. Word that Taku and Onua's mission to destroy the final energized Protodermus pool on Doxia had succeeded, had spread across the Matoran resistance movement, and Kapira, Tom Matoran, an old member of the Kua's Chronicles company on the island of Manui, rushed to the full work day. Soon, the two Matoran reunited with Tafu, Ho Matoran Carver, and original Chronicles company. That's a full work day, baby. As the three Matoran, led by Maku, ventured deeper within the archives, Maku revealed the true reason she had brought them together, for she had encountered Toa Tuyet deep beneath the archives, who claimed to be willing to aid the resistance and defeat Paradox. Skeptical of her powers and strength, Hafu and Kapura questioned Tuyet, who was overjoyed to realize the Matoran had forgotten of her misdeeds thousands of years ago, and her crimes had faded into obscurity following the death of Likon and Nidiki. Revealing the pulsating Nui stone in her fist, Toa Tuyet explained how she was the perfect ally against Makuta, for he truly believed her to be dead for some 2,000 years. While Maku headed back to spread the news among the resistance network, Hafu and Kapura agreed to help connect Tuyet with the rest of the rebellion, who in turn had no doubt she could organize and lead a successful rebellion against Paradox and bring him down. But she had no intention of allowing Matanui to regain control. Thousands of years to gain power and knowledge had led Tuyet to be convinced Matanui was weak and ineffective. And the Matoran universe needed a ruler like her to truly achieve greatness. Part 5 Gods of Old. As Tuyet plotted to overthrow Makuta Terrax and seize control of the Matoran universe for herself, conflicts and battles broke out all across the robots. The Toamari still. This is all overtime, bro. The ruin of the island of Zakaz were witnessing a grotesque being slowly rise from the tank of energized protodermis. The melding universe Makuta Terrax and Mazika found themselves facing off against alternate versions of Takanua, completely turned to the dark. Tahu, Onua, and their team had just won a major victory against Terrax, overwhelming the guards of Daxia in a massive assault and destroying the only source of new Rakshi. In the ruins of Destral, Takanua and Pohatu worked desperately to gather arms, salvage weapons and armor, and mount a defense against Makuta from within. The Skakti warlord Nectan readied his forces of Rakshi and Paraka to venture to the Southern Islands, for reasons unknown. And in these Southern Islands, Axon, still reeling from his mind prison, reunited with Rutaka, who is now fully merged with Antidermis and levitating above the ground. Together, the two old friends set off on a long journey back to Metro Nui, finding their way through hordes of Rakshi, Exotoa, and Vizrak as they went. In the Silver Sea of Protodermis, the Baraki legions led by Bot Frogs, if you want to watch it at normal speed, just watch it on point five speed. It's just watch the VOD on point five and you're good. His sole quest to wipe out the vicious fires. And finally, in the mind of the great spirit robot, Toa Helrix, leader of the Order of Matanui, prepared a devastating Nova Blast, ready to sacrifice all life in the Matoran universe to stop the Unitarians. And on an uncharted island, Toa Liwa found himself face to face with the horrific sight of the slimy, tentacled mass of Tren Krom, former overseer of the Matoran universe, now left a rottenness prison cave. A voice dripping with decay telepathically wormed its way into Liwa's It's Tren Krom again. Heard the voice of Makuta Terrax echo through the universe. Tren Krom pondered that there may be a way to use his knowledge of the inner workings of the Matoran universe against Makuta Terrax, but it would require great sacrifice from Liwa. As the Toa Nuva of Air agreed to do whatever it takes, a tentacle wrapped around his neck, and in the next instant, the world began to spin. There was light and pain and impenetrable darkness, and when the shadows cleared away, Liwa found himself staring at himself. He looked down, only for a microsecond, long enough to see a huge tentacle mass grafted the stone. Instinctively, Liwa realized he was in Tren Krom's body, and Tren Krom's mind was inside his whole body. Overjoyed at his newfound freedom, Tren Krom, possessing the body of Liwa, only laughed, explained that in return for his help in overthrowing Terrax, he would take Liwa's former body as his own, leaving the mind and spirit of the Toa Nuva there trapped in Tren Krom's body, condemned to the Forsaken Island. As That's Liwa fucked. Protested, straining against the cave, Tren Krom took off in his body, telepathically contacting Artaka, who was That's so the fucked. He stole his body. And allowed Tren Krom to join the fight against Terrax. And so, the world around Tren Krom began to shimmer and fade. When his vision was clear again, he was standing in a subterranean tunnel filled with a collection of broken equipment and dust-covered artifacts. He had never physically been to this place before, but he knew what it was. The Metro Nui archives. As he surveyed his new surroundings, the parting words of Artaka echoed through his mind. Carry out his end of the bargain, or Artaka would find a way to utterly destroy Liwa's body rather than allow Tren Krom to steal it for all eternity. As Tren Krom, the body of Liwa surveyed his surroundings, he was hailed by Hafu and Kapura, who had brought along Toa Tuyet in the hopes of returning the tide of rebellion. Reading her mind in mere seconds, Tren Krom was amused at her ambitions to overthrow Paradox, and while she was powerful and dangerous, he surmised that she may have some use as well. Sensing this intrusion to her mind, Tuyet quickly deduced that Liwa was not who he claimed to be, but kept that knowledge to herself. And while Kapura was overjoyed to see a second Toa materialize before him, Hafu began to grow suspicious of both warriors, who seemed to each harbor Holy fuck! Leaving archives, Tren Krom, <laughs> Holy fuck! Came across Toa Holy Liwa, fuck! City, Get to the point. Tren touched the minds of the two to Get to the point. Who's artificial reality to this? Hoops and Momanga shook their heads as if waking from a dream. Even as he restored them to the real world, Tren Krom sent his power cascading into the minds of the other Toahaga, freeing them as well. As the Toahaga reeled from the illusion, finally breaking free from their prison at last, two yet Tren Krom and the Matoran ventured onwards, demolishing the wall to Toa Helrix's prison just as she was about to unleash a devastating Nova Blast. Quickly recognizing the dark Toa, Helrix powered down her Nova Blast and moved to confront two yet. But in the commotion, Tren Krom was distracted by the portrait of Makuta Misrix on the wall. The portrait of Misrix marked as if folding in on itself. An instant later, Makuta Misrix himself stood in the chamber in full reptilian glory. But the Makuta looked dazed at first, then his eyes filled with rage. Quickly catching up on the situation. Helrix ordered Hafu and Kapura to leave that sanctum and get word to the rest of the resistance, and be prepared to make peace with the Great Spirit and with each other, for the end of everything was nigh. Just then, Tren Krom leapt to a hidden wall of machinery, manipulating a set of controls for the Great Spirit robot. As he muttered about golden armor and sending a beacon to the Agika, Helrix oh, yes. resigned her decision to destroy the mind of Paradox, and in turn doomed the Matoran universe to destruction. Before either side could complete their tasks, a voice echoed from the chamber wall. Axon and Brutaka had finally returned to Metro Nui. They're Axon back. Surprised, Brutaka declared that Tren Krom must be allowed to complete the task he set out to do. Axon and Brutaka. The universe must die, and Paradox with it. Before the startled eyes of Kapura, I understand these characters. On one side, stood Helrix, Misrix, and Axon, all three determined to demolish the brain of the robot and commit the ultimate sacrifice to kill Paradox once and for all. On the other stood Tuyet, Tren Krom, and Brutaka, who were convinced the Matoran universe could be salvaged, all for their own goals. Helrix avoided Tuyet's slashing attack and l
about himself, but under the control of another. Whoever that was, they had no access to the Toa's air power, which he thought would make him right for defeat. Unfortunately for him, Liwa's body was now home to Trenkong, an ancient entity with enormous mental powers. Miserix's first solid blow knocked Liwa to the ground. The fallen Toa responded with a mental shock blast that came close to turning Miserix's brain to ash. But still, Miserix had been through a lot in the past millennia. Imprisonment, torture, humiliation, and no mind power was going to be enough to stop him. He gathered Liwa up in his claw and slammed his soul against the wall once, twice, and three times. Meanwhile, Axon's heart wasn't in this fight. He had only recently rediscovered Rukaka and regained their old friendship. He couldn't believe they were already at each other's throats once again, and he wasn't certain Rukaka was wrong. Maybe Helix's plans were too extreme. Perhaps due lay in protecting the until the very last moment. But for this moment, he had to concentrate on protecting just himself. For one good hit from Rutaka would take his head clean off. Helrix, on the other hand, had not wavered in her determination, but she also knew that this battle was sure to draw Makuta Paradox's attention. First her time shatter. At any moment. She had to do the Nova Blast <laughs> before anyone could stop her. To yet to guess what was about to happen. Sliding an elbow into Axon. I want to stop and read your message, but it's not worth it. I can't, I can't pause the video. Right towards Helrix. To her surprise, just as Miserix was about to crush Helrix, the ancient demon Go with it. The Makuta landed in a heap, but was barely slowed by Julian already I risk losing one second of time. In front of the combatant's eyes. At the chamber entrance, space itself appeared to be warping. The next instant, a massive figure stepped out of the distortion and stood before them. All around them, a voice, both young and old, echoed through the chamber, parading them for their squabbling to save existence. No one in the room had ever seen the newcomer before, but there were some who knew How it many was. subs to restart? The the There's not a number. A I mean, a million. <laughs> Artaka. One million Artaka. subs, I'll do it. Into madness. <laughs> At the sight of Artaka, the chamber went silent. He stood in the shattered doorway, facing some of the most powerful beings in existence as their superior. First, his cold eyes fell on the body of Liwa. Reaching out and placing his palm on Liwa's forehead, Artaka closed his eyes. The Toa's body spasmed, then dropped to the floor. After a moment, Liwa's eyes opened and he looked around, dazed, for he had returned to his body for the first time in weeks. As Helrix began to challenge Artaka, still preparing for her Nova Blast, the combatants were frozen solid by a reverberating voice around the chamber. The voice of Makuta Terax, who now had drawn his attention to their gathering. Mocking their efforts to stop him, Terax extended the briefest of energies to the gathered beings. One instant, Axon, Rutaka, Helrix, Artaka, Miserix, Tuyat, Hafu, Kapura, and Liwa were inside the half-ruined chamber deep beneath Metru. The next, they were floating in the airless, icy void of outer space, slowly losing consciousness as the cold crept through their armor. On the surface of Aquamagna, they could barely make out the dizzyingly colossal form of the great spirit robot look to the stars beyond the planet and blast off the shattered planet of Vara Magna in search of Matadui, the mask of life, and victory over all life itself. In the void of space, we was summoned a thin bubble of air linked around the heads of each castaway, calling them to join hands and link up as they drifted in the cold reaches of space. Despite his efforts, not even Artaka had the power to defy a true new god, and Teradax had blocked their return to his form. Before the warriors could make any moves, a hole appeared in space before them. Reaching outwards was a clawed hand, and before they knew it, the nine beings found themselves sprawled on a damp stone floor. Kakura was the first to realize that the stone itself was moving, not to mention breathing. He cried out and got to his feet, backing against the wall. The bricks in the wall reached out to embrace him, holding him fast. Stepping out from the shadows was the mad half-being Bazon, who called their attention to their host. As the occupants of the chamber turned to face the being before them, they could barely make out a figure seated on the floor, chains affixed to arms and legs. The chains were writhing like serpents, and the voice of the insane, cursed great being echoed out. He had made a deal with Bazon and brought him back to this core universe, but after realizing Bazon did not have the power to free him from his prison, he tasked him to rescue some of the most powerful beings in the mature universe from the darkness of outer space. And so, as the cursed great being demanded his freedom, Liwa glanced out the window of his cell. He was stunned to see a forest that stretched as far as the eye could see, far larger than any jungle he had called home on the island of Matanui. For Liwa, Bazon, Artaka, Helrix, Miserix, Axon, Rutaka, Tuya, Kapura, and Hatu had been transported to the jungle planet of Botamaga, moon of Sirius Magna. Meanwhile, back in the mature universe, on the island of Zaxos, the Tomamari watched in horror as a terrifying fusion emerged from the pool and energized for those. A mixture of a Zyglite, a Vortex, a Steltian laborer, and the five surviving Raka. It had been created by the barbaric Scotty in an I'm paying attention. Now, I'm paying attention. It was terrible, and it was beautiful. Try Axon. Towering 12 feet high, with gleaming golden skin, powerful muscles, and piercing green eyes, it regarded the assembled Skaki with the benevolent gaze of a creator. Only the vaguely reptilian past of its face took away from its stunning appearance. As this new, golden-skinned being cried out in hunger, its hypnotic mental powers took hold of the assembled Skaki and Toamari, binding them in its way. Throwing down their weapons, the five Toamari rose and walked forward, ready and eager to obey the commands of their new dark master. Back in the Southern Islands, the Teradax of the Melding Universe and Tomator Lazika ready for combat against the three Shadow Takanua who blocked their path. The Teradax of our core universe had expected the Melding Teradax to react nobly and fight from a distance, using his long-range abilities to hold the Takanua at bay. But the Melding Teradax had no such weaknesses. Unlimbering his warhammer, Teradax charged. Before the startled Shadow Toa could react, Teradax had swung his hammer, striking one Toa in the face and shattering his mask to pieces. Whirling, he landed another hammer blow to the chest armor of a second Toa, cracking it straight down the center. Mazika moved in then, catching the third Takanua with a scissor kick and sending him to the ground. Teradax made sure he would never be getting up. The now maskless Toa staggered forward, firing shadow energy from his hands at random. One blast caught Teradax in the shoulder, badly damaging his armor. Without the luxury to feel pain or worry about his escaping antidermis, Melding Teradax created a swirling fog of darkness to conceal his movements. Using the coverage to his advantage, Mazika reached out with all his senses, leaping and whirling in the air with his eyes fully blinded, sensing the scrape of Shadow Takanua's boots on rock. His foot connected with the Toa's mask, knocking the skew but not dislodging it. Even as his momentum carried him forward, Mazika landed a second blow to the Shadow Toa's neck. Enraged, the Toa hurled tendrils of darkness that began to strangle the but just then, there was a sickening crunch, and the shadow to his face went blank. Behind him was Teradax and his Warhammer, which had smashed Takanua's mask and brained to pieces. The two warriors had finally overcome their trials, but the final battle was only about to begin. Part 7, In the Valley of the Maze. As Makuta Teradax, in the body of the Great Spirit Robot, blasted off from Aqua Magna to challenge Matanui on Vara Magna, the Toa of Light was encountering his own trials and tribulations in the desert sands. While rebellions were fought across the Matoran universe, and the Toa Nuba led their allies to victory, Matanui struggled through the Valley of the Maze, ancient fortress of the Great Beings, which housed a mysterious power source deep within. Meanwhile, the Glacoria continued to defend the Agori from wandering bandits like Sama and Remnants of scroll patrols who still sought to conquer more land in the wake of Tumas defeat. With Final all battle. The impending threat of the Batera legions. Akari Final battle. The north of Var Magna, seeking out Matanui to aid in his quests. At the same time, Gresh
Matanui ventured deeper within the fortress, where he discovered a computer stationed within a mechanized volcano. Before his eyes, images projected on the walls around him detailed his mission to study other cultures and civilizations throughout the galaxy, to understand the reason for war and how to prevent it from arising on Spirus Magna again. On the screen, the progress of the great spirit robot was tracked, which showed how Matanui had completed his mission and was headed home just as Makuta Teranak struck him down with a virus, causing the robot to crash towards the planet. As the impact grew into a deep slumber and erased his memories, Matanui was surprised to see that the restoration of Spirus Magna required a second colossal robot. And so, as Matanui and Tarduk delved deeper within the There's maze, a second one? The second robot and left the maze after seizing it for themselves. At last, Matanui was closer than ever to regaining control of a massive robotic form, and our journey is about to come to an end. Part Wait, eight, whoa. Returning to the mega village with the power Whoa, source, we're getting there. The prototype robot and restore Spheris Magna once and for all. Despite being confronted by Gresh and Ranu, who accused him of being willing to destroy their only shelter just to gain more power, Matanui convinced them of his noble intentions, and Ranu reluctantly allowed him to use the mega village, but not before warning him that should he betray the Agori, they would find a way to make him pay. The Agori and the Torian of the four tribes then left the mega village, taking shelter in the mountainous caves, and Matanui prepared to enter the prototype robot. Bidding him a tearful farewell, Kina, who had grown close to Matanui over his time in Bar Magna, was at last to send him off. And so, in an explosion of energy and light, Matanui's spirit exited his body and traveled into the prototype robot, awakening it after 150,000 years. Jesus! And across the land in tendrils of glowing green light from the sockets of the robot, Matanui rose once again. Barely managing to keep control over the ancient internal systems with a mask of life, Matanui struggled to his feet. Power surged through his body, out through his metal fingertips, and he began the cosmic process of reuniting the moons of Aqua Magna and Bota Magna with Vera Magna. As dark oh energy forced gravity rippled through space, and Matanui concentrated on restoring Spheres Magna, Makuta Teranax, in the body of the original Great Spirit Robot, grew ever closer to Bara Magna. Inside the Matoran universe, Tahu and Onua had just succeeded in destroying the final supply of energized protogermans. Reconvening with Dali, Pohatu, and Kopaka, the five remaining Tawanuva had little time to ponder where Liwa had gone before rushing to the southern regions of the robot, tracking hordes of Rakshi that had abandoned their posts and flooded to spaces unknown. Ordering all remaining agents of the Order of Matanui, active Toa teams, and Dark Hunters to rush to the southern islands in pursuit, Tahu watched as legions of Exotoa, Viserak, and Skafti, led by Nectan, followed the Rakshi to the southern regions. As the forces of both good and evil rushed to the south, there was impact on Bara Magna. Makuda Teranax commanding the We're getting so close. We're so close. In an instant, Teradax vaporized a peak in the Black Spike Mountains, killing several Skrull and proposed an alliance to conquer the universe together to Matanui. As Matanui refused, in response, Teradax used his own gravity powers to Here it is. above the cave where most of the Agori and Latorian were hiding, forcing them to flee onto the desert sands. In an instant, Makuta Teradax engaged Matanui in a full-on robotic duel above the clouds. <laughs> on the ground beneath Teradax's feet, Gresh and the Latorian concentrated their blasters at single spots on his armor, hoping to distract him long enough for Matanui to gain the upper hand. But before they had a chance to deal any damage, hatches opened by Makuta's feet, and out of the darkness poured countless legions of Rakshi, Skakti, and Vizrak, followed closely by the forces of good. While the two armies clashed, Takanuva and the Tawanuva emerged from the opening, joining forces with the Latorian in a climactic battle. To avoid standing okay. out being targeted by Rakshi, Takanuva altered his armor color to silver, blending in with Toa and Latorian device as he blasted through waves of villains. In the distance, Strongius watched the proceedings and, seeking revenge for the Rock Tribe's earlier defeat, led bands of Skrull warriors into the battle, which had now begun in earnest. In a different section of Bar Magna, Tahu Nuba stumbled out of the Matoran universe, faced with the blinding light and heat of the desert. Cast into a vision of Tawahi by the Mask of Life, Tahu was shown a flashback to thousands of years ago, where the great beings had designed a set of golden armor to be worn specifically by Toa Mata Taku in the event of an emergency. With the ability to destroy all solid antidermis in the area, the armor could act as a vast explosion of energy that decimate all Rakshi forces, which of course used armor made More golden of armor. Tahu, the golden armor began to materialize, and the Mask of Life devolved him purposefully into his original Toa Mata form, as he was needed in his unaltered state to fulfill this crucial task. But before Tahu could don this golden armor and destroy the Rakshi, Teranax noticed the blinding glow of light and sent a gargantuan blast of energy from his hands, scattering the pieces of golden armor all across Bara Magna. Meeting oh up with Takanuva, Tahu began a search to recollect all the pieces of the golden armor. Oh all my all god. Of of Introducing himself to Gresh and the Glatorian, Tahu had only moments to explain the threat before the battles resumed. The Toahaka, now fully cleared of Teranax's illusion, held a desperate defense alongside the Glatorian, protecting the Agori villagers. In other regions of the desert, Gali and Pohatu clashed with Skafi barbarians, decimating entire legions in their wake. And in the skies above them, Matanui and Makuta Teranax engaged in their climactic final battle. Teranax dispatching Vizrak spiders to rapidly seal breaches in the hull with their webs, and Matanui barely managing to hold off the titanic foe. As Matanui declared that the Agori and Glatorian would never submit to Teradax, Teradax crushed Bara Magna with his gravity powers. In desperation, Matanui shoved Teradax and redirected the blast towards the two moons of Aqua and Bota Magna, accelerating their descent toward the planet. He then redoubled his efforts, forcing Teradax backwards towards a falling fragment of Aqua Magna. And in the desert, Tahu encountered Nectan, the Skakti Warlord who now seized a piece of the golden armor for himself. Challenging him in a one-on-one -on -one duel, Tahu sliced through his crescent sight, melting Nectan's armor with his fire blast, and utterly defeating the Skakti Warlord. Nice. In the desert, Gresh, Takanuba, and the rest of the Glatorian and Agori battled Teradax's forces for the golden armor, desperately fighting to regain and get each piece to Tahu. In a truly epic battle stretching across the planet, <laughs> Tahu managed to finally regain control of the golden armor. The Toa of Fire concentrated, <laughs> focusing his thoughts just as he would do to activate a mass power or control flame. But this time, he was willing the golden armor to do whatever it could. To Let's go. Time. Power surged through. Let's go. Electricity locked his muscles and suffused his body with blinding light. Tendrils of energy shot from Tahu, coiling around every Rakshi on the battlefield. In an instant, the creatures fell to the ground, seized by spasms as their power raced back along the tendrils and into Tahu. As the combatants on both sides watched, the Rakshi's armor disintegrated and the Kratos slugs inside them exploded into shards of shadow. On the horizon, Tahu was still screaming as the energies of hundreds of Rakshi threatened to overwhelm him. Then, abruptly, the nimbus of power around him disappeared and he dropped like a stone. And just that quickly, the battle was over. With the Rakshi gone, the Skafti and Skrull were badly outnumbered by the Glatorian and Tahu's Toa Legion. Some surrendered, while others scattered back in the desert to fight another day. But no one was celebrating. They all knew victory meant nothing if Makuta killed Matanui, and it seemed there was nothing they could do to prevent that. But what none of the fighters on the ground realized was that they had already done more than they realized. Each Krana was bound to its creator in some way, and in this case, Makuta Teradax. While he did not feel their pain, he could sense their deaths. The loss of so many at once made him hesitate for just a moment. But that instant, Makuta Teradax was paying no attention to the world around him or the sky above him. Oh. Matanui saw it coming. It was why he had forced Makuta to this northern
The Baramaga Desert was a disaster area. The surrounding mountains had been pulverized or flattened, and massive scorch marks scarred the sand. The ground was littered with the bodies of those who had lost their lives in the clash, alongside countless shattered pieces of rock shiara. Dominating it all, of course, was a fallen robot that had once been Makuta Teradax's greatest weapon. Kahu and Takanuba stood on a dune, looking at the metallic shell inside which they had lived their entire lives. No doubt the inner workings had been heavily damaged and there would be casualties. But as they watched the multitude streaming out of the robot, they saw many familiar figures. More than likely, most had taken shelter at the initial quake, and so survived the much larger shock. They stumbled out onto the sands. Toa, Matoran villagers, Vortex traders, Scotty barbarians, agents of the Order of Matanui, Dark Hunter bandits, wow. animals, Rahi birds, insects, and more, all wow. shone against the bright sun of this new planet. Towering above the clouds to the skies above, Matanui surveyed this brave new world. He watched as new species and populations mingled and met, witnessing the birth of new culture and world order before his eyes. <laughs> the Matoran and Igori had much to learn from each other. The Toa team with the Latorian would now safeguard both sets of villagers from being threatened. Natural alliances were being forged even now. Matanui turned his attention then to the fallen form of Makuta. There was another alliance that should have existed, but never came to pass. Had he and Teradax worked together, they could have restored Spheres Magna without the devastation and loss of life. But Teradax's greed and ambition wouldn't allow that. And in the end, both his mad dreams and the body he had stolen were wreckage. Get Makuta fucked, was Teradax! Was to worry about today and tomorrow for this world. When he had gone to Ranu and asked to take the Agori city from them, Matanui had made a vow to the Agori and himself. If he succeeded in rebuilding this planet, he would not stop there. He would give the Agori a new life, a new chance to thrive here. And now was the time to begin that work. And even though he knew that this final act of creation would doom his spirit, his mind, and his body, Matanui knew just what he had to do. Just as Matoro had sacrificed himself to save the life of Matanui, it was his own turn to pay the great debt owed to the world of Spheres Magna and his people. And so, with no fear or doubt in his heart, Matanui looked at the sky and stretched out his arms. He summoned the energies that coursed through his body, even as he called out to the Mask of Life. The Mask at first resisted. It too knew that it might well not survive this, and it did not want to cease to exist. Matanui could have forced the Igniga to aid him. He truly had a stronger will, but he did not. Instead, he simply pictured in his mind how Spheres Magna could be if this was successful. He knew the Mask would sense what was in his thoughts, and it would know this would be the ultimate use of its power. A moment later, Matanui felt the power of the Kanoki Igniga, Mask of Life, merged with what little of his own. Then he willed that power to flow from his body and sweep across the planet. Everywhere touched, mountains rose, forest flourished, life appeared. Wow. In the desert of Bar Magna, time seemed to flow backwards as barren sand gave way to a jungle teeming with trees and plants and long dead rivers returned to life. The vast ocean of Aqua Magna felt Matanui's touch as well. Underwater, plants flourished, providing a bounty for the fish that swam in the sea. The power of the Mask of Life touched even the twisted, mutated beings who lived in the depths, curing them of the worst of their afflictions while leaving them to survive beneath the waves. In the great forest of Botamagna, the giant biomechanical reptiles created so long ago by the great beings watched, amazed as their homeland shifted and changed all around them. Areas where trees and foliage had ceased to grow suddenly were green again. Smaller animals emerged from their hiding places to feast on the new growth. The Gori and Gorian that stood in the once desert were speechless. This was not the world they once knew. It was better. After 100,000 years of struggling to survive, of scraping for every morsel of food and drop of water, there was now enough for all. That's they how it feels. It, it does feel like it's been 100,000 years of struggling to survive. And with this final act of creation, Matanui fell. Anyone else get chills? Under the strain and energy of life, both the robot and spirit of Matanui lay dormant once again. Arriving on a ridge by the collapsed form of the robot, Tahu, Akar, and Kiva sat and mourned the loss of a god and friend. Agori, Matoran, and Gatorian had gathered now, drawn by the sight of the great robot's collapse. Some looked grief-stricken, others merely puzzled, and some fearful. Matanui had granted them a new life and a new world, and no doubt they expected him to lead them into the future. Instead, he was gone, and they were on their own again. Kina turned back to the pile of wreckage, damp from the gentle rain. For a moment, she thought a shaft of sunlight had forced its way through the clouds, for there was a faint glow in the center of the rubble. But then, the glow grew brighter. Akar saw it too, and climbed over the twisted metal to reach the source. He reached down, and emerged with a mass of light, now gleaming brighter than a sun. Flaring so brightly that all present had to shield their eyes from the light, the spirit of Matanui echoed from the mass, thanking his friends and proclaiming destiny fulfilled. And so, with the last remnants of his energy, Matanui bid his friends with one final test. Seek out the great beings, tell them that they planted this hole once more, and convince them to share their gifts. For Matanui himself had learned what it meant to have friends, not subjects, workers or soldiers, true brothers, and he hoped that the great beings may be able to do the same. Wait, and to quote Matanui, why would you get the great beings back? They fucked winning. everything up but to begin time, with. There is a new beginning as well. There will be challenges to face and enemies to fight, but I know you will overcome. All that has gone before, my friends, has only served to give birth to this new day. Let unity, duty, and destiny. All journeys must come to an end, but this time there is a new beginning as well. There will be challenges to face and enemies to fight, but I know you will overcome. All that has gone before, my friends, has only served to give birth to this new day. Let unity, duty, and destiny be your guides. Be well, be strong, care for this world, and for each other. Farewell. Pre <laughs> what a beautiful ending. What a beautiful ending. What a beautiful ending. <laughs> no, no, there is nothing left in this video. <sighs> now it is time to do the quiz. Now it is time to do the quiz. Let's do the quiz. Uh, let's see if I know my Bionicle. That was the full story. If I pass this quiz, I'm going to bed. If I fail this quiz, I'll watch the epilogue. <laughs> a passing grade would be a D. Okay. Let's see what we got. This one's tough. 10 questions on Bionicle. Is there an average one? 
Fuck it. Which one of these four was not one of the original six colors? Oh, come on, dude. Water. Red. I guess yellow. Yellow's not original because there was a gold. There were three Titan sets that came with the Toa Hordika and the Visorak. Which one of these wasn't one? <laughs> uh, Toa Likan. Likan's not a Titan. Right? Kitongu was a Titan. Sidorak was a Titan. Uh, I'm going to check that. Which of the 18 canister Toa sacrificed his life to revive Mata Nui? Easy. That's Matoro, brother. That's fucking Matoro. He did it twice in two different universes. The Order of Mata Nui member can be made of pieces from three Toa Mystica. This Order of Mata Nui member can be made from pieces of the three Toa Mystica. I have no fucking idea. This Order of Mata Nui member can be made of pieces from the three Toa Mystica. It's not Axon. Try try Numa. Because <laughs> it's got try in it and there's three. It's got to be it, right? <laughs> the Makuta Mystica are insect-like creatures. Which one doesn't have wings? Gorast. Krika. Bittil. They all do. No idea. No idea. Taking a risk. Taking a gambit. <laughs> that No, that's crazy, right? They wouldn't do this question. Can I get a hint? Hint. Oh, it's down to these two? Oh. Oh, shit. <laughs> All right, I'll stick, with, I'll stick with my answer. I'll stick with my answer. In 2003, the first Kanohi Avokis were released. It's like a fucking DJ. <laughs> What sets did they come in? I don't know the names of the sets. It's not part of the fucking video. I did a quiz on the video. This is stupid. This is not. These are not lore questions. Uh, I'm just gonna say it's. Uh, I'm gonna here. I'm gonna do that. There's a, there's a classic thing. All right. See, so look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Takunava is in all three of these answers, right? So it's probably one of those. So re remove this one. Then I see Makuta, Takua, and Maku. It's got to be one of these because I don't remember Maku at all. Takunava and Takua. Makuta. Makuta and Takunava. I'll take a guess. I'll take a guess. What was the pilot for the set form of the Swamp Strider? No one. It didn't need one. <laughs> it owns uh no it probably has a fucking pilot actually uh swamp strider voltraz no Miz M no i have fucking no idea honestly no idea in the comic brothers in arms what classic movie did voltraz parody after falling on spherus magna i'm gonna say it was fucking voltraz huh no i wouldn't they wouldn't do it twice toa Helrix, dude let's just try that um this is... I, I have no fucking idea. I'm going to say Terminator. Who was the first user of the Ignika? Oh, that's a great question. That I should know. Uh, It's not Matoro. He did it later. It could be a great being. A member of Toa Jovan's team? <laughs> That'd be a fucking terrible Vazon. Vazon's later. It's a great being. It's a great being. It's a great being. Which of these canister sets wore the first Kanohi Shellic? No, I have no idea what that is. Uh, hint me. Vampra. Fuck it. Submit my answers. <laughs> Correct. 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 Krika. Okay. I fucked that one up. Correct. Uh, Mazika. Okay, it wasn't part of the video. Wizard of Oz. That makes a lot of sense. 
but it wasn't part of the video. Great being, first user of Anika. Bro, I got every lore question right. I got every lore question right. 6 out of 10 is a D, 6 out of 10 is a passing. Passing grade, passing grade, passing grade, passing grade, passing grade! Let's go, dude! Passing grade! All right, let me try one more time. Let me try, wait, wait, let's see. Uh, Bionicle lore quiz. I'm not doing this. <laughs> no, 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 no. We passed, dude. We passed. We passed, we passed, we passed. What is this? Oh, wait. This could be an interesting one. Hmm. <clears throat> what was this character's name? Um, Toa Tahu. Oh, it says E. It says it right there. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, no, 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 no. But I knew that. I knew that because I knew that because Ta, dude. Ta, fire. Ta. All right, I'm not going to show that. What was the name of the device that Nuparo uses? I don't fucking know. Zoxor? Croxor? Boxor. What was the name of the main character in Mata Nui Online Game 2? <laughs> Fuck if I know. Holly. That's not part of the fucking video. What is the name of this? Zadok. Rorsak. That's not part of the video. In Web of Shadows, who make Vakama who make Vakama evil? Rodaka. Got it. Nailed it. Which three titans are used to create Kardas? Uh Axon. This is Axon, Brutaka, and Fenrak. Yeah, right? It's just how you spell it, right? Axon, Brutaka, and Fenrak. Okay, well, was <laughs> Axon with two X's versus one X. Fuck off, dude. That's just... What are the colors of Pride Act? Okay, white, blue, black. Don't care. What was the name of this Titan? Makuta Icarax, dude. Fuck off. In Legends Reborn, who takes over... <laughs> no, that's... <laughs> that one I knew. Obviously, I know it's Teradax, dude. Okay, I scrolled too far on that one. That one's fucking easy. Uh, what year are they from? This is so stupid. This is so stupid. Is there not one quiz on the actual lore? Oh my god. The one who created Toa Mata was... Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Artaka. <laughs> Who were the first Matoran and Toa, respectively? Uh, <laughs> I got six out of ten. We passed. We passed, baby. We passed. We passed. We passed. We passed. We passed. Look at chat. Wait, what's this? What are you linking me? An actually accurate Bionicle quiz. Let's see this. With the exception of Av Matoran, how many tribes elements of Matoran were traditionally female? One, the water. Which of the following is known to have worn a Kanohi Olmak at some point in time? Dude, I don't fucking know. <laughs> this isn't part of the video. The Kanoe Ignika, the Mask of Life, was known to place curses on anyone who picked it up. Who was cursed with the ability of killing anything they touched? I should know this. I should know this. Oh, fuck me, dude. This is in the video. Uh, it's either Nocturne or Dekar or Mantax or Takadox or Jovan or Gadunka. 
Oh, I should know this, dude. Nocturne had it at one point. Um, but I feel like it wasn't him. He wasn't given that power. It was someone else that got the ability to kill everything they touched. Maybe it was Gadunka or Mantax. <laughs> Give me a hint. <laughs> Give me a fucking hint, dude. Which of the following is known to be the name of a great being? They didn't name him in the video. I just fucking Artaka, 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 Artaka. What was the name of the Mask of Regeneration? Mask of Regeneration? Fuck if I know, dude. That's like the mask they never talk about. Amana. How long before the end of the main story did the event known as the Matoran Civil War start? Fucking a million billion years. Who the fuck knows, dude? 79,500. 79,100? 79,580,000? 79, what is this horse shit? Eighty thousand. <laughs> I don't know, dude. Fuck off. What are the following one is not the name of a cannon Kanohi mask. What is not the name of a cannon? I have to pick the wrong one. Road. It's a microphone. <laughs> Who said this quote? You just saw our technique. We laugh in the face of danger, but sometimes danger doesn't get the joke. <laughs> Bro, they didn't do quotes in the video. So how would I know that? Kind of giga chad though. Uh, if I had to guess, Kapaka. What were the two factions of the Matoran Civil War? Ta Ko Onu versus Po Ga Li. Ta Po Onu versus Ga Li Ko. <laughs> Fuck off, dude. <laughs> uh, stupid. So stupid. Nailed it. Who was the red one? So a Tahoe, dude. That's facts. <laughs> Wait, tell me which ones I got. Oh, you answered. Three were traditionally female. Ridiculous. This one I wouldn't have known. This was not part of the thing. It was Nocturne. Oh, fucking slay me, dude. Slay me. Nocturne was the only one I thought of, but I thought it was wrong. Oh, God, it was Nocturne. Okay. Uh, which of the following is going to be the name of a great being? Uh, okay. Uh, on Gonse. That was Beyonce's fucking brother. That's not in the fucking video. Name of the Masquerade Generation? Kirill. Okay, I wouldn't have known that. 79,500. Fucking stupid. By the way, that's what I picked. That's what I picked, and then someone in chat spammed wrong. And that's why I switched it. That's fucked. I got this one. I picked this one first. I'm counting it. Fuck you. Uh, Road, this is stupid. There's no way I could have known this. Who said this quote? Couldn't have known this. Wasn't in the video. I nailed this one. I got this one right. Incredible. Uh, I got the red. This is, I got all the ones I could know right. I am fucking done. I'm 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 done. Give me a real fucking quiz. None of these quizzes are fucking fair. Bionicle lore quiz, like a lore quiz, actual lore. I'm going to Sporkle. Bionicle bunker, Bionicle bunker, Bionicle bunker, Bionicle bunker. Question. 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 Play quiz. Who reversed the Toa Metru's Hordika mutations? Uh, fuck me, dude. This is a question one. <laughs> uh, this happened. Uh, this happened at the end of the water section. They all got Hordik. No, this is this is Rudaka or it's Nuju. Rudaka. <laughs> replay, 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 replay. Replay, replay, replay. Nuju, Nuju, Nuju. Replay, replay. I knew that. I knew, I knew that. I knew that. It was, it's Kitongu. It's Kitongu, bro. It's obviously Kitongu. All right. It's all right. All right. All right. Which Rahi resembles a tiger? I'm still going. It still counts. Remembers a tiger. Okay. I don't know what a Rahi is. That puts me in a bad spot. But I think I know this is obviously Nui Jaga. 
Okay, replay. B. This is obviously Manas. Replay. <sighs> Kitongu. This is obviously Tarkava. <laughs> this is obviously fucking Muaka. BB, huh? Never do double back to back Bs. That's crazy. Which of these Matoran was turned into a shadow Matoran? Tanma. Dude, fucking fu B, P, B, Kirop. Yep, I knew that. Okay. Who discovered the Mask of Light on Mata Nui? Tahu. <laughs> B, B, A. No comma. <laughs> Dude, <I'm fucking> losing. <laughs> Who destroyed Krata by wearing the golden armor? Now that I know. That, my friends, was motherfucking Tahu. What? And that was on times two speed. That was on times two speed, bro. Okay. <clears throat> Which Glatorian retired from the arena? to protect trade caravans. Gelu. No? Malum. Fuck. BBADC. BBADC. Uh, Gelu. It was Gelu. It was Gelu. Fuck me. It was Gelu. That counts, dude. That counts. I count that one. I my first thought was Gelu, and I thought myself out of it. I count it. It counts. I knew. I said Gelu out loud. Editors are gonna edit in. I got it, Gelu. Okay, next one. Which Turaga was temporarily under control of a Krana? What the fuck is a Turaga? What's a Krana? <laughs> Fucking Nuju, dude. BBA. DCA BBA DCA BBA DCA It's fucking no comma BBA DCA BBA DCA Matau it is it was Matau didn't get it last which means I'm good which temporarily fused with Vezok in the chamber of life oh oh shit uh Vezok and Vezok and Radok Huh? Or Hakan? Radok. It was Radok. Yes! 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 Smart. Intelligent. BBA. DCA. AC. Okay. Which substance did Bakama and Onewa make a tunneler turn into to defeat it? Plasma. Plasma, baby. BBA, DCA, AC. BBA, DCA, AC. BBA, DCA, AC. Glass. It was glass. It was glass. Second try counts. Second try counts. There's four options. I wouldn't fucking guess it second try unless I knew. Which Baraki is a native water dweller? Mantax. Easily. You're fucking kidding me. Mantax? The Manta is not a native water door? BBA, DCA, ACA. BBA, DCA, ACA. BBA, DCA, ACA. Elec. Yes. Second try. Still counts. Still counts. Who mutated Nidiki into his insectoid form? I'm just going to fucking guess Pterodax, bro. What? Or the shadowed one. Pterodax, Pterodax, Pterodax. Fuck. BBA, DCA, ACA, A. BBA, DCA, ACA, A. Shadowed one. BBA, DCA, ACA, A. Rudaka. Okay. Which Turaga showed the Toa Nuva of their Koro of a carving of the Toa Metru against the wishes of the other Turaga? What the fuck am I reading? What the fuck am I reading? Which Turaga showed the Toa Nuva of their Koro of a... 
no, of their Koro, a carving of the Toa Metru against the wishes of the other Turaga. No comma. a fucking genius no i didn't bink it dude i knew that i thought about it and i knew it who was responsible for the mountain being on zia who was responsible for the mountain being on zia zacton fuck 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 BBA, DCA, ACA, ACB. BBA, DCA, ACA. I forget it again. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> A, C, B. Rudaka. No, Mutran. Yes! Wait, I should have thought of that at the beginning. I actually knew that. Because Mutran's the only person on Zia. The other characters aren't from Zia. Wait, I actually... I, I, I show my work. I show my work. Mutran's the only character on there that would be on Zia. So it's the only one that can... No, that counts. That fucking counts. I, I fucking... I actually... I actually knew the lore of that. So I fucking nailed it. That counts. All right. Who traveled uncontrollably between dimensions after being exposed to energized protodermis wearing the mask of dimensional gates? Who traveled uncontrollably? Vazon. It's Vazon. It's fucking Vazon. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I'm a Bionicle Lord genius. I'm a Bionicle Lord genius. I'm a real fan. I'm a real fan. Uh... Which item did Makuta Teradax intend to use to recreate the Nui Stone from fragments? It's the staff. It's the Spear of Fusion or the Staff of Atarka. It's not, it's, it's not Protodermis. It's not the Mask of Life. He wanted to use the Spear or the Staff. I don't quite remember. I think it was the Staff, but Spear of Fusion sounds right, so I'm fucked up. But I honestly think it's the Staff. I'm going to go with my fucking gut and my heart and my soul. Yes! Yes! Yes, I'm the smartest fucking Bionicle alive. And you can all eat my ass. Stream's done, bro. Stream's done. Stream's done. I solved it. 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 I know my Bionicle. I know it. I know it more than you ever thought I ever would. Oh, God. Tomorrow, we might watch the epilogue. <laughs> you know, good epilogue. You have to let the story sit. You got to let the story sit. Uh, we might have to hold the uh, watch the epilogue. I am ending for today. Thank you so much for watching. What a truly epic journey! A truly epic journey. Just to catch us up on where we're at, that is eight hours and forty-two minutes straight of Bionicle, and I wouldn't change a moment of it except to end on the highest of possible notes. Yo yo, Taraka. Yo, yo, Taraka The gang on the loose, nothing you can do The beast on the move, fully coming through Trigger, tracer, tricks are coming through At the snake that makes Taraka crew Yo, yo, Taraka The gang on the loose, nothing you can do You can try, but why? You know you're gonna lose Taraka on the street, it's time, take taco The gang is on the loose, and in your school locker At your home too, in your friend's room Nothing you can do, the gang is on the loose No doubt, uh, we run the streets from now on. Uh, what you gonna do when we come? Trigger, tracer, drifter, snake, beast, bully, that makes Paraka. You can't stop us, you can't top us, cause we're Paraka. Introduction, <laughs> the police explode.
explosive. No fuse, no use. You're gonna lose, make a bet. Beast, no animal, no pet. Triggers on arms, no charms, and no sweat. Stay hidden, traces, no chicken. Oh no, drifters, never social. Let's rumble, the snake is cunning, never cuddles. You can't win Time. against this paraca. World record!